you got a hole in your throat. Oh no, just call your boss. Take a crust from out your eyes. So taste it, not a coffee. Good morning, you knuckleheads. Nobody's been able to do that since the bat's been gone. Uh, oh, this is Tasty you know. Live with special guests. Thomas Preston, TP, welcome. Thank you, Vanetta. See, you're all bright and happy to see I me. Wish. I saw Tom downstairs. I walked into the security thing, and Tom followed me. It was like, hey, TP. <laughs> <laughs> see, this is the welcome that I. I'm enjoy. happy to see you. Welcome. Thank How are you. things in the great state of Texas? They're doing very well. Thank you. We have five dogs now. You have five. Five, dogs. count them, Vanetta, five dogs. Oh, that's wonderful. Or as I say, their total poundage is about 460 pounds right now. That's a, that's, that's, that's we get a, a house. Lot of we dogs. get a house full of canines. What do you have? There's five dogs. We get five dogs. What kind of dogs? I don't know. They're dogs. An assortment. They got dogs. But anyway, the new puppy. And I'll, I'll send some pictures maybe to John. Oh, I want to oh, see. Maybe yeah, I get the puppy. The puppy, I have a before and after of the puppy. Okay. You know, love makes little dogs grow, that sort of thing, the whole Clifford thing. Aww. Anyway, Slim, the dog's name is Slim. <laughs> Slimmy. S-L-M, yes. Slim. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, Slimmy, he's about 140 pounds now. Okay, that's, that's well more than and he's I about weigh. He's about nine months old. What is he? I don't, he might be, a, uh, what are they, the Pyrenees? Oh, Might be a Pyrenees, Pyrenees and something yeah. else. Like a Pyrenees Dane mix. <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't, it's like, what is he? He's a dog. He's, he's 140 pounds. He's 140 pounds. He's a big ass dog. So, anyway, we got dogs. Oh, that's wonderful. How are the cats, Vanetta? Um, well, my cat passed away. No, I'm so. sorry. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. So I don't. You have any strays like that you feed? I, I, I. That was the last one. So oh, I, I am catless. Well, so. I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. Me. That's okay though. <laughs> it's part of part of part of the life. Uh, but I can't believe you have five dogs. How are your barn cats? Well, the barn. Well, the three. I hate the cats. <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for the cats to go to cat heaven. Oh, but barn cats are good. They serve her. Those are working cats. They, they really, purpose. really don't. <laughs> they really don't. That is that is a myth. It's that is a myth. a myth. And you gotta feed them, and then the you dogs do the dogs fight them. over the cat food. It's just Oh sure, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Anyway. Oh that's well it's good to be back. That is life on the ranch. What are you excited to eat while you were here in Chicago? Well, I had Shake Shack last night. Okay, that's a good <laughs> That's pretty good. I mean, it's nothing, you know, it's not like, ooh, go to Chicago, go to Shake Shack. Um, it's close by. It's a solid Yeah, place. I mean, it was easy. It was yeah, easy. Yeah. I didn't have to get in a car and go someplace. Yes. Um, I'll go to, what's the, uh, Bonsi, Bonchi? Oh, Bonchi, yes, the Italian Tonight. pizza place. Okay. Tonight, I'm looking forward to that. Okay. Um, yeah. Might go to Greek, is Greek Town still there? Yes. Yes, there's still. Well, I don't don't down. laugh. Things shut down. Things disappear. You know, develop it could be a giant Greek shopping Greek mall town. for I know. Things shut down, but not Greek town. Okay. <laughs> I mean a Greek <laughs> restaurant might shut is, down. Is uh, is Athenian room? Is is what's the what's the place Athena? I was like down there? Athena? Athena is Athena still open? Athena's still open. Sure. Maybe I'll go down there for Hiros. Hiros. Love a good hero. Um, you know you love Portillo's too. But that's a little. I'd have to get. I can't. I'd have People to take Uber. It. It's not that far. Yeah, but it's like, where are you going? No, Portillo's? no. You can easily from here easily walk to Greek Town. You can do. Yeah, Greek Town's. I know this small area. Cheval, Oshival, Oshival. Small Cheval. Small Cheval. Yeah, but Oshival, you might get a seat at the. Um, you might get a seat at the bar. Because I'm like somebody. No, because you're nobody. That's the oh, whole so thing. they put me at the bar. Yeah, like they, feel, they, they have a <laughs> certain section for people they feel sorry for. Oh, oh right. out of you know, town tourists. I don't tourists. have like 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 six degrees of separation from Taylor Swift or something. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we got lots of uh, lots of new fancy places. There's a restaurant that's doing Italian beef taco mashup. You could do yeah. Really. Yeah. What do you Italian mean, like beef? spaghetti in a taco shell? No, or something? Italian beef. Oh, taco. Italian beef. Italian beef tacos. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's Thank not, you. For that's not bad. Uh, I feel like a good spaghetti mashup, but there's there's uh, pasta. Carb it up. Have you seen the new pasta bar in Lincoln Park? It's all over my uh, TikTok or my Instagram. Pasta bar in Lincoln Park. What yeah. Is so you go in, you pick a noodle, yeah, and then you pick 
like a sauce yeah. and then like other flavors and they put it in like a giant to go container for you. I forget what it's called. It's like a huge pasta, but they have a ton of sauces, a ton of pastas and you get it to go or eat there. So we once I'd built, never seen that. It was a We built that 20 35 40 years ago. <laughs> you, <laughs> we I swear to god, we had a pasta bar. <laughs> where all all you do, a buddy of mine, we put up the money, he opened the restaurant and all it was was um, any kind of pasta you want, any kind of sauce you want. Yeah, that's what this. Oh, I've never heard that. Up. Story. Hold on. You ever heard that story? I must have. It was called Zapoli. <laughs> oh, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. that name. I remember that name. What? Drown your losses in our sauces. That was the. <laughs> <laughs> that was the T-shirt. It was right next to the exchange. Drown your losses in our sauces. <laughs> and uh, Zapoli had like eight different types of sauces. Spicy meat sauce was a, was the most. Um, was the most requested. I'm sure. And um, and like eight different kinds of pasta, but we sold more heroin than we sold pasta, so it didn't work out. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. So that was the problem. Heroin, spaghetti. This, yeah, this is okay. Wait, here we're trying to think of the name. Uh, oh, good. Sh uh, it's like verify you are not a robot. Uh, that's fine. I'm trying to find the name of it. But you um, love robots, Vanetta. I do. I do love robots, but. Uh, Oh, okay, well, it's on the TikTok, but I, I can't uh, see if I can send this. Oh, you look like me now. To, no, I'm going to see if I can send this to John. But how was your Is weekend, Tom? Cheese? My weekend was yeah. fine. I didn't do much. Yeah, you wrote that in the cherry bomb. You're kind of, you didn't have anywhere to go. So you were kind of like. Oh, on lost. Friday night, on Friday night, I went to the uh, casino. Oh, that's right. You went to Loser Fest 2.0. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> Slappy and Jules poker night. Yeah, um, in Rosemont, in Rivers. Rosemont? To the poker room. Well, first we went to dinner. Wait, right, where did you go to dinner? They have a place there called Hugo's Frog Bar. Oh, they have a Hugo's there? Yeah. How was it? Was it good? Yeah, it's good. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it's a steakhouse. It's a famous Chicago steakhouse. Anyway, so um, so went to Hugo's, had a little dinner, and then we went and played. I played like five hours of poker, which is way past my bedtime. Mm -hmm. That's brutal. Yeah, there was a guy there that had been there from back in the day we used to play. He was a trader in the OEX pit, and so I hadn't seen him in like 30 years. Eddie Large. And he's large? Eddie Large. Oh, Eddie, Eddie large. large. That's his name? <laughs> his name is Eddie. We always called him Eddie Large. Okay. So wow. he was there. And uh, at the same table. Because you're such a dainty, delicate flower. like. <laughs> so it was me, Jules Slappy, and Eddie Large all playing at the same table. Nice. What's the what's the buy-in for for uh, Rivers Casino uh, poker room? Oh, I don't know. Like, I don't there's really no know. Mi there's got to be a minimum. Yeah, we played like a what like a two five game, but there's I, no minimum per. I don't game. know what that means. That just means it's like the ante is five dollars. Five dollars. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't seem like enough for you. You seem like. Oh a no high no the average bet guy. the average bet's like, you know, hundred bucks or something. Okay. So you could, there's no limit on the games. You could bet it wherever you want. Mm. So you lasted five hours. Yeah, How yeah, long yeah. Slappy and Jules and Eddie Large last? I think they lasted the whole time. Yeah. I was down a little. I was up a lot. And I was I broke. I mean, I made a little money, which is rare for me because I usually lose. You everything. made money? Yeah, I usually lose money. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that's gambling. I mean, yeah. poker, poker. some people take it seriously and stuff. And oh, I can't take it seriously. It's such a joke. It, it's, it's like... It's such a joke. They're, they're, if you're going to take something seriously and you want to make money at it, there are way better things to take seriously. Yeah. That's my point. Um, I think John has the video here. It's called Pasta Fasta. That's what it's called. Oh, I thought it was called Pasta Fazul. No, Pasta Fasta. Can you can we play it, John? Pasta Fasta. Yeah, yeah. we're watching it now. I do not like that name. It's just pasta in ready-to-go containers. It's perfect for taking to work, the beach, or the park. And the containers are leftover ready. All you got to do is put them in the microwave. There are so many different sauces, and we recommend you ask the staff for their favorites. They might even just give you a secret combo. <laughs> they have both hot and cold pastas. Our favorites were the chicken <laughs> pesto and the beef and mushroom. Next time we are in Lincoln Park, be sure to check them out. And as always, like and follow for more Secret Chicago. Yeah. Pasta Fasta. It, it, you know, such, it's already in its own to go container. But this, see, there may, it's, this seems it's like a, a it's an off, idea. It's an awful name because is pasta it Pasta Fasta? fasta? It's an awful, it's or is it Pasta Fasta? It's it's pasta because fasta. you want the spaghetti fast. It's a it's an awful name. And um, I had okay, this I mean, it coffee. might be tasty. Okay, bad coffee. <laughs> <laughs>
TP, are you gonna are you gonna visit Bad Coffee while you're here? No. Even though we don't have permits from the city. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't really drink too much coffee, and it's like whatever. No. If you don't drink too much coffee, why would you start with Bad Coffee? Yeah. Exactly. But yeah. you eat toast. It is an artisanal toast store as well. Oh, is that your? T- did you open the toast store? No. The bread and butter store. You can't get the no. permits. <laughs> the bread and butter store. No. That was the only good idea I ever had was like uh, selling bread and butter. It, oh, who doesn't like a slice of bread thickly buttered? Exactly. Who oh, doesn't? We, we're we're doing it. It's just we're not there yet. Taking a little time. Yes, yeah, taking a little more time than I thought. Two years. <laughs> we're two years too late. Taking a little time <laughs> to put the butter on the bread. Do you guys have any spring break plans? Do you, or is was this your in, spring break? No, ma'am. That was two. Was it one week ago or two weeks ago? I don't My, know. I don't have kids, so it's different for No, it's different because up here, it's, right. yeah. it's everybody up here has spring break now because it's too cold to go anywhere sure. like in early March. No, and the, my kids are in college. They don't want to have anything to do with me. Oh, Can you blame no. have, As That's Tom said, true. they have a lot. I don't really. That's not true. They want your money. Well, y- <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, that is true. So you have a daughter at UT, right? Yeah, she's at UT. And, Does uh, she like it? Oh, she loves it. Though. Oh, good. And she's, you know, she's got, to, you know, but they have cars. You know, I never had a car in college. Sure. So they can go anytime they want. They can come home anytime. It's like, but they don't. That's the point. Aww. They go food shopping. They want to. They go out with friends. It goes. My older daughter works. She says no. She's putting in hours at H E B. Oh, she works. works at H E B. Yeah. Oh, that's the most she loves thing she can, ever. Maybe she can get you a discount. Sure. Do you ever I use have the I have the perf- I have the partner discount ten percent on HEB. Do you roam product. around the stores in like your pajamas and she's like, yeah, that's just my dad. <laughs> no, I don't. Okay. No, she she works at a very diff. She works at a much bigger, fancier HEB than the one I go to. Okay. But no, I would not. I don't abuse the privileges some people might. Yeah. But anyway, I, I get a ten percent discount. I flash. I run my card through the reader. Wow. Ten percent off. Ten percent off. Ooh, so ooh. I'm. It's like I'm living large in that ten percent. There you go. You <laughs> save some money on all that dog food that you definitely need. <laughs> it's not as much as you would think. For four hundred and thirty pounds worth of dog. Sixty. Four hundred sixty pounds of dog. Okay. No, <laughs> it, it really isn't because the little, the big one, actually the puppy. He only eats. He's cutting back. He's only going through like two and a half cups of food in the morning and at night. Well, I mean five cups a day. And those big Costco bags. Sure. We get like five of them a month maybe, and that covers all the dogs. Wow. Yeah, and the pit bulls, the pit bulls, because we've got to be careful. They don't get fat. So the pit bulls don't eat much at all because they have to be in their fighting trim. You know, the two pit bulls. <laughs> doing <laughs> on this ranch i'm gonna call sarah mclaughlin or something i don't well, know well <laughs> michael vick is renting out the spare bedroom oh so no it's... no no oh no t we got tp in the house politically incorrect as it is all <laughs> week long but hey tp one good thing about being here in illinois we have porn. There's porn here in Illinois. It's oh, that's right. Pornhub. It's not banned here in Illinois. Texas kicked out Pornhub. That's right. It's a free state, Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> Texas kicked out Pornhub? They, yeah. I reported that. Yeah. The, because they they were going to make them do the age verification and Pornhub's like, we don't want to scan people's IDs. We don't want that information on our servers. It's like, and then so because they, they it's an so onerous sh- ask for them in terms of data, they were like, we're just going to. You're going to scan, so no. gonna scan it, IDs to get what it is, up, but you don't no. scan IDs for So they guns. see your IP address, or however they do it. Sure, yeah. Not that I would know personally, <laughs> but they showed on the news what hap- What would happen. So you go to Pornhub.com, and it's like, and they blame Texas. They say, you're great. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, Attorney General Ken Paxton put on these draconian. But he went to jail. Not yet. Yeah, he's back. <laughs> he, no, he's, he's he's back, baby. Indicted but not convicted. Oh, so the um, no, and you get this screen saying that you know Texas <laughs> does not allow this in the state anymore. And I think they see by your whatever IP address. Yeah, so the number of VPNs uh, in the app store in Texas is skyrocketing. But you can buy, yeah. but you can buy guns when you're 12. Yeah, I mean, if you have the money for it. <laughs> <laughs> this is good times. Hey, we're going to keep it moving. We got a great show for you. TP's in the house all week. Uh, Bat is in Florida. We got a great show for you today at the top of the uh, 8 o'clock hour. We're going to do an option jive. Anton in the house. Yay. I love a, I love a TP-Anton combo. Love it's Anton. Sheer randomness. Um, <laughs> Anton was here all last week. Yeah. I had my fill of Anton, but 
Just before he left. Okay. How much money did you take from Anton last week? He's not allowed to gamble with me anymore. Yeah, how come you didn't take yeah. him playing poker? He, he's, he's, his, his wife was here with him. I shouldn't say quotes. His wife was here with him. So she, she, that's not, that, that's, that actually happened. So I, I know, but, but she has him on lockdown from gambling. Really? Yes. But just to, just to put him in his because place. Because she doesn't want to be homeless. <laughs> just to put him in his place though before he left, I played him a couple games of ping pong and slapped him. Okay. You put him in his place. Yeah. You set him back a bit. Just I set him back with his tail between his legs. Yeah. Hey, uh, also on the schedule today around 840, we're going to do an option jive. Zero sum games. What does that mean? That means zero is exactly what they're saying. Zero sum games. Zero sum games? You play and there's no winners. So you guys are going to download a bunch of dating apps? (laughs) No. (laughs) That's a zero sum game. No, I wouldn't be doing that, Vanetta. Thank you very much. Hey. We're going to do a market measures assets correlations. No, sorry. Who wrote this? Assets <laughs> correlation during market corrections. Uh, what? I don't know what that means, but um, intri- intriguing. Intriguing. And oh my God, I'm so excited. TP Scott Sheridan is back. Scott Thank was God. gone last week for his spring break. TP, did you hear about this? He got to stay in Buckingham Palace in London. I didn't hear about that. Wow. I can't wait to talk Scott to Scott. Scott stayed ask, in a place without indoor plumbing? You're going to ask all the Scott right Sheridan questions. Scott Sheridan stayed there? bring me in for that because I have so many questions for Scott. You don't know the right questions to ask. I have very specific questions about this whole Princess Kate situation. Write it down. Write it down. And he was boots on the ground. Why do you care? Because... Because I care. Oh, JJ's there right now. We'll get, a, we'll get an update line. Yeah, I need an update. I need an update. Well, they uh, probably need Scott the money. Is back. <laughs> they Scott probably is need back. the money. I mean, it's like, nobody, I don't think anybody wants the royalty over there anymore. Scott is back. So he's going to. You're crazy. He's going to well, talk about the top Royalty's trending bigger than ever. tickers over at Tasty Trade. Uh, and that's at around 930. But hey, let's get this show on the road. You guys want your daily dose? Yeah! Yes, please. Theme music. Let's go. Uh, Breaking news. 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 All right, all right, everybody. Today's a magnificent Monday, March the 25th. It's a part of the show that's called The Daily Dose, where we talk about today's financial news and headlines. My name is Vanetta. Are you ready for the news? Sure. Hey, I see breaking news coming across my screens here that Boeing CEO Dave Calhoun is stepping down at the end of 2024. Name someone who's worse at their job. I'll wait. (laughs) Well, I'm just glad no parts fell off the plane last night. Right? I'm happy about that. Yeah. I call that a success. I'm not sure what Boeing is doing, BA. It was up a little bit, bounced off its lows. Yeah. Let's see where we can get this Boeing going. So-called Boeing. Yes. Well, Um, like I said, I just saw it come across... Uh, my screen, so... Stock's up $5 on that news. Yay! He's leaving. Um, you know, it's funny. He's leaving on a jet plane. He <laughs> bought... But not a Boeing right. 737. He is building a house on my block. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. David Calhoun, the I, I CEO of Boeing, is building a house yeah, yeah. on the block that you yeah. live on in yeah. Chicago? Yeah, yeah. And Yikes. I mean, he lives in Chicago, right? Baby, I don't know. I don't go to those well, presumably, people meetings. Well, because Boeing's headquartered here still, isn't it? Yes, yeah. technically. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, somebody said to me it was the Boeing CEO. I don't really know. I didn't, they didn't say who was na- what his name was. Sure, why sure. Not? yeah, why not? Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. All it's right. Do you have a position in the stock? Massive. He took like well, like four or five lots. Great. Oh, and like one mega lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, I have to pivot out of that position. <laughs> yeah. No, it's good. Cool. Good for the neighborhood. No, it's a it's a fun neighborhood. I used to live not too far from there. So he, um, I yeah, it seems to say. I mean, obviously, the market likes the fact that he's leaving. Sure. Why not? And it's at the end of the year, so he's got time. Hey, getting to my first regularly scheduled headline of the day, U.S. stocks have shot up 30% in five months. Is it time to worry about a correction? Uh, Stocks are on a steady path higher since hitting October lows, uh, despite interest rate uh, that are near a quarter century high and inflation that continues to be above its targets. What, What are we doing? Well, I mean, everybody keeps talking about this like it means something. 
I mean, I mean, I'm just saying it like, you know, we're sitting here having the same conversation and I know, but we have TP in the house. He's a fresh perspective. I'd like to hear what TP Nobody has. cares about that stuff. <laughs> okay, nobody, I forgot that the no, two nobody, of you nobody nobody the same. Yeah, same answer. Thank you. Yeah, no, 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 I'm not 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 no, I'm, I'm not putting you down. This is a different answer point. you're gonna have to ask Victor Jones. <laughs> That's not the point. Feedback. I would much rather interact with Victor But the whole point <laughs> is the inflation stuff, such as it is, and it's high, I get it, sure. affects the people who don't buy stocks. Sure that the money is still floating around in there. Like, do you think, do you think like the Boeing CEO cares that he's paying f whatever it is, $5 for a carton of eggs as opposed to $2? He, sure. doesn't, he doesn't even buy the eggs. He doesn't care. My question, though, and as a good reminder, is we have our very first uh, guess the market, which we are going to complete this week because this week marks the end of Q1. Mm -hmm. TP, did you submit a guess for where you thought the S&Ps might, might end up? In no, I, I, because it's, I would have an unfair advantage. Because I, I know I I know the answer. Because you're I and I can't win. Because you're a super quant. Yeah, I can't win. So, uh, Tom, how close are you to your goal? Very close. No, they, no, you're not. Then why are you asking? Okay. <laughs> well, I was hoping for transparency and honesty. Well, he but... runs the game. He can switch it to any well, number he wants. Well, speaking of year-end targets, Goldman Sachs says they have a mega cap bull case that takes the S and P 500 to six. Thousand. Uh, they are sticking with their year-end forecast of 5,200, but they do have another scenario which might lead the index up another 15 percent. Um, again, at the end of the year. Uh huh. No. You gonna so put it, some odds on that, TP? Yeah. No. Okay. So. Six thousand. Yeah. No. The point is, it's like six thousand. Let's go to probability of touch. See, if you don't quantify this stuff, yes. there's no point in doing it. So 6,000, yeah, there's a 47% chance the SPX is going to touch 6,000 by the end of the year. That's a pretty good call then. It's right there. Yeah. Let me do the, let me switch over to the thing so people right there. can see. What are you, what are, what would you say the odds are that we hit? Well, I would say the odds are the exact same that hits 4,500 too. Interesting. Right. So it's 6,000. Oh, no, wait. Probability of touch. As I scroll, the data came through. 32% probability of touching um, uh, 6,000. And where's the 32% probability of touching on the downside? 4,400, 4,500, I'd say. Just guessing. Yeah, 4,500. 40, 4, okay. Or I could very easily do either one. So the S&P is up almost 10% uh, for the year, and they've already it's already left many strategists' forecast in the dust. So it's just it's a fun game. Thank you, Goldman Sachs. Hey, one thing I do want to talk about, because you were in the house, TP, let's talk about yield curve inversion. Oh, Ooh, yeah. can we, Vanetta? The U.S. Treasury key yield curve inversion has become the longest on record, and it seems that it no longer signals that a recession is imminent. Let's talk about the yield curve and what it does and does not signify. Oh, my God, it no longer signals that a recession is imminent. Mm. That's where they messed up. That's where they messed um, up. Don't. No, but let's talk about this yield curve inversion. It's the longest on record. Well, it it widened last week. Okay. So, um, I'm sorry, it narrowed last week. I take it back. It narrowed last week. So, it's interesting here because we think it's going to go the other way. Okay. Like, when? I think it's going to uninvert. When? I don't know, this year sometime. Okay. I think it's going to uninvert, mm -hmm. but um, you can do it. I don't have it on right now, but I can do it 10... 10 ticks better than it was last week. Yeah, and the point is, it's all about duration. If you yeah. can hang on to the trade. Yeah, but here's the problem. Small. It's expensive to hang on the trade now. So it used to be cheap to hang on the ah. trade. Because, and I was going back and forth with the client over the weekend on this. It used to be inexpensive to hold on to the trade because it used to be that the carry costs were so low. Mm -hmm. When rates were lower, the carry cost was low. And so the dividends almost covered the carry costs, right? So it was easy to hold on to the trade. But with interest rates higher now, even though the rates are higher, the carry costs have gone up more than the dividends. Got it. So what happens now is carrying the trade is actually expensive. Ah. So, and so people like, you know. So you can't just inventory it. You can't inventory it. And just hang on to it. Ah. It's not as bad as like volatility, but you can't inventory it anymore for like, it's not a, it's not a, it's not I can hold this forever. It doesn't cost me anything. Got it. So it becomes kind of an expensive role. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, it doesn't mean you can't make money on the trade, of course. Of course. But it's just, it's not as cheap as it was before to hold on to the trade. Hmm. 
Hey, uh, shifting gears to commodities. Looks like oil's ticking higher as sanctions and Russian attacks take the spotlight. Oil edged higher after a three-day drop on signs of a tightening market driven by sanctions, geopolitical risks, and OPEC plus supply cuts. TP, how is oil in Texas? (laughs) It's the same as everywhere. Um, No, it's pretty flat over the past couple of days. I mean, what happened in, in Russia was horrible. But I don't think that changes anything with oil. I don't think it changes anything with oil, but we had this conversation last night on First Call. If you missed it, um, we do a show on Sunday night at 4.55. It was Victor, myself, and uh, uh, TP, I'm not TP, um, Pete and Ilya. And um, so the question came up, I, I raised it actually. Do you think this is the straw that might finally break Putin's back like 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 this is the the massacre the terrorist massacre that happened in Russia I think I I don't think Russian people will forgive Putin for this like he obviously ignored the intelligence reports he obviously tried to pin blame on Ukraine Ukraine, which was garbage and everybody I mean they got the guys it's not you know um and no matter what you know, I just don't think the Russian people. I think, I think at this point, they've had enough. It would, be, but I don't. I don't. Yeah, yes. There's nothing wrong with that. But the, but I don't know, and I don't know enough about Russian politics or society to know what the mechanism for them to. There do. isn't a mechanism. He just won the election in a fixed election. Well, right. Just, that's my point. Yeah. The, the mechanism is. I mean, only, do they do they physically the go to the palace and drag out, him out of bed? Sort of in mass to mourn Navalny, which people said that they wouldn't have seen. You know, like you. So that, that that's true. But this this is this is different. This is like you know 150 people massacred for you know a few thousand. We're at a shopping mall. No, no, they were in a concert, concert hall. But it was a, a concert hall, but I mean, they were, these terrorists were paid. These terrorists were paid. They didn't even, they claimed they didn't even know why they were doing it. They were just paid, you know, the equivalent of like $2,500. You know, I mean, it's absolutely insane. Yeah. And, um, um, and, and they're idiots, you know, and, and the fact that Russia really blew this one. And the question is, you know, is this kind of the end? I, I think, I think I, it's I, going I, to be. But I don't know what the end looks like unless you get half a million people marching on the presidential palace. I, I have no sure, idea. Yeah, I don't I don't know either. I, don't I mean because some people love him over there still. Smart enough to And uh, he and it, it all depends on how he frames it. Well he tried framing it, but Yeah, he's he's trying to blame the U S. well it could be well, you know the United States is behind it because they're the ones that, that uh, suggested it, you know. Hey, I gotta keep it moving. Uh, yes, speculators please. have catapulted Aussie short bets to a record amid China woes. Speculative investors ratcheted up bearish Australian dollar wagers to the most on record after jitters around China hammered risk sentiment. I just Googled hot Australian and I was going to type in dollar, but then just hot Australians came up and I was like, yeah, I'm going to go with this. Um, but let's talk about the Aussie dollar. Hey, I am what I am. Um, we're, we're a little bit. Um, it's down. Um, well, it's up today a little bit. We're a little bit. Up. We're, we're long the Aussie dollar. We're short puts in there. And um, uh, it's up It's up a little bit today. You know what? As we speak, I think I'll sell a put in there, too. Oh, okay. Solidarity. What's that again? I said solidarity. Oh, so, oh solidarity. Solidarity. Hey, here's something interesting. I'd like to get your take on this, TP. Yeah. Uh, Sam Bankman Freed oh, is yeah. going to be sentenced this week. Uh, should be on the 28th, I believe, on Thursday. But it looks like the FTX victims might get all of their money that back. That has nothing to do but, with okay, it. Okay, I just, I just want to open up. A dis- I just want to yeah. have a conversation. Yeah, no, no, I understand. So we haven't talked that, to TP about I, it. I just hate just, when people say the FTX victims might get all their money back. I'm just saying this is the headline. I didn't yeah. write this yeah. story. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I just absolutely hate. But it is, it's, it's, a, it's a component I mean, I love that they'll the get their money though. back. I love that they'll get their money back, but I hate the fact that anybody thinks that that, that changes the decision with respect to... Why, why doesn't it change the decision? What do you mean, why does he? stole $8 billion. But if, if you can make the people whole again... It is, then... He didn't make anything whole, just Bitcoin went higher. Okay, but it was... You you could argue then that the malfeasance... Hold on, so you're telling me that it's okay... No, it's okay. I'm not saying... Oh, my God. Are you saying it's okay for somebody <laughs> to steal your money, and as long as they don't actually lose it when they steal it, it's okay? 
I don't know. I'm just saying. What do you mean you don't know? But just think about this for a second. Don't don't say you don't know. I'm just saying that it has to it it has to factor in. No, maybe no, no, no. no. It is not okay for somebody to steal (laughs) your money. Your thoughts? No, I I agree. I think not okay to steal somebody's money. If it wins, I'm not saying he should get no time at all. But I'm saying if it's a difference between like. 50 years and like 15 then it's like a sliding scale because like the, the people got their money back that's irrelevant no, yeah he it's, stole their money okay it, wow. no I, I, I don't yeah the judge shouldn't he care. stole eight billion the judge, dollars that's yeah, what yeah, the judge I know, shouldn't I know, care. I know I served on a jury two oh, no. three weeks ago really and they make it the judge makes the I mean I don't know if this is a jury trial or not, but they make it very, very clear. This is sentencing. He's already been he's already been found. Yeah, well it's the same thing. It's the same thing. So it's the judge, like the judge determines this. The thing. judge shouldn't care. Okay. That's not part of the sentencing decisions. Of course usually. not. But it makes he stole eight billion dollars. He was convicted of it. It doesn't matter what happened and afterwards. And especially it was was it a jury trial or was it a bench I don't know, but it was a jury trial. If it was, it was a jury, jury trial. It you, wasn't a bench they trial, don't yeah. like to screw around with that stuff. Yeah. First of all, he's going to, the, the, the defense wants six and a half years and the prosecution wants 50. Yeah. I'm thinking 20. And I'm, I, I, I would, think. I would think 50. This was, this was pretty egregious. We will see what happens. Although the event, the, the, the defense is also asking the judge to include the um, circumstances of Bankman Freed's life, including the possibility that he is neurodivergent and should be treated differently than other run-of-the-mill fraudsters. I'm just reading. He what, meant, please don't neurodivergent. Is that yes. is that like like closet what does, genius or something? What does something? that mean, neurodivergent? Neurodivergent for him, particularly maybe like on an autism spectrum, that okay. he is somewhere on a spectrum, but neurodivergence can also include things like ADHD yeah. or other sensory sure, or that. processing issues. And so it's just, um, well, I don't doubt that he's a very smart guy. Right. No, yeah, it's not. He's it's a very not. smart guy. Are you like no, a separate it's just neurodivergent. Whoa. Were they like a separate cell for all the people from MIT? Okay. We'll I, I'm going to keep it moving. <laughs> um, uh, what is, uh, what are, was Bitcoin doing this morning? It's up 3000 digital assets. To it's sixty-seven thousand three hundred. The futures. It was up all night. It opened up three thousand. It's just a little bit higher. Uh, what about coin? Um, coin that is a different question. I do not have coin on my. I have it on my screen. Hold on one second. Well, while you were looking that up, Solana's block coin is up seven dollars. Coin's up seven bucks nice. tonight. Solana's blockchain is being overrun with racist meme coins. Oh, this is great. In the latest cryptocurrency trend, by now you've most likely heard of Dogecoin or maybe even Dog With Hat. Uh, but now the meme coin is sparking some uh, not so appropriate memes. Uh, numerous cryptocurrencies uh, that are just anti Semitic, racist, and just overall terrible are now popping up uh, on. That's not good. That's it's a beautiful world we live in. Ugh, it's trash. Trash, trash. Oh, yeah, are you is. trading in crypto at all? Do you have any crypto exposure? Yeah. I'm long Bitcoin, Ethereum. Okay. Oh, nice. All right. I Just wasn't sure. Long, you know. Yeah. No, I, tr- I don't trade it too actively. I trade coin more actively. Okay. Well, but. something that might be even more active today, and that's Reddit. TP, were you following the whole Reddit IPO last week? Not very closely. I don't. R-D-D-T. I don't. Un- I don't understand the whole Reddit. Uh, Forty-five stuff. bucks down a buck. Uh, well, Reddit options are going to start today, so options R-D-D-G? contracts. R-D-D-G. Oh my God, that is after two days. That is really fast. Option contracts on Reddit will debut on the Nasdaq March twenty-fifth. Nasdaq plans to list options on Reddit across all six of its. Yeah, they're out there. 25 days, 30, 53 days. Yeah. So what's the plan? Only downside is they're having five-point strikes on a $45 stock, which is too wide. Yeah. Give them okay. a second. <laughs> yeah, I don't have any plan for Reddit options yet, but... Um, we'll see what they open up at. We'll see what they open. Yeah, okay. Stock's around 45 bucks. But I don't understand. I, don't, I can't figure out Reddit. What can't it's, you figure out? It's not Just to, like the posting stuff. 
Like, go to, go to Reddit chat. It's like, no. Hmm. Okay. Well, I don't, I can't explain the internet to you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really know. Uh, China has blocked the use of Intel and AMD chips in government computers, according to a report from the Financial Times. China has introduced guidelines to phase out U.S. microprocessors from Intel and AMD from government personal computers and servers. The procurement guidance also seeks to sideline um, Microsoft Windows operating system. Um, That's fine. Intel, AMD, Microsoft. More for me. Um, and China. We'll talk China. Stuff. That's fine. China yes. was down a few ticks this morning, but not much. Um, barely lower. And what'd you say? That was China. Let's, China, oh, yes. FXI. FXI is unchanged right now. Yeah, Baba and Baba's... Baba's down a tick. Baidu's up two bucks. And and what was the last one? Uh, Intel, AMD, Microsoft. Oh uh, well, those are all different. I mean. Well, yes, they are. All, they are all different. AMD games. is down. <laughs> six AMD's bucks, down six bucks. Five which and is a half. A huge bucks. move. That is a huge move. Intel. Intel is down a dollar fifty. By the way, Intel has been a PIG pig, and and again, I just want to go on record because I'm so tired of people telling me that. You know, everybody in Congress knows what's going on and blah, blah, blah. There were, Intel was awarded two $10 billion contracts and and everybody in Congress knew and the stock is now four and a half dollars lower from where it was when they but were. That's awarded. one example. I, it's a though. one good no, example. That's one That's okay. the, the people of one Congress cannot example. defeat the standard normal yes. variable. You can't defeat market randomness. I really hate when Tom is in stereo. Nvidia yeah. up. I really do. I'm sorry. Really Nvidia up two dollars. Intel yes. down. AMD down. Nvidia up. Nvidia. What are you doing in Nvidia? I'm getting killed. Well, they had their AI Palooza last week. Their AI I extravaganza. I hate it. Yeah, they're up another. Dollar fifty. Blackwell chips. Hey, the Financial Times is testing out an AI chat bot trained on decades of its own articles. Subscribers can use Ask FT to answer questions about recent events or broader topics covered by the Financial Times. TP, what is your thought on the utility of AI? I think it's great for college kids. Um, I think if you understand like if you're just talking about like you know like chatbots on Financial Times, great. It saves you a lot of time. It's a, it's a, it's a it's a search engine alternative. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all it really is. Yes. And if you want to understand what the popular opinion of something is and not get an essay question wrong, it's great. Did you know that Dr. Data here has created a um, a Tom Sosnoff chatbot? Yeah, we were talking about that. <laughs> we were talking about that. And it will insult you, and it's very funny. <laughs> yeah, he said, what, what, what actually valuable data do you have? And he said, well, there's some, not a lot, but there's some. Anyway. Uh, here's something interesting. Microsoft has made a $650 million deal with a company called Inflection AI, and they're basically paying the startup for not suing them, and they're going to poach its CEO and all of its employees. It's a good page from the Microsoft playbook. So Microsoft finalized the deal with a company, like I said, called Inflection AI for $650 million. And they basically, like I said, they the company has to relinquish any legal claims associated with mass recruitment. Um, Microsoft gets their CEO and all of their top engineers and devs and uh, scoopy scoopy. Yeah, it sounds a little fishy, but. Right? Yeah. But what are you guys doing in Microsoft? I'm um, short it. Okay. I don't have a position in Microsoft. Not what was working. It doing this morning. I did. Not, I not working. It's not working. Yes, not Microsoft working. is strong. Well, Microsoft is down like a dollar twenty by. Well, oh, that should help you then. Um, not a little bit. Yeah. 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 Hey, getting back to some aviation news. We already covered that the Boeing CEO is going to step down by the end of 2024, but the FAA now says that future projects at United Airlines may be delayed due to increased oversight. The FAA said that they are basically going to be setting up shop in United Airlines after a string of nearly a dozen incidents on flights this month alone. That means that the troubled airline will have to put some of their future plans on hold. United it is not the only airline that has been forced to scale back hiring and expansion and routes and a bunch of other things uh, because of the kerfuffle with Boeing planes, uh, mm. but they are affected pretty widely just because of their total reliance on mainly Boeing 
aircraft, UAL. Um, well, UAL does fly a bunch of, um, they fly a bunch of Airbuses. Sure, sure. But they, they have, a, yeah. they're weighted yes, strongly 100%. to Boeing, so. 100%, especially most of their, uh, most of their uh, long haul routes. Sure, what are you doing in UAL? Um, we're pretty flat. We have a small strangle on, but it's it's right in the middle. I'm not trading UAL. I have positions in love, oh, and I'm okay. getting whacked in love. You're getting whacked? No love from love? No. Hey, uh, Donald Trump is about Dog. to get $3 billion richer after a deal is approved to take his company public via SPAC, but it won't solve his cash crunch. First of all, he needs to come up with $450 million today, or Letitia James literally owns him. Uh, but uh, Truth Social is going public today uh, via SPAC. It got approved last week by shareholders, so it now will trade under DJT. That's right, Donald J. <laughs> Trump. I'm not making this up. Starting today. Um, but again, the green light for material, it doesn't automatically transfer into billions of dollars into his pocket today. Right. I would like to just point that out. So, um, Oh, maybe you can buy back his properties at a lower price. <laughs> Hey, I'm going to just keep it moving. Hey, the Biden administration uh, is urging the U.S. Supreme Court to reject Elon Musk's appeal in an SEC dispute. Uh, Musk in December asked the Supreme Court to take up his appeal after a lower court upheld his consent decree uh, with the SEC that arose after he posted that funding was secured. So now President Biden is urging the Supreme Court to turn away his dispute uh, and say that, that it is settled. Um, what are you guys doing in Tesla? Um, I was short Tesla. I'm a little tiny bit long. I was you're short, short Tesla. you long? Well, I was short and covered that last week. But it's the, actually down about a buck and a half this morning. I'm a little bit long, okay. tiny bit. Tiny bit. Like a, a few deltas. Yeah, I don't, I don't love Tesla here, but... I'd just rather be a little longer than shorted. I mean, compared to all the other stocks. It's but it's got a 58% IV rank. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. I mean, compared to everything else I'm looking at, it's like the only, I mean, Tesla and some Chinese stocks and Apple are the only things that are on their butts. Yeah. Well, yeah. The nice thing about Tesla just trading it is it's $170 stock with a 50% implied volatility. So its options are rich. Yeah. And You're there's no rewarded. earning, no imminent earnings. So. Well, earnings are coming out in the middle of April. So it's got that. Oh, okay. But you know, you're getting rewarded for taking a risk in Tesla. Okay. And I have no idea what's going on with this SEC thing. Yeah. Well, I don't get it. Well, you can't tweet that you have funding secured to like your shareholder, like if you don't actually have funding so you, i'm just saying i mean well, thank just, you thank you for simplifying it yeah that's it thank you that's it that's that's it that should be before the judge hey streaming price hikes are pushing americans to their limit tp do you know how many how much you pay for streaming services in the preston household no no uh well a new report from deloitte, i know i know we got a get a bunch of my don't watch the tv a new report from deloitte suggests that u.s households spent 61 dollars a month on average on streaming which was up 27 percent from last year uh looking at netflix maybe uh amazon disney and apple i think streaming costs have gotten out of control Everything costs have gotten out. Look at your insurance right now. Look at my cell phone bill. Look at my yep. broadband from Comcast. Like, everything's out of control right but now. But that's a, you can live without insurance and cell phone. You can't company. live without, you have to have insurance. <laughs> you can absolutely you gotta have your you can live without insurance. You have to have insurance. On what? On your car, yes. That's, yeah. That's yeah, it. in your house. Well, yeah, you know, you get, if you have a mortgage and all that stuff. Anyway, yeah. but Netflix, yeah, you, yeah, Netflix is surging. Uh, what are you guys doing in Netflix? Nothing. Nothing? I want to be short it, but I'm not. Okay. What about Disney, DIS? Was all the March Madness? Not trading Disney either. Um, yeah, we're pretty And they're going to have their April Disney's 3rd. up like $1.60 right now. Yeah, April 3rd, I think, is their earnings. Or it's their surging. Investment yeah. meeting, so... Disney is on the clock. Hey, Chick-fil-A, chick a fillet is rolling back its commitment to antibiotic-free chicken. What? Uh, Chick-fil-A was like, yeah, this is too hard. We don't want to do this anymore. Uh, they announced that they are allowing certain antibiotics now in its chicken, overturning a commitment they made in 2014. Okay. I mean, I'm sure they have a reason for it. <laughs> it doesn't sound that good, but I'm sure there's a reason. It doesn't reason sound for it. that good, but. You... I'm sure, like, there's got to be something safer about chicken that, you know. 
doesn't have disease. Yeah. Also, yeah. Tyson, a major supplier, announced that they were reintroducing certain antibiotics uh, to its chicken supply well, chain yeah, after you, they'd gone antibiotic-free in 2017. You don't want to have a warehouse full of coughing chickens. It's. Do you still have chickens? No, they were. <laughs> everything likes chicken. They were wiped out a couple of years ago. I'm thinking about reintroducing a flock, though. Oh, Think about stepping back chickens. in at the bottom. You should get chickens again. <laughs> hey, um, the pressing news here: Mega Millions. No one won last week, so it rolled over 1.1 billion. I'm in. Um, now's my chance. Now's his chance. You know, TP. He won't play the lottery unless it hits a billion. Well, because he's, you know, he's huge. You know? Yeah, he's yeah. So uh, a billion like, dollars like, like half a billion dollars doesn't mean anything to him. No winner in the Mega Millions. A billion dollars is my is my answer. He's point. he is so far out on the. <laughs> utility curve. He's so far out in the utility curve. I, just, I can't get involved in the lottery, but if it goes over a billion, I'll buy tickets. Okay, who are you going to send though? Bat's not here. Oh. See, you need him. I need my biatch. Okay, well, I did <laughs> See, not say that, but you need I him. wouldn't. I wouldn't buy the tickets for Tom. Yeah, also, do I don't you do check that. on I'd, Disney? I'd go stop morning, at the pasta Disney, restaurant. Yeah, Disney stock is moving. You looked at it. It was like up a dollar fifty. Rumpf. Rumpf. Where do you even buy them at the grocery store or the gas station? Yeah. Where do you go? In a, in a I haven't store. bought. I usually have bat buy them. I get because he doesn't have to get gas because he drives a Tesla. The only time, the last time I bought a lottery ticket was when I was nineteen years old, and I thought I had discovered an arb in the um, Massachusetts Daily Lottery. Turns out it was wrong. <laughs> lost turns twenty bucks. Lost out, twenty bucks on it. That was about it. Turns out it was Whitey Bulger. No. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah so good job. Here is that Preston boy out yeah. in Fitchburg won't let him win. Hey, <laughs> Fanatics, the sports apparel company, is firing back at DraftKings' claims of corporate espionage in a bitter legal battle. DraftKings is suing a former executive in federal court claiming he stole corporate secrets for Fanatics and tried to poach VIP customers. That's very interesting. Um, they are battling it out in court. DraftKings, DKNG, like I said, March Madness. Uh, you doing anything in DraftKings? No. No? Okay. 20% IV rank, a little low. And finally today, Shoei Otani is going to address theft allegations <laughs> against his interpreter today. Uh, we're going to get more uh, information on Bookie Gate. He uh, was fired by the MLB team amid allegations that he stole millions from the player to pay off gambling debts. He will have a new interpreter to make this address? <laughs> I mean, it's an ugly story. It stinks. Something about it stinks. Yeah, something about this story is not... Right, but Shohei can't. He, he, I mean, if you if they gotta sacrifice this interpreter guy, then they gotta sacrifice this interpreter guy. Like, well, yeah, they, I think they already sacrificed the interpreter guy. Yeah. Something about this whole thing. Yeah. But these guys, you gotta realize that they make he, he makes a half a billion dollars. You know, more than that, seven hundred sure. million dollars is his contract. For him to lose a couple million dollars gambling. What? I'm just saying, it's not. So that's like me well, saying. Well, hey, the FTX people got all their money back, and then you're like, no, blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. I'm saying it, it, you're telling, you're saying it's slippage to him. I, I'm saying it depends what he's gambling. Like he, like Michael Jordan you gambled. Make no sense. No, Michael Jordan gambled. Charles Barkley gambled. You know, lots of people sure, gamble. Bruno Mars is basically owned by MGM. They have okay, a $50 Mars. million dollar contract <laughs> because he lost like $55 million yeah, like sure. gambling. Right, right. So like, he's terrible at it. Like. I, everybody's terrible at gambling. <laughs> Except I did win like couple hundred hours on Friday night. Nice. Okay, um, congratulations on your wealth. <laughs> hey, I have a funny video to show you, and then we're going to pivot out of this segment. Uh, They're calling this video the Canadian Citizenship Test. Could you pass? Watch this. Probably not. It's pretty good, though. I want to know where this is. Winner's back, This guy is just throwing time from the back of something, and this guy is jibbing and jabbing and weaving. I mean, this is pretty impressive. And, and there's a dog. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Funny, it was funny yesterday. Only in Canada. Yeah, I know. It was like a recycling bin. <laughs> 
I, I like how the whole street is just frozen. Um, I like how the dog runs pretty good on ice. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, it's, Dar dogs like, what's the big deal? It's Canada. Dogs are built different. Can Canadian dogs? They are built different. Those <laughs> Canadian dogs are built men different. built different. Call me. Anyway, hey, that's my time uh, for today. Uh, TP, it's lovely to have you. Look forward to seeing you all week. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, Tom and TP are going to answer viewer questions and confirm and send. You're watching Tasty Live. <laughs> Morning, Uncle Craig. I really appreciate all the investment advice you bestowed upon me this holiday season. That opportunity Prince Harry emailed you about sounds interesting, but I think I'll just stick to watching Tasty Live. Sometimes it feels good to get smart, get even smarter with live trading insights and some live taunting. I don't kick the cat of the door. Morning, Uncle Craig. I really appreciate all the investment advice you bestowed upon me this holiday season. That opportunity. Morning, Uncle Craig. I really appreciate all the investment advice you bestowed upon me this holiday season. That opportunity Prince Harry emailed you about sounds interesting, but I think I'll just stick to watching Tasty Live. Sometime. Looking for a better broker and a bonus? Sweet. We got you. Right now, you can get a bonus of up to $4,000 when you open and fund a Tasty Trade account. Plus, low rates, smart tech with the analysis tools you need, and award winning support. So, get a broker who's actually got your back. And up to $4,000 at Tasty Trade. Make your move, genius. Tasty Trade. in your life, I'm Vanetta, and this is your first look at the spring issue of Luckbox. The latest Luckbox is all about the auto industry, and once again, your free digital subscription is available at GetLuckbox.com. In 2022, the U.S. auto industry sold 13.75 million vehicles, and it feels like I got stuck behind all of them this morning in traffic. And in 2023, the total value of the U.S. car and auto manufacturing market is an eye-popping $104 billion. This issue of Luckbox looks at what's ahead for the auto industry and who are the winners and the losers. EVs have hit a speed bump the last six months, dealing with slowing demand, more competition, and lagging infrastructure. What lies ahead? We also take a look at two EV titans battling for supremacy in Asia. Tesla versus BYD and US versus China. On the American side of things, baby, you can drive my car. We also take a look at GM versus Ford. Plus, we look at why hybrids are so hot and is there a play to be made in lithium? The massive rare earth deposit is the key to powering vehicles. Will lawyers and lizards stand in the way of mining? I'm sorry, what now? We also show you the 12 hottest new cars of 2024. I hope they're bringing back the El Camino. Business in the front, party in the back. And I went to the Chicago Auto Show, and I want to know why there were adventure vehicles everywhere when people are only driving to Starbucks. And AM radio is back and more relevant than ever. Finally, for all you investors, we have 50 auto sector trade ideas. But hey, don't take my word for it. Do you want the best in life, money, and probabilities? Get your motor running and go to getluckbox.com and hit that subscribe button to get the digital edition of Luckbox Magazine for free. Make your own luck. Get Luckbox. Hey, get Luckbox. Let go. Beat the opening bell. Get trade ideas and market insights before the open. From the creator, Tom Sosnoff, and our chief market strategist, Tom Preston. Every weekday. Sign up at tastylive.com newsletters. 
Regulation time may have expired, but the conversation is just getting started. This is Overtime, the post-market scrimmage for market junkies. Join Chris Vecchio, Ilya Spivak, and me, Dylan Radigan, as we analyze the X's and O's for everything from earnings to politics to macro events and more. Nothing's out of bounds on Overtime. We break down the news to provide you a playbook for your trades. Watch Overtime Monday through Thursday only on Tasty Live. Golf putt, normal distribution, reduce speed, increase standard deviation for a wider angular strike. If you think like a trader, we've got your back. Tasty Trade. Join the club, genius. Hello, everybody. We are back. I'm Tom Sosnoff here in the new Tasty Live studios with Tom Preston, TP. You've done a nice job at the place, Tom. Took day and night I worked on this. I'm sure. You're <laughs> painting, the, painting the designs and... Doing whatever it takes. Well, you know, you have to... You're showing off your... What do they call... What do the kids call it? Uh, street cred of or course. whatever it is, you know, with your, like... The, well, I wanted, I wanted a place that looked a little... Going back to my... Um, old CBGB roots, you know, on a little dark New York alley type of, you know, I yeah, like freeway like freeway under, on, you know, the freeway underpass. I like I like um, cave like studios. I don't I don't like bright. I don't like to be able to see out and stuff. You're channeling Howard Stern. You've always wanted to be Howard Stern. I always liked their studios, but they were boring. You know, they, you know their studios were always. Boring. But they were just black. They're black. It was just, but it was I never just Howard liked, Stern sitting in the black. If you remember, our first studio was black. Yeah. Remember? And I liked that. Matt Black. Matt Black, yeah. It was when we got when we got there, it was like it was like a light color. We painted it all matte black. Or and we changed the whatever, you know, just to get it all black. But um we have another studio here which is looks out over Chicago, mm -hmm. um, which we haven't opened yet. We're going to. And it's actually really nice, but it's not for me. <laughs> um not for me at all. Anyway, these are emails that came in to us over the weekend, TP. Ready for a little confirmance, and we got a ton of them. Oh, hold on one sec. I got to get my screen just disappeared. Can up. you see them? Uh, I will now. Yep. Okay. All right. When do you close earnings trades? I closed one last week on the open um, when volatility collapsed. But had I waited, I would have made more. Is there a preferred time to closing these tra types earnings trades? So for my own earnings trades, I, I don't necessarily close them right on the open because sometimes the markets are a little wide, so I can wait a little bit till I can get a good fill. But if I have a profit on an earnings trade, I, I just take it as soon as I can. Yes, you can wait and see, especially if, you've, if it's an option with, you know, less than five days to expiration, if you hang on to it, the theta really kicks in and sucks the premium out of those short options. So yes, you can make more, but for earnings trades for me, any profit is a good profit. I don't necessarily want to hang on to it and squeeze out more because it's too volatile. I don't know where the stock might go post earnings. You know, um, uh, it, it's a... I'm all about consistency with respect to earnings trades. So we close ours on the open here because we're do, usually doing a show, and um, we just want to move on because it's part of you know part of what we do. We can't I can't sit here for a half hour talking about you know moving at a penny or so. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, sometimes you will do a lot better if you hold on to it longer, and the market doesn't do anything. And other times, you know, the market will have a huge move after earnings, and and you would have done a lot worse. So it's not there's no. There's no right answer to this. I like to close it right away because just move on. Trade's yeah, done. I, I agree 100%. You know, so I just, I like to get out. If you have a profit, take it, yeah. move on to the next one. Yeah, just be consistent. Let's go to the next slide. So how do you manage a strangle that begins losing money from volatility expansion? Do you make any adjustments if the price hasn't changed? If, this, if the stock price hasn't changed? How do you manage a strangle that begins to lose money from a volatility expansion? So, yeah, if if the stock price really doesn't change much, 
and the strangle starts to expand, okay? And you kind of like trap like a rat, but but what do you do if the price hasn't changed much to the stock, but the strangle's increasing in, in value? I don't really, I don't, I don't touch that strangle at that point. If the stock, if my underlying belief that the stock isn't going to move very much or nearly as much as the volatility suggests it will, if that's still true, I don't touch it. It just shows that I'm early on that vol, vol contraction. So if I see high implied volatility, sell a strangle, and then volatility goes higher, I'm wrong in my timing. That, that's what that is. But I don't necessarily adjust or manage that trade at that point. If it's just volatility causing the loss, I'm not rolling to different strikes or future expirations. I'm leaving it as it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, for me, it... <laughs> It's a, it's a difficult, it's a tough question to answer because it's almost impossible to manage volatility expansion. Volatility only expands about 10% of the time. Mm -hmm. It contracts 20, it stays like in a lull state 70. So it only happens 10% of the time. And when it happens, like that's when volatility actually wins. You know, like you have a position on, volatility is expanding. There's not a lot you can really do to defend against that, except don't increase the size of your position when that's happening, just deal with it, and then when it'll come back. Right. It's it's it, it's just timing. It's it's yeah. you you thought it yeah. would contract and it didn't. Yeah. Hang on to it. Next slide. I mean, every once in a while, something else has to have a chance to win. So, what is the relationship between implied volatility, expected move, and delta? They knew I would be here this week. <laughs> <laughs> So implied volatility drives both expected move and delta. So that is the gasoline in the little engine of these formulas, okay? So when volatility is high, it makes the expected potential move of a stock bigger too. So vol goes up, expected move goes up. It also increases the delta of out-of-the-money options. Why? Because a higher implied volatility means that the stock has the potential to make a bigger up or down move. Not up or, it, it's not picking direction, it's picking magnitude. So implied volatility says, an implied volatility of 20 says the stock might move this much, an implied volatility of 40 means it might move this much, a bigger amount. And so those way out-of-the-money options because delta is a proxy for the probability of being in the money, the delta goes up to when implied volatility goes up. Lower volatility shrinks the expected move, drops the out-of-money deltas, the opposite of high volatility. That's what it is. Yeah. Implied yeah. volatility drives those numbers. Yeah. So the relationship between implied volatility, essentially implied volatility is expected move, and delta is just the sheer equivalency of whatever your position is. Mm -hmm. So you have the number of shares, and then you have, um, you know, the implied volatility, which equals expected move. So, and, and just, to, just to restate it, expected move and delta turn implied volatility into a useful number. That's what they are. Yeah, okay. Um, I was gonna say, I'm covering a lot of this in, don't forget this Wednesday is part two of our um, webinar series at 11 a.m. And it's on a portfolio. Um, it's on managing a portfolio of for active traders. And so, really put together a really interesting webinar. So it's 11 o'clock this Thursday, this Wednesday on the 27th. And you can sign up on tastylive.com forward slash events. First Part one two. is available on the website. First one is available at the same Great spot. Great presentation. Yep. Second one is this Wednesday. All right, let's go back to the slides. Next, next slide, John. So this person writes, I entered into a call calendar spread in SPY last week. My short strike is at 530 in April, and my long strike is at 530 in June. The position started turning a profit, and I'm trying to understand why. Is it because the market moved higher? Yes. So calendar spreads, they're directional to the point where they maximize, a calendar spread maximizes value when the stock is close to the strike of the calendar. So you bought a 530 calendar spread, call calendar presumably, yeah, call calendar, last week when the SPY was probably around, I don't know, 510 or something like that. 
And now it's higher, up to 520. As the stock spider moves closer to 530, the calendar spread will move up in value. Volatility also hasn't really come off that much because it already has started low. So even though you're long Vega in that calendar spread, you're not really hurt, hurt by it. Um, and the time decay in those April options is starting to benefit you. So April right now has, let me see, let me see, 25 days to go. So that's right at the, at the end stage of its maximum theta decay. Um, and that's why you're making money on that calendar. The SPY moved up, volatility didn't drop, you're making money on the short uh, call in April. Yeah, I mean, it's that simple. I mean, calendar spreads the way you're trading here at the 530 strike with the index at 520, it's strictly a directional play. I mean, that's it. And so um, if you had, if you have, calendars are, usually if people do put in call calendars, then it's a range bound play. But if you're just doing a call calendar, you're hoping that the market goes up towards your short strike. If you're doing a put calendar, you're hoping the market goes down towards your short, towards your short strike. Um, that's all they are. And so they're, they're, a, they're basically a short front month premium play that actually likes volatility expansion in the back month too. Let's go to the next slide. But that's why you make money. So do you monitor your gamma risk? If so, do you do it at the position level or at the portfolio level? I am covering this on Wednesday, just, just as a reminder. But if, do you do so at the position level or the portfolio level? And what is a good amount of gamma risk? So gamma is a measure of the amount your delta will change for a one point move in the underlying price. I don't manage gamma at the position level. Most of my trades are because they're based on volatility and theta and probability that each one of them has its own characteristics and I'm not looking to hedge it in any way. My deltas never get too big in any of my individual positions. As I get to the portfolio level, my deltas are also relatively small. So gamma, rather than looking at the specific number, I kind of have built up sort of like a big versus small gamma. So let me just see right now. Well, I, I'll pull it up. I don't want to pull up my own right now. I don't want to take the time to do it. The point is that gamma isn't the first thing I look at in a portfolio. No. As you, it, it, gamma really gets out of control as you get close to expiration. And if you roll stuff at that 21 day mark, your gammas never get that big. They just, they just don't. Gamma is a risk. And your risk. delta is stay stable. Gamma is a risk for, gamma is really a risk for, um, I feel like gamma is a risk for like professionals and prop traders. I feel like for retail investors, you should focus on your theta and your delta and just know that if you roll a 21 DT, you're not going to have any gamma risk. That's right. If, if, because ideally, you never have any positions big enough to generate a huge amount of gamma. Yeah. Whereas a professional may be short, you know, 200 straddles somewhere. Yeah. And they're manufacturing deltas as the stock moves up 10 cents. Yeah. That's gamma risk. Tasty trade. The, our style doesn't generate gamma risk. Nope. Let's go to the next slide. So on the last one, let's say, for argument's sake, the market was to go up every day for a month. Would I make more money selling a put with an expiration date one month out or selling a zero DT put every day? Hmm. I'd have to look at those net and it without with the, I could, I'm, without looking at the option prices. I'm going to say net net for a given level of probability you're going to make more selling 30 or 25 or 26 of those zero DTE options. Of course. Yeah, I mean, it, this is because I do that. This is this <laughs> is a hypothetical and um, not not saying it's easy to sell a zero DT put every single day and close your eyes. But the, and in fact, it's much easier to sell a one month put and manage that than it is to sell a zero DT put. But the reality is you would definitely make more money if you sold a zero DT put every day. That's when you start to get into potential gamma risk. 
Okay, if you're going into SPX or ES, it's a big product, and if it moves down to your short strike, suddenly your deltas yeah. explode. Of course. And the zero DTE, it's a binary trade. It either works or it doesn't. There's no adjusting it. There's no rolling it, no managing it. It's a binary trade. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason the person asked this question is because there's certain situations where, like, if you do the zero DT every day, you wouldn't get the overnight moves. But, you know, I mean, that's... Yeah, but that come, all comes out. I, I, I know. I agree. So, yeah, I think every single day would be better. Um, not that we would ever do that, but that would be, that'd be better. All right. Good stuff. Um, we're going to come back. We've got Anton Kulikov waiting in the wings. Champing uh, at the bit. He's chomping at the bit. Champing. Champing. Not chomping. Not chomping? Champing at the bit. That's the expression. Is it really champing? I'm pretty I'm sure. Pretty sure it was chomping. <laughs> Aren't you because chomping you... at the bit? What's a champ? Champing is like... That's when a horse champs? I no, thought it was chomp. kind of like pulling it. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, See, because in Massachusetts, the horse is champ. I, I have to look this up now. You go to Suffolk Downs champing, and they champ at the bit. Champing at the bit versus chomping. <laughs> There's actually a whole site. Webster <laughs> say, says champ at the bit is to show impatience at resistance. you restless. It comes from something the horses say. Is it champing or is it chomping? AP says champ at the bit is the original and better form, but Webster's adds that chomp at the bit is an acceptable variation <sighs> for the common folk like me. <laughs> is it champing or is it chomp? I can't believe how many articles there are on champing versus chomping. Oh, well, it's like... Um... Oh, it's wow. like continuous versus continual. It <laughs> yes. always gets people. Rational versus irrational. No, not not <laughs> irrational. What am I saying? Um, what is it? Uh, oh my god! Now my mind's flaking out on me. I got, I'll come back to it. Do you go to break? Yeah, you can go to yeah, break. Yeah, go to break. <laughs> Chomping on the bit. Champing on the Champing bit. Champing on the bit. Paper. Scissors? He just played paper. He'll do it again. No, rock. Men statistically play rock, but he played paper and lost, and the mind works in patterns. He's going scissors. He knows I know he'll go scissors, but knowing I know he knows. Scissors, shoot. I thought we were doing rock, paper, scissors, shoot. It's always rock, paper, scissors. If you think like a trader, we've got your back. Tasty trade. Join the club, genius. One of the things that, that was most intriguing about the financial space to us is just that there wasn't a lot of vision. There wasn't a lot of innovation. After almost 20 years of open outcry, standing in the pit trading, I felt like all the markets were moving to uh, electronic trading. I saw the writing on the wall and I wanted to be first. Building the best technology in the world for traders was one of the coolest things anybody could ever do. I loved every second of it. Think or swim will always be my baby, but this one, it's different. We built ours literally from scratch. It's a much thinner, it's a faster, it's a slicker application. Everything's on one page. So you're always looking at the core page and then bouncing around from there to get to whatever you wanna to get to. We're here to support whatever you're looking to do. We have the tools that you need to be a successful trader. Are you on a quest for trading enlightenment? Driven by an unquenchable need to find the twin flame to your chosen strategy? Our Where's Bat Live event is the search for trading's ultimate holy grail. Do you have what it takes to find the elusive bat as we visit three cities? Join six tasty live speakers as they present six unique strategies and six unique clues using games and probability to lead to the ultimate prize. Sign up for this free event today at tastylive.com slash events. It feels good to get smart. Get even smarter with the ultimate how-to guide. Learn 31 different option strategies, cover calls, iron condors, jade lizards, 
Become a trading mastermind. Get the guide at tastylive.com slash guide. cost you guys to do simultaneous hair flips years of practice Jive. Antone in the house. We're up? back. Tom. Hello, Anton. Oh, this is a fantastic view. The production team did a stellar job with this. Beautiful. This is a much better way to look at it. Beautiful. All right. Thank you, Anton. Well, because I've never been on the Zoom with a new studio. Or maybe I have, but not with this view. TP, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm happy to be back here in Chicago. The weather is very nice, by the way. It's not like, you know, 15 degrees. Yeah, well, you came at one of those, like, w one week where it's perfect. Yeah, because they knew I was yeah. coming. <laughs> but no, I'm doing very well. Thank you, Anton. Are you ready to uh, take a look at how these options jive? We are. I am. Been waiting Let's for this one. <laughs> Let's take a look at the first slide and go into it. Um you guys see the slides, yeah? Yes. We do. Only 43 points this week? What? I'm going to pull them up on my end then. Yes, so we got 43 points of expected move, probably because uh, we have no Friday. Um, but still, 40% drop in the expected move. This is now among the lowest we have seen over the last two years. We did that study last week, Tom, which you really liked. Uh, this is basically the bottom first percentile of expected moves we're going to see this week. But yeah, that's what 13 handle VIX will get you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've had like 70 handle for the last two weeks and 50 handles before that. Um, but yeah, we haven't seen 43 in a while. So, uh, but it's, I think it's typical for a four day week. You really have to kind of, you, you kind of have to give it a normalization factor of another like eight points if it was a five week, five day week. Right. So it's really more like a 50 point week when you account for the last. Still, that's kind of, that's kind of low considering where we've been. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to point that out. Today's show is not going to be much about expected move or volatility, though. I wanted to point out some correlation, some some stuff about correlation, because I think we got a lot of questions recently, specifically because of uh, how Bitcoin's been moving, how gold's been moving, how the Russell's been uh, trying to move, uh, and obviously the equity indexes. So you know what we're going to do? This, this research corner is going to be themed about kind of showing you the the power of a high correlation and also all it takes in a drop of a correlation metric to completely kind of change how two underlyings move. Just to kind of give people context, like is a 0.4 correlation high? Is a 0.6 correlation high? Is a 0.8 correlation high? What's a high correlation? So let's do this graphically, shall we? Let's go to the second slide. And this is kind of, so we're going to start easy. So this is, these are called scatter plots. Every day there is a move in, let's say, IWM and QQQ, right? Let's say IWM, which is the Russell, moves up 2%, and QQQ moves 1%. You basically plot a point at that intersection, okay? And you do that for 12 months, and you have basically the scatter plot. The more correlated two underlyings are, you'll have that scatter plot be very narrow and very directionally uh, linear, right? So the more narrow and directionally linear it is, the more correlated it is, and the more it'll move together, right? That makes sense. So right now we're seeing with IWM and the Russell, 
uh, we're actually seeing, I'm sorry, IWM and the NASDAQ, we're seeing it actually be slightly uh, less correlated than the S&Ps are to the Russell, which is kind of surprising. Uh, but that's what we're in the environment right now. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Just knowing yeah. that this could change any time, too. This can change any time, but it is interesting to see. I wouldn't have thought that the Russell was more correlated to SPY than it is the NASDAQ. You can see that by NASDAQ and Russell move the opposite 32% of the time. And that, uh, the SPY and the Russell only move opposite 22% of the time. So you actually get a quite a sizable difference. Does that, does that surprise you? It actually doesn't surprise me. Um, no, no, well, it, it, given the price action last year, it doesn't surprise me. But if, you know, over time, we would expect the Russell and the NASDAQ to kind of lead the market. That's kind of the typical traditional model. But the last year totally bucked that trend. Obviously, the empirical price action makes it easy to, to know. Well, that. But if you weren't looking at the market. I think part of what's going on is the queues are basically the same as Spider. It's, you know, most of the stocks. And so, you know, again, they're constant, the queues being a little bit smaller index, so only got 100, share, 100 stocks versus 500. The big cap stocks are really concentrated in the queues versus the very small cap IWM. So I could see the correlation between those two being weaker than IWM and SPY. Um, and yeah, even though these things can change at any time, I think Anton, to your point, is very broadly, the correlation between IWM and Q is less stable than it is for IWM and SPY. In other words, that will continue and persist. Yeah, and this is over going back a year. So th this is, you know, this this may take some time to actually go back, you know, to what it was back in 2018 or something like that. Yeah. We're the opposite. So now let's go to the next slide. And now this is our typical equity index. This is SPY and QQQ. This is going to be our basically our most correlated pair. Um, and you can see, obviously, that that scatter plot is the narrowest and the most linear, right? That means it's the highest correlated. Okay, so now we got kind of that notion in our minds how a scatter plot looks. So now let's go to the fourth slide. And now we're going to take a look at some assets that are moderately correlated, maybe a medium correlation, not super strong, but have been in play over the last few months. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, should be slide four. Okay, so Bitcoin and Russell. Okay, so recently Bitcoin and Russell have kind of been moving... Um, kind of in the same direction. Correlation is about 0.47. Um, it's been higher, or you know, back in 2022, but it's dropped off a little bit, but it's still relatively correlated. I mean, we have, you know, a lot of days where Bitcoin's up and Russell is given a boost because of that. Um, but their correlation of 0.45 is a lot different than what people think of as like a moderately high correlation. We're going to kind of show why that is uh, later but anyway this is the current correlation between russell and bitcoin does that surprise you tp or I, I, it doesn't surprise me i i would be surprised if there's you know anything there well yeah and anton i think this is a good good example of you know correlation does not equal causation and yes right. maybe there is a, an element of bitcoin in the small cap world that i i don't understand and may you know make it more correlated but I see this, th it, this is a very interesting graph. That's kind of the random nature of just pulling correlations, right? right. When you have something not obviously tied together like Q's, SPY, and IWM, the correlations can be all over the place. Right, right. And, and, and again, it's still positively correlated, but it's not as much as the equity indexes. And I think when we're going to we're going to look at a scatter they're only plot. positively correlated because we're in a bull market i mean <laughs> I, I got it i mean everybody I everybody know. confuses there there's a lot of confusion around correlation when it comes to bull markets a lot of things are correlated in a bull market everything goes up let's, yeah basically every go. asset goes up let's go to the next slide we're going to take a look at bitcoin and gold um i was actually surprised with this it's not correlated at all bitcoin and gold have been hovering over around zero basically for the last two years without exception so um, that is still remains, and I, I think you know those would make good core, uh, good diversification uh, components. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's let's go to the next slide. Or gold and bonds, either gold and bonds. Honestly, I thought would be more correlated, but again, uh, moderately correlated at best. Recently, they haven't even been as strong as they've been in the last couple of years. So 
now we have basically a few examples of moderately correlated pairs, right? And then those higher correlated equity indexes. Now let's go to the next slide. And I just wanna show you how big of a difference that actually makes in terms of trading them day by day, right? We look at IWM, the Russell, it doesn't roll off my tongue easy to say IWM. I'm gonna say Russell and the NASDAQ. Um, we saw that scatter plot earlier, right? It's correlated, it's kind of strong, but not super strong. Now look at Bitcoin and IWM. Mm -hmm. That correlation, is only a handful of points lower, but look at the difference it actually makes on a day-by-day -day basis. You couldn't, if I gave you that that scatter plot, you couldn't tell me that it was correlated at all. Yeah, you know, I would I mean, say, I you know, there are statistical tests you can perform on it, but just on just looking at it, say that's a random plot. Yeah, it, it's a random plot, despite that correlation plot we saw in slide four, saying, oh, well, it's 0.45, semi like not super strong, but it's positive. But on a realistic basis, anything less than the 0.6 really doesn't get you anything. And if we go to the last slide, I'm going to reveal the actual correlations here. Um, go to the, yeah, the correlations actually are not that far apart. The correlation between Nasdaq and, and the Russell is 0.57. Between Bitcoin and Russell, it's 0.45. I chose those intentionally because realistically, if you're looking at the number itself, you would be like, okay, 0 0.57, 0 0.45, that doesn't make that much of a difference. But on a day-to-day -day basis, what a difference it actually makes. Yeah. You have a correlation that's close to 0.6 and a correlation that's close to 0.4. And that's that a makes slide. a world of difference. Hmm? That's a great slide. Yeah, so, and, and, and that's, and, and the reason, and this is why we choose for pairs trades as an example, a correlation of 0.6, because we, there is actually a relationship there. Once you drop below 0.6, numerically it doesn't look that different, obviously, but on a realistic basis, you can't really d discern a relationship there at all. This is the also- Back the relationship to work. And this is also, I think, when you go to a, a traditional financial planner and they tell you that you're diversified by investing in the S&Ps, NASDAQ, and IWM, and maybe some, you know, non-U.S. index, they all move together. That's not diversification. That's not diversification. The, the other for the tasty world, though, this just shows you that you can go into things like Bitcoin and gold and TLT to add small positions that will just diversify your portfolio and just give you almost zero correlation between them. You, you, you insulate your portfolio by trading these non-correlated products. Right. And, and the way we would think of non-correlation is different than the actual statistic that tells us correlation, right? We sometimes right. think, oh, you know, 0.4, that's correlated, 0.6 is correlated. So if I want to trade non-correlated assets, I have to go to like, like 0.1 or zero. In reality, it's kind of hard to find those assets, but you don't need to, because even a correlation of 0.4 or even 0.5 could be sufficient diversification because of how random they actually move on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Well done, Anton. We got to go. We're out of time. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Nice shirt. Sure. <laughs> <laughs>
It's a much thinner, it's a faster, it's a slicker application. Everything's on one page. So you're always looking at the core page and then bouncing around from there to get to whatever you wanna to get to. We're here to support whatever you're looking to do. We have the tools that you need to be a successful trader. Hello everybody, we're back. I'm Tom Sosnoff, we're here with Tom Preston sitting in for the bat. And we're about to get a down opening after a little bit of a after a little bit of an underwater close on Friday. You don't say. You don't say. They should open the cash down pretty good this morning. Um, this the S and P sold off about ten handles on the close on Friday, and then you're down another seventeen right now. In, so interesting. Does it mean anything, or mm -hmm. is it? I don't know. It's just it's just random movement our way. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're down. Awesome. No, I mean, ES was down. They were down. They rallied back a little bit right before the open. They were down nine or so. Now they're down 17 points. NASDAQ. Um, and the rut, by the way, it's up, up five points, um, up six points. So they're loving the rut. That, that's a trade we have on TP. That's the only reason I mentioned it. Was that uh, RT, RTY? Yeah, yeah, we're long rut. We're long small caps, short S&Ps. Nice. So, yeah, well, it hasn't exactly been nice. No, it's, it's, it's been at, brutal, but it's It's nice at a multi-year low. <laughs> I'm just looking. We, we had this big talk about China last night, and I'm just looking, and FXI is actually unchanged. Yeah. But since i got to put my money where my mouth is, so I'm going to buy a little stock. Um, so let's look at some of the big ones. NVIDIA is down three and a half bucks. Which is, by the way, nothing. Not for NVIDIA, it isn't. Not for a $940 stock. Uh, we we're talking about coin earlier. Coin's up five, six dollars right now. That's a big move in coin. Um, Surprisingly, Apple's down two bucks, which to me is a little bit surprising. And also, um, AMD down um, almost seven dollars is a big move i don't know why and then of course you've got boeing which is um up in the little bit in the stratosphere i guess Boeing up uh almost five dollars right now so we got a chart on that well it's off it's um zooming into this the way you see this chart you know it opened up here now it's down a little bit so it's coming off a bit but that's boeing yeah uh i don't have positions in there i have positions in love Managing my short put with some calls, short calls, and that's been just crushed right here. Now let's get stable. this Boeing going. I've got to roll up some some puts in Boeing, given this four dollar up move on the opening. But the problem is, these markets are like duty. Netflix down a dollar again for a six hundred twenty seven dollar stock. That's nothing. Uh, earnings are coming up in a couple of weeks in there. And so that's pushing the volatility up. Which one is this? Netflix, 72% IV rank. Um, yeah. I'm taking a look here. Apple down to, I, I don't really, I have a small position in Apple, but I'm not. I've been wanting to buy Apple just because it's Apple. I'm not and getting 46% IV rank makes it attractive. But looking at some of these, so let's say I go in here and look at the, the stock trading at 170, I look at the 65 puts or something like that. Um, I can make $5 on $2,800 of buying power. That's not great. Which one are you talking about? I'm looking at Apple right now. Oh. Just selling a put in there. Um, and the put spreads, I don't, if I turn this into a short put spread, I'm not getting the credit that I want for a five-point put spread. Um, with 32 days. But if I can go out to, let's say, 53... And this is this is how I trade. I just experiment until I find something I want. No, I'm not getting it out at 53 days either. So anyway, I'm gonna wait for wait on Apple. See what else is out there. Crude oil. Crude oil is up 92 cents. Um, some some stocks are fairly weird. flat though over the past week. Some weird moves this morning. Um, Arm up almost $7, which is a huge move in there. Yeah. And AMD down. I don't know if there's something going on between those, those well, two. AMD, well, what's Intel? Uh, and we have one more adjustment. Intel's there. down another dollar. Intel's down again. Uh, what's another one? NVIDIA we already looked at. 
about AMAT or something like that. AMAT down $1.67. So what I'm doing right now is just adjusting some positions to put myself in a not such a bad position. Adjusting yeah. some positions to put myself in a not such a bad position. Yes. Um, Bonds are down seven ticks. Yeah, I kind of... I, I I kind of like the bonds here. Um, oh, Tesla was down earlier. It's up now. I'm just looking around at all these different stocks. Um, yeah, it's bonds are down on a relative basis. Bonds are down more than you would think they would be with ZN down three ticks. They're now down three and a half. So, you know, I look for like a two and a half to one or you know, somewhere between two and three to one, which it which it is arguably right now. But I'm surprised bonds aren't down a little bit more here. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at my positions. I need a down move. I need them to be not 100 in the s and I blame, I kind of, I can't really blame you, so I have to blame the bat still. No, that's but fine. You I blame me. I kind of need them down 100. Um, AMD, Intel, and Microsoft. China is banning them, according to Josh. Apple, Google, and Meta all being investigated by the EU for unfair practices. Well, you know, that's your big reason for being down. So um, the dollar looks a little bit lower today. If so. China was banning Microsoft, don't you think Microsoft would be down more than four dollars? No, it, it doesn't. I don't think it matters. Really? They're gonna, okay. Just they're gonna figure out some way to sell stuff. So British pound is up a little bit today. I sold some put spreads in there. So my, the British daughter, pound? my daughter is going to study. London this summer for a special class. To study? To do, yeah, study something for three weeks. So we're okay. talking about the British pound. And she's got an account. And I said, here, if you want to hedge your potential expenses, sell a put spread in the British pound. So she sold a put spread. In the futures. Good Hold for it. her. You got her to sell a put spread in the British pound? Yeah. To hedge yeah. what? To hedge her trip over there in case the British pound rallies and makes it more expensive for her. Okay. How much money do you think that girl's spending? I don't know. She's, she's trading. She's got a put spread on. I'm just wondering, though, what are you, what are you hedging? I don't know. It's, she's got to trade. you got to teach these guys how to trade. I'm going to London this summer. And I'm not hedging my position. <laughs> It's engagement. It's okay. engagement. So you're doing it for engagement. So you told her to sell a put spread in the British pound. Yeah. It sold off a little bit. I said, okay, yeah. And did she ask you why she's doing this? Kind of. But she looked at the probabilities and time decay and the margin requirement. She had the money to do it. She likes, She's liking trading. She's stepping in. She mostly tra she trades, you know, like crude oil occasionally. So she's not converting oil. any money until she gets over there because she's just going to. She's not going to be convert. She's not going to do. This is not going to do anything. She's going to use a credit card. OK, they're going to do the conversion automatically for her. Girls from Texas don't spend any money when they get to, t to London. I have no idea. They don't spend any money. I have no idea. They get London boys to buy them everything they want. I can only <laughs> I can only hope. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, that's what it is. Yes. Yeah, getting the kids trading. It's fun. All right. That's not a bad strategy, but I'm trying to figure out if that kind of makes any sense. But I mean, I guess it makes sense to get well, a trade. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Who cares if she makes so a bucks put on spread? It? Just because I'm trying to, like, a one point put spread in the British pound because it's only six ticks. Is that? Is that six hundred dollars? Let me click into one. Is that max? I, I don't. I don't remember what strikes. Yeah, are. you make about you make about one hundred and fifty, one hundred and sixty dollars for a. Looking at this put spread, sell the the. But I'm saying a one point wide spread would be six hundred twenty five dollars max. So if you sell it, for yeah, like and it's it, and it's five hundred five hundred dollars max. Oh, five hundred dollars max. Okay. And you sell it and take in like a hundred and fifty or one hundred sixty. One third the width of the strikes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's about a third. But it's six twenty five a tick, right? Something like that. Yeah, six twenty five a tick. I hate that stuff about. I know. I know. It's it's like what are we in like seventeen fifty? I know. Anyway. All right, let's take a quick look here. We got some good stuff going on and some and some the good stuff going on this morning. S&P's down 12. On the heels of being down on Friday, 
um, closing them underwater. The Nasdaq's down 107. Also a little sell-off in there on Friday. Not as big. Mm -hmm. The Russell up 16 this morning. Huge up move in the Russell relative to everything else. Yeah. Um, uh, Volatility is basically unchanged. The VIX futures are down 12 cents. Somebody asked me this morning, they said, they wrote me an email and said, what are you quoting when you quote VIX? We don't quote VIX. VIX is up, VIX this morning is up 31 cents, but we're quoting the VIX futures, which is forward slash VX. Yeah. That's down 12 cents. And that's mainly because you can't actually trade the that's right. VIX. VIX so futures, you might as well quote something you can trade. VIX futures are the spot market. The VIX cash VIX is the futures is the what's happening 30 days in the future. Right. Uh, Bitcoin's the big mover this morning. It's up 3,300. ETH's up 100, and crude oil's up 80 cents. And what else do we have going on here in in commodity markets? Gold's up 18 bucks. That's a pretty big move. And yeah, uh, let's see. That's silver. Um, I silver up to almost like 25 bucks an ounce right now. Yeah, silver's up 12 silver. cents. And what else do we have a position on? Natural gas, which is actually down a little bit. Bonds, which are down a little bit. Um, yeah, bonds just are not moving. And then bonds are dead. soybeans, which are up a little bit. I am sure to put spread in soybeans. So that's working out for me. How about corn? Up six bucks in beans. Corn. Come on. Delete. Apple down 243. That's surprising to me. And AMD's down Corn four. Corn has changed. AMD's down four bucks. Anything else going there? Coin's up 13 bucks. Ouch. Coin, I freaking hate coin. It is the hardest damn stock to trade. Every single day, I am chasing this stock. And if I try to get ahead of myself, uh -huh. I get I go underwater the other way. Go! Oh! And if I try to do it, it doesn't matter what I do in there, oh! I think I'm, I'm always playing defense. Um... And Disney up almost three dollars today. Uh, so let's see if there's anything else crazy out there. And I don't, I don't really see it. Disney. Uh, da, 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 da. Microsoft's down big, but we're short that. And Nvidia is actually down now. We're a little short that. So those things are good. All right. I'm Tom Sosnoff. He's Tom Preston. This is Tasty Live. Um, is Dr. Jim in the house, John, or not? He's not, Tom. We're doing an options drive next one. Oh, we have an options drive. Yeah, I think Dr. Jim, I thought Dr. Jim was on vacation this week. Hey, listen. He's on injured reserve. No, he doesn't. He doesn't get injured. Uh, he gets sick proof. occasionally. He's, you know, he's, he's a bodybuilder. Yeah, yeah, he's bulletproof. Nice. Occasionally he gets sick, though. That's he's, nice. He's a little soft. But this That's week nice. he's actually on vacation. I think he's in a cabin somewhere in the... Where is Dr. Jim? In a cabin in in Appalachia somewhere or something? Some not sounds like sure. sounds like a, a horror movie in the making. Doctor Jim is a horror movie in the making. <laughs> Have you ever you haven't traveled with him? I've traveled with him before. Okay, he's a horror movie in the making. You know what? Here's the funniest thing about him. We will go away for one day, right? That kid, for one day, carries he carries a um, uh, he carries a the same suitcase is from at least. Maybe the 1970s, like oh. it was passed down to him, <laughs> and it's and it's it's it doesn't. I, I I'm not sure it has wheels, but it has like some way he's able to drag it. So he has a suitcase that he drags, <laughs> and on top of that he carries like a duffel bag. I'm like, dude, you're going away for one night. Okay, I carry a backpack with a pair of pants, a shirt, you know, and and a pair of socks. He carries two suitcases and a backpack, like something like that. It's insane. I'm like, where are you going? What is he packing food? I don't know what he's doing. Like, what's in there? Chickens? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> I was out to dinner the other night. Last week, I had this board meeting. These two guys flew out from, one guy flew out from California, one guy flew out from New Jersey, uh, from Connecticut. They work for different firms, and, um, and they're sitting on the board, and they both came out for one night. One guy had, one guy had, like, a backpack, like a small backpack, mm -hmm. and the other guy had like just like like something fit under his arm. Because these guys are professional travelers. Okay, they're yeah. gone for one night. Yeah. Boom, they're back the next day. And I'm like, God, you guys travel light. You're just like me. He goes, they go, yeah, we travel all the time. Doctor Jim, it's unbelievable. Moving Anton, an army. The, the guy's a one man army. Anton, he brought a trunk with him. I go, what are you doing? He had like a truck. These guys, I'm like, we don't check bags, dudes. Oh, I hate checking bags. Exactly. Checking bags is a defeat. It's a personal defeat. Oh my God. It's the it's like, are you kidding me?
It's like sending food back at a restaurant. Yeah. I mean, they spit in it and they do things to it. They send it back to you. <laughs> well, I don't know if they technically spit it in or not, but I don't know. I, I, do, I do not understand the concept of checking bags in 2024. Like, yeah, there's no reason it. to. I don't get it. All right. Um, again, I'm Tom. He's, he's TP. He's Tom, too. And a quick reminder, just a little before we, before we take a quick break. Um, this Wednesday, you can, as our part two of our webinar series, and you can sign up at tastylive.com forward slash events. And it is the precursor to a, a, to a live show called Modern Portfolio Innovation for Active Traders. There are six speakers. Our first show is in New York City. We, are, we have 19 spots open out of a lot. Um, there are only 19 spots open. It'll be probably be filled up by today. So if you haven't signed up and you want to come to New York, please do. Like I said, there are only, I got just got the email update from Britt. There are only 19 spots left open before we go to a wait list. And then after we get to a wait list, people will still get in it as other people cancel. But I um, just want you to sign up. It's April 13th. It's Saturday. It's at uh, Webster. Um, I think it's called the Webster Theater. And it's on the Lower East Side. All right. Thanks. We'll take a short break. We'll come on back in just a couple seconds with Option Jive. Cool. Know someone who needs a better broker? Earn $250 for each qualified person you refer to Tasty Trade. Because friends don't let friends trade on a bad platform. Terms and conditions apply. Join the club, genius. Tasty trade. Well, he's more public in his mentality. <laughs> I'm a believer. I believe that the world is good. And I know that the world is not good. That questioning yourself and, and questioning yourself in dialogue with someone you respect is both pleasant and sometimes extremely insightful and useful sometimes. Need a little more luck in your life? I'm Vanetta, and this is your first look at the spring issue of Luckbox. The latest Luckbox is all about the auto industry. And once again, your free digital subscription is available at getluckbox.com. In 2022, the US auto industry sold 13.75 million vehicles, and it feels like I got stuck behind all of them this morning in traffic. And in 2023, the total value of the US car and auto manufacturing market is an eye-popping $104 billion. This issue of Luckbox looks at what's ahead for the auto industry and who are the winners and the losers. EVs have hit a speed bump the last six months, dealing with slowing demand, more competition, and lagging infrastructure. What lies ahead? We also take a look at two EV titans battling for supremacy in Asia, Tesla versus BYD and US versus China. On the American side of things, baby, you can drive my car. We also take a look at GM versus Ford. Plus, we look at why hybrids are so hot and is there a play to be made in lithium? The massive rare earth deposit is the key to powering vehicles. Will lawyers and lizards stand in the way of mining? I'm sorry, what now? We also show you the 12 hottest new cars of 2024. I hope they're bringing back the El Camino. Business in the front, party in the back. And I went to the Chicago Auto Show, and I want to know why there were adventure vehicles everywhere when people are only driving to Starbucks. And AM radio is back and more relevant than ever. Finally, for all you investors, we have 50 auto sector trade ideas. But hey, don't take my word for it. Do you want the best in life, money, and probabilities? Get your motor running and go to getluckbox.com and hit that subscribe button to get the digital... Look out! At Tasty Live, we live and breathe the markets. But when the live show's over, are we out of breath? If you want to inhale the latest breaking market news, we've got you covered. 
The Tasty Live research team and on-air personalities post refreshing content updated daily covering earnings, economic reports, trade ideas, and much more. If you want a breath of fresh air and not stale takes, visit the News and Insights tab at tastylive.com. 90% goes to s and index funds. 10% straight to bank. Is 20th century advice driving your 21st century portfolio? Tasty Live has joined forces with the CME and SIBO to offer the industry's first multi-exchange trading collaboration. Our new live event, Building a Complex Portfolio, puts active traders on the path to modern portfolio creation. Tom Sosnoff and other Tasty Live personalities will cover strategies that'll help you integrate futures and options in your portfolio. Sign up at tastylive.com slash events and see where we're headed next. Oh yeah. Tasty Nation, good morning. It's rare, TP, when we get two wonderful option jives in one day, but occasionally the option gods throw us a little bit of and they a bone. They smile. Apart. Can I just ask you a quick personnel question? Yes, personal question, sure. No, personnel. Does personnel. Vanetta come in here and yell at you regularly? Oh, God, yeah. I was just wondering. I, Everybody comes in here and yells at me regularly. But, you know, this is the, um, it comes to the territory, but. That's the victim chair. It is. It is a little bit. <laughs> For about the last 13 years, she's been coming in into the studio between breaks and yelling at me, saying, this is exactly what I covered. Don't you read anything I do? You idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I here? I hate my job. I, can, I have all her lines down. <laughs> I hate what I do. <laughs> yeah. All right. Why Let us go into in? the so-called options. Don't again. you listen to a word I say, you know. You're just staring into space, blah, blah, blah. Um, but, you know, it's taken me a lot of work. I've been, you know, training her was not easy. Uh, uh, okay. Options drive zero sum game, Senor Sosnoff. Zero sum game. Is, is options a zero sum game? Theoretically, trading at fair value. And if everything is fair value, yes, it is theoretically a zero sum game. You get away from that with trade management and strategy selection. That's a different question, though. Optimization, we like to say. Yeah, optimization. Optimization. Let's take a look. So this is a tough concept, by the way. Not, not, a, not a difficult piece, but a tough concept, too, because a lot of people, you know, start to think, well, you know, if it's a zero-sum game, why am I doing this? I mean, why did I go play poker on Friday night? It's not even close to a zero-sum game. You know, right. the concept of a zero-sum game is that over time, your winners and losers will cancel out, leaving zero profit. A common theme is that if option trading is usually seen, a common theme is that option trading is usually seen as a zero-sum game. Um, selling premium should be as well. However, in practice, we know this is not the case, or at least we're going to try to prove that it's not the case. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next slide. So at $1 wide spread sold for 40 cents with a 60% pop may look like over 10 trades. It is a zero sum game. All right. We just put the numbers up here. You can kind of, we've, we've shown this before. You win, you win, you win, you win, you win, you lose, right? You lose, you lose. And then in the end, you end up with nothing. That even if you're the one selling these, you don't make any money. And if you're the one buying these spreads, you don't make any money either. Your, both of your trading ends up in zero P&L. That's zero sum. In a perfect world before fees, yes, this is it. You know, and, and we just, we laid it out in a simple format, but basically that's winning 60% of the time, losing 40% of the time. The numbers just come out, you know, the same. Right. Right. Let's go to the next slide. And you're going to see a couple of things here that make it interesting. Well, the fact that volatility overstates is one reason that it's not a zero-sum game. And 
What we looked at here was we posted a 45-day cycle in the SPY with the average expected move of 6.7% and the actual move of 4%. We took these numbers from, you know, years of our research, and they're pretty public numbers, but obviously that's one of the interesting aspects of the game is that one of the interesting aspects of trading is that it is a game. And that game fluctuates, opportunity fluctuates. And sometimes opportunity is, might even be like what you would consider negative. And other times it gets extremely advantageous. Mm -hmm. Like when volatility is super high, mm -hmm. the average expected move is gonna be significantly greater than the actual move. When volatility is low, the actual move might be greater than the um, average expected move. So even though over time everything equals out, at different periods, there's definitely more opportunity than other periods. Is that right. fair? Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And so that's just the that's the first slide. Let's go to the next slide. So we did a study and we looked at the spies for almost 17 years. Closest to 45 days, we sold iron condors with five dollar wings, each spread closest to a buck twenty-five, target of two fifty in total credit, expected fifty percent win rate. Basically, we did the risk one to make one. Mm -hmm. Risk one, risk one to make one, 50-50 probability profit. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, again, $5 wide wings, $1.25 on both sides. That's 250 total. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's risk one to make one. Mm -hmm. Right? 50-50 probability of profit. Right down the middle. Let's go to the next slide. When not managing or accounting for implied volatility rank, selling iron condors are more profitable than might be expected if it were a zero-sum game. So without doing anything, no management, nothing. I mean, selling the iron condor and letting it go to expiration. That's what this is. The win rate was 53%, and the average P&L per trade was $11.60 over 17 years. I'm yeah. surprised the, the win rate's that high. That it's 53 over 47? And not like, you know, 40, 51 or something like that. It's because volatility has been fairly low over that time, but it's 53%. And you say, well, it's 53% win rate good. Well, it's better than negative, a negative rate. But in our world, you know, I'm looking for a win rate up around 70-ish percent. For my own strategies, Tom, I don't know what you look for, but, you know. I'm in the same territory. 53% I mean, isn't isn't a good strategy for most people. Let's go to the next slide. Well, you're not you can't make enough money at 53%. No. So, when managing at 21 days, and this is where the optimization, we like to call it optimization, mm -hmm. but this is where the efficiency optimization, this is where the mechan optimizing the mechanics comes into play. So, um, when you manage at 21 days, your win rate that was expected 50/50 goes up to 62. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden you're talking but more important is the average P&L per trade goes up to 1245. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something we've done at Tasty for quite a long time, which is Mancha 21 days. But um, the reason that we do is for not just the higher win rate, but also for the higher um, average P&L per trade. So you make more money and you have a higher win rate mm -hmm. by just managing early. Very interesting. And that's still without, without um, qualifying everything with high IVR. So I want to put this in a little bit in context too. So over 17 years, that's that's what about 200 some odd expirations, something like that. Well, it's 250 days times 17. Well, no, it's 45. No, it's 40. They did 45 day expirations over 17 years. I, I'm right? going to multiply it out for you. My point is that. Going from 1160 to 1245 may not sound like a big deal. That's 85 cents for an average trade. But when you do that for enough trades, the 80 cents turns into portfolio profits. Just with the simple addition of managing at 21%, in other words, taking, taking it off at 21 days. It's 136 at 45 day expirations. Okay, so fine. That's, it's 136 45 day expirations, but that's without redeploying. Yeah, okay, fair, that. fair enough. But what I'm saying is. If you redeploy, it'd be 270. 85 cents doesn't seem like a lot, but you're doing this over 17 years, it accumulates. The more trades you do, the more those 80 cents add up. 
Um, next slide. Because you have to redeploy. That's yeah. the key. So finally, waiting for IVR over 35. We usually say 30, but let's say 35 they use for this one. Mm -hmm. Has made our trades even more profitable. So when you're waiting for IVR over 35, okay, in your all occurrences, you were at 62%. Held to expiration, you were at 53. But all of a sudden, it goes to 70%. And the the difference is um, your your average P&L per trade goes up to $37. Yeah, it triples from the... Every, all expirations when you're not counting in, in uh, yeah. implied volatility, and, and you're gonna you're gonna see from um, you're gonna see <clears throat> on my discussion this Wednesday, I cover <clears throat> a lot of this stuff. But managing at 21 days, you triple your average P&L per trade, mm -hmm. and you also reduce outlier risk. You also reduce portfolio volatility. But the key is you triple your average P&L per trade and your win rate goes from 53 to 70%. And just an interesting aside to this, the all occurrences of 53% and the IVR over 35% is 55. So 53 to 55, that's not a, a significant change in my opinion. And what it says is that high or low volatility is a good estimate of the future range of the index. So that if you just hold things for expiration, the volatility is a good estimator. When you manage it, when you optimize it, that's when you start to turn and turn your strategy into a profitable one. But just just saying that well, vol is volatility wrong in those cases? No, volatility is correct at all times. You're just optimizing the strategy. You know what's interesting is that there's a very simple and straightforward argument against zero sum, I mean, explaining zero sum game. And where you could argue that your ability to manage things early would also impact, for example, like a poker game, you know, because you can, you can, you can bluff somebody out maybe early, mm -hmm. but, um, or you can get out of the hand, that kind of thing. Um, but it's a little different here in that you have um, a much more, uh, much more defined set of of much more defined set of mechanics that can't be that can't be changed in the second half. If you if you manage early, you're not subject to what happens in the second half. So one of the things is that you don't learn any of this that I know in any finance program in America. Why? Because the finance professors who understand the theory and all that don't trade and don't think about strategy. So yes, in the theoretical world, options that are fairly priced, it is a zero sum game and you can argue that all day long. What can you actually do with that information? Nothing. If, zero, if, if you're saying that, well, gee, everything's at fair value, there's no edge, well, I'm not gonna trade at all. Okay, go do that and don't make money trading. Is that what you wanna do with your life? Let's go to the next slide. So some of the takeaways. Selling premium is not a zero sum game because implied volatility is usually overstated. It's not always overstated. Mm -hmm. But as seen in the iron condor example, selling premium can be made even more profitable when A, managing at 21 days, and B, initiating when the implied volatility rank is high. Mm -hmm. These are things that, these are kind of concepts and discussions we've had for 13 straight years, but it's good to just throw it out there once in a while and just kind of rehash it. To reinforce the, uh, reinforce, yeah. Reinforce. Because people are champing at the bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna bother me now forever, <laughs> champing at the bit. Am I the only person that didn't know it was not chomping? Well, I don't know anyone else John, who thought it was chomping. John, did you know it was champing? I did not. You did not? No clue. Okay, good. But to, to John, you know the expression, right? Yes, I do. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's perfect. No, he did not know it was champing. I feel better now because I'm, I'm not well, the Well, no, because you're putting him on the spot. Did you, I'm no, no, sure that if you asked John, could have said, if he used the expression, he would probably have said champing. John, do we have a picture of production? Not, not at this time. we have a camera time. of our production team? Not at this time yet. We don't. We're missing out on the best talent. No, I was just curious. I wanted, I wanted to you show. You want to do a survey? I wanted to A, do a survey, but to show. I don't know what outside pictures we have. Like, do we have pictures of the, of 
Do we have any other pictures of the area we're working in other than the studio we're in? Not at this time, Tom, but we're working on it. We should do a street camp <laughs> where we have a microphone, a little loudspeaker. Hey, you, you, over there, champing or chomping? Hmm? <laughs> I was going to say we could bring back the buddy cam, but that's not going to work. We have to bring back the Cali cam. Um, one of your five mutts can come in here. Good. The slim cam. <laughs> Slimmy vision. Slimmy vision. I'm sure I'm sure the actual Slimmy, Steve Miller, will be very happy to know that there is a dog named after well, him. Every time I say Slimmy, try to call him, I'm thinking of Slim. Yeah. How yeah. can I not? Who named this dog Slimmy? Because I did. Because came in, he was, my wife loves to rescue dogs. So we got this dog. And, okay, it came with some stupid name. And I thought, it's too hard to say. I'll never remember it. And Slim is a good Texas name. He was a, he's a very narrow dog. He's Slim. And it's a good Ted like He's a 140 pound narrow dog? He, well, he's big. He's about as big as your desk. <laughs> so he's, 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 he's a big dog. Is he gentle? More or less. To me, he is. I mean, you know, he's just, he's probably clumsy. He's getting there. He's getting there. We have a trainer come like twice a week. He's, he's a good dog. A trainer. But anyway, but call, yeah, I named him Slim. I thought Slim would be a good name. What? Did the trainer train five different dogs? No, just one. So we get the other four dogs in the house because it's all treat based and, you know, you can't yeah. have all the other dogs <laughs> running over to get the, get the treat. So the other dogs are all trained? Not really. <laughs> it's just, no, a 40 pound pit bull you could just pick up. Okay, a 140 pound dog does what it wants. Okay, you can't. You should get one of those livestock dogs. Well, that's what he th we, we think he might be, like a Pyrenees livestock those, mix those, or something. Those livestock dogs are really cool. Yeah, they are. You've seen all the videos of them. These things, they do their job. Yeah, I mean, they, just, they, just, they just sit there and scare everything off. They, no, they, they, they bond with like the goats and, and whatever other animals you have. And then, but when there's like coyotes or yeah. wolves or whatever it is, yeah. they're, they're on guard. Oh yeah, it's great. At three o'clock in the morning when the dogs start barking, yeah, yeah. that's just great. <laughs> but those it's... livestock dogs, I've, I've watched a million livestock dog videos. Yeah, they're very cool. They, they do their job. Well, they're not, and they're not pets. And so- They're not pets in the sense that they're, they're, they live outside. Yeah, and so it's, I always thought that we could have a couple outside dogs. My wife is more like, no, we gotta bring them in. Like, oh. So I, that's not a battle I'm going to want to fight, but no, you're right. They are cool dogs. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a short break. We're going to come back. We have a market measure. It's uh, 9.06 on, what is the 25th? Looking for a better broker and a bonus? Sweet. We got you. Right now, you can get a bonus of up to $4,000 when you open and fund a Tasty Trade account. Plus, low rates, smart tech with the analysis tools you need, and award winning support. So, get a broker who's actually got your back. And up to $4,000 at Tasty Trade. Make your move, genius. Tasty Trade. Take your swim will always be my baby, but this one, it's different. We built ours literally from scratch. It's a much thinner, it's a faster, it's a slicker application. Everything's on one page. So you're always looking at the core page and then bouncing around from there to get to whatever you wanna to get to. We're here to support whatever you're looking to do. We have the tools that you need to be a successful trader. When somebody says tape action, what do you think of? To me, tape action is a little bit of a historical term because that's how they used to relay the different information for all the different underlines that you could trade. They would share like the price, the volume. So it'd be a way for people to kind of get a gauge for different markets. But now I just kind of think of it as that little line of information on your screen when you're watching your financial news outlets and seeing what all the different products are currently trading for. What's a Johnny trader? 
A Johnny Trader is uh, defined as Nick Batista and myself. We are smaller traders, smaller accounts, mid-sized accounts where we can't sling anything we want. We can't do multiple contracts of anything we want. We are really defined to specific parameters in uh, trading in a small way. So a Johnny Trader is just someone that might be doing one lots, one contract here and there, or trading smaller price products. If you have any questions, feel free to toss them in the chat. I think I've always been interested in finance. I have a degree in management and I had took a lot of heavy finance classes and I've always loved it, but I've always done passive investing. And so as I went through life, uh, I decided that I needed to have a bit more control over my finances. I started to dabble in the options world when I opened up a brokerage account in probably four different companies and none of them worked really well in terms of education until I got to Tasty. You know, Tasty Live in particular because of the educational background that they tie in every single day on how to learn how to trade options. It started with the Where Do I Start series. Uh, it's outstanding. Tasty Bites, market measures, from theory to practice. I, I don't think there's a show that I don't like, to be honest. You know, that education piece is highly important. I found that Tasty offered that. Today's episode of Market Measures is brought to you by SIBO. SIBO is partnering with Tasty Live to provide educational opportunities for traders at all levels. Did you know, index options like these can provide opportunities for diversification, lower volatility, liquidity, and other benefits. To continue your education on some of the mechanics learned in today's market measures, check out SIBO's Retail Trader Suite at www.sibo.com slash minis. Hello, everyone. We are back, and it is time for a little market measure. I'm Tom Sosnoff. He's Tom Preston. In the house today. What do you think, do you think about the new studios? It's I, brighter. I like it. I like it. You know, it's it's brighter. Mm -hmm. I know it was a lot of work with the uh, for the production team to get this up and running. They did a great job. Um, but yeah, the lighting I think is great. The background colors are are really cool. I think they did a nice job with it. Um, it's real fake bricks behind me, not some sort of green screen effect. <laughs> um, no, I think it's very cool, very cool. And that over there looks like 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 a stack of amplifiers you might see at a concert or something. Yeah, it has a kind of a kind of a stagey rock stagey feel. And you cannot eat the cherries, just so you know. Yeah, I saw those over there. Are they in formaldehyde or something? No. No, they're actually... Are they actually like like uh, industrial-sized jars of cherries? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, they're legit. Well, if there's enough sugar in there, they'll yeah. never go bad. No, 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 no. It's bomb shelter stuff. It's prepper stuff. Oh, nice. Yeah. They're... So, like, you could survive, like, for yeah. a year and a half on those cherries in here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because well, you yourself... Well, when we get... You lock the door. Yeah. You eat the cherries. When this becomes, like, you know, the old diehard, the Nakatomi Tower thing, you know... You know, when, when Hans locks us in here, we have nowhere to go, and we're trapped in the in the tasty, you know, high rise. Um, we can all live off the cherries. Now I have a machine gun. Ho ho ho! Yes, yes, yes. Um, Is he alive, by the way? What no. was that guy's name? Hans Gruber. No, I know. I <laughs> the actor. What was his name? What? This British um, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why anyway, can't... he's dead. Yes. Oh, gee. See, all that stuff makes me feel old. Anyway. Uh, Wolfgang. No, not Wolfgang. He was a British guy. Uh, 
What a great villain. Hans Gruber was like, how can I remember that? It's like 40 yeah, it's years. Great. It was great a great villain. movie. Great villain. Um, Alan Rickman. Yeah, Alan Rickman. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. I'm not a movie guy. Yeah. And he, um, great villain. And no, he died a couple years ago. I'm, I'm starting to forget stuff more easily now. Really? Yeah, I'm getting old. How old are you? Like, name. I'm, I'll, I'll be 60 this year. You'll be 60. But, um, yeah, like, you know, like, kids' names. People's names. Your own kids? Mm, no, nah, mostly no, but, you, you know, like, their kids? friends and stuff. Do you remember like, your kids' birthdays? Yeah. Um, yes. Okay, that's pretty good. Yeah. You're not obligated to remember your dog's birthdays, just so you know. Well, well those are made up anyway. I know. So you're not obligated. So we celebrate the dog's birthday on my birthday. <laughs> so it's like, hey, you know, we like make a big pile of meat. Eat has your meat. wife, has your wife named any of the dogs Tom yet? <laughs> because that is the Not ultimate yet. cruel trick. <laughs> yeah. Not yet. Not yet. She has ample opportunity to yell at me all day long. No, we, she doesn't need a dog named me to exercise her aggression. We had a friend whose kids and wife named their dog. His name was Bob. <laughs> and they named their dog Bob. And so, like, he was just spent half, like, 10 years of his life confused as to who they were calling. Bob, want a treat? <laughs> yeah, <Bob>. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I had a great dog named Bob the dog, but. Um, he's in doggy heaven. He's now. in all dogs go to heaven. Yeah. All good dogs go to heaven. Um, all right, let's do it. It's 9 15. Um, ba -ba -ba -bum. Ba -ba -ba -bum. Can you turn on the screen here when you also get a chance, John? The big screen? Um, so. This is a heavy market measure. Yeah, yeah. We, Anton wanted to start the day off with a little discussion about correlations because he knew that the research team was working on a piece about correlations. And, and you know, I, I get confused. I shouldn't say get confused, but, but correlations to me is something like I really didn't figure it out until later in life like I didn't I don't get this whole you know because everything we do is so highly correlated like Coral, people get confused with the correlations betas um oh yeah yeah you know yeah. things like that no I'm talking about as an investment oh, very investments yeah investments like I realized you know every I don't really own very much real estate but everything I own is in Chicago you know, like it's yeah. all it's all highly correlated, and I don't. You know, like everything I have is highly correlated, um, and it's just kind of weird. I don't. You know, like we don't we don't realize how much kind of correlation risk we take, and all of a sudden, you know, I start thinking about um, these all these studies on correlation. I'm thinking, hey, you know what? Maybe I missed something along the way. But anyway, yeah, we always learn learn something new every day. Asset correlation during market corrections. I totally feel like this piece is, is unnecessary because there are never market corrections. I mean- I've heard of them. I've heard of them, right. I've heard of them too. They, they used to happen back in the like 80s and 90s and 2000s, but we haven't had a market correction for so long. I forgot what one is like. Yeah. So, but this is a piece called- If, if a correction were to happen. Yes. Um, let's take a look. We often say that equities tend to move in the same direction during market corrections, implying that the correlation between assets strengthens when the market declines. But does historical data support this observation? Is a question. Hmm. Does so, um, what do you think? I'm gonna wait for the data. I, I know, but this is not a show about waiting for the data. This is a show about yeah, saying, saying, and seeing saying if, what you seeing think. if the data actually confirms And then my trying to prove you wrong and saying, I oh, think, dummy. Yeah, I, so in, when the market declines, yes, I think everything goes down. In other words, there's no, there are no shining lights in, uh, in a crash. So in, an, in, an, in a correction, when the market is selling off and people are pulling money out of the market and in everything – converting into cash that yeah i would say that the correlation increases on down moves more than it is on up moves that's what we've been saying all along for years let's okay well i didn't know you've been saying that i mean we've been I guess saying it on this common... network forever 
On the way down, common everything name, goes to one. On the way knowledge. up, common knowledge. But again, I we could be wrong. On the way up, it's think of it like a breaststroke. On the way up, yeah. On the way down, oh, wax on, wax off. That's right. Let's go to the next slide. For example, the long-term average correlation between Nvidia and the SPY is 0.56, which is considered a moderate positive correlation. Do we see a higher correlation reading when the broad market panics? And that is a question. Let's go to the next slide. So 56 correlation is the benchmark, okay? Well, this, yeah. Well, no, but that's to compare, to compare it to. A simplified way to find market correlation, market, to find the market correction is to examine the VIX level. If our assumption was true, we would see an increased positive correlation between NVIDIA SPY when the VIX is significantly higher. I, I wonder if I wonder if it, Nvidia just being Nvidia now is so much different. But let's see. <laughs> yes, let's go to the next slide. So we do observe an increase in correlation between the SPY and Nvidia during some of the largest downside movements of the past decade. Um, and you can see here, obviously, you know, again, I'm not sure Nvidia is the greatest judge of this, only because Nvidia has been a different animal in the last year or so. But but it's a good test for the for the premise. It's a good if, test for the premise. If yes. Nvidia shows any any of this, it would suggest it's true for everything. So I want to make sure people understand what they're looking at here. Down below is the level of the VIX. The red is the actual VIX. The green line is the correlation between the SPY and NVIDIA. It's not the price of the SPY or NVIDIA's price. So it's VIX is in the red, green is the correlation. The peaks of the correlation tend to happen during peaks of the, the VIX. So in other words, when the VIX goes up, um, the correlations are a little bit higher. That's not in every case because you see some, you know, smaller spikes in VIX and the correlation doesn't necessarily increase. But it is true. The other important thing to realize is that we're not doing the standard sort of Yahoo Finance idea of market corrections down 10%, blah, blah, blah. No. We look at the actual VIX. We look for confirmation in the VIX. When the VIX spikes up after the market sells off, that is a good confirmation of a correction. So in this case, not every time, but in many times we see the spikes in the correlation occur in relatively high VIX. So yes, in this example. Let's go to the next slide. On the downside, the correlation increases. We also found that the average correlation number also increases when testing when the testing VIX level is higher. This confirms that these two assets have a tendency to move together when the VIX is greater. So you can see here NVIDIA spy correlation and goes up and up and up as the VIX level goes higher and higher, even though there's not that many VIX levels. I've never seen this before. This is very cool. Yeah, well, we're only doing NVIDIA spy here, but yes. Let's go to the next slide. Next, we expand the study to multiple random underlyings across different sectors. So we looked at Love, EEM, Apple, XLE, and Costco. Okay, just Can't to get more random than that. That is very random. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. And here we go. We're going to expand the VIX levels from 20% to 30% to 40%. And you can see in every one of these cases, the correlation to the SPY moves significantly higher no matter what the business is. So you think it's a consumer non-durable, it's an industrial, it's a biotech, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. When we go up, when we go up, the um, correlations go down and everything spreads out. Mm -hmm. When we go down, the correlations all contract towards closest to one. Yep. And it's just the nature of sell everything versus buy whatever you like get just get me out right yeah yeah get me out is very different than a stock picker's market yeah like yeah. this this is a stock picker's market people are buying um they're buying nvidia they're selling apple because pick it because they figure no matter what stock they pick it's going to be right so sure i'll pick that one or that one it's, anyway, this is a very interesting slide. I've never seen this data before. It just confirms our belief. Yeah, I mean. This is very cool. Yeah. 
yeah, it's a it's a it's it's an aggressive approach. Look at this Bitcoin right now. I'm just taking a look, but um, it's up five thousand five hundred, which has pushed Coinbase up twenty four dollars. Yikes. Twenty four dollars to almost back to a new high. Crazy move. Um, impressive. It sure is. Um, let's go. Perfect. So assets tend to move in the same direction when the market is falling significantly. Thus, portfolio diversification and hedging might become less effective when volatility is elevated. Reducing portfolio allocation can be an effective strategy to reduce potential risks. So again, we, we learned here, assets move in the same direction when the market's falling. Everything goes to one. Yep. And, you know, um, when you are, the general practice should be always to diversify, but you diversify by strategy, diversify by duration, diversify by underlying. But still, as volatility moves higher, it's painful no matter what. Yeah. There's nothing yeah. you can do Unless you're because right the market's in crash mode at that point. Yeah. Or it's it's heading down. And then how do you adjust for that? You just get smaller. Stay small. Stay small, get smaller. All right. Perfect. We're coming back in two seconds with Scott. He's been away for a week. He's got a lot to talk about. <laughs> Looking for a better broker and a bonus? Sweet. We got you. Right now, you can get a bonus of up to $4,000 when you open and fund a Tasty Trade account. Plus, low rates, smart tech with the analysis tools you need, and award winning support. So, get a broker who's actually got your back. And up to $4,000 at Tasty Trade. Make your move, genius. Tasty Trade. Take your swim will always be my baby, but this one, it's different. We built ours literally from scratch. It's a much thinner, it's a faster, it's a slicker application. Everything's on one page. So you're always looking at the core page and then bouncing around from there to get to whatever you wanna to get to. We're here to support whatever you're looking to do. We have the tools that you need to be a successful trader. When somebody says tape action, what do you think of? To me, tape action is a little bit of a historical term because that's how they used to relay the different information for all the different underlyings that you could trade. They would share like the price, the volume. So it'd be a way for people to kind of get a gauge for different markets. But now I just kind of think of it as that little line of information on your screen when you're watching your financial news outlets and seeing what all the different products are currently trading for. What's a Johnny trader? A Johnny Trader is uh, defined as Nick Batista and myself. We are smaller traders, smaller accounts, mid-sized accounts where we can't sling anything we want. We can't do multiple contracts of anything we want. We are really defined to specific parameters in uh, trading in a small way. So a Johnny Trader is just someone that might be doing one lots, one contract here and there, or trading smaller price products. any questions feel free to toss them in the chat I think I've always been interested in finance. I have a degree in management and I had took a lot of heavy finance classes and I've always loved it, but I've always done passive investing. And so as I went through life, uh, 
I decided that I needed to have a bit more control over my finances. I started to dabble in the options world when I opened up a brokerage account in probably four different companies, and none of them worked really well in terms of education until I got to Tasty, you know, and Tasty Live in particular because of the educational background that they tie in every single, every single day on how to learn how to trade options. It started with the Where Do I Start series. Uh, it's outstanding. Tasty Bites, market measures, from theory to practice. I, I don't think there's a show that I don't like, to be honest. You know, that education piece is highly important. I found that Tasty offered that. Today's episode of Market Measures is brought to you by SIBO. SIBO is partnering with Tasty Live to provide educational opportunities for traders at all levels. Did you know index options like these can provide opportunities for diversification, lower volatility, liquidity, and other benefits? To continue your education on some of the mechanics learned in today's market measures, check out SIBO's Retail Trader Suite at www.sibo.com slash minis. Looking for a better broker and a bonus? Sweet. We got you. Right now, you can get a bonus of up to $4,000 when you open and fund a Tasty Trade account. Plus, low rates, smart tech with the analysis tools you need, and award winning support. So, get a broker who's actually got your back. And up to $4,000 at Tasty Trade. Make your move, genius. Tasty Trade. Hello, everybody. We are back. I'm here with Tom Preston, who's sitting in for the bat this week. It's going to be a fun week. It's a short one. Get your helmet on. Not making any money yet, but it's going to be a fun week. <laughs> and Scott Sheridan, finally back from his six-month vacation. Oh. <laughs> More days off for Scott. <laughs> exactly. It CTP, nice. you, can appreciate, you can appreciate that. I will say I need more days off. It was amazing. Happy to go away. Happy to come home. My mom used to say that it's great to go away. Always better to come home. So nice, nice to be back. Uh, but really, really great trip. So I think I will say what was odd. This is the first time in forever. I haven't watched. I miss all the games, the NCAA, and I love this tournament. And I now I can't get into it because I just haven't watched any games. So I tried watching a couple yesterday. I'm like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> It's oh, been, it's been there has been a couple, so far. there's been a couple of good games. There's been a lot of blowouts. Yesterday, there was a lot of blowouts. Yeah. Yeah, way past okay. the point spreads. And I don't even follow this stuff, but Baylor lost. That was a massive loss last night. Yeah, the Illinois looks good, though. Good. They got a good you know, team. So I was watching Connecticut. They're good. They're good. Um, there's some other teams that look like they're pretty good, but it's just so funny because I know we've talked about this. At this level, you watch these guys as good as they are, and then you watch the worst NBA team. They would destroy these guys. I know. So college basketball but, but destroy. So college basketball is so a, is so bad now. It's, it's like it's it looks like high school basketball to me. Yeah. Okay. Question: Is it Edie? Who's the big guy for Purdue? Edie. You're buyer or seller in the NBA? Oh, he he. he I'm a buyer. He's seven four. Are you? He's got nice footwork. He can block shots. He's intense. I like him. He just seems like he's slow. I will say, I don't know who the kid is on Connecticut. He's a monster. He's a man. Kid, I'm a buyer of that. I'm a buyer of that guy. Yeah. He just looked like he put his paw up. He just put his paw up and said, <laughs> Not in my house. Yeah, yeah. He he's there's there's a bunch of kids. The kid on Illinois is great. The you know, the their forward. Um and there's there's a bunch of kids that are really good. I don't know who the first pick in the draft is. I don't know, but I was watching a little bit of San Diego State game. I think Lede, Lede, Lede. Yeah, he's that good too. Can ball. Yeah, he can. He can. He, he can. can ball. Yeah. So I mean, when it's he looked like a man amongst kids. So, yeah. Anyway. It was I mean, so now here's my my next important question, my pest question. I know we went through this. What was your cuisine? I think you said Mexican food, which I called complete BS on. If you could only have one type of food, because I have to say the food in Paris, I would weigh about 800 pounds. I, I, I love there. I love the food. I love French food. You know, I'm a huge fan of French food. I love French food. Yeah, They invented cream. But, 
Yeah, they're butter. Right. See, TP, it's right up here. Like cream, salt, and butter. Yeah, like, they invented it. You, you, just, <laughs> you just go down the list, and then they invented more of it. Like, I had some chicken with morel mushrooms in a cream sauce. I, I could just eat it, like, every meal. I don't think I'd ever get tired of it. It's just amazing. Shouts out to the French. Yeah. Sorry, Tony. You if you're listening, back if you're listening all- Tony. All smitten. All morelled up. All morelled up. Right? <laughs> well, you gotta live the life when you're when you're there. Do you yeah, any, don't do you don't any, don't be trying to give Scott any button mushrooms anymore. Did you have any good did you have good food in London or not? Great food. Did you I have fish and chips? If, uh, TP, I did. The place next door to where we were staying is really cool. It was a food hall. It was a church. Oh. Somebody's definitely going to hell. Somebody's going to hell for this one. <laughs> we walked in, and it's literally, legitimately a church. They turn into a food hall. That has to violate some rules. <laughs> anyway, right next door to it, it had award-winning fish and chips. I'm like, well, I'm getting that. It was amazing. It was probably the best really? fish and chips I've ever had. That's great. But Lila, if you need in any city, you need food recommendations, go to my daughter. I told her. She's got car plot. She's like, you don't want to look at the menus? I'm like, nope. I know the way you eat. If it's good enough for you, now this was a vegan, a gluten-free vegan, up until a couple of years ago. Still eat anything now. Anything. Remember with Borough Market, the place we went yeah, for yeah, the yeah. Sunday roast. Yeah. Okay. So Borough Market, when we were there last time, which was uh, eleven years ago, we went there and they had this giant. Eleven it was years like ago. A mass- we were just there a couple of years. We were there like two years ago. No, but as. as as a family, you don't count. This is oh, personal. Oh, okay. As a family, we were there. So they had this giant, I know I've been there a lot since then, but I didn't, when we were at Borough Market, I didn't see this. If you remember the paella. Yeah, giant, the giant, giant bowl of paella. Yes. Yes. So that used to be duck confit sandwich. Well, I said to Lila, she found it. She's like, they still have it, but it's on the side. So we go and we get the duck confit, but she was late getting there. She texts me. She says, you're going to love this. Now, remember, gluten-free vegan. Yeah. She looks at me. She's like, Dad, would you split the pulled pork sandwich with truffle and something else on it? And I texted her back, who are you? I said, of course, I'll split this with you. So this is my daughter. Did you cry, Scott? Pork- Scott, did you yes, cry a little bit? Me. Yeah, but how was the, the, ba- yes. the baby's coming home? the duck confit? The duck is amazing. The pulled pork is amazing. I mean, lines, you got to wait in line. I mean, yeah, the they, line, the last time I was there, the line was so long. I was like, I'm not waiting in this stupid line. It's worth it. So anyway, when you travel, just pick a city with because feet. now she's going to be all over here. Duck with feet. Yeah, but the line was- will give you the- Confit. I wanted that paella. That's, that's French too, by the I way. I wanted that paella. The line yeah. was like an hour long. I was like, I'm not waiting on that. The one. line for the paella was really long. I know. It was, I will say. The paella line is over there. <laughs> the paella line was that long. Line, that line down the street, that's the paella line. The duck confit line was long. I, I couldn't get anything. The only thing, place there wasn't a line, because last time I was there, I was there with my wife, it was at the gluten-free bakery. And it was like, okay. you know, <laughs> right. right. And I'm like, <laughs> what's the point? And she's gluten-free, so she's like, oh, this is great. I'm like, for you? Like, I'm not eating this so, stuff. Had great Jap- had great Japanese food. Uh, went to some steakhouse that was excellent. Good Italian. And then in Paris, ate at, it's like a, some world famous falafel place in Paris. It was great. Nice. We, had, we had lunch. It was great. But food, yeah, food was excellent. But I, I was thinking about it. going to send you a picture of the pulled pork sandwich. You'd be like, you don't need pulled pork. I, I don't, I, I got to tell you, I love pork. I had a pork chop on Friday night. Mm-hmm. But oh, here it comes. You're not a pulled pork fan? I'm not. Pulled pork just doesn't do it for me. I like a pulled pork. You, it's easy to cook pulled Thanks, pork, Thanks, DP. I like a pulled pork. Do you make your own? It's fairly easy. Yeah, I mean, it's not. A pork that, That's how you start out. That's how you start out smoking. Yeah, when you're, because when you're an amateur smoker. Because it's yeah, yeah. manageable. You oh, get a lot of room for See, error. PP, an amateur glad smoker. To know, glad to know that you're not. You're not removed from being attacked. So he just called you the amateur smoker. No, 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 oh, no, 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 no. I'm saying when you're an amateur smoker like you, you will. Um, <laughs> no, pulled pork is delicious. So start, with, pulled you pork. start with pulled pork. It's like the Johnny. It's the Johnny. But you can't mess up pulled pork. Yeah, I mean, it, it takes you, you years shred? to get brisket. With your hands. 
Oh, you do? Yeah, yeah you, you just grab it. You if it's Pull hot. out the bone. Yeah, pull you, out the bone you have the, you have the big, heavy gloves. That's, for, that's right up your alley, getting your hands in I the know, bowl. but it's not, it doesn't <laughs> do anything. You'd be anything all over that. that. <laughs> no, I think it's delicious. I think it's delicious. And um, no, Scott, I'm with you. Nice pulled pork. Mm, mm, delicious. Mm. It just doesn't yeah, do it for duck me. Okay, fine. More for, more for Scott and me. I'm going to tell you, Tom, the next time you're in London, you're going to have to take a car over to Borough Market. They only do it Friday, Saturday, Sunday, so that's going to be an issue for you. Um, but totally worth the trip. Uh, totally worth it. Last time I was there, I was kind of disappointed. Yeah, um, I was kind of disappointed. You haven't had, you haven't had the duck confit. It's won <laughs> numerous awards. I'll send it to you. <laughs> You know, or it's funny. I'll I've had plenty home. of duck confit, duck with feet. And, um, you know, I mean, considering we did own the website, duck with feet. Didn't didn't pay off, though, did it? Didn't pay off. I wanted, <laughs> no. I wanted to name our last trading platform duck with duck feet. Duck with feet. Speaking of which, I've been gone for a week. Any update on the names? I heard Itchy and Scratchy were still in the running. No, they're not. What are you trying to name? What I heard. The studio. No. Exactly, exactly the studio's. Tom's had the names for. I will tell. Months. I'll tell TP before he leaves. Oh, <laughs> like like you're gonna tell Beth? <clears throat> oh no no she's she can't keep her mouth shut. She's a she is doesn't know how to. She's a tell okay. Beth. Here. Tell she's, Beth. She's, tell the world. She doesn't have a lock. Wait. She doesn't have a lock. Tell Neither Beth. Tell the world. She doesn't have a lock. Neither yeah. of them are here right now. Who's worse, Beth or Tony? Oh. They're they're cut from they're separated at birth, cut from the same cloth. They <laughs> they are totally the same. You tell Beth something, and then Tony knows immediately. You tell Tony something, and Beth knows immediately. <laughs> they got like a little pact going, and they just tell each other everything. It's like they're two yentas. So I don't I don't I can't tell either of them anything anymore. Those two are the worst two at the entire firm when it comes to telling them something. Oof. Yeah, Oof. and they're both gonna and they're both gonna be like Tony's like I'm a vault, and Beth's like I'm a vault, and they're neither of them are. They tell everything. They're 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 a vault with an open door. Yeah, they are. They are. All right. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, are we ready for some business? So so what what else is going on? That's it. That's your whole that's your whole week. That was pretty good. I will. I mean, say, you were there in a week where there was a lot of drama in in the UK. Okay, I don't want to take heat for this. I know I'm going to get bad emails about this. I'm calling. You're calling bullshit? It's not. Yes. <laughs> yes, I am. You're saying yes. there's no I cancer. To, I didn't want to say, no, I'm calling complete. Can we say that on air? Yes. Yeah, you can say it. I'm calling complete. Okay. Really? You're going out of the limb. The that maybe there's some they found something in her past that invalidates the royal marriage. No, I think he's off with somebody else, oh. and they're figuring out a way. To, they're figuring out a way to walk Pump her off. The so they inject yeah. her with some so, cancer cells. I would think that the well, British public has to like she, her better than him. Who knows? I think you'd like anybody better than him and the dad. I mean, those are two of the least personal people. Like. Like you, Charles. Like, if you want to like him, I don't know how you can. He's got no personality. Yeah, and I think William is there. I personally, I put Harry in the job. He's got a great attitude. I like Harry. He'd be good for the people. Yeah, Yeah, he'd be good for the people. I mean, I'm not a royal. You like, I'm not like those people. If you're a royal follower, you're a royal, all right. But you're a royal (laughs) Sheraton. Okay. (laughs) Anyway, yeah, I wasn't going to go there, but and I'm going to get some hate email about this. I'm just something's not right. Came, it came a little a quickly, shop, didn't it? Okay. Came that, a little yeah. quickly. That's a fair, um, you know, that that's fair. What kind of cancer is it? I mean. What do they say uh, she has? Something stomach cancer. Abdom- abdom- abdominal. Something abdominal. I have a stomach. Yeah, see, that's they just didn't say something, it. something said. abdominal. They didn't say it. She said it. Different. Okay. She not, said it. They. She had abdominal surgery. Listen, I wish her well. Don't wish badly on anybody. I'm just not buying the story. Okay. We'll leave it. Wow, a shirt and so so I can't say that they landed the plane in the Hudson River intentionally, but you can say <laughs> that, which you can say she's wait, faking wait, cancer. Now, that's a double standard. Wait a minute. 
But she's wait a minute. That's the double stare. What? Wait a minute. Was that U.S. Air? What? What? what, what yeah, U.S. Air. Yeah. You think they did that intentionally? Hundred percent. It went reason. very smoothly. Went very smoothly. It was planned. For wait, for what reason? Who would plan to land? Hero on stuff. Earth? Hero stuff. Hero stuff. All right. Yeah. Didn't I didn't know. I'm not awesome. going there. So, what was the guy's name? What was that captain? Sully. Sully. Sullenberg or Sully. Yeah, Sully. <laughs> right, right, Sully. Leader of the bird. Tom Tom Hanks played him. I mean, you're going way yeah, further out of a limb. You're going way out of a limb with this cancer thing. Yeah, I know. I'm going to catch some heat for it, but it <clears throat> doesn't make sense to me. Like, again, you're going to be put on the terrorist watch list. Yeah, you might not I be able to go not. back to I'd, London. I'd, I'd, I'd you like might not be able to get back, back into out. America. I'm wishing her well. Whatever's going on, I wish oh, her sure. well. But yeah. I just... Something intriguing something possibility. Okay. Like... We'll leave, we'll leave it at that. How was your week while I was away? I will say, I wasn't going to say this, but I will say this. <clears throat> I got some emails. Oh, God. About some not nice things that you were saying about me. About and you? My answer, yeah. <clears throat> my answer just categorically is the worse that the comments are, the more he misses me. I don't even know if we talked about you last week. Because well, see, that's the thing. It just rolls off your tongue. Like, you don't even realize when you're saying it. No, there were comments. I, I'm not going to rehash I don't. Them, okay? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember saying anything. I mean, I did say that you rented an Airbnb in Buckingham Palace, which I thought was cute. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. I thought, it was, I thought you were saying Buckingham Palace. Why would Scott stay yeah, in Buckingham TP Palace? TP thought it was real. Yeah, I did. I yeah. Think, why not? They need money. Yeah. They need oh, money to pay for the cancer would, treatments. So it's like, why wouldn't they would, sell Airbnb? That, that. My question is, Scott Shard would never stay in Buckingham Palace. Why would that? It's like. No, he would. He would it's like sure. 800 oh, years old. 100%. 100%. He would for sure. I would do that. See, that's a good experience. I'm an experienced person, TP. You know that. So just for the experience, we did do. But they don't. When we were there long years ago, we went to the Churchill War Room, which is fascinating. If you've never done it, it's really, really cool. Great piece of history. Wow. I don't know how much this cost, so it was just part of like a whole thing we did. We somehow were behind the glass. Like everybody where, was where were you? The Churchill Museum. In the Churchill War Room. So I have pictures. I'm sitting in Churchill's seat behind the glass. And people are pointing, going like, like, like how did they get back there? <laughs> okay. So we're down in the area, like the in you know, down where there his bed was underneath, you know, below ground. But we were sitting in the Churchill. I have a picture, I'll send it to you. It's great. And people, the best part was people are like, how did they get back there? Who are those people? So there you go. I'd stay. I'd stay in Buckingham Palace. Bravo. Next time you want to go, you want to go to Churchill Warham. I'll make the connect. You could go sit in Churchill's seat. It's really cool. I don't remember. I think he wore his ring on his right hand, and the chair is all dug out from his ring. They still have everything there. They just locked. They just. It's all there. The yeah. maps, everything was just preserved. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. yeah. So got that going for me. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, see, you gotta have something. Okay, it's not bad. Yeah. All right, should we go? To, should we go to some business? Sure. Oh, that was not like TP. Could you be a little more excited? I've been waiting for this for months, Scott. TP, thank you. That's what I'm looking for. This, All right. this is why people tune in. It's almost unfair. It Say really it. is it, that we have him it, and everybody else doesn't. <laughs> oh, by the God, way, please be gentle. By the way, before I get to this, did you see? Did you guys happen to watch Tom? It would have been on an airplane because I know you don't watch movies anywhere else. DP, maybe you've seen it. Did you watch Dumb Money? Which no, one? I didn't see it yet. Which one? Dumb Money about no, GameStop. No. no, how was it? Well, I was trying to be objective, but having lived the life. Yeah. And understanding what really went on. I'm not speaking on behalf of I know. There's no way, there's no way you're going to Yeah. I just, I mean, I will say they made, what's the guy's name from Melvin Capital? Um, whatever that guy's name was. They made him look like a complete idiot. 
They made Ken Griffin look not great, but um, eh, you know, it's, it's funny to me because you take the herd mentality and <clears throat> there's a lot of things I will say about GameStop that it was ridiculous, but I love GameStop for one reason. I love what happened for one reason because I, you know, how many times have people told you, oh, that can never happen. That can never happen. You can never say it can't happen because GameStop happens. Yeah. But again, because most people don't understand, they did make a comment about a $3 billion call at NSCC, which Vlad was like, we don't have $3 billion. So he was trying to figure out what to do. And in fairness, Apex had a similar issue. So the problem was that the system worked the way the system was supposed to work. The problem is the system needs to be changed. We'll leave it at that. So I wouldn't watch it, but I had, I had time, so I did. We'll leave it. Okay. Here we go. Top 15 symbols going through the system. First, 40 minutes of the day, no broad-based indices or futures time for you. Number 15, Nike at an 11. For everybody else, NVIDIA at a 59, AMD at a 63. Tesla at a 58, <clears throat> Apple at a 45, Boeing at a 68, MU at a 28, Intel at a 63, Meta at a 66, ARM at a 26, Coin at a 62, SMCI at an 82, Microsoft at a 29, XLE at a 4, Lulu at a 25 and number 15 for Tom, Nike at an 11, rounding out the next 10. Google is at a 61, BITO at a 75, MSTR at an 81, Google Mail at a 61, TQQQ at a 41, Netflix at a 70, and Amazon at a 32. There is one other place that we went to that I will tell you, if you do happen <clears throat> went to go to London and take the train to Paris, I'll get the name of it. It's I think it translates to arts and crafts, but it has nothing really to do with arts and crafts. It's inventions. It's basically an invention uh, museum. And <clears throat> Levi really wanted to go. They have the machine, <clears throat> the first machine, I don't remember what it's called, from the 1800s that allowed them to make the pieces that they needed to make the other machines. So when you look at a machine, you go, yeah. that's cool. And Levi's like, like, think about it. But they had to make the machine to make the pieces to make the machine. So <clears throat> and you look at a lot of the stuff from the 1800s, you go, damn, they were really smart. Like, really, really smart. So speaking of that, did you guys see that movie Oppenheimer? I didn't see it. Yes, that was excellent. Oh, I did watch Barbie. I did I not Barbie like was good it. Too. I did not like it. You didn't it. like Oppenheimer? Because really? they didn't, I don't think they captured just how freaking smart those guys actually were. In other words, you take anybody else, it's like, you know, quantum physics. Oh, geez, I could never figure that out. You take your average physicist today who's, like, reading the stuff that they created. They made that stuff up, right? They collected the smartest physicists in the world. You know, you think you know somebody who's pretty smart. They're never, not even close to that league of genius. Those guys were not so freaking smart. <laughs> And they didn't quite they didn't quite capture how impossible what they how impossible it was what the, it was that they actually did. Well, it was already a three hour plus movie, I think. I mean, you know, they could have cut point. out the nude scenes. TP <laughs> coming from you. That's a strong statement. It is. <laughs> that's why okay. I feel yeah. so. You know, I don't know, moved by this. It's like cut out the nude scenes, show a little bit more of the whatevers. Anyway, cut that, out I didn't I didn't scenes. realize oh it. Oh my god, you've reached that age. I know. Yeah. My that's wife bad. loved and it. I'm Everybody I'm loves Oppenheimer. I'm hey, so it's like, yeah, okay. I'm a little depressed now. Okay. <laughs> I'm a little when depressed. When you come too. up with like if Tony came and said that, and you and you were both sitting there, I go, I think that might be a mic drop. Something's wrong with that, the world. Something, something it, is askew in the in the balance of the world. Very, By the way, I we actually I went up to Los Alamos. We're out in Santa Fe, so we drove up to Los Alamos. It is a a heart stopping drive for a non native. A heart stopping drive up to Los Alamos, but it's pretty cool. There's a huge nuclear complex up there huge scientific stuff still what, would you what's heart, what, what's if you're not native what's the heart stopping part you're, you're going up a, the side of a cliff yeah but what is there to see hey, you're going up the side of a cliff and the only thing i could think of scott the only thing thing i could think of driving off the cliff. is in 1943 it was out in the middle of nowhere and you could have seen a nazi spy coming from 20 miles away <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and there was only one way to get it, and the Nazi spy would have had to go up that road. And there was no other way to That's, get there. Is it there's this, still active? What's that? Is it still active? They have a helipad there. They have a big, yeah, it's this big research facility. There's a town up there. I've been there. There's a town up on Los Alamos. No, you have not. Yes. We were in Sant, we were driving from. Santa Fe. Yeah, we're driving outside from, of Santa Fe. Yeah, it was just outside of Santa Fe. We were driving from, um, we flew into Albuquerque. We, I forgot where I was going. I was going to Santa Fe, but we went through. I am a giant seller this entire story. No, no, no. We were there. I was there. There's nothing there. If I remember, there's nothing there to see. No, there's, there's a lot there. To see? Well, it's not like you can go in and go behind the glass right, like Scott did. By. They're not going to let you go. Here, what's I, this I, button do? I know. There's nothing there to see, though. Just trying yeah, But by. it's just the idea you're in Los yeah. Alamos. Yeah, right. We had, Chinese, we had Chinese food in Los Alamos. Let's put it that way. You stopped for Chinese food in Los yeah, Alamos. Yeah, it was a little Chinese. My kids were yeah. hungry, so you know. Yeah. Yeah. Chinese. I had Tex-Mex. I remember stopping there. There's no it was actually pretty good. There. It was a Chinese buffet. I'm, <laughs> I'm believing, TP. No, 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 no. There's I no, did. I'm we drove by. Because, Scott, the only who, thing that makes it who, who, believable who is I think... In other words, you can go, there's a route from Albuquerque to Santa Fe. Yeah, I'm telling you. It passes you. through yeah. Los Alamos. It's not the right route. Well, you didn't go up. Nobody you does that. Up. You might have just went by. No, I didn't go up the mountain. I just drove by, drove yeah. through town. Well, you have to, it is a, it's okay. on a mountaintop. Yeah, but I didn't do that part. See, this is why I'm Wherever thinking. the town was, I was in the town. <sighs> That's all I know. All right, TP, more importantly, did you see Barbie? Because I like Barbie. I watched it on the plane coming home. I thought it was good. Did you see Barbie? Everybody no, liked, I didn't. Everybody liked Barbie. I didn't. But maybe I'll watch it. But it's on yeah. the Southwest flight, so maybe I'll watch it in the flight back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't watch movies on flights. Well, I, I don't either, typically, but on Scott's recommendation to watch flights. Barbie. International flights, yes. Any domestic flight, no. I know, but I'm not going to watch Barbie if not on the plane. Okay, Correct. and on Scott's recommendation, that's why I watched it. I'm gonna yes. watch Barbie. Thanks, TP. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, TP. Yes, sir. In your honor, in your honor, do you have any control over what's for lunch this week while you're in town? Chicken hut. All no four one days. What? <laughs> all, four, all four days. <laughs> <laughs> And make sure, See, make TP. sure they don't say chicken hut for 20 people, but they, they get 20 chickens. We made that mistake TP. prior. You're an OG. You appreciate the hut. <laughs> you, Donnie, me, Tom, Steve, basically falls off a cliff after that. And we, chicken hut gets no respect in the office. None. <clears throat> it's terrible. I don't, I don't, yeah, and I don't understand why, because everybody likes chicken, and it's gravy, and it's warm, and it's, it, for God's sakes, the company's paying for it's it, good it's good quantity, food. and it's, it's good quantity, CTP, if I, this is what I would do for you, I'd have mm. chicken hot, I'd have Fontanos, oh yes, Fontanos, meatball subs, fried chicken, so you either go with Dave's, or, um, yeah, probably Dave's. Yeah. And then you need a pizza. Then you need a pizza. That would be your four days of lunch. Scott, so you're there. the CEO Absolutely. of Tasty Tasty Trade. I think you can make it happen. He's he's already he didn't plan ahead. He's, he's, he's yeah, planned ahead. Lost control. He's Call no, an audible. He's no saying anymore. I I I got the keys to the castle here. Oh my God. I got Tori. She's under my under my watch now. Okay. TP, I'll see what I can do. I'll Thank get the you, menu. I'll see if I can Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. I'll see if because I can do that. Because you know what? So it, it could be a very lean week for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's 100 degrees in the studio. No, it's nice now. They got the air conditioning on. I can barely. F oh, my God. You're, you're, something's wrong with you. <laughs> All right, Scott, we got to go. I like you. Goodbye. Him. Goodbye, Scott. Goodbye. All right, TP, as we wrap up here, good job. First day back. Spoo's down 10. NASDAQ down 60. Dow down 128 and Russell up 14. Nothing much there. Yeah. Um, but, 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 but big bonds down 12. Yeah, bonds are ugly. Bitcoin's up big. Nvidia's up big. Coinbase is up big. Crude up a buck 63. Up to 82.23. It is. It is. <clears throat> Hate that damn crude. Um, Gotta roll that. But, 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 that's about it. That's it. That's it for me.
We'll be back this afternoon at 2.30. Looking forward to it. Liz and Jenny in the house. They're coming up right now. Yep. Just saw them. They poked their head in. To see me, by the way. Of course. <laughs> Peace. Hey, Doc. Your tips on diet and exercise have been illuminating. I'm sure busting my ass at the gym five days a week is gonna be way quicker than just giving me the skinny shot. Sometimes it feels good to get smart. Get even smarter with live trading insights and some live taunting. Batten down the hatches, everybody. He's going on the skinny bitch diet. He's gonna be hangry. From the smart mouths at Tasty Life. Need a little more luck in your life? I'm Vanetta, and this is your first look at the spring issue of Luckbox. The latest Luckbox is all about the auto industry. And once again, your free digital subscription is available at getluckbox.com. In 2022, the U.S. auto industry sold 13.75 million vehicles, and it feels like I got stuck behind all of them this morning in traffic. And in 2023, the total value of the U.S. car and auto manufacturing market is an eye-popping $104 billion. This issue of Luckbox looks at what's ahead for the auto industry and who are the winners and the losers. EVs have hit a speed bump the last six months, dealing with slowing demand, more competition, and lagging infrastructure. What lies ahead? We also take a look at two EV titans battling for supremacy in Asia. Tesla versus BYD and US versus China. On the American side of things, baby, you can drive my car. We also take a look at GM versus Ford. Plus, we look at why hybrids are so hot, and is there a play to be made in lithium? The massive rare earth deposit is the key to powering vehicles. Will lawyers and lizards stand in the way of mining? I'm sorry, what now? We also show you the 12 hottest new cars of 2024. I hope they're bringing back the El Camino. Business in the front, party in the back. And I went to the Chicago Auto Show, and I want to know why there were adventure vehicles everywhere when people are only driving to Starbucks. And AM radio is back and more relevant than ever. Finally, for all you investors, we have 50 auto sector trade ideas. But hey, don't take my word for it. Do you want the best in life, money, and probabilities? Get your motor running and go to getluckbox.com and hit that subscribe button to get the digital edition of Luckbox Magazine for free. Make your own luck. Get Luckbox. Hey, get Luckbox. No, no. Know someone who needs a better broker? Earn $250 for each qualified person you refer to Tasty Trade. Because friends don't let friends trade on a bad platform. Terms and conditions apply. Join the club, genius. Tasty Trade. Option pricing is central to everything that you do as a trader. You want to buy options? You need to understand option pricing. You want to sell options? You need to understand option pricing. You want to understand how you can sell a put spread, have the stock actually go down, and still make money? You need to know how to interpret and apply option pricing. So for the next 45 minutes, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to focus exclusively on this one critically important area. But before we dive in, if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to add this video to your watch later playlist. That way, if you take breaks along the way, you won't have to give up on your journey just because you can't find the video in your browsing history it will be saved in that watch later playlist. But all right, without further ado, let's do it, man. Let's dive right into the option pricing crash course. Boom. Hey, Jim Schultz here with you guys for the Tasty Live Network. Excited to get into another brand new crash course right here, right now on option pricing. Now, if you've already seen some of the other crash courses that we have on the website that we have on the YouTube channel, the reality is this, a lot of what we cover in this crash course is going to be overlapped with the content in those other crash courses. But option pricing is so central. It's so fundamental to everything that we do with all of our strategies 
I really felt that a dedicated, concentrated crash course on option pricing specifically would still be very useful. And also, quick disclaimer, or maybe second disclaimer at this point, this crash course, it's not really designed for a true beginner. I am going to be skipping over some things that I'm just going to assume that you understand and that you have at least a reasonable handle on when it comes to some of the beginner beginner concepts. I would check out the full 2023 options crash course that we already have on the network, on the YouTube channel for more of a big. Mike, what does it mean to be assigned? When you are assigned, you are ultimately short an option that's in the money and the counterparty has the ability to exercise that option. So if you are assigned, it means your option against your will ultimately has turned into 100 shares of long or short stuff. What does a green scratch mean? Ooh, a green scratch refers to stubbornness getting the best of you. And when I say you, I mean me. Uh, green scratch refers to rolling a position, defending a position, and instead of just closing it for less than a uh, loss that you're seeing, or maybe a $100 loss, $50 loss, a green scratch is when you close it for maybe a five cent winner, 10 cent winner, 15 cent winner. Just the ability to see that green number on your screen and get out in a profitable way as opposed to a loss. How much does it cost you guys to do simultaneous hair flips? Years of practice. Looking for a better broker and a bonus? Sweet. Get up to $4,000 when you open and fund a Tasty Trade account. Plus, smart tech and a broker who's got your back at Tasty Trade. Make your move, genius. Tasty Trade. Welcome to the Monday edition of the Liz and Jenny Show. My name is Liz Dierkin, the beautiful brunette across from me is Jenny Andrews. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Um, an exciting day because when we walked into work today, there was a package waiting for us. <gasps> oh, we're going to jump right into it. Well, I'm going to jump into Twitter. I, I, we're gonna, can we jump right into Twitter? I love it. I love it. I love it. Because um, you know him. You love him. Woohoo! Bob on fire. Bob on fire. And Judy. And Judy. And Judy, his beautiful wife, made our day. And, okay, so I don't know if you can see this. It's a spoon rest with the Texas blue, blue bonnet flowers. Blue, blue, bell. Bell. blue, bells. blue bells. Blue bells. Blue bells. Blue bells. Blue bells. That's right. We were just, Tom's like, blue bells, isn't that an ice cream? And we had to have a discussion on what's the ice cream. Blue, bo blue bonnet. Blue. blue bonnet and blue bunny, depending if you're in the north or the south, is the ice cream. But these are blue, blue bells, bells from Texas, and we appreciate it so much. Bob and Judy, you guys and, are the best. And I believe Judy made this. Y'all, it's a Texas thing. And the state of Texas and the beautiful flowers. And this couldn't have come on a better day because TP is here. And we were like, TP. Well, and, and uh, like our producer, John Kenny is like, did TP just bring that for you guys? We're like, nope, Bob no, and Judy. <laughs> Bob and Judy. Right. So uh, su like super exciting day. Walking in, we had the package. And we have these nice gifts from Texas. So pretty. I can't wait. It's like it's really gonna bring adds a, a touch of spring to my kitchen. I know it really will, and I'm very excited for it. Thank you very much from the bottom of our hearts. We love yes, it. Yes, and it. I can never have I never have enough spoon rests. You know, my you Liz talks about my kitchen counter, and I have a lot of things going on. Spoon rests 
I am always like cooking and putting spoons somewhere, and then I'm, I'm always needing a clean. They better go in the drawer, and then you pull them out when you need them. <laughs> now I've got the Texas spoon rest. Well, this matches my kitchen because everything in my kitchen's blue. Yeah, I just busted out my blue yeah. yesterday. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts, Bob and Judy. Oh, it's so sweet. Yeah. Okay. Now, Jenny, on to the market. Do you want to pop back into Twitter, or do you? Sure. Want and I will say, I will tell people like we're taking live tweets, and if you're on YouTube, post something on YouTube. Frank's on YouTube. He'll share it with us. You just need if you're on Twitter, put the hashtag L I Z J N Y. If you're on YouTube, post it, and Frank will share it. And you can see the post right there, L I Z J N Y. It's mm -hmm. that little hashtag. Yeah. Um. So now Bob is coming in. Thank you very much. These week's earnings, Jenny. I just want to look at this because we are here today. And here tomorrow. And here tomorrow. And I'm here Wednesday. Yes. So I'm here Wednesday. So we will be looking at um, Ooh, Carnival our Carnival Cruise. Carnival Cruise. But we also have a Walgreens Boots Alliance. We have a Walgreens Boots Alliance position. So yeah. addressing this list, the only thing I think we have in our account is Walgreens. I'm glad I saw this because I have... I'm leaving for Florida. I have, after tomorrow's show, I have a Carnival Cruise position. I have a Walgreens Boots position. Yeah. I don't have a Restoration Hardware position. I do not have a Restoration Hardware position. I've never had a Restoration Hardware position. No. But you know what's exciting? Exciting news. Uh, the Reddit options came out today. Oh, I know. I already yeah. traded some. Oh, good. I told you I want to be the first. And, and in my know. mind, I am because the volume still says zero. So it was me. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Um, do you want to pop in the platform and take a look at yeah, it? No, let's. Um, RDDT, right? Yeah, Reddit. So I, so the margin isn't, the margin isn't helpful yet. Uh, oh. It's like it's cash secured. It, yeah. If you go down, it'll use three thousand, four thousand. Oh, yeah. It's cash secured, but we can do a spread. That's that's got some juice in it, though. Look at that. Your forty-five day options, which isn't bad, hitting in considering it's up five bucks today. No, that's not bad. So you could do the forty-five. 40 and you're still getting I mean you're getting 288 for the 4535. Sure, do it. Press that button. Although, although let's just I'm going to look at a calendar to tell you when we're coming back. Well, I was just going to say go out to May cuz I was in the April 25 days and that's not if we really wanted to get into Reddit, I would go something very very conservative and do maybe no that's too small. I'm just going to look at my calendar to tell you when we're returning because we're, we're, we're returning on the day of the eclipse. <laughs> oh yeah, a April 8th. Yes. Okay, so we're returning April 8th. So you we could see if if we have an option that's expiring April 19th, when we return it'll have 11 days to go. Yeah, that's why I moved to the the um Which I fine we can come in in 11 days if it's if it's a spread we can put spreads in april any naked options have to go to may but i don't mind taking a look at this you're at the 40 30 so the ipo would way higher than this 40 you know here it didn't it's never oh, been I, down that low. i'm happy to sell the spread so 40 30 for 258 so it's not exactly a third tp might come running in here at any given moment because he is here i'm tempted to say though it wouldn't it be kind of nice to do the 25 day we both come back from vacation and we're just like look at all this money we made it would be. However, we're up one strike, one five dollar wide strike. Sure. You know what? I'm gonna be agreeable today, Jenny. Whatever you want. I, I'll do whatever. Your wish you, is my command. How about that? I'll do whatever so you 288 want. Two eighty eight on the forty five thirty five. And if we come back from vacation and this has eleven days to go, we roll it out in time. Or we take our eight hundred dollar loss, whichever comes first. <laughs> but that's okay. I don't mind. It is what it is. Okay. Now we have quite a few things to do because I know we have the top symbols running through the platform today because Scott. Oh, because Scott's back. Because Scott, Scott brought it in, so that's good. We have some things to go. Wait, did over. TP TP saw your earrings and he was like, "What did he?" he thought? Oh, silver's silver. It's up. Silver's oh, up. Oh, that's why he said those earrings are worth so valuable because they're silver and silver is silver's up a ton. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> He's like those earrings must be must have made a thousand dollars today. That's right. He said 1500. Oh, <laughs> they must have. They must have. Okay, let's pop back in the platform. I wanted to do some things real quick. I actually I'm so mad at myself because I opened up everything that I wanted to address and then I lost it. Then I opened up everything. So now everything's Oh. Okay, so we're going to go through um uh high class problems first. Here's 50% on beyond meat. Hmm. 25 days. Sure, yeah. yeah, I guess we have to take it. We can put that on in May if we want to. Yeah, we could take a look at it in May. But I'm Beyond me, these were, remember when it had the big moves and we were putting these in and we kind of thought, oh, we might be stuck in this till expiration. So to get it out for, to get out for 50%. Heck yeah. Um, Hold on, I can't, I'm going to keep paying. I'm paying for They're, they're wide. Are they wide? I'm paying 49. Days? It's fine. It should fill. What the heck? That was the offer. I don't know what to say. It's over the offer. There you go. 
49. I paid 50, got out for 49. Okay. All right. So that's Beyond Meat. Um, I think we can take more. off soybeans too for, I know we're only up 18%. Let's see. What do we have? It's an iron condor with 32 days. I'm okay with taking. I'm off. okay with $56 when it's at both sides. I don't know. I'm not sure. We'll see if we can get filled on that. That's fine. I would rather, on the era of us being gone for right. as long as we're going to be That's gone That's what I'm for, thinking. Like, I'm we're going to be gone. Let's clean this up. Of the opinion to air, there was one thing that we needed to get to, Jenny, and it was a strangle that was through our call side. Is it this one? Is it FCX? Yes. Here we go. Oh. This is the... I, I, oh. <laughs> yep. Well. FCX. Copper. Yeah. This has to be addressed. So what we've got here... Is this is our problem? What's trend. our loss? Um, two hundred fifty-three dollars. Um. So here, I'm just gonna start closing. I'm gonna close this. I just think we don't. I don't like when it needs. So this can just as easily turn around and go the opposite way. I don't want to roll all the way, roll the puts all the way up, and then lose on both sides. Um, I, I don't roll the puts up. I just closed it. And I mean, honestly, if I rolled it even to a straddle, we'd get thirty-five cents for it. I closed that put. Will you go to the chart, please? I would be honored. So here's what I would say. If I, if I want to keep, I would, I would probably, if I wanted to put on a bearish position, if I'm playing that it's going to come back down, I would put on a diagonal, a put diagonal. So, but if we don't want to put on a bearish position, I would just close this and take the loss and say, forget it, X, FCX. So it's hard. It's tricky. And especially for me over here on this side, because it's a metal. You know how I feel about Yeah, I know. Right. So I don't care if we just close it and take the loss. So we could close it. Now, to your point, we are going to close this and a diagonal would be, the bearish diagonal would be probably selling, I'm going to go to the 43. You're not getting enough for it. No, you're not. And then you're going through earnings and I'm going to buy the 46. We're paying six dollars for it. No, granted. No, no, you're not paying six dollars for the. You're paying two twenty for the diagonal. Yeah, but I'm doing this as a whole. No, no, I know, but it's like the one trade is a lo loser. What new trade would you put on? Right. No, but I put it in as one, and it is actually a six dollar debit. Like that's facts. Yeah. But then you, if you're closing one and opening up the other, you would be cl taking this off. Right. And then, getting back nine hundred dollars. Yeah. And paying three eighty five. So we're t we're locking in a loss. Paying two. So for the um and for the diagonal it was like two twenty. And we'll do the diagonal separately. So I went to the forty three day. I don't know. I don't know if it's worth it. I don't know if it's. I don't think it's worth it. Two sixteen. Two sixteen for a three dollar wide. I don't mm -hmm. think it's worth it. You're just you. It would be like a slow grind of making your money back. Yeah. Uh, my only other option, and uh, you could roll the call out to May and roll it up. Let's take a look. May, if you're going to roll it out and up. Roll it to like the 45, the at the money. I just wanted to see what these prices were. And then maybe sell the 40, 41 put. Well, you could do, you could do like a spread here. <clears throat> oh, I see. You could do a spread. Or, I mean, we could do something like this. 15 cent debit. It's not bad. What would we collect the first time? Um, I don't remember. 79 cents? No, 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 no that I was one that. side. Okay, so if we set 80 cents and 80 cents, probably a dollar sixty. Yeah. But then you've got a $2. What, you're not covering your risk to the downside. You're not covering your risk to the downside. You're just taking as much premium as you can. Let's. And I don't want to leave a naked option. Um, you know what? No, I, I would just. So I'm closing it. Roll it to May. I'm closing it because we could, when we get back, we're not going to leave a naked option through going on, especially an at the money naked option in a metal product. So yeah, I, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem. Something on, if we want to put something on, what we're going to do, we're going to put a pin in this and we're going to put FCX on our list tomorrow to be like, Hey, what position would we want to have an FCX? And we're going to give ourselves one night to think about it. Listen, I don't have a problem saying I'm going to take a $250 loss or $280 loss in FCX. It's gone. I don't need to be in, I don't need to make it back in FCX. No, I agree. Um, um, so that was the one thing that I wanted to look at. There's another big loss that I wanted to look at. This is. Yeah. Speaking of, with oh, Spoo's down nine, maybe we sell the SPX Iron Fly or Iron Condor. Right now? We do it at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, Annie's been getting, Annie started getting it on Friday. The, and I saw on the woman on Facebook, Annie, start, Annie started doing it on Friday. Well, Friday was the least you could get for it. Well, I know. That's why I'm curious to look at how much you're getting for it now. I'm Here, curious to see. You. So $20 up and 20 So 25 So you're going to go 15, to 15 Oh, five. Oh, yeah. Oh, five. Just do a $5 wide. Well, I just want to see because it was t like, because we know what the pricing of the $10 is. 45 And 40, um, 45 
I, I'm curious because Andy said she started doing Friday. Friday we looked and they were like cheaper than they've. Uh, and and, I, and, and it's early. And it's early and you're not getting anything for it. So them. if you do a five dollar wide, you're getting fifty cents. It's, it's not, not worth, worth it. it. They're not worth Jeez. it. <laughs> there, I, I was curious to see because Friday it had gotten so bad. The balls come in so much you weren't getting anything for them. I know, and that's what Tom was saying. They'll they'll work until they don't. They're yeah, and right now it's not. It's not worth the risk. You're not getting set up, which is kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. Um. I'm trying to close this forty-seven fifty. I'm actually gonna. And then just put in a fifty percent GTC and leave that. While we we're had gone. a fifty percent GTC. I'm just gonna put tick up one. We just took that GTC off. I'd rather take profits than not. Yeah, I hate to leave too much. Okay, I don't. I, we did kind of look at that. Do you want to pop back into Twitter or should we? Oh, hang on. Let me look. Um, do, do, do. Hold on one second. Hold please. I'm just seeing what's, I'm just check. <laughs> we don't need to. I just was saying, like, we can look in here and put new things on. No, no, this is good, because Frank's been posting. So Frank's been great. Um, okay, let's pop into Twitter. I've got a few things going on. So this is Frank. Ooh. He's in Arizona, overnight snow. And I'm always shocked when it's snowing in Arizona. Well, my husband's in Arizona right now, and I was driving, talking to him, and he said it was 45 degrees there, and it was 52 in my car. It's colder in Arizona than it is here right now. And uh, we have we had friends over yesterday, and we're both leaving for spring break tomorrow. We're leaving for Florida. They're leaving for Arizona. And they were like... I think it's supposed. Right. It's, I think it's supposed cold. to warm up, but it's not. It's not hot. It's a cold snap right now. Yeah, it's not hot. It's not hot in Miami where I'm going either. It's not seventy. It's eighty four in Orlando. Well, you're the middle of the state. There's no. There's no breeze. There's no. <laughs> there's no oceanfront breeze. <laughs> like, yeah, it was kind of crazy. It's a little bit. It's not. I'm happy because we're going to go fishing in Miami. Yeah, you don't want to be, like, hot. You don't want to be yeah. hot on the boat. Super happy. Like, it's perfect weather. Yeah. Miami, you keep saying, you keep being Miami. Um, so, okay, so this is Frank Walsh. He's on YouTube. He's amazing. And he's been posting lots of uh, lots of things from YouTube. So, uh, yes, she made she them. She did I make thought them. So. I thought you said that, Bob. So thank your wife so much for making these. And I, did you ever, did you ever do any kind of cross-stitch? And this isn't not exactly, I, I don't know what you call this, and is it, or did she make it on her sewing machine? This is like legit on a sewing machine. Do you understand who you're talking to? You've never done, I, I'm taking it, I'm guessing you've never done any stitching. It's an excellent guess. <laughs> <laughs> Forget I asked. Forget I asked. It's an excellent guess. I mean, this is talent that I will mm-hmm. never possess. Never. Well... I think, it's, I think it's super talented. I think that this was... And I think she painted these. That's what I'm saying. Like, this is talents that, that I will never possess. I am not this talented. She's amazing. Maybe she didn't paint these, but she definitely made this. All I know is that, once again, her skill set, I'm a here, Judy's here. Judy's way above <laughs> yes. us. Way above us. Um, so thank you, Bob, and thank you to Judy. Uh, blue bonnets. Yes, yeah, state flower. And TP has them in his yard. Uh, our pleasure is a small thing. Didn't he call them bluebells? And that's where we went down the ice cream kick? Blue bonnets. See, and I think that's when it was like, blue bonnet, what's the ice cream? It is blue No, bonnet. TP called them bluebells. He called them bluebells. But they're blue bonnets. He's, he's a transplant Texan, though. Like, he's not born and raised from, in Texas. He's from the East Coast. Yeah, yeah. All right, so this is coming in from YouTube, from Harsha. Harsha Varden. Um, hi, Liz and Jenny. I'm short. One call in coin, 300 strike in April. The stock is moving against me. Should I buy something like the 260, 280 call spread in April? So if you're short the 300 strike. It's trading 279. So if you want to pop into, uh, you can you can still read that when we pop over, right? Yeah. So, like, so if you pop into the platform, she's short the 300 call in April. I don't know, if, but he, yeah. he, he, who they are short the 300 call in April. <laughs> you're still out of the money. It's still out of the money. I feel like... So the problem here, and let's talk about this. I don't, what did they actually ask? Can you re, read it? Um, should, they buy the, should they buy the 260, 280 call spread to help reduce some risk? So look at the price of that. It's probably $1,000. 260, 280 call spread? Yeah, it's going to be... 260, buy it, and then sell the 280. Yeah, $1,000. So here's $1,000, but this could make you another 1000 If If it keeps running up and going through, this will add another $1,000 to your break even. Uh, the only way I would do this if I collected way more than $1,000 on that call when I sold it, which it, probably not. And then you're not going to make anything. Well, so if you are short this call and long this call spread, you need it between 280 and 300 Well, 
they're just trying to they're just trying to help mitigate the risk a little bit. What it'll do if you sold the three hundred for a thousand, and then you make a thousand on that instead of your break even being. Uh, you know, it'll give you another thousand dollars in room. It'll give you a thousand dollars on top of your break even. Yeah, you're going to lose on this, but yeah. it's a very, very small range to keep to have. A coin's tricky. I, so you're already in it. But I would say this is I, this is guess where I was going to say, Jenny. And I didn't know what they were. I didn't know they gave you a call spread. So to their point, you will be giving to Jenny's point. You will be doing. You're giving yourself a thousand dollars on your break even. But when you're looking at this, if I've got a problem that is not. Um, that I've already made my bet in, it's very tricky to buy insurance when the house is on fire. You can't so, buy insurance. You have to like, risk is managed at order entry. Yes. So like, and, and hedge, and hedge, in the words of TP, in his text they sent me on Friday, hedge is a four letter word. So like, what do you do here? It's hard. It's very tricky. I think the biggest question we get is, I've got a losing trade. What do I do with it? And you, options are managed on order entry. You can, roll, I, you can roll this out in time. So the only thing that I know about is taking things and getting them the heck out of the way. Like, I don't know what they have against this position. Do you have a large Bitcoin, a large crypto position? Uh, that's That would be a difference to me. If I had a lot of crypto and that like was going up. Like this would a covered call? Right, where yes. if this is offsetting a large crypto position, where if, if everything keeps going up and you're losing on this, but you're making on crypto, then I would be okay with that. Yeah. If you're just short this and you don't have long crypto and you're just losing on this, this would make me a little bit nervous. It would make me a little bit nervous too. Um, so I think it kind of depends on their overall portfolio. Because did they look at this as a covered call? If they look at if they looked at this as this is kind of a covered call against my crypto, then I might not worry about it. But I'm gonna guess they didn't this isn't this is them trying to say what do we how do we fix a, a, a naked short call? And I, 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 naked short calls make me nervous. They make me nervous too. I don't, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't, you can email Tom at tastylive.com because I don't this sell. Isn't that a covered call? That's a high class problem because you're winning. If it, if you have a lot of crypto and this is against crypto, you might not be winning because coin is up more percentage wise than a Bitcoin probably. Um, will you go to the chart and coin? Uh, hold on. I, just, I, you're probably losing more on this option than you. I don't you, know. Let's go. We go to the chart and well, oh, and coin. So like, that's what I'm saying. They're, they're up. Don't get me you wrong. I'm not, I don't, is, I'm not thinking that they have like one full Bitcoin. But Bitcoin is parabolic. But you don't, we don't know what the hedge is. We don't know anything about this. All I'm saying is naked short calls make me a little bit nervous. But there's very little that you can do to them once you're in them. You just saw an FCX. We stared at it. Stared at it. it was on a much smaller scale. But we just closed it for a loss. I, I think that they're in better shape because you're still out of the money. They're still out of the money. Uh, speaking of things that we're in not good shape on, Jenny, you just jogged my memory. Rivian. No. 25 days to go. And it's through our long call. Roll it to May. This is defined risk. It's through our long call. We should be able to roll it to May for even. You Well, it you will be able to because it's between your Yeah, tracks. and that's the time to do it. Yeah. And we can add on a put spread. We can roll it to May and add on a put spread. You should be able to roll the same strikes. Yeah. It's a 22 cent debit. No, I mean, the market's 70 cent credit at a dollar. You should be able to roll it for very close to even. I consider that close to even in NVIDIA. Yeah. If you're paying 5 cents, 10 cents, 20 cents, that's even. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because these markets are pretty wide. Uh, this will this will give you a little bit more time. So, gonna, yeah, roll I'm gonna, it. I'm going to see if I can take it up a bit. Yeah, I'm going to pay 25 cents. I'm taking it up by $5. $5. Okay. So, pay. you're paying 18 cents? We're getting it out of the way. <clears throat> So you locked it in at, I think, at 18 cent? We'll see. I'll pay 23. Yeah. And then I think we can add a put spread. But this is defined risk. Okay, so that's filled. Yep. And look at maybe adding a, going all the way down the expected move, what do you get for a $5 rate put spread? I don't know what we originally collected. I think we collected $3 on this. A dollar. It's not bad. It's not terrible. It's not terrible. I'll ship this too. So our original collection in NVIDIA, which we've, we've scalped in and We've out been of in and out of NVIDIA a few times. This is just hard to leave. That's why I'm glad it's all the way out to then May. And we're out to May. Yeah. Um, and, okay, so yeah, going rolling. back, we go back to coin. I just want to look at something. Sure. Like, if you're worried about it, could you go out to, if I was worried about the naked call and coin, maybe I would buy that back, take a loss, and then sell a defined risk call spread further out in time, a defined risk call spread. Because then you can still make money if it comes back down, but you're defined risk if it keeps going up. Concept makes sense. You're not going to get that much collection. No, I know. I know. Massive loss. I, Concept, in, like on paper, what you just said makes perfect sense. It, in practice, it's going to be too much. If I had a lot of crypto, I wouldn't worry about this. If I had no crypto, I would worry about this. Yeah, I mean... 
But yeah. That's a very advanced trade if you're saying, I'm long crypto and I'm going to sell a Coinbase against it. Some it's people do it. Trade. Some people d- I'm going to guess that's not the case. Maybe. I don't know. Um, Maybe. So, okay. Next person, let's see. Want to pop into Twitter? Oh, yeah. We'll pop into Twitter. So, Bob is coming in. Just to clarify, it doesn't have to be a spoon rest, Liz. It can be a, for change. You can no, put no. it on your desk. I use spoon rests. I just keep them in my drawer. No, this is it, I, and it maybe it, it maybe it could just permanently go on my desk. I'm gonna, you know, where it's not gonna go on the tasty trade table, or no. some, someone will take it. Um, okay, so Harsha comes in. Back to coin question: Should I buy 200 call or something in the money? So I, 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 you don't, you can't like. You're just going to be locking in a... If you're going to go buy some kind of other call, you're better off just closing the trade. If you buy the 200 call, you're spending eight Yeah, you're, Yeah, like, at this point, if... At this point, you can't take a naked option and really turn that position into defined risk. You're better off just... If you don't want it, if it's making you nervous, if you're losing sleep over it, you're better off just, like, closing that. And just take, like... So, to your point, we just did an FCX. Now, smaller scale, and ours was in the money. So when we're in, we're a smaller scale, and we were in worse shape, by the way, mm-hmm. by the by, because we had. <laughs> but no one else can see that yet, right? When did that happen? <laughs> Pop into Twitter. When we, um, <laughs> when I said sell the April, we'll come back from, we'll go on vacation, and we'll just make lots of money. <laughs> Screenshot, excellent job, Mike. Yeah, if you can go to Twitter, I don't know. Do you see oh, we're it? in Twitter. Okay, it's hysterical. It's hysterical, and we will go back. We will go back to the coin. Monday's edition, casual but, Jenny. But just to kind of, just to kind of like put 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 coin to bed. What I did is mm-hmm. honestly one of the hardest things to do: close a losing trade and say, guess what? We're gonna think about this and put something else on if that's what we would want to put on. Because that's the hardest thing to do. And nothing we say is a trade recommendation. No. But we, there was no good fix over an in-the-money short call in a metal product. Now, coin, to me, is a little bit scary, too. Coin is, I know to me plenty is, of people scary. that have worn off yeah. naked calls. Coin is scary to me. So for, for me, I wouldn't sell a naked call on coin. That's why I'm saying email Tom at tastylive.com, because he probably does. Um, he probably does. It. This might be him. Is that his yeah, alias? <laughs> is that him on Twitter? <laughs> um, but I, we wouldn't sell naked call and coin because that would make us just too nervous. Would make because sense. we've we've seen how this is run. Can, I I barely tolerate naked calls in FCX. Right. We couldn't even take that two hundred dollars in FCX. <laughs> All right. So um, do you see Twitter? No. Oh, let, let's pop back in. We'll get to a well. You know, it's ten thirty. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we have trade small, trade often. We have the top symbols. We have tweets to get to. Um, lots going on. We'll be back in ninety seconds. Stay tuned. Looking for a better broker and a bonus? Sweet. We got you. Right now, you can get a bonus of up to $4,000 when you open and fund a Tasty Trade account. Plus, low rates, smart tech with the analysis tools you need, and award winning support. So, get a broker who's actually got your back. And up to $4,000 at Tasty Trade. Make your move, genius. Tasty Trade. 90% goes to SP index funds. 10% straight to bank. Is 20th century advice driving your 21st century portfolio? Tasty Live has joined forces with the CME and SIBO to offer the industry's first multi-exchange trading collaboration. Our new live event, Building a Complex Portfolio, puts active traders on the path to modern portfolio creation. Tom Sosnoff and other Tasty Live personalities will cover strategies that'll help you integrate futures and options in your portfolio. Sign up at tastylive.com slash events and see where we're headed next. Everybody, welcome back. It is a manic Monday, so we are going to go through. Let's go jump in the the top symbols. What do you think? Uh, sure, let's jump in the top symbols. Then I promise we will get to the tweets coming in because yes. we do have a lot of tweets coming in. Uh, top symbols. Nvidia, check. Top of the list. AMD plummeted today. 
Well, let's see. Let's take a look. Well, we have to keep this up. All right. Unless you have a pen and paper. Uh, <laughs> no. That's uh, what I'm saying. We can't, we can't keep back, going back and forth. All right. Tesla, Tesla and coin. Coin. We already addressed. Apple down a ton today. So AMD, Apple, mm -hmm. Intel went down. Um, what else was down today? Is you all on here? No. Boeing is down. All these are down. Yeah. Intel. VITO. Hmm. I did hear, Jenny, to kind of make your day. I don't know if this is true or not, but um, some of the cannabis stocks have popped. Ooh. I yeah. So, well, you know, that makes might make sense because I went into my account and it wasn't negative today and I thought it was going to be negative today because I have a lot of these stocks that are down. Maybe the cannabis stocks is are saving me. <laughs> You're being... <laughs> <laughs> Finally. You're being held up by this. Now, there isn't much that we don't... Um, Why have. is Chewy on the list? Disney's up, Disney's up a ton, too. Um, it Disney, is? Yeah, Disney got upgraded by somebody. Let's take a look at some By a ton? Please bear in mind, I'm we, getting percentages. Yeah, so... And somebody's get, like, it's up 4%. That seems like a lot. Okay, all right, so. let's see. Let's let's look at some of these. So Disney up 280, yeah. And I'm kind of missing out because I've just been selling puts or put spreads. I sold calls against mine. I don't have any well, stock. Like, I'm capped out, I think, at 118. I'm done. I, I think I'm done. Okay. I hate that. I hate that. So Disney's up. So I was kind of going, I was kind of being kidding, kidding about this, but these are the things that I know that are down. Well, look at our Disney position. And he's up on the day. It was down this morning. Okay, hold on. Uh, look at our Disney position. You would think we're, oh, all we have is a garbage calendar. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> <laughs> it's a call spread. Just we're take up, that off. We're take up that off. dollars well, Jenny that hates off. it. I'm closing it. Well, no, because I, I would think we'd have long Disney positions and we're not making money on. It was an earnings setup calendar. Earnings setup calendar. We'll take, fine, we'll take 10% out of it, 11% out of it. I went the wrong way because I was thinking we were buying it. Okay, so we're going to close our Disney. No, take a look. Chewy was on the list as two. Wait, oh, whoa, whoa, before I do this, Chewy was on the list as well. Looks like we're down a lot. This is a residual. These are residuals. This is worth nothing. We actually wind up, we just have 116. 116 put, and that's not winning. Oh, because Chewy's down. Yeah, no, but the, the residual is what what looks bad yeah. here is the residual. It's not nearly as bad as it is. We are down down today because Chewy is down today, which is a, a dollar is a big, on a. Yeah, you know what else is down is, is not good today is Rivian. Do we have, we have Rivian in here? We always have Rivian, and that's not good. Oh, it's only down 28 cents. That's what I'm saying. They were today saying that AMD was like plummeting. And I look at it. It's up to. This is what happens when I get in the car, listening to people who have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> Instead of looking at your platform? Yes. So they were saying AMD was down, and they were saying Intel was down. Intel's down. But not... 57. Like, this is a flesh wound. Yeah, but it's, Intel, if you look at the chart, Intel hasn't been great. This didn't even break the skin. I, I guess it was down more earlier today. Mm -hmm. I was like, where is it? Yeah. So the low was, I guess, 40, 57, so it was lower. Can, okay, so... I got the list up. What On that list, I I I NVIDIA taken care of. AMD, yeah. we, we have a position. Tesla, do we have? Will you look at our AMD? Is it just an earnings setup calendar? Because if it is, no, no, it's just a put spread. Put in a GTC for that, please. A GTC put spread. We have a put spread in. And, and this is crazy. It is so far. It's $20 away, and we haven't made much on it. No, I think we just put it on, though, Jenny. Let me see how long it's been on for. Five days. Yeah, oh. it's, it's, it's okay. brand It's like it's brand new. Okay. So uh, Apple took a took it off the chin again today too. Here, look at this. Apple was down too. That was another one that was down. And we just have the earnings setup calendar. Earnings We're setup fine calendar. here. Like it's it's bullish and it's good. So that one's fine. Not a good day for Tom, right? No. Um, I Boeing is the other thing that was in the news. I have the list up. Somebody wanted us to look to talk about too um, what a covered call in Mara. So Mara is also on the list. So Mara's number fifteen yeah. on the list. So let's look at that. Covered call in Mara. Mara is only $21. Um, so I was sitting with uh, Dr. Data. Mm -hmm. It's funny you brought up covered call. I think maybe this is him. Who is this? Is this Dr. Data? Uh, Frank posted it. It's from Dr. Data. Uh, <laughs> yes. Oh, it's from Ben. So I was sitting with Dr. Data today, and we were looking at the bot. You know how he's so good with the AI stuff? Yeah. Um, and he was saying, uh, give me some interesting things about covered calls. And he then, it, 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 it was just very fascinating what AI can do. But if somebody wanted oh. to look for a cover, covered call in Mara, you are essentially buying the stock and selling a call. And we could even use... I just want to show. You could do like a diagonal too if you don't want to put as much money into it. Well, I wanted to show here that if you are buying a covered call, if you're buying the stock and selling a call against it, uh, can I do it like that? Can I buy this and add that? Or do I you, you might have to do yeah, it. Yeah, no, I did yeah, it. Yeah, okay, good. You can leg into it. This is a covered call. It uses um, a lot of capital here. It uses, yes, it yeah. uses $1,400. 
and your the, your your profit potential is from where the stock is trading all the way up to 27 plus the credit you receive. The the easiest way for me to understand how to do this is to just sell that put. It's still a lot of okay, so it's still a lot of capital here, but so, it's the same it's the same trade. Now I will say some people some people. If and especially with buying power, if buying power is not helping you, some people. I was shocked that buying power wasn't helping me. Yeah, if the buy, if the buying power is not helping you, some people like to have the stock and sell a call against it. And Anton talked about this the other day, uh, you know. And this is something you could have, talk to your tax professional about. But if you sell calls against your stock and the calls are more than thirty days out, um, having you know, those are taxed. A long, the, again, we again, don't know. Talk to your this is something that Anton was talking about the other day. Um, Call Anton. And, and some Anton people like to have com. some people like to have the stock, and they just like to to have it and For sell sure. the calls, and then and like to hold it. And so, if it is a situation where the margin isn't any better, I don't have a problem buying the stock and selling a call against it. I no, I never have a problem buying the stock yeah. and selling calls against it. I was just going to show you that it's synthetically the same thing as selling that put if you wanted to in a single click instead of two. Now, if someone wanted more defined risk, I would set up a diagonal. You know, you could set up. You're bullish, so you'd be selling that same 27. Yeah, you sell a call in the 25 day, buy the. So this is 21 to 27, six dollars wide, and you're paying 317. So. It has profit potential of about three hundred dollars, and well, you're only putting up three hundred dollars. You've got profit potential of three hundred dollars. You're only putting up three hundred dollars. This does not wash extrinsic value. I would just like to be very clear. This doesn't wash extrinsic value. If you stay right here, you can actually lose money. But the data is call, what a covered call does for you is yeah. give you that extrinsic value. So it gives you that we were getting what a dollar in extrinsic value, and there a dollar yeah. twenty. It gives you a dollar twenty-seven room to be wrong. That is the cleanest version of it. And now it's positive theta. It's positive theta because that April call is going to decay faster than the 53-day call. What yes. you'd have to do is when there's not much left in the April call, then sell a call in May. Yes. And so it is a positive theta trade as Correct. long as you then roll that April call to May and sell a May call. Correct. You have to be proactive yeah. about it. Right. But it, it, this is a lower risk way uh, to have a long position. I don't disagree. Now, if you are long, if you're looking at something like this, my, my, I will always prefer just selling puts. Sure. Because if you're if you're looking to make three hundred dollars, then this gives you the most room sure. to be wrong, and you're you were putting up what a couple hundred dollars to do it. Yeah, you can still sell a put spread, and I'm fi I mean, I'm fine with that too. Yeah, those are pretty interesting. Now we don't. What do you think about this? Let's put it in. I don't mind. Uh, so yeah, what are our thoughts on a covered call, Mara? I don't mind it. I don't there, mind it either. If you want to have less at risk, you can set it up differently. You could put it on diagonal. You could sell a put spread. Um, Given this, it'll give us a little bit of room to be wrong. I'm going to sell the 2015. We're going to get two dollars for it. That brings our break even yeah. down to 18, which gives us the um, like just a little bit of wiggle room. A little bit of room to be wrong. Yeah. And it's defined risk. I'm going to ship it. We're in 53 days. And that Mara was on the list as well. Um, the other things that are on the list, so Disney is, XLE is, Chewy we looked at, um, Google, Netflix, Lulu, which I was surprised by. And what's uh, our, what is Nike doing? Do we still have a Nike position? Yeah. So Nike position, um, we're up 10%, and it's been on for 33 days. Can we take that off? Did we ever roll it? Oh, we just left it. We just left it, remember? And it went down on earnings, and we left it. I would say if we want to stay in Nike, roll it to May. So here's the deal. That is our only trade that we've had on in there okay. for the entire year. To your point, we left it for 33 days. We took some heat. We yeah. had it on, took some heat through earnings, left it, and still if we, left it, and it's on. And if we want to keep it going, we would roll it to May. Yeah, I agree. So I'm going to um, close this. I don't mind being a Nike. Now, that being said, Jenny, take a look at the Ivy rank. It's got a two um, Ivy rank. Let's just get out of this. We took some heat. Let's take yeah. our profits. You and I can reload a Nike when we get back. Sure. Okay. Uh, so I was laughing so hard, so I went to, and we got back $1,700, by the way. So I was laughing. I was at Nordstrom this weekend, just shopping. Um, we went to Oak Brook. We had to get some things for the trip. On clouds are everywhere in Nordstrom. Like on people's feet or in oh, the store? In the store. At Nordstrom, not Rack, Nordstrom, no, yeah. Nordstrom, Nordstrom, Nordstrom. Like, on on it's like, it's on like on. let's check out, let's check you out on, on. There was no other gym shoes there, but on clouds. Now on, on, it went down on earnings. And then it's got, oh, back and up. it popped right back up. Sweeping the nation. <laughs> <laughs> let's pop back into Twitter. We have a few tweets to get to. Um, 
Okay. So let's see. This So that was Ben. Thoughts on covered calls. Josh says, Miami is a fun time. Go salsa dancing. I agree. I'll go salsa dancing. I'll see if my 17-year-old will salsa dance with me. Yeah. <laughs> and your daughter would go salsa oh dancing. Oh, my God. She's like she's like stacking the deck because she's a dancer. <laughs> yeah. You're going to go for sure. Great idea, Josh. And um, from Theta Trader, I, is IWM a Jenny uh, JNY darling? Seems like it's been flat long enough that put selling would have been profitable. So, yeah, I mean, I didn't. I like IWM. Let's take a look at IWM. We'll pop so, it in the platform. Yeah. Take a look. We have, what, I don't know. Oh, we have a spiked lizard. With, hold on. I'm just going to. It has, well, it's a strangler. I'm actually just going to go to the analysis page so people can see what we have. We have a spiked lizard that we sold the strangle. So the strangle is sold here. The spiked lizard portion yeah. is right there. So that kind of just has to sit. Now it's got to sit because you can see where the, um, where the flag is. The flag is going mm -hmm. out of our peak range into here. This is technically bearish. We want IWM to be in the in the, the top of this peak. Now, if you go to the trade page and just go to May, I just want to, so the nice thing about IWM, it has a 42 rank in May. As far as the puts go. We're in May. You know, at this level, IWM has been running has been running up if you look at the chart. Yeah. Um, we I really, usually we haven't had it on that long. We've only had this trade on for hold on. Let me no, see. No, but as far as it is one week. Is it one of my day. darlings? Not right now, because after this run up, I usually like to have my puts at like I don't like it getting up into the 180, 90 okay, level. I'm just gonna define what her darling is. Something that is down at the bottom of its range and flat lines and stays there the no, entire year. I, I'm I'm fine selling selling uh, both sides in IWM, but I I don't yeah, but your love your darlings it up here. are selling puts. Your darling yeah. is something that stays right here and you sell puts. Yeah, SoFi is my new darling. Yes. SoFi is gonna be my SoFi is gonna be my seven dollars puts all day long. For how much are they now? It's for days. Hold on. They're not much in in April. You gotta go to May. And then you're going through earnings, but whatever. 50 cent puts. 50 cent puts in a $7 product, just you, load up. <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't listen to her. Don't. No, but so <laughs> I think that's my prediction. What is SoFi's going to be on my list of darling? It's not bad. I mean, the, uh -uh. it's the low price products, right? So it was DraftKings. Yeah, it could, wasn't. It, wasn't um, it was DraftKings. It's not anymore. No, DraftKings just. Well, the problem is, so once again, you, at some point you give up and be like, oh, I'm going to wait till it comes back down to get back in. Yeah, I'm not. You like selling it when it was around 10 or 12. Yeah. And Ford, Ford's starting to, Ford's, like, Ford's been on fire too. Is it? Down a penny today, but. Look at our calendar. We've got the 1288 calendar. So let's to get our free longs for June, remember? Great, let's do it. <laughs> we might get it. We had 20% on a calendar. No, we have to leave it. We did it to get the free longs. Which won't be a free long if it stays up above it. We'll, we'll just leave it for 25 days. Um, okay, so uh, but let's pop back into Twitter. We have a few more tweets to get to. And we do have some time. So, Alan, down here in Orlando, playing 12 straight days of golf, and it's windy as heck. Is it? Mm. Wait, Alan, when are you coming to Chicago? For the show, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. For the... Not our show. No. They're, that show's going to be but amazing. The building a complex portfolio. Yeah, building a complex portfolio. That'll be really it's good. It's going to be amazing. That will be good. It's going to be amazing. Um, and then, Bob, she didn't make the trays, but the we're, she's still super talented, Bob. Super she is talented. talented. And Mikey, ladies, is it time to nibble on MCD? That's the micro Canadian dollar. Can we just look at, isn't it micro Canadian dollar? I believe so, yeah. So we could buy a future or we could just go to like six, we could just go to um, six C. Take, go, pop in the platform. So MCD, I, I'm gonna nibble with Mikey, honestly. Hold on, hold on. Look at this, well, MCD is, it, you put up $100 to buy it. But look at the chart, let's see what he's looking at. Yeah, I'll yeah. nibble. I'll take the bait. Can we just look at 6C and see if there's put spreads we can sell? Because I would usually rather sell a put spread. You can look. So go to the May 39 day. Daughter's birthday. And what do you get here? $160 risk 340. I'd it's go with this, spread. Mikey. I'd go with the put spread. Look at the, the chart is different. Because the other one maybe doesn't, it doesn't, it's like, so do the dollar sign, do the dollar sign 6C and then you can get a real view. Like I said, I like to nibble. My there we go. It doesn't look as appealing. It does not look as appealing. But then you can do it that with a lot of charts. Look at the yen like that, right? Doesn't same look thing. as good. That's the same thing. Mikey, great idea. Let's just do a put spread. I like Mikey's unlimited profit potential. 
on the for sure for sure go ahead and buy the micro get in with mikey get get in with mikey yeah, buy yeah. the mcd yeah mikey i'm nibbling are you interested i'm nibbling watch this 100 bucks putting it in shipped how oh, we got another futures position we'll manage that on, we'll manage that oh did we find did somebody just turn on our tom must have got filled on something you don't think it was the exact same time i got filled on something i think it came from no i don't know i'm not sure i don't know what to say <laughs> <laughs> finally turned on our ringer. Um, okay, so uh, Harsha, who had the questions about coin, is coming in with this question. When selling delta neutral strangles, is it better to pick 30 delta strikes or 20 delta strikes? Looking at ARM. So let's take a look at this. We'll go back to the platform. ARM 130.155 call. Usually the research shows if the vol's really high, if you have a really high IVR, you can, it's okay to bring it in. If the vol's lower, I might go with the 20 delta over the 30 delta. We've got 29 rank. I might do 20 delta with the 29 so rank. I wasn't, so you were reading while I was in here. So she went with the 130, 130 155. 155. That's a 43 delta on the upside and a 34 delta on the downside. That's not, that's nowhere near a 20 delta. No, and with the 29 rank, I'd probably stick with the 20 delta. You're going to go farther out. So with well, the 20 delta, you're going to go 185 and 115. 115 and even higher. Yeah, you can probably go the 190, right? Yeah, yeah. the 190. So there's a ton of, here's what would be a little bit of an uh, alarming to me. I wouldn't press this button. No, here's what's alarming to me. That you're getting 950, 950 on a strangle in a $130 product. This, that seems like an obscene collection for a $130 product. This is definitely not mine because I did not get filled. But Tom and I simultaneously got filled at the same time. Or something. Um, I would hesitate to sell this strangle, but that's just me personally because I don't like, I'm a risk averse person. No, this is just back to the naked call position. Yes, so like I do this thing. Again, you, you, so I will tell you, I, I, the, the, uh, how do I say this? Tasty, there's lots of personalities in Tasty Trade, and there's lots of people with different size accounts, and there are lots of mechanics at Tasty Trade. They all follow the loose principles of selling premium. To me, I've been doing this for a long time. My biggest, 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 biggest have been naked calls. My biggest yes. losses have been naked calls to the point where I, it's hard to defend naked calls. It's okay. Now that being said, lots of people trade this way. You're looking at a rank. Uh, we have a tendency to lean towards lizards, right? So what we might do is I might Where do you have no risk to the upside. No risk to the upside. It's so tough. You were willing, but you were willing to t sell that put at the 20 Delta. Yeah. It's not that tough. No, we're here. You've got a $5 right call spread and a naked put. You're getting you're getting over $5. If it goes through the call spread, you'll make money. You won't be losing and you won't have that stress. My biggest losses too in the last how, however many years we've been doing this are on naked calls as well. And I would not sell a naked call in ARM, but people do. And Tony from Mexico, who is he's a friend of the show and we, he fills in mm -hmm. quite a bit too. He and I have talked multiple times, numerous times about how in his account, I'm just, I mean, I think I can extrapolate and say it's bigger than a bread basket, right? Yeah. And he has... If you want a bigger collection, you can move it further and you can widen it, but maybe make it $1,000 in risk or two. Maybe define your risk on the call spread so that, because now you're, you know, you're in the situation with coin where like, oh my gosh, it's getting close um, to my call. What do I do? If you define your risk on the upside, you never have that worry. Right. You never have that worry. You never have that worry. And that's kind of how the Jade Lizard was born, was the fact that I was done being like, I get, I get the taste of trade mechanics. I'd rather be the house than the, than the gambler, 100%. Yeah. And selling premium makes you the house, not the gambler, right? It just right. does. That's it, If you do it over time and in enough things, you're going you're gonna to wind up winning. But in my heart of hearts, it's very challenging to go through naked calls because the nature of the way it goes. The implied volatility mm -hmm. technically comes down, and then it's hard to defend. And there mm -hmm. is no ceiling. There is always a floor. And sometimes when something it looks too good to be true. Like you look at this, there's a ton of premium. It's like, whoa, look at all this premium. This looks too good to be true. It's call skew too. I know, I know. It changes to implied volatility. So I don't know. I, I, I. So she's asking about Delta. I don't know if he's a he or a she. Well, whoever it is, I just assume everybody's a girl because you know we're girls. So um, they, they, it's interesting because I do think a lot of the a lot of the research is I don't have a problem selling calls in some baskets of ETFs because the skew. Well, this is isn't arm, there. arm. Arm is. Arm is in a basket. Yeah. What's an arm? Yeah. Right? Arm is not an ETF. Let me see. Oh, I mean, so fine. Even if it is a basket, this is not an ETF. Like if I'm looking at this, something without um, call skew, let's look at IWM. So if you're looking at IWM, I'm just going to go to, we have something in there. Um, Arm Holdings. 
What do we not have in? What do we not have in? That's an ETF. We have SPY in, right? April. Here, I'm just going to go to May 3rd. So if you take a look at this, implied volatility in SPY. When I look at the call of implied volatility, I'm to the expected move. So you look at the 530, it's a 12.97 implied volatility. Then you look at the 540, it's a 12.07. The implied volatility is going down as you get higher and higher and higher in strikes. Oh no, it's that, a it's British a, semiconductor. Yeah, it's a it's it's arm is not an ETF. Uh, but 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 so look at this. I don't want something with call skew, and it doesn't matter. This is just my opinion. But um, normal skew is in implied volatility will get cheaper as your strike goes up in price versus the put side where it's going to get more. Expensive. If you look at the 510, it's 11.29. If you look at the 505, it's 12. That's what Volsku does. I'm okay with that. Uh, British software, British semiconductor company. Yeah, it's definitely not. I mean, I would define my risk in there that, for sure. Yeah. Did you really think ARM was an ETF? Maybe I'm thinking of ARC. Maybe I was thinking just You're thinking, thinking of ARKK. Yeah. yeah. ARKK so and ARKC. Go, will you go to the, um, will you go to the chart? I don't know. I I would be leery of naked options. Here. I think. I mean, I this think, thing went from seventy to one hundred and forty. I think we've stated our case there. <laughs> yeah. Just I don't want to get another message of like, what do I do with my naked calls and arm when it's through it again? Or, these things are whipping around. They are. They are. They do. They're whip. a little bit. They're. There's a reason my favorite puts to sell are in SoFi. <laughs> cheap, inexpensive book. I mean, I yeah. don't know. I don't know. It's, Let's pop back into Twitter. Do we have more tweets coming in? Oh no, we got to the. We got. Um, Harsha was our last one. Okay, I perfect. think we got to everybody else. It is tricky when it gets there, though. So, but that's those are those are the hot topics. All these chip companies are hot topics. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, okay. Anything else we want to manage while we get in, before we get in here? Let's work on um, the platform. You put, in, you put in the Canadian dollar. We have Walgreens, which lines, yeah, I'm filled immediately. And will you look at? Will you just look at natural gas for me? Only because I'm touch and go. Sure. I'm touch and go with one that's expiring today at noon. Well, it. And one si one point six four five. What I tell you? I need it at one point six five or above. What I tell you? Hold. It was at one point three when we started. The what show. time does it close? Listen, I was very I was very proud. Um, twelve twelve o'clock I believe. Maybe right. So you got about an hour. No, maybe it could. Is be it closed already? No, because there's no. still three point oh no, three cents in there. So it was funny. I was listening to Jamal and Anton and. Jamal's like, you know, Liz is like a natural gas trader. I was like, my my positions in natural gas. You open them up. I'm. I, my positions are this big. I have no idea why. I became and last year it was creator. your biggest winner. Last year was my biggest winner. Yeah. I let these things go because this acts super goofy. At the end of the day. It acts super goofy the last week, always. The last, like. But what I love about this is it's cash settled. So it doesn't, so it's cash settled. You're not going to take a tankard of natural gas. Right. You, you can let it go. And if you look, we're talking about this, like the zero day that's expiring today, because if you look at natural gas on the top, that 1.809 is the next cycle. And you can see that right here. And, I, and rolling is hard because you're rolling from, it's hard to roll from 1.6 to 1.8. You're not rolling to the same strikes. So I have just let mine go. 1.65 is my short strike. So I almost think I treat this very similar that I, as I do the, as those SPX trades. I don't yeah. put a GTC in for them. I just, just let them go. Because at the end of the day, if I'm going to put another one on, I'm not going to try to roll. Because you're not even, it's, it's kind of like trying to roll, in my opinion, from, um, nat, like, it's kind of like trying to roll from IWM to SPY. It's a different price. It's a different, it's a different price. It's a different yeah. contract. It's a different day. Yeah. It's, it's almost not worth the roll. Well. That's why UNG has a drag. So if you look at this, UNG has a drag because UNG has to take the futures contract. So they're taking little bits over time mm -hmm. and they're taking it from 1.64 to 1.87. And that higher price is dragging the price of UNG And UNG down. is okay to be in if it's a shorter term trade. Yeah. Just not as a longer term trade. Right. Right. Not as a longer term trade. It is true. Um, uh, okay. So that was, that made, that made me feel bad. So Walgreens Boots Alliance, we have, I just want to Short puts with 25 days to go, roll them out to May. The only reason I'm saying this is they have earnings on Friday or on Thursday when we're both gone. Did you see the PCE numbers are coming out on Friday with nothing open? That's interesting, isn't yeah, it? That's crazy. I thought it was nuts. So well, the PCE numbers are coming out this Friday and I think are the future. But it's out? probably like a certain day of the month, right? Friday. The last day of the month? The last Friday of the month? Maybe. It's the last Friday of the month. It is the last Friday of the month. So they are still coming out, because that was the big debate, is whether the numbers mm -hmm. were still coming out with the market being closed. Do you want to roll Walgreens to May? Because then... Sure. Then we I, I think any na naked option we have, we should roll to May. And we have to, we have tomorrow and Wednesday, too. Now, we're going through earnings, but this, I don't mind... Who do you have on Wednesday? 
Uh, Anton. Oh, okay. But I have Anton locked and loaded. We won't be doing a lot of management. Yeah, you're going to be busy. Because we, I've got him locked with market measures. If you have any questions you want to ask Anton, I like to keep him in line. So send him to like, me. So you have a schedule for him. <laughs> Uh, so just roll that out to May. We'll keep. I don't mind keeping the same strike. We've had a bullish position in Walgreens Boots. No, we're only getting 27 cents, which normally I would not be doing, but I don't mind. We're going well, through earnings. It is bullish. We have some room to be right. It's a synthetic covered call at the 22 level. Yeah, we've been in this for a long time. Yeah. This is in honor of Liz's mom, whose favorite stock was Walgreens Boots yeah. Alliance. It was Walgreens. Then it, until then, it became Walgreens Boots Alliance. By chance, not by choice. <laughs> Uh, okay, so that is good. I'm actually going to take it down a little bit, make sure we get filled. Been and how is our spy diagonal that we have? To, it's a downside one, and I just want to check on it. I don't want to let that go and just, like, lose. How much is it worth still? 309 We're down $300. I know. I just, you know how we talk about adjusting them? You would have to readjust. So if you're going to do that, you have to adjust. Because there's the nothing size. left in that 490 anymore, barely. So if we were going to adjust, you would. You could take it. We could make this a longer duration trade. Right, where you could you can sell the May, like sell the May. It's crazy because it's almost where I'd be selling it. Um, I'm going to sell the May 503 and buy the June. 520. You're only putting an extra $3 in. Yeah, and it's pretty wide. It's seventeen dollars wide. Yeah, and this will give us this will extend yeah. our duration. Until we, get, we get don't back. have to worry about it till we get back. Okay, I'm shipping them, and we'll do quite a bit of management tomorrow. We're going to open yeah. up every position. And I think that I mean that's it. It's eleven o'clock. Wow. Okay, fastest hour of the day. Done and dusted. All right, Jenny, go. Oh. Um, you are going. Your son's here. We haven't even yeah, talked about that. Yeah, my son's here. We're going. Yeah. We're going over to the German consulate to get his visa. I can't wait. I have like a stack of paperwork this big to take in. Does he speak German? Nothing. No Sprecken Z Deutsch? No. <laughs> um, are you going to go sell your silver earrings? I am. I'm going to see what TP will give me for them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. Have a wonderful day. Remember to trade small, trade often. Laugh with us, learn with us, and watch the Listen Jenny Show. See you tomorrow. Ninety percent goes to S and P index funds. Ten percent straight to bank. Is twentieth century advice driving your twenty-first century portfolio? Tasty Live has joined forces with the CME and SIBO to offer the industry's first multi-exchange trading collaboration. Our new live event, Building a Complex Portfolio, puts active traders on the path to modern portfolio creation. Tom Sosnoff and other Tasty Live personalities will cover strategies that will help you integrate futures and options in your portfolio. Sign up at tastylive.com slash events and see where we're headed next. does it cost you guys to do simultaneous hair flips? Years of practice. Trading is hard enough. Here's what liquidity is. You want to be like water. Liquidity is in reference to how easily you can get in and out of a position, from volume to open interest to actual price at which you can buy or sell your position. It's important for all traders, from stock traders to futures traders to options traders or even crypto. Tight bid ask spreads and high volume are characteristics of good liquidity. Have any questions feel free to toss them in the chat
It feels good to get smart. Get even smarter with the ultimate how-to guide. Learn 31 different option strategies, covered calls, iron condors, jade lizards, become a trading mastermind. Get the guide at tastylive.com slash guide. We built the Tasty Trade app for today's traders. See it, tap it, trade it. Deposit and withdraw money right in the app. View company financials, forecasts, news, and more. Set custom alerts to stay up to date. See things bigger in landscape mode. Get the customizable trading experience you want. The tools, the data, the knowledge. See it, tap it, trade it. Join the club, genius. Tasty Trade. What's up, everyone, and welcome back to the show. This is Option Trading Concepts Live. My name is Nick Batista. I have my friend Katie McGarrigal with me in the house today. And if you want to come join us, hop over to YouTube, type in Tasty Live, come to our channel, give us a like, and subscribe to our videos because that helps us immensely. But more importantly, just come chat with us live because we'll be taking questions throughout the show. Whatever you got questions on from strategies, concepts, trade ideas, trade management, whatever. Just come hang with us for the next hour of the day, my favorite hour of the day, because I can spend it with my friend Katie. How are you? Good. Are you missing your boy, though? Yes. Mikey is um, shredding some pow mm -hmm. up in Big Sky. We've been in constant contact with, you know, the betting that has been going on throughout the weekend. Okay. Which, um, I have to give a shout out to Rob, who's already in our chat right now. Uh, but it, his strategy worked flawlessly. Uh, my dad and I went on a, a little half and half okay. with all the betting. So we were up about 15 units, the all said and done, which was, Jeez. which is fantastic. Yeah. Yes. So shout out Rob paying for some dinners this week. Love it. <laughs> yeah. What else is going on? I mean, um, anything else outside of the world of NCAA basketball or? I, that's my focus mostly yes. for the for the Are near you term for the Illini? Yes, as, I can't you as can't a former as an alum. I need your support. Did you get some drinks and party all weekend? No, I mean, come I, on, I, sweet 16. I, I really wanted to, but um there was a little bit of a covid scare with some people uh, that I've been rubbing elbows with the last couple of days. So Come on. Trying to be cautious and make sure I'm doing my part to not uh, spread anything. So I had a very low-key weekend, so I was watching from the comfort of home. No. And then my dad texted me. He's like, are you going to Boston? And I momentarily thought he meant, like, for here, for Tasty Live, uh -huh. like, as an event. And I was like, no, we're not doing Boston <laughs> this year uh, on the road. And he's like, I meant for, you know, basketball. But you're not like, that well, guy. I'm still not doing that, so... That's fair. I will be watching from the comfort of home, but ILL, go Illini. I know. It's unfortunate we can't. In Illinois, they don't let you bet on any of the Illinois teams. Mm -hmm. So you can't bet on uh, Illini or the Northwestern game, which was last night. So mm. um, those have been excluded from my Rob bets, wow, unfortunately. Wow. That's okay. Well, in other non uh Non-bets, but probability-based assumptions. Okay. What's going on in the market? What have you been doing? Uh, it's, scale me. <laughs> I haven't done a ton today. I did put on a trade in Reddit, which the options just got listed today. So if you've been looking to trade Reddit you're, and you want to trade in options, um, those are open. It is cash secured, so it is very capital intensive to trade if you're looking to trade like naked puts or naked okay. calls. I did an upside crab trade. I can definitely walk through that as well. I'll give a quick little market update. Uh, we've got the E-mini S&P 500 futures here, 5282. We're down 10 on the day. It's been a big old nothing burger. We did get down to 5272, which is 10 points lower from here, but it's been a very tight 20 point range. It is a short week, so you have to keep in mind that Friday, Oh yeah. good Friday, take the day off, enjoy, do whatever you want. Um, market holiday, so the market will be closed. Uh, but we do have the end of the quarter SPX guess, which will be on Thursday, which will be some fun on the show. We'll see if uh, anybody's close. Our very own Mikey Butler 
is within within shouting range from it. It's pretty amazing. Ugh. We were talking about this like on the very first of the year, were we not? Yes. Five three three seven is his guess. A hundred points out of the money from here. Man. Which the way this market is moving, could be could be a couple days. Yeah, it could be. I mean, that would be very just classic of him. Of course. You know. Of course. Some people have all the luck. <laughs> not that he always does. I'm not saying that. I know he's probably he, he, he could a use. Of he could use some good luck. Lately. He could use some okay, good luck. Yeah. I will say that much. <laughs> all right. Fair enough. Well, uh, then I wish you well, Mikey. I wish you luck. Just we'll be we'll be rooting for you, Mikey. But you can't win the prize. It's only viewers that can win the prize. So beautiful. Mikey will only get notoriety out of it. He will get nothing monetarily. <laughs> Nasdaq down fifty six. We got the Dow down one hundred and twenty six, and the Russell Buck in the trend up eleven points here, a little over a half a percent. Oil futures forward slash CL eighty two, basically on the dot, up a dollar forty, a little a little under one and three quarters of a percent. Volatility futures in the gutter fourteen thirty. 35 here on the VIX futures. Bonds down 14 ticks. You got gold and silver both catching a bid. Gold's up 16 bucks. Silver up two cents. And then Bitcoin uh, mooning again up to 70,000 on the future spot up 2,100 bucks. It's had a swift and ferocious move to the upside in the last two sessions. Love it. Yeah, I have not dabbled in much of anything uh, yet this morning, but covered. Oops. The wrong way. Let me see what I did. I covered my crude oil iron condor last week. Okay. That was a point and a half wide, so fifteen hundred dollars in terms of risk. Um, I collected five hundred bucks, so classic nice. one third the width, um, and then I covered it for a little over a two hundred dollar winner last week, just with a little bit of the pullback that we saw in crude and a little bit of volatility coming out of those options. But other than that, nice. I'm very light. Come with your ideas, yeah. and we can discuss. Yeah, that crude oil position, I closed mine earlier. I didn't have the, the stones to wait for uh, the other 100 bucks or so that you got out of it, so good good trade out of you. Thank you. I will go over the uh, Reddit position that I put on. So right now, you only have monthly expirations. You do have higher implied volatility, obviously, in the front. So April juiced up relative to May. May implied volatility up about 120% or 118 here. Uh, April at almost 130 here. So it sets up nicely for some upside, because uh, you do have call skew here, but an upside crab trade is what I put on. So I went into May, bought the 55 uh, strike call. I sold two of the 65s against it, bought one of the 75s. I did it at 324. Uh, it's trading right around that at like 330-ish, so it hasn't moved all that much. But I wanted to play the upside. Right. It's hard to do so when it's cash secured. Selling something like the 40 strike put is something I would certainly consider if you have a little bit more capital. I know that the IPO, the the Original pricing was somewhere in the mid 30s to 40s. So if you think there's a little bit of a pullback baked into this, you know, the 40 strike is an interesting trade in April at $2 and change. Okay. Even if you want to go to like the 25 and buy the 25 strike just to cap your risk, cuts your buying power in half down to 1200 as opposed to three grand. So you could do the 40, 25 at $2 and change. Pretty interesting. Little. Yeah. Yeah. Not too shabby. Yeah. And speaking of, give us a sh uh, follow on Reddit. Yes. So Tasty Live um, has a subreddit as well as Tasty Trade. I'll drop the links in the chat. But the Tasty Live side is hankering to get a lot more active yes. over there. So please come join us. I think we've doubled the amount of members we've had in just like seven days. So that's good. Let's keep it going. Um, lots of fun to be had over there in very short order. Yes, have some very fun stuff. I'll be on there. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll get Tom to join. Dang. Maybe my dad. Oh, yeah. Mikey, somebody. Yeah, I'll jump we'll in. Get the whole team. Know. There you go. Yeah, we'll have a little a little Reddit party. Beautiful. Lovely. All right. Um, so what are we covering today? So I got a couple questions over the weekend about uh, equal with butterflies and butterfly tr you know, trading around earnings and, and what to expect from a butterfly type trade. And so I figured that we would talk through kind of the setup of these trades, what the 
the makeup of the position is and then ultimately you know what we should expect out of these trades over the duration of them if you're starting around that 30 to 40 day time frame so yeah we're going to kind of talk through the ins and outs of butterflies and profit targets sure i this is a good one because i feel like this was something i learned about very early when i was trading with your dad mm -hmm. which by the way i was showing nancy who's also on the marketing team uh my old like show song okay and how was that like born to be alive remember that <laughs> i don't remember your song yeah, specifically it was but a okay disco song okay um, which, hey, no hate to, to disco. It was, yeah, I think uh, Patrick Hernandez, I think, is the guy. Okay. Anywho, I learned about butterflies when I was, like, first learning how to trade with your dad. And I feel like over the years, we haven't really covered them as much, primarily because, you know, we think more about how skew can play into the options and therefore mm. maybe it makes more sense to do something like a broken wing butterfly. So this is going to be a nice little refresher for me as well. And I'm eager to hear, like, where you kind of stand in terms of like when you do them, when it makes sense to, is this just kind of like a gateway strategy? So yeah, let's jump in. For sure. Let's do it. All about butterflies. So we're talking about butterflies and I group ratio spreads into this as well because they're very similar positions. So ratio spread, broken wing butterflies, they're omnidirectional trades. They contain an embedded credit spread with a ratio spread you have that embedded short call or you have that naked short call that is technically a uh, the the risk that you're buying in on that position is a spread so um, they're very very similar positions we say omnidirectional because they're <laughs> sort of what are you giggling about because this has been such a point of contention behind the scenes at tasty of course is it is it bullish is it bearish is it bothish like so it Keep going. I think we, I will say, I think Mike and I coined the omnidirectional. I think you did. Kind of uh, description for butterflies because if you ask a, 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 you know, a Tom or Tony or one of the old guys on the trade desk, they'll tell you all that matters is your delta, right? right? If you have long delta, you want the stock to go up. That's a bullish position. If you have short delta, you want the stock to go down. That's a bearish position. With right. a butterfly, you have uh, a dynamic delta where you you have no risk to one side, which means that that's where your delta leans. Right. But your best case scenario is actually against your delta. So it's a little bit, it's, Truly omnidirectional. Right, like you want you you'd be happy if it stayed where we are, but like your sweet spot might be a little one way or the other. Yes, totally, um, and that goes to the first point here. So starting delta um, uh, is on the risk-free side. So if you're doing a call broken wing butterfly or call ratio spread, you'll have short delta. If you're doing a, a put broken wing butterfly or put ratio spread, you'll have long delta. Mm -hmm. But the max profit is where your short strikes are. So you have that, you know, no risk to one side, but you ultimately, to get the most profit out of the position, you actually want it to move against your delta. Um, and that's because you have this dynamic delta. You, you have this closer at the money long option, which has some positive gamma. Mm -hmm. It increases the value of that option as it, it gets in the money. And so, you know, you're, you're ultimately your, your best profit is at your short strikes, which is a little bit funky with um, uh, going against your delta. In terms of turning these into risk-free positions, uh, ratio spreads, your risk is a naked option. So if you do a one by two on the call side, you're short an extra call, that is your risk. If you can buy in that risk, so either closing out of that naked short call or making this an equal with butterfly for less than the credit, mm -hmm. you'll have a symmetrical position that has no principal risk on the table. You have risk in that the position holds some sort of value, but you have no risk other than whatever your position is trading for. Right. And the same thing goes with the broken wing butterfly. So you have a wide, you're selling a wider credit spread to finance buying a tighter debit spread. If you can buy in the risk of that credit spread, that extra width that you have, you turn that into a risk-free position. Again, the risk being whatever the value of that position is currently trading at. Both these trades, whether it be a broken wing butterfly or a ratio spread, they're gonna be very, very high pop trades. So you have a high probability of profit, meaning you can make 
a, a penny on that position or more, a dollar or more on that position. But ultimately, the probability of hitting that sweet spot mm -hmm. is relatively low. And that's kind of what we're going to focus on here in the next couple slides. Yeah. And I think it's worth kind of mentioning, like I know I started being all gung-ho on the actual, the true butterfly of this yes. whole thing, but just to kind of drive that point home, the true butterfly is similar to what Nick is saying with respect to like, you know, you're selling the guts and buying the wings, but you're buying the wings on both sides, typically at an equidistant stretch with respect to where your long and short strikes are. Mm -hmm. So it might not be as high probability of a trade as your ratio spread or broken wing butterfly because you're typically not able to do them by and removing risk to one side. Like you typically have to like pay a couple of pennies for that trade. Um, but it does still have that max profit at a peak, if you mm -hmm. will. And ideally it's typically done relatively like near where the stock price is trading. Maybe, yeah. you know, anywhere between where it's currently trading and somewhere within the expected move. Yes. I will drop um, a little bit more about like the traditional butterfly though in the chat for those that want to learn a little bit more. Cool. But carry on, what is on the next slide? All right, so when we talk about risk-free butterflies and we talk about buying in the risk, this is what you're doing. So uh, you've seen this multiple times. I love this slide. Um, when you set up, and this is on the put side, when you, when you set up a put broken wing butterfly or a put ratio spread, you're buying one closer at the money, selling two further out of the money, that's your short premium. To buy in the risk, you need either one of two things or both things to, to happen, right? You need either a move in the direction of your delta, so for a put broken wing butterfly, the stock going up right. because you're long delta, or for time to pass, it pass, or a combination of those two. So those two things working together are definitely going to help you. If you get that move, you can buy in the risk on the initial entry of that position. If you can do that for a, le for a lesser amount than you originally opened the position for, right. you give yourself that equal with butterfly, that free shot. That's the embedded, you know, buying in the embedded short spread of that butterfly. The equal with being, you know, 10 by 10, the butterfly being 10 by 20. If you can buy in that extra $10 mm -hmm. of, of of room, you'll turn your position into a risk-free butterfly. The caveat is, is that if you are making this adjustment, it means that the stock has moved, it has likely moved further away from your max profit zone yes. or time has passed. And so your overall position, it's going to be a low pop trade. It's going to be a lotto ticket type position. Right. You have to kind of manage your aspect expectations moving forward because, you know, those two things have, have worked in your favor, meaning the stock has gone away from your spread mm -hmm. and time has passed, hitting that max profit has now decreased relative to the opening position. Right. And also you need to be, in order to really kind of achieve your max profit, you need to kind of be really butting up right against expiration as well. So sure, you're taking off the risk. Maybe you did, you know, collect in the, your example 50 cents, which, hey, great. I mean, no complaints there. But you're going to be sitting on that position until, you know, the very end if you were to actually start to get closer to the dance floor in terms of where your short strikes are. 100%, and I think that was the, the uh, issue with the question is, that I received over the weekend is like, okay, I've, I have this butterfly, we've got X amount of days, when should it start to come into profit? And that's really what we're gonna get. When you're taking it, you, the things that you should take into consideration for a butterfly, the value of the butterfly or the ratio spread comes from the decay of that further out of the money short premium, so those two options that you're selling, as well as the potential intrinsic value gain on that long spread. So those two things are where you're getting your profit from. You have to keep in mind that the value of those two things are highly influenced by time, mm -hmm. which is extrinsic value. So when you have short positions, time is on your, on your side. Extrinsic value decays as time passes. Uh, that's good. Right. When you have long premium positions, time goes against you, right? So the extrinsic value decays and that, becomes, that position becomes less valuable. So the time factor is on your side for the short premium position. For the long premium position, you need that intrinsic value 
to come into play. And we know intrinsic value is static, so if an option is $5 in the money, it has to be worth at least $5. That's its minimum. Right. But we know that as positions get closer at the money, extrinsic value also increases. Correct. So when you're long that premium, you're, that extrinsic value is going against you. So you need the combination of the decay of your short premium and the decay of your long premium with the intrinsic value to start working in your favor. That's how you get to that max profit potential. And that really comes down to time decay, which is what, really what you're playing with these positions. Right. Do you tend to have a appetite for one over another? Or does that... Well, I love my crab trade. That's why I, I created it. But I would say I would say ratio spreads are probably my go-to just because they move a little bit faster. Yeah. You know, something like a PayPal or Square. You know, these like fifty to set DraftKings would be another great one. Something like that. A ratio spread plays perfectly into because it's low priced. It doesn't use a ton of capital. Yeah. Volatility is high there, so you can be flexible. You can manage the position. You could sell, you know, a uh, uh, naked option against it because if you have the ratio, you're naked an extra option. You could sell the other side. Mm -hmm. There's so much that you can do with those positions. So I lean towards ratios Got over it. a broken wing butterfly. Fair enough. But it's all a capital. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you have to keep Your in risk. Like you're saying, what's moving? Yes. Like. And I'm looking at gold because it's trading, you know, near its highs. And I remember there was a time when I thought I could be like really cute and do like and there's typically call skew to uh, to, to gold futures options. And there was a time where I think I like tried to do like just a ratio spread. But as you know, they get teeth very, very quickly. Um, so I, I basically pushed the button and then I immediately changed my mind and I got out of it right away. <laughs> that span margin can catch up to you. It starts small true. and then it gets very big. It's so very true. Careful. It's very true. But um, yeah, I would say kind of on the flip side of that, I'm probably more in the broken wing butterfly camp just because of time management and risk yeah. tolerance. And I don't mind something that's a little bit slower moving. Um, but, you know, like you're saying, there's room for all depending on what your preferences are and with futures you gotta be smaller totally because you get that extra leverage so those positions can get very big and in something like gold you know our yeah. the accounts we're trading in is it's not big enough to yeah to do naked there not at all um one more slide i want to get to guys if we can um so here's mm. kind of an expectation for profit targets on these sort of positions. And this is gonna vary significantly by the width of your spread. So if you're in something like NVIDIA, your, your ratios are broken wing butterflies, they have to be more like 20, 30, 40, 50 points wide in terms of your, your spreads versus something like, you know, Roku that can be $5 wide. It's relative to the stock price. Right. You, I, I, the suggestion I usually use is about uh, 5 to 10% of the stock's price is how wide your spreads should be. So in NVIDIA, you should be looking at like 50 to 100 point wide butterflies or ratio spreads in something like a PayPal that trades at 60 bucks. $5 wide is, is relatively wide for a ratio or butterfly spread. Sure. So you, you got to keep that in mind. If you're doing something like $1 wides or $3 wides in SPY, something like that, those aren't going to move nearly as fast as what I, I outlined here. But um, in terms of days till expiration relative to the options for managing this position, for a ratio spread, you can see from, from what I've put here that your position is going to move much faster. It's still going to take like 20 days to get any sort of profit out of that extra profit zone for sure but once you get towards that like 21 day mark up until expiration you'll start to see added profit potential around that 21 day or maybe a little bit um, before that in the 22 to 28 day range that's when you'll have the opportunity or potentially have the opportunity to buy in risk turn that into a risk-free butterfly um, after that, you can see profit potential starts to ramp up. And really, when you get to the last week or so to expiration, that's when the peak profit potential really comes into play. Right. So you're not going to be, if you're pinning the short strikes and you still got 20 days to go, 
you got lots of time, lots of price uncertainty, you know, lots of volatility baked into the underlying. Like there's, you're not going to be at 50% of the max profit. You'll be at somewhere around 10%. Right. And that's even more skewed for the broken wing butterfly. And that's because you have relatively less risk. You have less premium that's decaying out of the short spreads. You have the decay of that further out of the money long option that's going against you. Mm -hmm. Much more um, time intensive as is any defined risk position. Anytime you define risk, you should expect to be in that trade longer. Yeah. What are your, what's your position on, like if you're new to this, right? Like you mentioned some really solid points, like maybe don't do like super narrow spreads or if you are like, just know that they're not gonna move a whole lot. Think about the price of the underlying relative to your spread width. Um, and then you kind of talked about expectations in terms of how long you'll need to be in this trade. Mm -hmm. Do you think it prudent for somebody that's new to maybe set up a GTC saying, okay, here's the credit I did collect. I would ultimately be happy to turn this into a free trade at X. Mm -hmm. Like, do you think that is something that a new trader can do in order to kind of like remove some of the emotion of like withstanding any changes in the stock price? 100%. I think that's... You know, if it helps you be comfortable with your position and, and not worry about your position and you're not able to be right in front of your platform like we are all day, mm -hmm. I think that's a, a perfectly reasonable thing to do, especially with turning it into a risk-free butterfly. I think for me, I, I don't like the excess orders in my book. They just kind of like take up too much space. And I'm sitting here watching my positions all day long, so it's easier for me to, to say uh, that I don't need to use them. But I think for most people, certainly can put that resting order in to buy in the risk and right. you know let that position play out. Lovely. And the other thing to mention too that caught me off guard, I guess, when I was first learning about all of these types of trades is if you do buy in that risk, know that on your positions tab, your trade is going to look different, yes. right? Because you're closing out, in the case of the broken wing butterfly, you're closing out one of those legs. In the ratio spread, you're buying one that's new, but you might look at your P&L percentage of like how much of your max profit you've capitalized on, or you might see like a really large like green number if you're able mm -hmm. to buy in that risk. And just do yourself a favor, check out the order chains feature on Tasty Trade, because that yes. will really be able to show you like your true realized, you know, and unrealized gains and losses for a position if you're starting to like manipulate the strikes that you have on. Because that was one that was like, oh, like this looks really good. Like I didn't think I made that much. And then uh, you're realizing like the way that the platform is doing the math because of the closed out leg. Yes, the realized the versus unrealized values, so. Right, yes. correct. Should we get to some uh, questions in the chat? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so first up we have a question from Harsha. I sold the 300 strike April coin call okay. for a $12 credit. A rough trade. How about buying the 200 call for 82? Buying the 200 call for 82 for a $70 net debit spread? Okay, so paying to reduce, okay, the, the price of the spread. Yeah. It would reduce my buying power by about $5,000. So trying to kind of triage a position that maybe isn't necessarily working out. Uh, it, it's a really tough adjustment. You you're putting a lot, I, I know you're reducing your buying power, but you're putting $8 of risk on the table mm -hmm. or $800, $80, which is $8,000 right. to buy that position. So that is risk on the table, assuming, um, you know, or in the event that we get below 200, which, you know, seems like it's far off, but it is not all that far off. Sure. I, I will just... You know, you're if you sold this at well, the 300 at twelve dollars, you'll have profit potential net net here. You'll still have like three grand of profit potential if the stock continues to rally. If the stock stays here or goes lower, you're going to lose money on this position. So if your net cost on this is somewhere around seventy dollars, you'll need the stock to be above two seventy to have profit potential on this position. If the yeah. stock 
drops below, you know, goes to 260, now you're out $1,000, whereas your call is would be profitable a thousand dollars. So you're totally flipping the switch on your position. You're now going from a a pretty heavy short delta position mm -hmm. to a pretty heavy long delta position. Right. You know, you're synthetically a covered call here. You're going from a sh you know short call, right? Naked call to now a cover call. Yeah. That's a big adjustment into what is a significant move here. So I, I would that wouldn't be the adjustment I would make. I would be more mechanical, sell a put against it if you want to reduce your 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 risk here. So the 300 call is about a 40 delta. Yeah. I would sell something around a 20 delta put. Collect another eight bucks, 230, 235, something like that. Sure. And reduce your delta that way. Fair enough. All right, uh, Ron, looking at a Boeing strangle in the May 3rd. Um, right. expiration so it's looking like there might be an earnings announcement prior to that but May 3rd 175 puts 210 calls I think the liquidity in this expiration mm -hmm. I don't love um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts though with respect to you know holding knowing that you'd be probably holding this through a potential earnings announcement how that might keep volatility high would yeah. you do something naked in Boeing with everything going on <laughs> I, I mean, the stock has rallied like $10 from the lows. When I closed out of my position, I like took a small loss in an iron condor I had like, in, in, the, in the first move. You know, you get 3 or $4 and you're like, thanks, that's a gift for this position, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. out. And then you watch the stock go another $7 higher and you're like, God, I'm such a Johnny. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. Uh, yes, of course. The hindsight trade is, uh, is undefeated. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you on the spread. So if you look at these May options, 50, 60 cents wide on the put, you know, 20 cents wide on the call, I, I would just prefer to be in the in the May monthly. You got 10 cent wide options, much more liquidity, much mm -hmm. more open interest. So I would do that. But mechanically, I, I, I don't mind the trade 20-ish delta on either side. Right. Collecting dollars, you know, I, I like it. All right. Fair enough. Um, let's see. So from H Montero, and you kind of already touched on this, but just to drive the point home, when would you favor a broken weave butterfly over an iron condor? I would say, oh, over an iron condor. Yeah. Um, they're very similar. I would say an iron condor is hot, is, of course, it's going to be a higher probability of making X amount. So if you're trying to make, you know, like if you're selling premium and you want to capture some premium, yeah. you're going to get that from the iron condor. It's a short premium position, short volatility. The butterfly is more of like a shot trade. Yeah. So I don't know if I would, uh, there's something specific that I would do or the reason that I would lean towards one or the other. I would say if something's very high volatility, I would probably lean towards iron condor, but they're, they're two very different um, plays. Yeah. You know, you're, the ratio butterfly, you're, you're taking a shot. And I, I usually like to buy in the risk and leave that shot on just because, you know, the, the asymmetry of the risk and reward, like I, I want to play for that $500 profit versus take 20 cents. Mm -hmm. If I was trading 20 or 50 contracts and we're talking about a couple hundred bucks, then I take that, you know, like a big dog, like Tom was sure. trading. Then Fair I enough. take that off the table. What about throwing a wrench here? What about where does that fall in then with like either a jade lizard, which is mm. a short call spread and a naked put, which kind of is like the marriage of like a ratio spread and an iron condor or a broken wing butterfly and an iron condor or something like a dynamic width iron condor. So you're playing for range, but you're also, if done properly, reducing risk to one side. Jade Lizard is basically an Athamoney butterfly yeah. or an Athamoney broken wing butterfly. You have the risk to the downside. You can see the uh, the risk profile is very much the same. If you had a butterfly, it would be something like this. I mm -hmm. know that's in the money, but still right. same for yeah. uh, all intents and purposes. I, I, I think it comes down to uh, obviously risk tolerance and capital available. So selling the naked put, going to use a lot more capital. Um, but volatility is really your, your differentiator here. I would look for, like Boeing, I would probably prefer a Jade Lizard over a put broken wing butterfly. Why? 
because of that. Because of it's where it's been trading and. Ivy rank is 71. You want to capture some of that premium. Sure. So sure. I would lean towards the, the Jade Lizard. Okay. Um, kind of piggybacking on that then, are call broken wing butterflies like a thing or do puts historically like work better with that strategy? I Depends think, on what. Yeah, go no, on. Go no, 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 go on, go on. I was going to say uh, because equities tend to display put skew, meaning that the puts trade richer than the calls, you might see them a lot more in single name stocks than you would um, on the call side. But there are commodities out there. There are often stocks that also display call skew as well, where it might mm -hmm. be more applicable to do a call break going butterfly. But it's, it's tougher, I guess, is what I would say. For sure. And skew is definitely something that you can play into. It doesn't necessarily mean the outcome is going to be better. Right. But it's something that you can play into. I isolated coin here as one that's just an example. But coin very, very much has call skew. And you could see when you're looking at skew, you, and you could use this in any expiration, we typically go to the one that we would be trading, which would be April or May. We can go to April just to show this. Uh, but the way that you can see skew is either by looking at delta. So let's say going to the 20 delta option on either side, you can see the call is around the 270 strike. On the put side, it's 235. The stock is trading at 280, which means that you know the relative width of these 20 deltas is 45 points on the put side. On the call side, it's 90. Mm -hmm. So all else equal, it's the way you can look at this is that the market is projecting the probability of being 370, 90 points out of the money on the call side, and 235, you know, 45 points away on the put side are equal probabilities. Right. If it was normally distributed, it would, you know, the same $45 option away yep. would be the same price. So that's one way you could do it. The other way that you can isolate skew is by looking at the val the relative value. So if you were to say, let's go 50 points out of the money and we'll look at the 230 call yeah. versus the 230 put, which is both options, 50 points out of the money, the put trades are like seven bucks, yeah. the call trades at almost 14. Mm -hmm. So you have call skew. And that means that if you're doing a ratio spread, you're going to be able to go much wider or broken wing butterfly, yeah. much wider on the spread to collect that same amount of credit. So just to set it up, uh, let's go to like a, a 40 delta option and we want to get, you know, do this for basically a scratch, let's say. So something like this, 50 points wide on the call side for ratio spread. We go to that same delta on the put side and we go to the 270 to do that for basically a scratch, you can only go 30 points wide. This is even a debit, so you go even less than that. So you can only go 25 points wide. Right. So it doesn't mean that one is better than the other. Yeah. It just means that you'll have more potential profit on the call side versus the put side because of how wide you can make it there, and that's because of the skew. Right. Well demonstrated. Thank you. Um, moving away from the butterflies and the ratio spreads for a second, from Goron, is there a minimum number of days we need to like have a diagonal where it's reasonable? Like, what is the shortest amount of time that you can kind of set up a diagonal and have it still be something that you're comfortable with? I don't think it really. Uh, your the day still expiration is going to directly correlate to how volatile the position is. So if you're doing a 50 day for the long option and a three day for the short option, you need to be directionally correct pretty quickly. Yeah. And so you that that sets up well for something like an earnings trade or a binary event or you know if you just want to play Bitcoin long here for the next couple days, mm -hmm. doing it in Coinbase with a April and then the March weekly would totally just, you know, you could totally justify that uh, position. Sure. I just think, you know, with further, if you're doing something like a 50-25, like we have in May and April, you don't have to be directionally correct today or tomorrow. Totally. You can be correct in a week or two weeks, and you're still okay on your position 
that's the biggest difference between which duration you're choosing. Sure. But would you ever do something like you said that like the March, April with three days and 25 days. So like a three week difference in terms of time frame. would you ever do something like a three day, 11 day? See, that gets a little bit more dicey because that, you know, the, the benefit of going a little bit further out of the money is that that option holds its value. Right. And the, if you're doing two within like a very short where the, the premiums already come in like this. Yes. And we can, I can kind of show this in Coinbase here. I just did the 300, 310 and we can, we can analyze this here. So, um, these options are going to move m much more differently, right? So this option, this three dollars, is coming to zero at the end of the week. Right. This long option isn't moving all that much, and that's because volatility isn't likely to change all that much here. Like maybe a couple points, something like that. If we move this, and and you know your profit potential increases significantly over that short period of time. If we do something like the April, we'll do that same 300, and obviously this will be a cheaper position, so that's a benefit to it. Um, but when we look at the same position, oh, this volatility is gonna come down much more than uh, your April position is. And so you you really need, you could see your break even is right at the stock price. Right. Whereas with the April position, you'll have a little bit of a buffer and we could go back to that just to show this. You can see you have this five, five to $10 buffer to the downside where you really don't lose anything with the shorter duration one you know, you're really 50, 50 yeah, shot. Fair enough. So this is more of like a 60, 40 and shot. And the other one is like a 50, 50. Sure. Which might not seem like a lot, but you know, when you think about th the duration that you have to hit that, you know, you only have three coin flips. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's the difference between hitting, you know, needing to hit two of them or just needing to hit one of them. Yeah. Um, let's see, Brian, I have an MU strangle. I've got the 77 and a half puts, the 115 calls in the May 17th monthly expiration. Because it's so far out, would you just leave it alone for now or roll up the calls? So 77 and a half puts, which have like six or seven cents. Mm -hmm. And then the 115s, which are right on the dance floor. Yeah, I thought you were inverted on this position, but... You got to roll up. There's nothing or or take off the put because there, you know, there's no there's nothing more to make on this on the 77 and a half put. Mm -hmm. I've thrown in the towel and rolled up to the 105 strike on my position. But, you know, you could certainly justify going to the 110. I don't know. Do we know the credit on this position? I don't think we do. It, it, it's I know it's a tough decision. I wouldn't hate the idea of just closing the put and hoping for a down move at some point and then selling a new closer after money put, but it's hard to, you know, these stocks, it is hard yeah. to trade them. Big range today. Yeah. Jeez Louise. Okay. All these. NVIDIA as well. NVIDIA was getting at new highs. SMCI, another <laughs> one that's gone nuts. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Let's just never get over it. Just like, you know. That was my fault. I mean, I turned X. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes being a trader hinders you a little bit because you know, you're like, you know, yeah, it's, it's hard unless you like fall asleep and just sleep through it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's hard to say if you're long at 200 and you're going to just wait till it's a thousand. Oh yeah. And then that thousand print is going to happen in two months. Yeah. And then yeah. you're like, well, well 1400 why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then hold it, can, you know, yeah. through the next. So you 4X, what are you waiting for? Yeah. 8X, 10X, 12X? Mm -hmm. I mean, those, those sort of things, I guess it's more common in uh, the, the market that we've been trading in recently, but yeah. so it's still a hard thing to kind of stomach. Well, and I think that that's a good point, right? Is like, we talk about this and we make jokes and stuff, but I'm sure you get asked all the time, I do, like, 
oh, like, what's the next, like, stock that's going to be like that? Like, you know, like, what is the secret sauce to finding out what that, like, catapult is? And it is, it's not normal. So it's, you know, it's, I laugh, like, when I'm saying it just because, like, yeah, of course, like, we want, maybe not all the time, but, like, this is the first time in a while that stocks have been really memeish, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and so everybody always wants to know, like, okay, which one's the next one, you know? And it's just like throwing a dart. Like, you 100%. don't know. 100%. You don't know, guys. Yeah, I None wish. Of us do. I wish I knew. Um, let's see here. Do. Let's take a look at another MU, or nope, just kidding, MS, from James Bond. Happy Monday. Okay. I have a strangle in MS, the April 75.95 for a buck 17. It's supposed to have earnings on April 16th. Thoughts on rolling this out a week or just take it off for a scratch? So I'm assuming it's still trading right around where they sold it. Yeah, so you've gotten, you know, this is a perfect example of not having to be directionally correct with neutral strategies Mm -hmm. time decay works in your favor this position that you you know probably sold when the stock was somewhere in the 88 ish range i would imagine over the last couple weeks in this range mid 80s stock has rallied pretty significantly three four five bucks and this the put has gone basically to zero the 70 something yeah basically at zero your calls trading at 120 so you're out Five cents on the position. It's a big old nothing burger. Yeah. Um, that's a, the power of time decay. Um, obviously, going into earnings, it's a it's a, a directional shot. Just being short the call. If you wanted to flatten that out, you certainly could roll it out to May. You could sell the put in the in the same expiration, but um, it's it's a tough decision. Ivy rank forty two percent. Not bad. Is that you? Is that you? That wasn't me. It might be Tom over there. Um, Yeah. I think Tom's stopped eating lunch and is back (laughs) on his platform. (laughs) Yeah. What do we got today? Fontanos? Is what I heard. Rumblings off. I brought my own. Oh. Trying to be a good girl. That's good. That's smart. I know. Um, (laughs) It's a tough call. It's a tough call. I, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't really have a bone to pick here, Morgan Stanley. If you were to roll it out to say the May, you know, you're softening your delta, would you also consider like recentering in some fashion? So maybe I don't know. Um ninety five, eighty five like, is yeah, probably what I would lean towards. Like Cause you you I mean you you kind of want to lean a little short into this move. If you started neutral over the yeah. last couple of weeks, stocks up four or five dollars, you got to lean a little bit short. So, I think that's probably what I would roll to. Okay, fair enough. Um, AMD put credit spread the one seventy seven and a half one seventy five expiration on April twelfth. So two and a half points wide, pretty narrow. Um, but maybe you're new or you don't have a super strong assumption in AMD. 50-50 shot. Nothing wrong with it. Um, it's going to be a slow-moving trade, especially when you have something that has 50%, 60% implied volatility. It, it is unchanged today, but it's had significant two-sided action in both directions. So um, I, I don't mind the trade. I'm leaning a little bit long. Uh, or uh, a little bit long now with my position. I have a at the money put. I have the 200 strike call against it. So your assumption lines up with what I need. So <laughs> I will talk my book and say uh, that I like it. But you know, ultimately it's a 50-50 shot. Just to give you an idea of the change in that position. If you look at it here, it's trading at like a dollar ten. If we go to you know, next week, which would take off seven days of time. We look at the the eleven day options, it's trading at a dollar and change. So you got like ten cents of value. Yeah. Assuming the stock stays right where it is. Uh, it's very binary. It's going to be until you're gonna be holding this for the eighteen days. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Um let's see, Anka looking at cost C O S T. I was trying to go there yesterday. 
Were you? Couldn't convince the old ball and chain to go. Ooh, what were you in need of? Um, so like everything. Dishwasher, soap, antibacterial wipes, like the the cleaning kind of stuff, and then a couple of like lunch meal preppy things. Hence, bring okay. in my own lunch. But nice. anywho, Costco is down a little bit today. How about a call crab trade? Okay, it's gonna be a an expensive one. I mean, you you do a it, volatility isn't super high here, so um, it won't be that expensive. Um, so typically I look for like somewhere around a 40 ish Delta. I was leaning towards the 750 just because it's a little bit cheaper, but somewhere around like 740 to 750 for the long option out in May, you go into April and then you want to sell the twenties against it. So somewhere like the 755s, fives and then you buy a 15 point wing. So I, I don't hate how this sets up cause it, you know, do it around a thousand bucks, which is Typically, where I'm looking, maybe a little bit, even a little bit cheaper, but selling about four dollars. Uh, I'm sorry, selling about six dollars of extrinsic value, which is a decent amount of premium here. Mm -hmm. um, your risk profile as you get closer to expiration, of course, will increase. You'll see this gives you a nice little range to hit. You don't have your max risk is the debit you pay. So if something crazy were to happen to the upside. Uh, you, you only have a capped amount of, of risk. I um, I kind of like this as an upside play. 15 points wide, 740, 755, 770 for a thousand bucks. 740, 745, 770? 740, 755. Oh, 755. Yeah. Sure. So I'm doing this May, April. So May for the long option, April for the shorts. Okay. I'll, I'll tell you if I get filled at 720 because I'm definitely going to have to go above the mid. Actually, I will get... You got 10 something. 1020. Seven. Oh, sorry. Oh. 1020. I'm looking at the I know. You're looking options the are 740. I'm all over the Oh, place. good. I got filled at 1020. Okay. Okay. All right. What do you want to get out of it? 100 bucks, 200 bucks would be ideal. Okay. Um, that's what I tell you. Your max is probably 500 if you pin 755. So one trip to Costco is what you yeah, are hoping to get out of it. Maybe a fraction. <laughs> Maybe it's a lighter trip. Yeah. Infla <laughs> inflation means that Costco trips are yeah. two x. At least at, you're spending at least 300 every time you go. Yes. <laughs> Um, all right, switching gears a little bit to Theta Trader. Um, is my 6J coming back? I'm about ready to just move straight into FXY shares and wait until I'm right. Ugh. You know, I don't know what's going on with the yen. I'm hoping that maybe Mr. Westwater can uh, give us some insight maybe on Wednesday since I'll all be right. in here on Wednesday as well. But, yeah, this thing cannot, other than, you know, a little bit of a rally going into the end of 2023, this thing has had a pretty rough go of it. I mean, kind of similar to what, you know, one of the previous traders was showing us, like, you're probably just stuck with like a, a call debit spread if you wanted to use the yen futures options, mm -hmm. or as this person is saying, there is a proxy ETF, which is called FXY. It used to trade, I feel like we used to talk about it a lot more. I think volume has kind of come out of there. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, if you're just looking for, you know, long static shares, your guess is as good as mine, but obviously from a price extreme perspective, it's definitely interesting. I just don't know what it's going to take to kind of get some legs underneath it. I, I would say FXY, the only 46,000 shares have traded. So yeah. very, very thin markets here. If you look at these options, they're very, very wide, totally. um, especially the in the money options. So if you're trying to get like a synthetic uh, stock position, just be careful of your pricing because like this option, the 58 strike option, it's marked at 370. You're gonna get filled at a much better price than 370. This should trade mm -hmm. somewhere around parity. It's got no extrinsic value here. It should trade somewhere around $3.15. 58 plus 315 gives you the 61.15. So it probably trades at 317, 318, 319. It, it's going to be nowhere near 375. So just be careful when you're pricing these options. They're going to trade near parity. Yeah. 
All right, general question about navigating um, times of high and low volatility. Does it make sense to do iron condors when the VIX is so low? It's tough. You can't, like, I think what we've learned is that the strategies don't change. Yeah. Uh, the, the trade selection and the risk that you're putting on, that's kind of what changes. So, you know, there's still pockets of high implied volatility. You can look at NVIDIA. You can look at some of the chip names. Mm -hmm. You can look at Coinbase. You know, there, there's always going to be a pocket of volatility somewhere. Yeah. And, you know, if you have overall low market volatility, then you got to be more selective finding those higher volatility pockets. Yeah. And then, you know, sizing down and waiting for other volatility events, whether it be in individual names like earnings or just stuff that's moving or the market as a whole. Maybe the, the market takes a little bit of a down move and volatility increases and then you have all this powder dry to, um, to get in those positions. I... I you know, one of the things with the options is that you are leveraged. So, like, right. even if you're only using 20 or 30 percent of your capital, you're likely notionally exposed via options 100 percent of your cash value. So you're always fully in, even if your your capital isn't fully tied up. Yeah. So, um, short answer is I don't think anything changes. You just gotta be a little more selective with your positions right and keep risk and check yeah and of course like like you're saying with respect to selection i mean yeah. you know think about like especially with iron condors too because i fall into this trap as well like i really want to do i really want to be directional in an underlying but volatility is low so i'm like well i guess i'll take both sides but then i've like really compressed the range in which i can be profitable so mm -hmm. like you're saying like really kind of just go through your trading checklist of what feels right, what you think is feasible over a given time frame, and, and go from there. Um, let's see, Victor, I have a 4050 April strangle in INTC, which I sold for a little over a dollar. With reports of a potential China ban on Intel chips, how would you manage at 21 days to expiration? So I'm assuming the April monthly, 25 days. So mm -hmm. looking to kind of cover this, you know, in the next few trading sessions, they're 40, 50. Yeah, you're up money. Yeah, it's you're, up 20%. Yeah. It's or 15%. Not, if you're worried, maybe just cover close it. it and take the money and run. I mean, you could roll down the, the call, but it, trading at a bot, you know, starting at a dollar and change, it's trading at 80, 80 cents. Yeah. You take the money and run. Yeah especially if you want to free up that buying power. Like yeah. maybe there's something to your point. There's, is there another opportunity that looks attractive to you um, that you might want to, you know, dabble in if you were to free up this position? Yeah. Good stuff. Um, okay. Time for one more? Yeah, quick really one. Really quick one? Okay. Um, NVIDIA one by two trade. So this is a May 17 buy the 860 puts. Okay. Sell two of the 810 puts. That would be a width that I would find reasonable for something like Nvidia. Got to go 30, 40, 50 points wide to really see any value come out come into that position. Mm -hmm. Obviously for me I can't throw my whole account at this and especially if you're in a uh, smaller or a cash account or IRA account, you'll probably have to buy some sort of wing. You can buy the, you know, 700 and use only 6 grand in buying power as opposed to the 20. I think that would that would fit um, most people. So I would do that. All right. Fair enough. Should we wrap it up? Yes. All right. Thank you all, as always, for joining us. If you want to see anything in future episodes, just tweet at us. I'm at Trader Katie. Mikey, Shredding Narpow, at Trader Mikey B. Show him some love while he's gone. Show him what he's missing. Trader Nikki Bat is uh, Nick's handle. Mm -hmm. um, I will be back here on Wednesday with Thomas. I'll be in here on Thursday. Mm -hmm. So a little bit more from me. I think we're going to plan to cover some future stuff later in the week. But if there's anything you guys want to see specifically, Give us a shout. Good luck. Good trading. Peace.
One of the things that, that was most intriguing about the financial space to us is just that there wasn't a lot of vision. There wasn't a lot of innovation. And I think that that, you know, that left a, that left a door open for us, which we really liked. After almost 20 years of open outcry standing in the pit trading, I felt like all the markets were moving from kind of traditional open outcry to uh, electronic trading. I saw the writing on the wall and I wanted to be first. Building the best technology in the world for traders was one of the coolest things anybody could ever do. I loved every second of it. Thinkorswim will always be my baby, but this one, it's different. We built ours literally from scratch. It's a much thinner, it's a faster, it's a slicker application. Everything's on one page. So you're always looking at the core page and then bouncing around from there to get to whatever you wanna to get to. Most of our competitors have legacy technology and some of them are multiple firms. Their technology has just been rolled up into a single platform. That's not the best way to build a platform. We built ours literally from scratch. It's from the ground up. So we were able to design it in the way that we wanted to design it with the flexibility that we wanted. And obviously beyond that, we do have in my mind, the greatest customer service in the industry. You wanna reach out to me, you wanna to talk to JJ, it doesn't make a difference who you wanna to talk to. We're always available and not only are we available, we look forward to your questions. We're here to support whatever you're looking to do. So you can trade stocks, you can trade options, futures, futures options, crypto. We're agnostic to product. We have the tools that you need to be a successful trader. Golf putt, normal distribution, reduce speed, increase standard deviation for a wider angular strike. If you think like a trader, we've got your back. Tasty Trade. Join the club, genius. We are back. It's Monday, March 25th, 2024. This is Futures Power Hour, sponsored by CME Group. I'm your host, Chris Vecchio. He's Anton Kulikov. Anton, thank you for filling in for me last week. It was uh, it was my honor. No, actually, it was a very uh, my honor. It was my, it was my, it was my pleasure in the <laughs> 1500s. Um, yes, it was pretty fun. Um, we got to say we had the great, some great hosts. Um Finished the week with Ilya telling me why he was short the Nasdaq or some nonsense like that, um, and and then um, no, it was a really really fun week. New studio, it was great. Uh, I know that you were out sick, uh, but it worked out. We're glad glad to have you back. Nobody's talking about replacing your position. It's all good. Just kidding. <laughs> Didn't think so. <laughs> who, 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 you know, be, besides you, I mean, who else would be cheering on this market run, which has been a really remarkable run here, Anton. 17 of the past 21 weeks, the S&P 500 has closed higher for a gain of 27%. How many times has that happened before in US history? You can count them on one hand because the answer is zero. This is the first time you've ever seen a market Seriously. like this before. Seriously. Yeah, uh, some downtime on your hands in shoes. <laughs> Come up with some statistics like that. I could, I could, I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink water. And nothing like a you know sickness before the summer to get into beach shape, but uh, but I had plenty of time to read. My eyes were still working, and uh, was reading a lot of the stats on this market run. Five months in a row, likely to end up positive. We'll see how this last week works out. But one thing that did happen last week, uh, uh, you know, I tried to work on Wednesday. Beth wouldn't allow me to, which thankful for in hindsight because I was really truly sick. Um, was this FOMC meeting, and I had a chance to finally sit down and listen to it. Because the the commentary I was reading on Wednesday was that Powell himself was very dovish. And I have to say, I, I walked away with that as well. And I don't necessarily think that's a good thing for the broader market. I think that one of the backbones of the strength of this equity market rally over the past several months has been that the Federal Reserve has everything under control. That rate cuts may not be coming, but it's for good reasons. That inflation is trending lower, the labor market remains strong, and that GDP is still quite positive. You know, three percent or so, a little bit less than that in real terms, six percent or so uh, nominally. 
check, 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 check. That's fine. We don't need the rate cuts. But what Powell acknowledged on Wednesday and what the Fed's new projections in those summary of economic projections acknowledged on Wednesday is that not only will growth be stronger, so too will be uh, inflation moving forward. And I think that you are potentially entering a zone where the possibility of the market perceiving a policy error increasing in likelihood down the pipeline is, is starting to go up. What I mean by that is if the Federal Reserve says, yeah, the labor market can remain strong and we could still move forward with rate cuts or inflation, it's a bumpy road. So as long as we continue to make progress, we can begin to justify cutting rates. That leaves the possibility where ultimately inflation does make progress, but it never gets back to 2% and then starts to turn higher again later this year when the Fed has already started its cut cycle. And if we see that type of economic data play out, I think that's where you begin to hear those those people in the peanut gallery who've been wrong for many months thus far, those people saying, well, this could be like the 1970s where you get another rise in inflation. They're overlaying those charts, they're sharing them everywhere to scare people. They actually have a little may have a little bit more credibility. Not that it's going to be another move higher to seven, eight, nine percent inflation, but another bounce higher where you see threes, fours, God forbid, maybe some 5% readings uh, become a greater possibility down the line. And as, as that possibility grows, the market then has to reprice assets because all of a sudden, does the Fed have to back off those cuts once they begin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not to say I'm no longer a bull, Anton, but I think now the window, or at least the weightings of, is the Fed on the right path towards a soft landing or have the odds shifted with a little bit more of a, a greater likelihood of a policy error? I see that there. I thought Powell was probably too dovish for his own good on Wednesday. And that is something that I need to get off my chest as there's literally no one in my household. My four-year-old was not interested in talking to me about this while I was hugging the toilet Wednesday afternoon. I can imagine, actually. <laughs> oh, Powell was too dovish. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> uh, Daddy, are you okay? No. Um, no, but um, I'm never going to do that on air again. But uh, <laughs> there's that's a one-time only thing, folks. So, okay, I think the, everything we're talking about right now, I think is always has to be taken into a context of like a myopic point of view, right? That this could change in the next month, both either direction, right? And, and I think we've seen that um, very clearly back in the end of last year, right? Where, you know, the market was going down, going down, going down. The fears were there. All of a sudden, on a whim, that's it. It shifts overnight almost. There wasn't a huge capitulation to the downside. I mean, there was in the sense that there was a lot of selling multiple days in a row, but there wasn't like um, a single day of like whew, like a thousand points. You know, the Dow sold off a thousand points or the S&P sold off like 300 points. We didn't have a day like that. It was all of a sudden, boom, market sentiment shifted overnight and nobody ever looked back. But remember, we were talking about this a lot in 2022 and 2023. Well, that's, that's actually where I want to go with this conversation, Anton, because- if the Fed is potentially making a policy mistake, does that mean that you need to be bearish? And I think the answer is distinctly no, because yeah. we saw them make a policy make mistake in 2021. The second half of the year, the market was saying, you have to start raising rates. You have to start raising rates. You have to start raising rates. And the Fed said, no, we're not going to. And it was only once you got into the calendar turn of 2022, when you get those December 2021 FOMC meeting minutes, that first Wednesday of the trading year, that the market says, oh, the Fed is about to raise rates. They finally get the message. And then the asset pricing, repricing begins. But there was a six-month window where the market started pushing up interest rates and the Fed was continuing to say, we're not going to do anything. We're not going to do anything. We're not going to do anything. And so if interest rates are lower than the market perceives that they should be on the Fed side, so bond yields go up themselves, even though Fed policy remains unchanged, it, it's inflationary for asset prices otherwise. That was good for gold. That was good for silver. That was good for equity markets. Stocks did rally in the second half of 2021. The NASDAQ ultimately peaks in November of that year. So just because the odds are rising of the Fed making a policy mistake doesn't mean that A, we can't recognize that's happening and B, that there's still the ability to profit in a move going to the upside right now, which right. you know we're seeing a little bit of weakness here today right now. Technically, uptrends have been reclaimed or restored from the last time I was really engaging with markets the previous Friday. Um, 
But that doesn't mean that this rally is done because there are some really impressive stats being put up on the board. So I, I say that today is a day where the plot's really thickening here. The bulls have a lot of good data on their hand. The strength of this uptrend is historic. And historically, when you have rallies like this, it doesn't usually mean that the end of the rally is nearby. Yeah. On the other hand, it feels like, you know, you could begin to see that maybe we're playing with fire a little bit more here. At least that's my sense of things. Maybe that's just my, you know, fever induced interpretation from last week. But I did rewatch the Fed, uh, Fed Chair Powell's speech today, his, his press conference this morning um, while I was reviewing some things. And that is still my takeaway. He was uh, objectively a little bit more dovish, even though commodity prices are starting to rise back, gasoline prices are up, inflation expectations are beginning to trend higher. The, you know, CRE, I think part of the reason why he was dovish is because he's looking at CRE, commercial real estate, and saying like, we need to start thinking about some of the interest rate sectors, uh, sensitive sectors of the economy and providing a little bit more support there um, because there are some issues that are coming into play. But Anton, I know one thing that we haven't looked at in a few weeks is positioning in this market, which has changed markedly since the last time we checked in. Uh, I would point out that there is a big decline in net short positioning in the S&P 500 last week, which given the fact that the market has moved up to all-time highs, who wants to stay short in a market moving up to all-time highs? Similarly with volatility, as the market was moving up to all-time highs, you see that there was a big build in those net short positions. Volatility had come in. Of course, traders were positioned properly to benefit from that. Anton, this is basically the hand washing the other hand here. Uh, people are right on both ends, so to speak, by taking those shorts off the board in ES. And moreover, with short vol here on the table still, we've made it through the difficult part of the month that February 15th, we'll call it Valentine's Day to uh, St. Patrick's Day portion of the early part of the year tends to be difficult for equities, tends to produce a little bit more vol. We're on the other side of that now. April can be good. This looks like a market that still is fairly well positioned, nothing extreme on any end whatsoever. Kind of ignore it and move on. Yeah, and, and and I do I do want to say one more thing about that, you know, commentary on on the Fed and, and its policy. Sure. You know, they, I, I, you know, there, I, and and this is kind of after listening to Ilya. I think you can make a solid argument for both being um, a bull in certain markets and a bear in other markets, right? Whatever the time is, right? You, you can make an argument, and and you know, and Ilya did make his point. I didn't agree with it necessarily, but. I did think that it was an argument that came, came from a certain, like a, it was a disagreement on fundamental grounds, right? It wasn't a disagreement on, oh, your logic is stupid, right? It wasn't like, there wasn't anything like that. It was, a, it was a cogent argument, just didn't disagree on the, on the philosophical or, or I guess the fundamental basis, which is a fair, which that that's how, that's what makes a fair debate, right? However, I think that with these Fed you know, with these, with us looking at the markets like this position report every week, we look at the Fed cycle independently almost um, it, it, from the last time the Fed spoke. Um, you know, the two times the Fed spoke, like two times ago, almost is like non-existent uh, in, in this point. At least the market perceives it as old news completely. I don't really think that th there is any real, and I, this is going all going back to me to say that I agree with you. I don't think there's any reason to change um, our position or our bias until the market tells us otherwise. Whatever the Fed does, whatever fundamental data we get, honestly, I think it it is it, it doesn't bear any weight compared to the actual price action in the market itself. Um, and I think you would agree with that for the most part. So, yeah. Let's and and if, yeah, yeah, I mean, let's keep going, and we'll talk about the again the implications for if the if the odds of a Fed policy mistake are going up, how do you position for that? And quite frankly, I don't know if you change what you're doing in the short term, at least as it pertains to equity markets. That, that's a can, good way to say it. How can you change for it? Like right, and that's that's you know you identifying the, the the part of the cycle that you're in because the policy mistake part of the cycle is usually the later part of the equity market cycle. Now, again, given what we just saw where we had five months in a row and it's the November, December, January, February, March, you look at how the market performs the rest of the year. Equities are up every single time in history you've seen something like this before, for the rest of the year, hundred percent hit rate, and the average gain is like just short of twelve percent. So the, these, there are stats on the board that bulls can put into their pocket and say, this is one of the best equity market rallies we've seen of all time. When things like this happened before, it's usually not a precursor to the market topping out. There still could be legs left to this. And absolutely, if you're entering a window where the market feels like inflation 
could turn higher, but the Fed is going to say, no, we don't necessarily need to address it. We could still bring down rates because it's a bumpy road. Uh, then you get into a second half of 2022 or 2021 type of trading environment. And that's kind of how you adjust. And how did stocks perform then? Well, they still climbed. They were yeah. able to still climb. Sharply climbed, I may add. That was one it, of the most it, rapid fire years in history. And granted, it was it was the it ended up being the final six months, you know, final four to six months of the rally. But the rally did continue. So we're not, you know, one of the working themes, it's not that we're definitely in that environment, but the odds of us being in that kind of environment, I think, have gone up as opposed to the pure, it's just all Goldilocks, nothing is going to bring us down, there's nothing that can prove us wrong type of attitude that I've had personally uh, for the past several months. I know that you've had two, Anton. So the weightings for me are starting to shift, still not a bull, but where that puts us in the cycle maybe yeah. differentiates. And then you have those confounding variables where if we are in the policy or a part of the cycle, yeah, we could rally, but we're closer to the end. And then yeah. you think about the history of how the rallies performed. It's not at the end of the cycle, but either way, you still arrive at the weighted average of, should I stay bullish? And the answer is yes. And, well, and, that's, and that. that's that's the, see, that's exactly it, right? Realistically, let's say that that's true. Let's say there's a shift in, 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 in what's ahead in the next three months that was different than the last time we did the show. Let's say it's completely different. Would we adjust the strategy and the bias that we've had going on for the last three months a in any way, shape, or form? No, no. And, and 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 that's and and that's how the two, like my thesis, your thesis, diverge or converge rather. If I'm saying it's solely a price action thing, and you're saying, well, okay, maybe we'll have some fundamental variables that affect the outcome in the next three months is different than what we saw earlier. Let's say in three months we get a shift in price action, proves my point, proves your point. Trading strategy is the exact same. There's no difference. Anton, uh, by uh, request, bond positioning. You've been asking for this. Ask and delivered. The rebound in bonds that we've seen outside of today, because bonds are weaker across the board here, but the rebound that we saw last week and ultimately the basing we saw through March may have been driven by short covering. In fact, last week, the week over week change was a negative 16.4% drop in net shorts and ZN. Uh, the most recent report showed that there was a 6.1% drop in net short ZN positions, Anton. This is the lowest net short position we've seen in the bond market since mid-December 23, of course. When you think about where we were, bonds were actually trading much higher back then. So there's two takeaways here. Is there ample room still, given the size of the net short position, for uh, covering to continue? Yes. Is it worrisome the fact that we've seen a significant leg of short covering happen already, and yet prices aren't as high as where they were? Yes. That to me says the market's weaker. It's not necessarily speculators who are keeping this. There's a lot of other things going on here. People have taken money out of the market. People are just outright short. They're not doing it through futures, but through other, other products as well. Positioning across the board is still very negative on bonds. And so even though there has been a substantial recovery in positioning, where's the rally, so to speak, the last time we were at these levels, um, right? That is a bit of a divergence here that I think is worth noting, and I find worrisome. So yes, there could be a little bit more upside right now. This has been a covering rally, in my opinion, but bonds do look weak, mm -hmm. and they look weak for a reason. So, okay, let me ask you this then. What was the positioning back at the end of October, I mm -hmm. guess? Uh, and I'm not just trying to you know throw this for the sake of you know asking you questions, but oh, I, it's think an important to, question. I think I think huh? <laughs> it's an important question. Well, yeah, because I mean, I think you have to put that into context because since October, end of October, bonds are up quite a bit. You know, so I think it depends on if if October was if the end of October was an extreme and a shift, fundamental shift for all asset classes. But I mean, I mean, bonds and equities specifically, then I think you have to look at the positioning then and compare it to here, because I mean, if positioning was, I mean, let's just say it was, you know, minus a million, like short a million contracts. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't that at those levels. It was closer to uh, net negative 610. And the lowest points came, you could argue, uh, in the middle of January this year when it was closer to negative 830,000. But again, you know, it, positioning here, it's, it's not an extreme is my point. I, I really only care about positioning directionally on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis. It's not going to tell you much of anything. Is this in a place where the market is super saturated on one or the other? No. Right. Have, we, have we seen more extreme positioning in the past? Yes. You know, you go into uh, September 21, for example, the the market was uh, 
yeah, retail was actually starting net small speculators were starting to get net short at that point, but large speculators were still net positive. We're still net long in this market here. And they eclipsed their lowest levels ever, large speculators in January. So we're coming off of that point. Um, but the point is that this the corresponding overall balance of positioning, it's not where it was in October at the lows. And where we were at the highs at the end of December, we're nowhere near that in price. Maybe positioning here isn't as viable of a signal as it is at equities or it has been, but it's not an extreme. And so any positioning indicator that's not an extreme, we take with a grain of salt one way or the other. Right. And I think, yeah, I, I agree. I, I I don't think there's anything more to say. I, I mean, bonds, realistically, I'm still long them, but just on a longer term basis. So it's not as much of a, you know, month by month trade as now it's kind of more of a quarter, quarter by quarter trade. Um, and I've, I've liked that position much better recently because it's been a lot easier to withstand the, the fluctuations in the bond market, which have been pretty consistent, to be honest with you. Like, like one of the things about the bond market that we haven't really, uh, seen at least, you know, and I'm sure we'll talk about it is we haven't really seen a break lower. Right. And, and, you know, I think that's important, uh, from, in terms of being a bull. So I think I'm going to remain with my, uh, with my position there. And time, we're going to quickly go through gold to no one's surprise during that big rally that we saw people finally jump back into the gold market. Uh, there was a 37.8% increase in net longs the week prior with gold hovering around the all-time highs. Now, this past week, gold didn't really do much of anything. People were taking a little bit of profit, but you know, you just had this big surge. Why would you want to get off the train just yet? No one really wants to. So a minor amount of profit taking, that's really it. Oil prices last week ultimately do break to a fresh yearly high and the longs are coming back into the market. We're now at the most net long level that we've been in four months in terms of speculative positioning. Uh, what else is there to say? Over 300,000 contracts and what a difference from where we were at the end of December, beginning of January, when we were near uh, multi-decade lows, the lowest levels that we had seen in the history of the oil futures contract. Anton, wrapping it up in the Euro, there was a surge the week prior. It comes off the board now. 29% drop in net longs for the Euro as these Fed ECB cuts are diverging. Markets expecting a more dovish ECB and a relatively more hawkish Fed. And here we see that the Euro net longs are abandoning ship. We're barely off the lowest levels that we've seen this year thus far. Okay, let's look at these charts finally, Anton. We need to move this session along. Anton, stocks uh, mostly weaker here on the day. S&P 500, 52, 83 right now. This is a very minor pullback. It's just two sessions ago on Thursday that we hit a fresh yearly, fresh all-time high here. Today, we're pulling back to the five EMA, the one-week moving average, and that's exactly where the market has caught itself. The IVR rank of 11.6, the uptrend very much intact, Anton. Why do anything else other than what has been working for months and months and months now? Again, it's the same thesis. It's like, realistically, whatever happens with the Fed, the whole reason that our position is so versatile, um, namely those long call spreads in ES, is because for every given trade, we're risking about one to make two. When volatility is low, you can afford to do that. You're not going to get eaten alive by the fate of decay. And one of the nice things that affords us to do is be able to take these profits on the way up and at the same time expecting that at some point, whatever the reason is, doesn't matter. Either it's a scare of inflation, economic data, or geopolitical tension, doesn't matter. We get stopped out on the downside and then we wait for another opportunity to enter, either long or short. But that hasn't happened yet, right? And on the way up, you know, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter the reason, you could win on nine out of 10 trades, each winning approximately, you know, uh, you know, if you're risking one to make two, you know, you, you make basically double, uh, like, you know, you say you buy the spread for $10, sell the $20, you know, reposition, you did nine out of 10 times. Okay, then on the 10th time, you have a boom, you have a loser, you have a losing trade. Well, you're still up eight units, right? And no matter what happens to the market from that point on, you then have a decision point to make with fresh eyes because that position has been a loser. You're up eight units. You have a fresh, clean slate to look at the market with. And that in itself is probably the, honestly, that's pretty much the only argument the bulls need right now. If you're trading this market with caution and precision, and what I mean by that is having a stop exit point, having a, a certain amount you're risking, a certain amount you want to make with options, you do that all in one trade. You don't have to, set any additional stop losses or anything after you place that trade because it's already done for you if you're doing a defined risk spread 
after you do that, there's no reason to, in my opinion, back out of the trade because the whole point of placing that type of trade is that you will be backed out by the market. You don't have to do anything yourself. And until that happens, I don't see any reason to change it. That's all there is to it. Anton, uh, there's that great tool on tastylive.com. You got to look back at tastylive.com. One of the uh, you know ways to verify this. So you started trading this on November 1st. Granted, that's pretty close to the low. I'm not saying time it down to the low that we had back in October. So I'm saying do it since November 1st, which I think in fairness, uh, 4236 was the first time I got an ES back then. That was three days away from the low. So we'll benchmark it to then. Uh, if you've been doing the long call spread, 45 days in, 21 days out. If you've been doing the short put spread, 45 days in, 21 days out, you've taken four trades, both sides, you're four for four so far. You are in the middle of your fifth trade right now. Um, plain and simple, it's working. So until something breaks, and if this happens to be the one trade that doesn't work, then you just went four for five, 80% hit rate over the past five months in a single product. If you do that in every single product you trade, you're going to be a very happy camper. Right. And that's guaranteed at this point because you've already won the last four trades. Point, yeah, points points are on the board, right? Those those right. you can't take the ball out of the hoop. So granted, yes, there may be there's this is always the discipline part of the trend trading. Uh, and I always bring up that Jesse Livermore quote. The most when Jesse Livermore says that when he makes the most money it was from sitting on his hands, letting the market do the lifting. Yeah. Letting the just following the trend. And the trend remains pointed higher. We had a little bit of a scare. Granted, I personally was getting a little bit scared when I looked at the market on the 15th. In fact, the last thing that I had written for the Tasty Live blog outside of the Five Futures morning report prior to getting sick was that stocks were looking topish, like tops were forming because the NASDAQ had lost the uptrend. The Russell was breaking out of its uptrend. But the S&P was the only caveat there. Was we hadn't closed below that one month moving average yet. And until that happened, you really couldn't say that stocks were done because that one month moving average had been the backbone of the uptrend effectively since the low in the beginning of November. Right. And that was never achieved. We dipped into it and then we treated it as support and then we bounced and now we have to reconstitute our trend line and we constantly update it to the most recent swing low. And here we have a brand new ascending triangle breakout. We are coming back into former resistance, the former yearly high turn support around 5240. If we're able to hold that area at plus the five EMA on a retest, that should be the area where you're beginning to see the market bounce higher. Otherwise, back to the one month moving average is 5209. The uptrend is a little bit higher from there, near 5215. And that's the line in the sand. And if you get another pullback into there, as we've seen with this uptrend, with even with the minor adjustments that we've made along the way, but with this uptrend, Anton, if you've been buying into it, you've been fading the rise in vol, and you've been staying, like you say, precise and disciplined on those executions. It's been a fruitful endeavor for you, really, no matter where you've been able to enter. And so I think that's the modus operandi this week. The one caveat, though, same thing here for the NASDAQ, for the Russell, is that the big report this release or that's being released this week is the PCE report, the Fed's preferred gauge of inflation. Let's do it on Friday. Anton, are markets open on Friday? No, they're not, Chris. They are not open on Friday, Anton. And so that's why I think this is a very important consideration for how you're structuring trades. If I'm trading uh, short term, I'm looking for things that are expiring on Thursday. I would not want to be holding a contract expiring on, say, Monday. Otherwise, I'm looking much longer term so that I could rally around PCE because you have PCE coming out on Friday when the market's closed. We are very likely to have a gap between the Thursday close and the Monday open, plain and simple. Uh, this is a this is an important report. The market cares about inflation, and if my thesis holds correct, that the odds of a policy error are going up, that means inflation data that does not show any sort of progress will scare the market more than it has historically. So, one of my considerations this weekend, time because I'm still holding on to my long ES call spreads that we continue to lay in and lay out. I have 25 days to expiration. I will say on Thursday, instead of rolling it Thursday, I will be closing it. And I'm going to close it to reapply it back on Monday. I do not want to have it on in what I think could be a troubling PC report on Friday when the markets are going to be closed. Illiquidity will be there and who knows what could happen. That's my personal risk appetite. I can wait one day to put back on a position. And if I miss 20, 40 points, I'm not going to shoot myself over, again, a move that we've been mostly in on. Yeah, and, and I think and I think I think a lot of people would be in the same boat. I mean, if you look at volatility right now for Monday, 
uh, April 1st in the ES options, you're looking at 9.5%. Um, that's the lowest volatility reading in the entire options chain, which shows you that- it Makes no uh, sense to me for what it's worth. What did you say? <laughs> it makes no sense to me for what it's worth, knowing that oh, really? PC. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I I think that, yeah, honestly, actually it doesn't, which is, which is kind of interesting, right? I Honestly, yeah, actually, now that I'm looking at it, I was going to say, I was going to give a reason why it may be so low, but if, yeah, if you have to go through PC, it shouldn't be that low. Um, but I mean, listen, you, I mean, you look at the active money straddle, you're looking at 49.75, vol uh, expected moves 48. That's exactly where it should be. That gives you a volatility reading of 9.5%. Um, from now till Monday morning, which includes a CPI or a PCE, you're looking at an expected move of less than 50 points in the E mini S&Ps. Realistically, I don't know if the market's even giving that any any premium at all. I think that's under. I think that's ridiculously underpriced. Well, then, then you should actually buy the premium there, right? If you, if you think there's going to be some move, maybe you could sell. You could hold the call spread to Thursday, and then over to the weekend, you can put one of those uh, maybe a little butterfly on. Okay, we're going to do that. We're going to do that on Thursday on the Thursday show. There you go. And Jamal's not here, so I need a co-host for Thursday. So you're coming on Thursday. But that's I already agreed to, Chris. I'm one step ahead of you. I'm like your, I'm, I'm right. like your, I'm like your entourage. Like I'm already there before you ask. That's the appropriate answer, Anton. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's talk about Nasdaq here. Uh, I'm grateful you, my, for you, my friend. Uh, Nasdaq here. Look, it was getting a little slippery here. All right. Like again, Friday we start to lose the uptrend. And we get back to swing support. Although we get back to support, and we never really quite broke on through it. In fact, we did base there very neatly. We then break the downtrend, we'd be in a rally and we're back right at the highs where we have since paused. Okay, so we do need to reconstitute these trend lines because we know that the uptrend is still very much in play here. The NASDAQ, you could argue, Anton, probably looks a little bit less stable than the S&P 500 uh, because it still potentially is in the throes of what may be considered to be this bullish wedge. The other side of this, however, is that we do need to respect the market that remains in an uptrend. And to that end, this could simply just be an ascending triangle that's coming together, which we have seen so many times before, right? We actually saw this previously. We'll just take a copy of you here and nope, not going to cooperate with me. We'll get a new one. Um, when did we see this? Here, for example, in November, rally flattened out ascending triangle. We saw that in December, we could keep moving this up where the market hits a peak and then ultimately rallies back through it. Uh, if this is another ascending triangle situation, is this something that we want to be shorting? No. So I respect Ilya's perspective on why you think the risk to reward here is short. I think that we don't know where the market's going to top out because if the market's topping out at 24,000, is, is the risk to reward here good for getting long still? Yes. I'm not saying yeah. the market's going to go to 24K, but you don't know where the market's going to go at the end of the day. So you just have to look at the chart. An ascending triangle in the middle of an uptrend with momentum indicators having turned more positive recently, an EMA cloud that is serving as support here, even on an intraday basis, you could see the long lower wick on the daily candle. There's nothing bearish about this to me. The market may not have been going anywhere effectively since the start of March. I mean, truly, we were at these levels right around the first trading week of March. But this could be in a, the resolution in a market being overextended doesn't need to happen through price. It can be through time. And this has been a sideways shift that has cooled off a lot of those overbought momentum indicators. For every for every channel that you can show me, every sideways action uh, market that has resulted in a downtrend, I could show you the same amount that have resulted in a continuation to the upside. There's exactly. no, there's absolutely no, I don't see anything short. I, in fact, if I'm looking at this, I'd still rather be long because the fact is, is even on these semi, you know, semi, you know, uh, uh, dull down days, you know, down 30 points. I mean, for the NASDAQ, that's an unchanged day. Um, <laughs> like this could easily go to 19,000 by the end of next week. There's no reason why, like if it did, there would be no surprise there. And, you know, the bulls would be saying, absolutely, of course, this, this makes sense. And, and, and it absolutely does. Right. Um, I think volatility stays low in both the S&P and the NASDAQ. It's not a matter of if, and, and, you know, for everybody, you know, for everybody who's bearish, I feel like sometimes, I feel like sometimes there's like some kind of like, you know, misunderstanding that the people who are bearish think the people who are bullish are just idiots. They're like, 
<laughs> I'm like, how can you like? Do you think the market is going to go up forever? Like, don't you see? You know, like, don't you know that at the at the top of the market, that's when we have the biggest corrections. I'm like, we know that we're that's exactly how our positions are are prepared. You know what I mean? Like, we're prepared to exactly that type of position at some point, but we don't know when. And it's been a fool's errand to guess the top of the market since the beginning of time. So, you know, why would we start now? No, and listen, there are times that it's appropriate to be bearish. I mean, one of my better trades in 2022 from people that were, you know, following me back then when I was on uh, Jones and Friends with Vic uh, was short arc, <laughs> right? I was long energy and short arc for most of the, like that was one of the best uh, trades that I had that year because I was very bearish on technology, ratcheting higher interest rates, all these companies with no moats that predicated or, 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 or that flourished in an era of just QE and ZERP during the pandemic. Uh, where were they going to go? And so the the tide was going to come back in. And I was very bearish on tech stocks back then. It only took until like late 2022 when I started to get a little bit more bullish. And it was January that year when I really 23, when I got like, okay, we're back in this. Let's start get going. Um, but this is still one of those times where it's appropriate to be bullish. Volatility is trending lower. Look at the VIX right now in this market, 14 and a half. It's not exactly screaming that there's a problem right now. I know a lot of people were uh, laughing that there was no vol crush after expiration, I would argue the exact opposite. It looks like there was a vol crush after expiration. Plain and simple, it came back in, as it has often the case the last several months. One of the hallmark features of this bull market, Anton, if you go back to December, has been every time you have a rise in volatility around expiration, vol contracts in the next few days thereafter, and it just happened here again. So again, one of those characteristics that has been part of this rally still in place. So that's not a reason to doubt that things have changed thus far, at least when it pertains to the S&P, when it pertains to the NASDAQ. We haven't talked about the Russell here yet, which is part of your you know, great diversified strategy, if you will, of getting exposure to long equities. Again, the scare tactics there, because we do break the uptrend, although we now move back towards the highs. So let's reconstitute this as well here, given the updated information in price action. It still looks like a longer term ascending triangle, Volatility is 44.2. I assume that you are still in the long call spreads for ESNQ camp. And if you want to be bullish in the Russell, it's better vis-a-vis -vis the short put spread. And that gives you a little bit of diversification with how you're expressing your long equity bias right now. Yeah. I mean, listen, this is another day where you just prove this kind of relationship to be a beneficial part to a diversified portfolio. The Russell is up over half of a percent. S&P's a little down if you held if you're holding both of these your chances are you're at least unchanged on the day and the whole point of this is exactly is it to be exactly um it's, it's not to be unchanged on the day but it's to be unchanged on a day where the rest of the market is lower right the s p and the russell i'm sorry the nasdaq and the russell um have a correlation right now a three-month correlation of 0.57 that's very low that that is essentially almost like an individual stock in the S and P five hundred, but there, it's an equity index, right? So there's it's it's almost like playing a pairs trade in a sense, but both being to the upside. And on days like these, where you know the S and P you know trails the Russell, and now granted, last week we had a couple of days where the Russell lagged the S and P, and I get it. And if you compare the performances overall over the last couple of weeks, um, I think the Russell is like lagging by like a quarter of 1% to the S&P, right. like, like, like very marginal. But if you take all the days on an intraday basis, your portfolio is a lot smoother, despite the fact that the Russell has a higher volatility than the S&P 500. That's the hallmark, is that it's not necessarily thinking that the Russell is going to go up because X, Y, and Z. It's more so saying if you're bullish equities, it doesn't make sense not to be long the Russell because the Russell is where you get the volatility opportunity. And on days where the S&P is down, the Russell not only gives you lower portfolio volatility net-net, but also gives you opportunity to profit from the short premium perspective that's missing from the S&P 500 right now with volatility rank, I think, uh, if you, I don't know if you can pull it up. It's like 11. 11, right? So that's- 11.3. Yeah, so that's 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 where the thesis is. And, and I think, you know, like, 
unless you know that the S and P is, which is a rhetorical statement because nobody knows. Nobody knows. Of course, yeah, you're going to be long the S and P, but realistically, the Russell hasn't lagged by that much, and it has had a lot higher volatility, which means chances are, if you're short premium of the Russell, chances are you could have made more money or about the same amount of money as being long the S&P calls for his, despite the Russell not making a direction move higher. That's the power of volatility. Anton, the conversation about the Fed perhaps is best suited for what's going on in bonds here. Uh, bond market has been both good and bad, not last week, obviously, but the week before. Uh, we were able to put on a long call spread in ZN when it was on the 15th right now, that long call spread, long 108, short the 112 and a half. So a little bit off today, but net net still positive. Uh, why? We were going into support and it's a range bound market. So you buy it, support it, you sell it resistance in a range bound market. Not going to overthink that. Um, if I were putting on a position now, volatility is too low to justify doing an iron condor probably too low to justify shorting a strangle. So if we get up to resistance, I would look to sell a call spread or buy a put spread. And if we get down to support, well, I'll probably have to reconsider because I'm already long the call spread. But I would, if I was looking at it with fresh hives, I would think about getting long a call spread. Volatility is low and you're at support. If there's a Fed policy mistake coming down the pipeline, however, the question is how much of this is already priced in by the market? Because one of the confusing factors, I think, and I saw a lot of people discuss in this, I think I saw even Vic tweet about it, was, you know, isn't what Powell said in context of the, the, the changes in forecast, shouldn't that be bad for the long end of the curve? A lot of that may have been priced in already heading into the Fed meeting, right? You look at ZN here, it goes from 112 and basically five ticks down to where it was on the 18th at 109 and 24 and a half ticks. That's a significant move. In ZB, you had a four plus point move from high to low. And where we were relative to where we were at the end of last year, we've come down again significantly over three and a half points here in ZN and five, six points in ZB. Rate cut odds are effectively on the floor still, right? Maybe June, maybe three cuts this year, perhaps, but one fewer next year. Okay. I, I think that if there's opportunity to buy bonds on dips, then people should look at it still. But you have to have a reason to do so. And at least in this case, if you're at support in a range, you buy at support, sell at resistance until the range breaks, and then you go into a trends trading strategy. I don't think you can execute, though, on something like an iron condor or a short strangle here. And if you can't, is it really worth trading it then? I don't necessarily think there's a trade here right now for ZB unless you're looking, or ZN, unless you're looking really long-term. Anton, I know you said you're still long ZB here, but you're in the middle of a range right now. Vol is 1.5 on the IBR. There's more juice to squeeze in other parts of the market right now, I think, for the average person. Yeah, and I think that if you are going to stay long bonds, I think, again, it's it's a, I understand it. I think it's a fair, uh, I think it's a fair reason. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I just think, again, Longer term duration is the key because you'll be able to weather out the fluctuations over a longer period of time. Uh, sometimes being longer term options, uh, especially for people who don't usually trade them, can be a little bit deceiving because you're, you know, if you're long a call spread, for example, you're paying more to be long that call spread on a on a on a technical accounting bay. Like you look at the debit paid, it's higher than if you're doing like a thirty day call spread or a twenty day call spread. But on a day by day basis, it's actually a lot cheaper. Right. right. Um, the way I would look at bond premium, if you're if you're going to buy it, is just take the debit you're paying and divide it by the number of days to expiration. It's the easiest thing to get a sense of how much you're actually exposed to or paying on a day by day basis. And if you do it in the sixty day, for example, okay, um, you know, let, let's let's just say hypothetically do a one nineteen a one twenty four long spread. Okay, paying one forty three. Well, one forty three. First, we'll convert that to dollars. So 43 over 64, that's 60. So once, oh yeah, it says max profit. There you go. Six, uh, 1672 divided by 60. So your exposure is twenty-nine, uh, $28 a day, essentially, till expiration. Now, if you go to the 30-day uh, position, right, and you do the same exact trade, 119, 124, um, right, it's cheaper on the surface. But you divide that same amount, or you divide that new max loss figure, which is lower, 
1422, but you divide it over 32 days and your actual exposure is $44 a day. So it's about 50% higher on a, uh, on a day-by-day -day basis for the shorter duration spread. So going longer duration saves you about 50% or reduces your risk by about 33% because it goes from $44 to like $29. That's mm -hmm. what it was, like $29, right? So again, that's, that's what I've been doing and um, it just makes the fluctuations a lot more manageable. I think that makes a great deal of sense, Anton. Uh, one can't ignore the fact that as bonds have dipped back, metals have remained resilient here on the session. Gold and silver, uh, silver, place I missed holding out long, but no regrets there because we still make money on it. Gold, on the other hand, has been going nowhere for the past two weeks, although the fact that it's been able to stay at these levels is impressive enough unto its own right. We know that longs have come back into this market finally, although they really weren't there before the move started itself, which is interesting. Gold has been eaten alive by Bitcoin. People have been trading crypto more than precious metals. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, Anton, we're hovering and pinning near the high that we had back in December 2023. Volatility is 43.6. Um, you know, I get there's a I see there's a case that you could be selling calls up here. But quite frankly, the charts still look pretty bullish to me. And I don't like selling calls in something that's going from bottom left to top right unless I see a topping pattern. And I don't see a topping pattern here. There is a little bit of a range. Maybe this is a little bit of a expanding wedge, but we're above the five EMA. Maybe you get some chop. I don't want to put a position on right now. I have no strong conviction here in the short term. I think this can continue to go up, quite frankly. Uh, but I think it's going to happen independent of bonds because quite frankly, gold <laughs> has not given a hoot about how weak bonds have been, relatively speaking. If you told me that gold was going to be at near $2,200 an ounce in the six uh, GCM4 contract, I would have thought ZB would be near 125 130 at this point in time. So f funny enough, we did a research piece this morning. Um, I was live with Tom and TP. Uh, we, our, our whole show was based around correlation today. And one of the charts we showed was the rolling correlation between gold and bonds. And right now, the three-month correlation is like 0.4 or 0.45. I mean, I'm looking at it's It's a graph, so it's, it's I'm just eyeballing. It's about 0.4, which is essentially non-correlated. Now, I know technically it's a positive correlation, but if you look at on a the way we perceive correlation, is that okay? If if X is up, then Y will be up as well, and if X is down, Y will be down as well. Well, a correlation of 0.4 basically states that 45% of the time you're going to get that relationship. I'm sorry, 55% of the time you're going to get get that relationship. 45% of the time you're going to get an opposite relationship. So it's still in your favor, 55%. That's why it's positive correlation. But that's not how we think of correlation, right? When we think positive correlation, we're like, okay, well, gold is up, therefore bonds must be up, right? Um, at least at least 90% of the time, fine, 80% of the time. But a 0.4 correlation, you're right around 50-50, which is not a tradable correlation from the standpoint of like, okay, I'm going to trade these assets together. It's frustrating. <laughs> but that's what happens. That's why you can't rely. That's why you use correlations. You know, they're not causation and regimes and relationships change in the market all the time. So are they useful forward indicators? They can be, but you never know when they're going to turn on you. So uh, that's why it's always important to update your models. Always be willing to let go of your preconceived notions because if the relationship changes and you say, no, 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 it should be X to Y, it should be a positive correlation, which means they're both going up. Well, then you're out in your rocker. Silver, on the other hand, you know, we have seen a little bit of weakness here. Uh, the charts are starting to get a little bit more volatile and messy, although you wouldn't necessarily see it in volatility itself, despite the rather large ranges in price. The IVR is only 12 right now, Anton. Um, this is a breakout that still has some legs to it. Quite frankly, if it's a bullish falling wedge, it calls for a return to the high that you had at $26.57.5. And we have not yet achieved that. So structurally, I think remaining long is appropriate. That said, the inverse head and shoulders pattern, uh, the measured move was effectively a dollar and 80 cents, you'd say. And a dollar and 80 cents from where we broke out is basically where we peaked out last week. So this is a good place for a breather. That's not to say that the uptrend is done, but in terms of the recent technical thrust, that inverse head and shoulders pattern potentially guiding a breakout, 
Um, that has since been completed. So if that was the reason why you were long, that's no longer appropriate. I don't have any position on silver right now. I'd like to see a little bit of sideways chop, but then I'd like to find the ability to ultimately uh, get long as soon as possible. Maybe a little while here, Anton, though. We are winding down this show, so we're going to go over to energy real quick, Anton. Crude oil has been up. It is back down here today, however. Uh, no, it is back now up here today, $81.83. My goodness. Uh, we take a look at our chart here, and ultimately that breakout through 80, you know, this is a really instructive chart, Anton, for people who are new to technical analysis. Just we've mentioned this before, but I haven't been on air. So we're going to do it again for people who may not have been listening in the past. You see this band right around like 78, 80 or so. We'll call it right around 79. Support, resistance. And then every single attempt that we try to break through for many months is immediately rejected. You're there for a day or two and then you turn back. And that changed in February where you start to loiter and linger up against resistance. This overhead supply in the market was thinning out. There wasn't that ample amount there anymore where the price would immediately get rejected. It took some more chop and grind, chop and grind. And ultimately it chews its way through that band. The lesson here is the more time that you spend testing a level of resistance, the more frequently you test a level of resistance, the more likely it is to break. The more frequently you test a level of support, the more likely it is to break. If you're grinding away at it, you're literally chewing through all the orders that are sitting there. And the market not being rejected is a very clear sign from the tape that a change in behavior may be coming soon. So $81.83 right now here in crude oil. Uh, is there possibility for some legs to the upside still? Yes. What am I doing? I still have on my uh, iron condor trade, short the 84.86 call spread, short the 70.68 call spread. It's still in the money. Today's obviously not a great day. I'm getting into the window where it's time to start thinking about position management, 23 days. So this is the week where I need to take it off. Look, uh, I would be happy taking it off here. It's obviously not near max profit, but a winning trade is a winning trade. Would I put it back on immediately? No. 13.2 IVR. So short of put spread here. Mm, if anything, given how the market's bullish, if I wanted to be in the game, I'd probably have to be long and at the money call spread. But we'd only be trading that into about 84 and a half, 85. And so the risk reward here is getting a little bit janky, if you will. I'd be more interested in potentially buying a put spread up at 84, 85. Right when we get up there and at the money put spread, looking for a swing back to the downside, then maybe perhaps trying to squeeze the last little bit here on this uh, recent move up. Yeah, I haven't been really trading crude. Um, I mean, if there here's the thing: if there wasn't call skew, I'd be bullish. But the problem is, it's a little tough to get long crude um, from a defined risk perspective because those out of the money calls have so much skew in them, mm -hmm. um, where you're basically forced and, and i you know you take my words carefully you are trading the long side at a significant premium right it is a lot more expensive to get long crude oil because those call spreads will be cheaper in other words for the same upward exposure that um i'm sorry i said that backwards it the <laughs> oh no, no 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 i'm sorry i, I said that correct you, you have to get a lot uh further away to get the same type of risk reward that you would for a different product where you can get closer to at the money. So because of that, it's just a tougher trade in general. Um, the same for gold, if you want to be long gold. So personally, it's 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 the opposite of equities, essentially. Right. It's like buying put spreads in equities. It's it's just it's it's tough. But yeah, for that reason alone, I've I haven't been really trading them. Um yeah, natural gas either. I, I know you've you've had some luck earlier this this year. I think you you literally hit the one period in the market where you actually got out of the profit. So good 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 for you there. <laughs> yeah, and I've been looking to jump back in, and I know that others were starting to dabble with that as well. Westwood or flagged it for me. I never got back in. I was looking for a little bit more evidence of a technical bottom coming together, and that may have been here on March fourteenth. But like I was waiting after the February 20th bullish outside engulfing bar for a little bit more evidence. And then ultimately I did get triggered in because I saw the continuation higher the next day. That didn't happen here. And so I've been continuing to wait and watch. And the fact that we've just been slouching down now towards the lows again, I don't really see a long trade here. Ivy Rink is 25.2. It's not nearly high enough to say, you know what, it's worth selling a, a small short put spread right here because look, Ivy Rink is 70, who can't take the stab at the yearly lows. Right now, I don't see the risk to reward 
being favorable. I'd rather wait a little bit until some pattern comes together. And maybe it does this week and we can size up a trade. But right now I got nothing here, Anton. Uh, dollar mostly weaker across the board. Uh, the yen is back and forth, positive, terry, no negative. It remains weak. Intervention watch is certainly back on right now. But the dollar down, Aussie pound, Canadian dollar, euro, uh, all now here up by 0.22% or more. Dollar index itself off by 0.20%. We'll dedicate a little bit more time to currency in tomorrow's show. What's next on the calendar? Tomorrow is, again, this isn't the busiest week in the world. There is an important U.S. durable goods orders release tomorrow morning, 8.30 a.m. Eastern, 7.30 Central Time. Uh, an important part of the consumption picture, durable goods are items with lifespans of three years or longer, like your refrigerators, washing machines, dishwashers, automobile parts, airplane parts. So Boeing's troubles showing up in durable goods orders recently. Uh, hopefully Boeing can get their act together because... You know, that's supposed to be a great American company. Uh, other than that, five-year note auction in the afternoon, 1 p.m. Eastern, 12 Central Time. Keep an eye on ZF. Anton, as we wind down the show, as we typically do a brief bit of education here, today we're talking about trading hours, perhaps the number one reason why I like the futures market. Let's go over to tastylive.com, top banner, learn, beginner futures, get past Anton and move over to the top banner of the website. We can find this great course put together by the fine folks on the Tasty Live research team. Uh, trading hours for futures, they are different than your regular cash equity markets. Sundays, 6 p.m. Eastern, 5 central time to Mondays, 5 p.m. Eastern, 4 central time. There's a one hour break for batch order processing. And then the trading day resumes 23 hours a day five days a week, ample liquidity in different products across different expiries that you could effectively trade whether you're going to bed, you're waking up. If you want to wake up in the middle of the night to go pee, you can go put a trade on. As that old commercial said, got to put on a hedging trade, Anton. Well, the futures market is for you and it allows you to navigate and also potentially uh, hedge off risk in other positions. If you say you own a lot of individual equities and you see something happening and you can't get out of your Apple position, hey, I can go into the market and short some MNQ and therefore- I'm good. I feel safe. I can hold this risk overnight. Uh, learn more about the trading hours. It offers great flexibility for traders. Head over to tastylive.com, top banner, learn beginner futures, or click the link here at the bottom of the slide, and it will take you there directly. Anton, that was a mouthful, and now we are done here on this Monday edition. Thank you very much, my friend. It was good to be back in the saddle with you. Thank you for steering the ship and only crashing into the ground a few times, and for that, I am grateful. See, if, if you had told me you'd watched all the shows, that would have believed you. But, you know, now it's like, you know, you can't say it. Credit. Everybody in the office was like, Anton, Anton, look at now. I'm just kidding. It was, it was, it was fun. <laughs> the crowd uh, goes wild. <laughs> oh, no. It was, uh, oh, gosh. <laughs> anyway, I have no words. For Anton Kulikov, I've been Chris Vecchio. This has been Futures Power Hour. We'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place, here on Tasty Live. Until then, good luck trading. After a brief break, we will be back. More Tasty Live next with Dr. Jim Schultz and From Theory to Practice. So welcome to our newest crash course, how to build a portfolio in four easy steps. My name is Jim Schultz, and I am very happy that you are here with us today. I'm going to try to make this crash course as quick, as concise, and as worthwhile as I possibly can. And what we're going to do in these four episodes is we are going to take a bird's eye view of building your portfolio. And guys, I would argue this is more important than which strangle you're going to sell, what stock you're going to trade, or which earnings announcement you are interested in. So yes, this is going to be a four-episode crash course, super quick and super to the point. Here is what we're going to do. In episode number one, this episode, we are going to establish your portfolio goals. In episode number two, we're going to talk about the power of using indexes first. In episode number three, we're going to look to add individual stocks. And then in episode number four, we're going to talk about the day-to-day -day portfolio management. So without further ado, let's do it, man. Let's dive right into episode number one, establishing your portfolio goals. Okay, so step one. And this is mission critical. This needs to happen before you place a single trade. This needs to happen before you look to put on a single position. You need to map out 
What do you want your target theta and target delta to be at the portfolio level? In other words, how valuable do you want time to be for you at the portfolio level? And how valuable do you want direction to be for you at the portfolio level? Doing this, man, it will give you incredible guidance and clarity with your day-to-day decision-making. What you're quickly going to notice is that every decision you make, the new trades, the closing trades, the position adjustments, all these guys can be traced back into these overarching portfolio goals. Now, we're going to talk about each of these targets in more detail in just a minute, but let's take a look at your theta. If your portfolio theta is too low, then you're going to be actively seeking significantly positive theta opportunities with your new trades. This makes sense. But what if your portfolio theta is too high? Which, yes, by the way, this is a thing. Then you're going to be more cautious with adding more theta. And instead, you're going to be looking for ways to reduce your theta exposure. Now, what about your delta? Are you more bullish than you would like to be? Well, then you'll look to add bearish positions or close bullish positions. Are you more bearish than you'd like to be? Then you'll do the opposite. Add bullish positions and close bearish positions. And if you like your deltas, well, then you'll be looking for some more neutrally based positions. Those will be your go-to. By determining your portfolio goals at the start like this and then using them as your guide, you're able to reduce a ton of subjectivity in your analysis and remain far more objective. All right, so now let's turn our attention to theta in a little bit more detail. And what we're going to do is we are going to look to target a percentage of net lick or net liquidating value in daily theta. What this is going to do is it is going to add an incredible amount of context around what this number means and what it can do for us. Here is what I mean. Generally speaking, we tend to fall in a range of 0.1% to 0.5% of our net lick in daily theta, the number that you see at the very top of your platform. Numbers on the lower end of this spectrum, like 0.1%, these are more conservative, whereas numbers on the higher end of the spectrum, like 0.4% or 0.5%, These are going to be a lot more aggressive. And the numbers in between, of course, like 0.2%, 0.3%, these are kind of middle of the road. To put these numbers into a portfolio context, 0.1% on a $50,000 portfolio is $50 in daily theta, whereas 0.5% on that same $50,000 portfolio would be $250 in daily theta. On a $200,000 portfolio, 0.1% would be $200 in daily theta, 0.3% would be $600 in daily theta, and 0.5% would be a whopping $1,000 in daily theta decay. Now that we've built a little bit of a foundation for our portfolio of theta, we can lean on the tasty research, which has shown we can expect to capture about 25% of our daily theta. This accounts for all the big winners, all the big losers, and everything in between. What this is going to do is it is going to give us a great reference point for returns when it comes to our daily theta capture. So, assuming 360 days in a year to keep all the accountants happy, a 0.1% in daily theta would be 36% for the entire year. But we only expect to keep a quarter of that, so we net out to a 9% return. Not too shabby. And you can clearly see that this number scales with more daily theta, with 0.2% coming out to 18% a year, and so on and so forth. Now, some of you out there, after having heard that, you're kind of licking your chops. You're like, man, this is some really, really good stuff. And rightfully so. I mean, positive theta and daily decay, these are some powerful, powerful allies. But let's make sure that we all understand something. These are just reference points. These are just theoretical markers. It's never going to be as simple as just putting on your half a percent in daily theta, kicking your feet up on the desk, collecting your 45% returns, and then doubling your money every 18 months. It's never going to work out that cleanly, which is a perfect segue into our next topic and our next target, Delta. So now that we have a theta foundation, let's turn our attention 
to Delta. And the interesting thing about Delta is there are effectively three different options that you can choose, three different pathways forward through the forest, if you will, each of which with its own set of gimmies and gotchas. So effectively, the first thing you'll need to decide is what directional bias you want to have in the market. Do you want to be bullish? Do you want to be bearish? Do you want to be neutral? Again, a strong case can be made for each of these. The market wants to go higher over time, and the positive drift in the geometric Brownian motion asset pricing model effectively ensures that it will. So for that reason alone, you might want to be bullish. But the big high velocity moves in the market usually happen to the downside, and these moves generally coincide with expanding volatility. So a short delta bearish portfolio can be a nice hedge against your short premium option positions. And lastly, you might want to remove direction entirely from your portfolio returns, which a number of traders like to do, and just be delta neutral. You have to choose your own adventure here, and any of the three can be successful over time. So let's work through how to get started with each bias. So if you want to be bullish, then I think a great way to position your portfolio is relative to the SPY index itself. Here's what I mean. For instance, with the SPY currently around $450 a share, that means that 100 shares of SPY is equivalent to about $45,000. That means that if you had a portfolio that was also equal to $45,000, then 100 beta weighted deltas at the portfolio level would be the same as 100 shares of SPY. Thus, you would have a one-to-one -one leverage in your portfolio relative to the index. If, however, you had 200 beta-weighted deltas in that same $45,000 portfolio, then you are effectively controlling 200 shares of SPY, which has a notional value of $90,000. Thus, you have a 2-to-1 leverage in your portfolio relative to the index. As another example, let's say you had a $180,000 portfolio. Here, you have four times the notional value of 100 shares of SPY. So your starting point to have that same one-to-one -one leverage isn't 100 beta-weighted deltas or $45,000. That's only a quarter of your portfolio. Instead, it's 400 beta-weighted deltas, which has a notional value of $180,000, the same value as your portfolio. If instead you had 600 beta-weighted deltas, that would be a one-and-a-half-to-one leverage ratio. 800 beta weighted deltas would be a 2 to 1 leverage ratio, and 1,000 beta weighted deltas would be a 2.5 to 1 leverage ratio, and so on. All right, so that's how to think about your portfolio deltas if you're bullish. But what if you're bearish? Well, it's going to play out a little differently. Let's have a look. If you're bearish, you could use the same leverage relationships that we established in the bullish context, but it's probably even more helpful to think in terms of your delta to theta ratio. Remember, guys, a big reason that you are bearish in the first place is to protect your short premium, and your theta number is a representation of how much short premium you have. So using a delta to theta ratio shows you just how much protection you need. The key here is to lean on our research and strive for a delta to theta ratio of about one to two. So one short delta for every two positive theta. This makes it pretty easy because you already know your portfolio theta numbers from the work we did just a few minutes ago. So with that in hand, you can easily figure out your short delta target. For example, if your daily theta target is 100, then you're looking for about 50 short deltas. If your daily theta target is 500, then you're looking for about 250 short deltas and so on. The great thing here is this already accounts for your portfolio size as that was included in the theta calculation itself. So this ratio can be applied more quickly and universally. Okay, so that's the bullish case. And that's the bearish case. But what about the neutral case? Well, as luck would have it, this guy is actually going to be the easiest of the three. So let's have a look. With delta neutrality, it's pretty simple. You want to keep your portfolio delta as close to zero as you possibly can. Now, 
Given the fact that we're retail traders and commissions and transaction costs begin to add up really quickly if we try to peg our portfolio delta to exactly zero, we can just focus on keeping our portfolio delta within a range of neutrality. Anywhere between plus or minus 0.1% of net lick is close enough to zero that we can classify it as pretty delta neutral. So, for example, on a $10,000 portfolio, that's going to be a range of plus or minus 10 deltas. On a $50,000 portfolio, that's going to be a range of plus or minus 50 deltas, and so on. If your deltas move outside of that range, then you make the necessary adjustments with both your new trades and your existing positions to bring it back in line. It's really that simple. So there you have it, guys. That's how to establish your portfolio goals. It's up to you to now decide how to take this information and apply it. But before I let you go, let me give you a couple of points of guidance. First, you might naturally be wondering, Jim, why didn't you include Vega? Because when it comes to option returns, there's three pieces. There's theta, there's delta, and there's Vega. Well, theta and delta already cover so much ground that I'm not sure that you're going to derive any incremental benefit from tracking your portfolio Vega as well. And not to mention, now you also have another metric that you have to babysit. You have another metric that you have to target. And at a certain point, that becomes significant, right? At a certain point, there's too many cooks in the kitchen and it's difficult to move forward in any meaningful way. So that's why you don't see Vega included in this discussion. Second, Many of you out there, especially you new traders out there, my heart really goes out to you guys that are just starting out, man. It's like drinking from a fire hose. I totally understand. You're thinking, Jim, I have no idea, man. I don't even know where to begin. Well, here is a really great starting point, and then you can adjust and customize later on. First, start with 0.1% of net lick in daily theta. It's very conservative. You can ramp this up later as you gain experience and you get more comfortable. If you want a long portfolio bias, which is totally up to you, then start with a one-to-one -one leverage ratio in exactly the same manner as we went through how to figure that out. If you want to be short, then just target a one-to-two delta-theta ratio. These ideas, these guide points, they will give you a great foundation. They will give you a great starting point for establishing these portfolio goals. And then you can adjust and you can customize accordingly as you move forward along the learning curve. And just like that, guys, we made it through episode number one, establishing your portfolio goals. Whenever you are ready, I will see you in episode number two of this crash course, where we are going to talk about the power of indexes. We'll see you there. So welcome back. Looking for a better broker and a bonus? Sweet. We got you. Right now, you can get a bonus of up to $4,000 when you open and fund a Tasty Trade account. Plus, low rates, smart tech with the analysis tools you need, and award winning support. So, get a broker who's actually got your back. And up to $4,000 at Tasty Trade. Make your move, genius. Tasty Trade. 90% goes to SP index funds, 10% straight to bank. Is 20th century advice driving your 21st century portfolio? Tasty Live has joined forces with the CME and SIBO to offer the industry's first multi-exchange trading collaboration. Our new live event, Building a Complex Portfolio, puts active traders on the path to modern portfolio creation. 
Tom Sosnoff and other Tasty Life personalities will cover strategies that'll help you integrate futures and options in your portfolio. Sign up at tastylive.com slash events and see where we're headed next. One of the things that, that was most intriguing about the financial space to us is just that there wasn't a lot of vision. There wasn't a lot of innovation. And I think that that, you know, that left a, that left a door open for us, which we really liked. After almost 20 years of open outcry standing in the pit trading, I felt like all the markets were moving from kind of traditional open outcry to uh, electronic trading. I saw the writing on the wall and I wanted to be first. Building the best technology in the world for traders was one of the coolest things anybody could ever do. I loved every second of it. Think or swim will always be my baby, but this one, it's different. We built ours literally from scratch. It's a much thinner, it's a faster, it's a slicker application. Everything's on one page. So you're always looking at the core page and then bouncing around from there to get to whatever you wanna to get to. Most of our competitors have legacy technology and some of them are multiple firms. Their technology has just been rolled up into a single platform. That's not the best way to build a platform. We built ours literally from scratch. It's from the ground up. So we were able to design it in the way that we wanted to design it with the flexibility that we wanted. And obviously beyond that, we do have in my mind, the greatest customer service in the industry. You wanna reach out to me, you wanna to talk to JJ, it doesn't make a difference who you wanna to talk to. We're always available and not only are we available, we look forward to your questions. We're here to support whatever you're looking to do. So you can trade stocks, you can trade options, futures, futures options, crypto. We're agnostic to product. We have the tools that you need to be a successful trader. Golf putt, normal distribution, reduce speed, increase standard deviation for a wider angular strike. If you think like a trader, we've got your back. Tasty Trade. Join the club, genius. Looking for a better broker and a bonus? Sweet, we got you. Right now, you can get a bonus of up to $4,000 when you open and fund a Tasty Trade account. Plus, low rates, smart tech with the analysis tools you need, and award-winning support. So, get a broker who's actually got your back. And up to $4,000 at Tasty Trade. Make your move, genius. Tasty Trade. 90% goes to S&P index funds. 10% straight to bank. Is 20th century advice driving your 21st century portfolio? Tasty Live has joined forces with the CME and SIBO to offer the industry's first multi-exchange trading collaboration. Our new live event, Building a Complex Portfolio, puts active traders on the path. So welcome back to the Building Your Portfolio Crash Course. Jim Schultz here with you guys, and we are about to dive into episode number two, the power of using indexes first. Back in episode number one, right, we kind of built up our foundation, looking at portfolio theta, looking at portfolio delta. Well, what we're going to do now, as we look out to build out the specific positions in our portfolio, we're going to start to fill in some of the mortar between those foundational Brick. So let's do it, man. Let's not waste any more time. Let's dive right in to episode number two, the power of using indexes. So the real power behind using indexes, it's actually really simple. It's going to give you a smoother ride from start to finish. Basically, by definition, this has to be the case, right? Because when we look at indexes, we're talking about, you know, S&P 500, you know, NASDAQ, you know, Dow, and all these other guys. These guys, by definition, are comprised of hundreds and hundreds or thousands and thousands of different individual stocks. Now, formally, 
This difference between indexes and individual stocks is referred to as systematic risk and unsystematic risk in the academic ranks of finance. Now, keep in mind that these labels are a lot more theoretical than they are practical. So for us as traders, we need to slow ourselves down a bit before we attach too much weight to what we have here. But nevertheless, these are very, very useful when it comes to understanding the differences between indexes and individual stocks. Now, systematic risk or market risk, this is the risk that is inherent in simply having some capital at stake in the financial markets. It is unavoidable and in many ways, it's simply a cost of doing business. Now, unsystematic risk or single stock risk is very different. This is going to be risks that are unique or individual to that one specific stock. Therefore, they are avoidable and they only become relevant if you happen to have a position on in that particular equity. All right, easy enough. Well, let's dive in a little bit deeper and work through some examples of each one of these guys. So starting with market risk, some common examples would be economic data, global growth or lack thereof, or maybe interest rates. Obviously, these numbers can have varying impacts and hit some indexes more significantly than others. But the idea is still that these risks are spread over the different stocks that make up the index. Now, Single stock risk is a little bit different with some common examples being an earnings report, maybe a product or service success or failure, or really any major company news. These are only going to impact one or a small group of stocks significantly. While any stocks that are not directly impacted or related to these events, they're just going to go on business as usual. Therefore, by focusing on indexes first before you dive into individual stocks, you are only going to be exposed to market risks. So then, by definition, as a result of that, you are naturally going to have or you can expect to have a much smoother ride from start to finish. All right, fair enough. But you might now be asking, Jim, which indexes should I focus on? Well, let's have a look. So let's think about the indexes in three different levels. Now, these aren't formal or official levels. They're really just for us. But I think it will help to demarcate between the different kinds of indexes. So level one, these are going to be your major equity players. SPY, the S&P 500, QQQ, the NASDAQ, IWM, the Russell 2000, and DIA, the Diamonds, or the Dow Jones. Level two, these are going to be your major non-equity players like GLD, which is gold, like TLT, which is bonds, like USO, which is oil, and SLV, which is silver. And then lastly, level three, these could be considered your international indexes or maybe your sector indexes like EWZ, which is Brazil, and FXI, which is China, and then XLE and XLU and a number of other X indexes that represent different sectors in the U.S. economy. Now, of course, this was not an exhaustive list that was intended to represent every single index that you could potentially trade, but I do think it's a reasonable starting point. Now that you have this, lean on this list, use this list, and turn to all the strategies and the tools that you already have in your back pocket when it comes to stock screening, strategy selection, or trade entry. And if you don't happen to have any tools or strategies in your back pocket, then hey, let me offer up a shameless plug for our very first crash course from last fall that will help you do exactly that. Wow, so believe it or not, but you already made it to the end of episode number two inside of this crash course. Some of you at this point, however, you might be thinking, Jim, wait a minute. What if I don't see enough opportunities with indexes? What if I don't see enough opportunities with indexes to hit my portfolio theta or portfolio delta goals, the very same goals that you showed me how to do back in episode one? You know, guys, it's almost like I've done this before because I had a sneaking suspicion that you might have that question. So I suppose I will see you in episode number three, adding individual stocks. We'll see you there. Boom. 
So welcome back to the How to Build a Portfolio Crash Course. Jim Schultz back here with you guys in this episode, episode number three. We are going to focus on the role that individual stocks are going to play in your portfolio. To this point, we've already built up a decent little foundation, right? Episode number one, we talked about our portfolio targets. Episode number two, we talked about the power of using indexes. Well, now it's time to layer in some individual stocks. So without further ado, let's do it, man. Let's dive right into episode number three, adding individual stocks. So as we kind of alluded to on our way out the door back in episode number two, there's a really good chance that indexes are not going to be enough. There's a really good chance that for you to hit your portfolio targets in theta, in delta, you are going to need some individual stock exposure. That makes sense. Well, before we do this, let's make sure that we all understand it. We all remember what it is that we've signed up for as premium sellers. When you sell an option, which is what we primarily do, you want its price to fall over time. So that way you can buy it back later at a lower price. Doing this would lead to a profit that is really no different from buying stock or buying an option, letting its price increase, and then selling it later at a gain. Selling the option first is just this process in reverse. But even more specifically, we primarily sell out of the money options. So their prices are 100% extrinsic value. Over time, these extrinsic values will naturally be falling as an out of the money option must sell for zero at expiration. So we want to benefit from this with our new positions as premium sellers. Okay, so now that we're all on the same page in terms of what we're even trying to accomplish, it's going to be easier to see the power that individual stocks can play, the role that they can have in your portfolio, if we take a look at one of the most important metrics that we use at Tasty Trade, implied volatility rank. So implied volatility rank, or IVR, is a metric that we lean on heavily, and it shows quite literally how the implied volatility for a stock stacks up against its historical self by taking the current implied volatility of the stock in the numerator and dividing it by the previous year's range in implied volatility, the denominator, we're able to more accurately gauge where implied volatility is right now relative to where it has been. For example, let's say that last year's implied volatility range ranged from 10 on the low end to 35 on the high end. If the implied volatility right now is at 15, then the implied volatility rank is going to be sitting at 20. The implied volatility is 20% into the distribution of all the implied volatilities from the last 12 months. Similarly, let's say that the implied volatility were 30 based on last year's range of 10 on the low end to 35 on the high end. Now, the implied volatility is 80% into its distribution or range from the last 12 months. So this would lead to an IVR of 80. Okay, all that stuff about IVR, that's all well and good, but why is this important? Well, let's look at a couple different reasons. First off, and quite simply, higher implied volatility rank means higher option prices. Since higher IVR can only happen from higher IV itself and higher IVs into the Black-Scholes model lead to higher option prices out of the model, higher IVRs are going to lift option prices. This is helpful because remember what we've signed up for, guys. We want option prices to fall over. So welcome back to our latest crash course. My name is Jim Schultz. I'm going to be your tour guide for this five episode crash course on all things rolling. Now, my objective with these five episodes, I want this to be your one stop shop when it comes to all things rolling. Now, one thing to keep in mind before we get going, all five episodes, they are meant to be consumed together. They are meant to be consumed effectively at one time because the content is going to build on each other. Like the content is going to be very continuous from one episode to the next. So keep that in mind as you're working through the material.
That's right. This is going to be five episodes. And the five episodes are going to be episode number one, this episode. We're going to define what a role is. Episode number two, we're going to roll defined risk strategies. Episode number three, we're going to roll undefined risk strategies. Not surprisingly, episode number four, we're going to talk about adjusting our profit targets after we've rolled. And then episode number five, which I think might be the most valuable episode inside the whole course, it's going to be rolling FA. So without further ado, let's do it, man. Let's dive into episode number one on rolling and let's define what a roll is. All right. So to kick things off, I want to start with some basic rolling terminology. In the world of options, man, there are so many things going on. There are so many different moving parts that just being able to keep up with the conversations, just being able to understand the terminology, man, that is more than half the battle. We'll get into the specific strategies and all those things in later episodes. But here are the most important rolling terms that you want to become familiar with. So starting with rolling out, this is maybe the most common type of roll, and it simply refers to moving the position from the current cycle to some later cycle. So adding time to the trade. Now that added time, it could be a couple of days, it could be a couple of weeks, it could be a couple of months, whatever. But rolling out is always adding time. Sometimes rolling out is also referred to as rolling forward. Next up, we've got rolling up and rolling down. These simply refer to changing the strike price or prices of your position and moving up the option chain to some higher number or down the option chain to some lower number. Now, it doesn't matter if it's a call or a put. If you move a 100 strike to 105, that's rolling up. If you move a 100 strike to 95, that's rolling down. Pretty self-explanatory. Now, interestingly, the last one, rolling in. This is not the opposite of rolling out as we never reduce the time in a trade by adjusting expirations. Instead, Rolling in refers to moving the strike closer to the current stock price. Again, calls or puts, it doesn't matter. If a stock is trading at 50, let's say, and you roll your 40 strike to 45, that would be rolling it in. Or with that same stock trading at 50, if you roll your 60 strike to 55, that would also be rolling in. You're bringing the strike closer to the action of where the stock currently is in both situations. All right, so now that we're familiar with some rolling terminology, let's go ahead and define what a roll is to begin with. Like, we probably should have led with this, to be honest. But a roll is nothing more than closing the current position and reestablishing a new position that is slightly different. Now, that slight difference, it could come in the form of, you know, the same strikes in a later expiration that would be rolling out. It could be new strikes in the same expiration that would be like rolling up or rolling down or rolling in. And, of course, you could do both. Like you could roll out and up. You could roll out and down. You could roll out and in. These are all examples of what a roll actually is. So when it comes to our rolled trades, technically, these are two separate, two independent trades. But we don't normally look at them that way. We kind of view them within the same trade package, so to speak. This is helpful because it gives our original hypothesis more time to be proven correct and it allows us to lean into something that you hear us say on the network all the time. Duration over direction. Now, either way, regardless of how you view it mentally or regardless of how you actually roll your position, whether it be rolling it out or rolling it in or staying in the same cycle or going out to a new cycle or whatever, one thing you have to be very, very aware of and you have to recognize is your mark price, the current price of the roll strategy, is going to change once you make that roll. Let me show you what I mean. Suppose you have a short put in Apple at the 160 strike that you originally sold for $2 when Apple was sitting at 175. Now Apple is also at 160, so your strike is being tested. And so your option is now selling for a $5 mark. Thus, you have a $3 loss on your hand. So you might want to roll this option to the next cycle. Suppose that in doing so, without changing strikes or adding anything else at all, just the same strategy, you would be able to bring in a credit of $4, which that might be a little bit high, but I want to keep the numbers different inside of the example so you can more easily follow what's going on. If you did this, this would bring your total credits to $6, which is great. But once this position moves out to the next cycle, its mark will no longer be $5. 
it will be more than $5 because the options have more time associated with them by being in the next cycle. In fact, the mark will be higher by the amount of the credit that you rolled for because that's where the credit roll comes from, which simply means you still have some work to do to bring the position back to profitability. And again, lean on duration over direction. I will see you guys in episode number two, rolling defined risk strategies. So welcome back to our rolling crash course. My name is Jim Schultz and our mission today continues forward. Back in episode number one, we laid out some rolling basics, right? Laid down the fundamentals to understand what rolling is, what we're trying to do and familiarize ourselves with some of the terminology. Here in episode number two, we're going to talk specifically about rolling defined risk strategies. So this is what gets everybody excited. Your verticals, your iron condors, your diagonals, etc. So without further ado, let's do it, man. Let's dive into episode number two of the Rolling Crash Course, Rolling Defined Risk Strategies. All right, so before we get into any specifics, here is the most important thing that you need to pull away from this entire episode. Maybe one of the most important things you need to pull away from the entire crash course. Whenever you roll a defined risk strategy, you need to make sure that you do so for a credit. This needs to be adhered to 98% of the time. Now, why isn't it 100% of the time? Well, more on that in a later episode. But this is so important. Let's break it down why it's so important. So why is it so important that you roll your defined risk strategies for credits? Well, it's pretty simple. Doing this ensures that you reduce your risk. Suppose, for example, you have a 195 short put spread in Disney that you sold for $1.80. At trade entry, your total risk in the trade is $3.20, and that total risk is capped regardless of what might happen to the price of Disney. I mean, it could fall to zero, and that risk would still be the same. Now suppose some time goes by and the trade isn't quite working, but you can roll it out at the same strikes to the next cycle for a $0.15 cent credit. It's not a huge difference, but look how that changes your risk return dynamics. You've now collected a total of $1.95 on that same $5 wide spread. This means your total risk has dropped from $3.20 to $3.05, all because you rolled for a credit. Suppose instead you had to pay a debit of $0.10 cents to roll. Now your profit potential has fallen. Your total risk has risen. This is not what you want for a defined risk strategy. All right, so rolling for a credit might sound too good to be true. Well, it's not if you can do it. The reality is a lot of times you will have to pay a debit to roll a defined risk strategy, which as we've just seen, increases your risk. To further illustrate how all of this works together, let's start working through some of the more popular defined risk strategies that we use at Tasty. And let's start with maybe the granddaddy of them all in the defined risk strategy genre, the vertical spread. So vertical spreads are fairly straightforward. If the trade is working, so a short vertical spread is out of the money or a long vertical spread is in the money, you should be able to close the trade for some kind of profit, which is usually preferred at that time over rolling. Now, what if the trade is kind of in the middle? So it's not really working, but it's also not really not working. That's where you can usually roll for a credit. If the trade isn't working, so the short vertical spread is in the money or the long vertical spread is out of the money, this is where you'll likely have to pay a debit to roll the strategy. So that is a no-go. Now, you might be wondering, Jim, how does that work? Like, why is it a debit when it's not working? Well, without even getting into the mathematics or even taking a really, really close look at what's going on, we can actually zoom out and take a much easier approach. The answer is really straightforward. If the trade isn't working, whether it's a short vertical spread or a long vertical spread, it doesn't matter. If you want more time on the trade, you have to pay for that. You have to assume more risk. Because think about it. If you didn't, if it was a credit, then we would never have to take any losing trades ever, which obviously can't be the case. All right, so that's all you really need to know when it comes to rolling vertical spreads, whether they're short or long, it doesn't really matter. Let's now move into an iron condor 
which is going to be a pretty simple transition because an iron condor is just two vertical spreads. So with an iron condor, when it comes to rolling out, we want to view it very much the same as a vertical, which makes sense because, again, it is comprised of two verticals. If both spreads are out of the money, so the stock is between your two short strikes, then rather than roll, just take the trade off with whatever profit you might have. Now, if you don't have a profit at that time, which certainly does happen with iron condors, then you probably just need more time. But what happens when one side goes in the money? Well, here, your roll is going to have two parts. You're going to have the tested side. That's going to be a debit to roll. You're going to have the untested side. That's going to be a credit to roll. So what you're going to want to do is net them together to see if your net is a credit or a debit. If it's a net credit, then go ahead and roll it out. If it's a net debit, then pass. And by pass, I mean sit on the trade and hold it longer, giving it a chance to come back. Again, duration over direction. All right, so those are some iron condor roll basics. Now, I actually have more to say about iron condors, but I'm going to save that for episode number five on the FAQs because there are some specific questions that I'm asked on a very regular basis when it comes to iron condors and rolling. And so I'm going to put that information in that segment. But let's now turn our attention to the last example that we're going to work through here in this episode. Let's dig into some diagonals, which are quite unique because of the way that they are structured. So with diagonal spreads that are tasty, we buy an in the money option in the back month and we sell an out of the money option in the front month. And the idea is if the stock moves in our favor, so this would be higher for a call diagonal or lower for a put diagonal, then we'll just take it off for a winner and be done with it. But what happens if the stock moves against us? The way this strategy is set up is we have a built in role ready to go that front month short is going to expire worthless. So we're going to be able to reload again in another expiration. Now, this second expiration, it could be a weekly option that expires before your long. It could be the same expiration as your long, thus creating a vertical spread. That would also be fine. You can do this at the same strike, or you can even choose a different strike, which would usually be a closer strike. And the best part is you're always going to be able to do this for a credit. It will always be a credit because you're just adding another new short option to the mix and short options alone are always credits. Now, how do you choose the same strike or a different strike, a closer strike? Well, the same strike is nice because your spread width will be the same. So the credit you collect just reduces your overall risk and boosts your profit potential, similar to a vertical spread. But you could also consider a closer strike which will bring in more credit, but it will also shrink the spread width and reduce your overall profit potential. I would only consider this if the stock has really moved against you and you want to aggressively take risk off the table. Wow, man. And just like that, we are done. Everything you ever wanted to know about rolling defined risk strategies. Now, some of you out there might be thinking, Jim, that was not everything I ever wanted to know because I still have some questions. Like, what do I do about rolling the untested side of an iron condor? What do I do at 21 days to go? Hey, those are outstanding questions. They're so outstanding, in fact, that I've placed them in a special episode, episode number five, the FAQ. So definitely stay tuned and hang around until you get to that one. We're going to cover all that and more in that episode. But either way, man, but I will see you guys in episode number three, where things really get exciting with rolling undefined risk strategies. So I will see you there. So welcome back to the Rolling Crash Course. My name is Jim Schultz. I am still your tour guide, and we are now into episode number three. Now, we just got through with episode number two, where we talked about rolling defined risk strategies. So naturally, we're going to hop onto the other side of the fence with this episode and talk about rolling undefined risk strategies. Now, a quick little disclaimer. We've already covered a lot of things as they relate to strategy management in the strategy management crash course that's already on the YouTube channel. Now, my goal is not to just repeat all the things we've already covered in that course. So use the information in this course alongside the information in that course to give you a more complete, holistic view of position 
management. My hope is still inside of this very episode, you will discover a, a couple of brand new nuggets along the way that you can use when it comes to adjusting your position. So without further ado, let's hop right in, man. Episode number three, rolling undefined risk strategies of the rolling crash course. All right, now before we get into any specific strategies, a couple of important things to note. Number one, one of the great things about undefined risk strategies is the simple fact that whenever you roll out in time, you're going to be able to do so for a credit. Now, does this mean that you should never roll an undefined risk strategy for a debit? Not necessarily, and I'll have more to say on that when we get into the FAQs in episode number five. But the beautiful thing about rolling for a credit with an undefined risk strategy is whenever you do that, two things happen simultaneously. Number one, you reduce your risk. Number two, you widen your break-even points. These are two very, very powerful implications of rolling an undefined risk strategy for a credit because with undefined risk strategies, here is priority number one. This is mission critical. You need to control your risk. Before you ever think about generating returns, you need to control that risk. The returns will come. You need to make sure your risk is mitigated in the most efficient way possible. So, okay, now that we've got those couple of things in our back pocket, let's move into two of the most popular undefined risk strategies that we utilize. All right, so we're going to start with the short strangle, but a quick little disclaimer that actually applies to any undefined risk strategy. If you're at 21 days to go and you're not profitable on the position or as profitable as you would like to be, then it's time to roll it out to the next cycle. You can keep the same strikes. You can even move the strikes up and down. Like there's a couple different ways that you could handle this, but either way, it's time to go ahead and move this guy out. Doing so allows you to avoid the increased gamma in the position that comes near expiration. This is important to avoid because more gamma means more directional bias. That's not something that we want to voluntarily sign up for. So, all right, the short strangle. With a short strangle, you have a short put below the stock price and a short call above the stock price. And the simplest way to begin thinking about adjustments is this. If the stock is between those two strikes, don't do anything. The trade is working, so you don't have to start adjusting. Of course, if you want to be a little bit more preemptive with your adjustments, a little bit more aggressive, and start rolling your call down when the stock drops or rolling your put up when the stock rises, you could do that to help neutralize your delta. But for our purposes here, we're going to work through the simpler approach, which I'm not sure is any less effective than the more aggressive approach. So let's suppose that your put strike eventually gets tested. This is when you'll want to roll your call strike down to bring in more credit and improve your break-even points. When you roll that call strike down, look to reduce your position deltas by about 30 to 50%. Reduce them by more if you want to be less directional and reduce them by less if you want to be more directional. Similarly, if the call strike is tested, roll the put strike up and do so such that your position deltas are again reduced by 30 to 50%. Now, keep in mind, as you make these rolls, this delta reduction is the magnitude of the delta, not necessarily a mathematical reduction in delta. Cutting position deltas from positive 50 to positive 25 is a 50% reduction. But in this context, cutting position deltas from minus 60 to minus 30 is also a 50% reduction, even though the number technically, mathematically, got larger. All right, so that's how you roll up and down. That's how you start thinking about rolling up and down when your strangle strikes are tested. But what about the time component? What about rolling out? How do we throw that into the mix? Well, this is a lot more of a gray area, and there's going to be a lot of subjectivity that comes into play. But here are a couple of things to think about. So if it's very early in the life of the trade, like still 40 plus days to expiration, it might be a bit too early to roll it out just yet. Of course, roll it up and down to reduce those deltas, but staying in the current cycle, that might be the move here. Now, what if you're already close to 21 days to go? So anything, let's say 29 or below, and you're tested. Probably go ahead and roll it out too, because you're getting close to that 21-day marker where you're going to want to roll it anyway. Now, if you're in the middle, 
like somewhere 30 to 40 days to go. This is a judgment call for sure. Roll it out if you want to lessen your exposure to the Greeks and keep it where it is if you want to benefit more from the stock reversing back in your favor. But this is very much up to you. All right, so that's how you begin to think about rolling a strangle. Again, more on that specifically in the FAQ section. But what I want to do now, let's move into the other strategy that I wanted to cover here today, the short straddle. So let's have a look. So similar to a short strangle, the short straddle has a short put and a short call. But here... They have a shared strike. So when it comes time to roll, one strike is always tested. So how do you adjust your rolling strategy? Well, your first move, should you need an adjustment, will not be to roll one side up or down. That would bring you into an inverted strangle, which is definitely necessary at times. And it's a tool that we use often, but it's not usually our first go-to move. Instead, you'll look to roll out in time first. So not exactly the same process as a short strangle. All right, great. But how do you know when to roll out? Well, here you'll want to use your break even points rather than the strikes themselves. If either break even point gets hit, that's when I would look to roll out, especially if there's 20, 25, 30, 35 days to go in the trade. Now, if you're really early in the life of the trade, like 40 plus days to expiration and one of your break even points gets hit, you could maybe hold it a bit longer to see if it comes back before you want to roll, but I would give that a short leash, man. Again, this is very, very subjective, but it's something to think about, and you don't want to build bad habits. But holding on to the trade a little bit could be warranted here. All right, so rolling a short straddle is in the books. A rolling a short strangle is in the books. Again, guys, don't forget, use this crash course in conjunction with the other crash course that we already have on strategy management. And don't miss episode number five of this crash course where we're going to go through the FAQs related to all of these different things. But that's it, man. Episode number three, rolling undefined risk strategies is in the book. So welcome back to the Rolling Crash Course. My name is Jim Schultz, and you made it, man. We are now in episode number four of this Rolling Crash Course. We've already laid down some rolling basics. We've gone over rolling defined risk strategies. We've gone over rolling undefined risk strategies. Well, here in episode number four, we're going to begin to put all of that together. We're going to talk about how do you adjust your profit targets once you've rolled your position. So without further ado, let's do it, man. Let's dive right in. Episode has been tested. And you've rolled accordingly, whether it's up, down, out, or some little combo deal across the board, like you've made the appropriate move. So now the question becomes, what should you do with your profit targets? Now, this is going to be a little overlap from what we've already covered in the previous episodes, but still, the thing you want to recognize first and foremost is how have your risk return dynamics changed? Let's take a look. Remember that whether you roll a defined risk strategy or an undefined risk strategy, the objective is to reduce overall risk in the trade. This is easy to see with defined risk strategies where when you roll and you don't widen the strikes, any credit you collect goes towards decreasing your max loss and increasing your max profit. Thus, you're able to improve that risk return dynamic in your favor. Similarly, with undefined risk strategies, if you roll the whole strategy out at the same strikes, you roll the untested side and closer to the action, or some combination of the two, again, you're improving the risk return dynamic by taking risk off the table, decreasing your max loss, and increasing your max profit. Okay, so now you can probably see that rolling and adjusting and managing your positions, like this is going to have a significant impact on that risk return relationship. And the goal, of course, is to always improve that relationship. All right. So how should you adjust your profit targets once you've adjusted the position? Well, the answer to that question is largely going to depend on whether or not you view this role as an offensive role or a defensive role. Let's dive in deeper to what I mean by that, and let's start with what a defensive role looks like. So most roles, almost by definition, are going to be defensive in nature. The only reason that you would roll a position in the first place is if it's not going according to plan. 
So you won't usually find yourself feeling like you have all the leverage when you're rolling a position. Instead, with a roll, you're often just looking to plug a leak or stop the bleeding a bit before you consider your next move. Hence, the default setting you should apply to all of your rolls is that of a defensive stance. And this is probably why this whole process is often referred to as defending your position. All right, so given the fact that most roles are defensive in nature, it kind of logically follows that we might want to consider paring down our profit targets a bit once we've rolled a position that makes a lot of sense. Well, there are different ways that you could do this, and ultimately which one you choose is, of course, going to be completely up to you. But here are a few things that you can think about. So there are effectively four different ways that you could adjust your profit target now that you have rolled your position. First, you could keep your original profit target. Even though the target itself hasn't changed, this is very much a defensive move because your total credits collected on the position have increased, meaning you have more credits to work with, so your original target is a smaller percentage now than it was. Second, you could reduce your profit target to a smaller profit than you originally targeted. This lowers the hurdle that you need to jump over, i.e. the type of move you need the stock to make to bring the position back, making it more likely that you can hit this lower, more attainable target. Third, you could target a scratch, like just break even. There will be times when you just want the trade off your board and you'd be over the moon with a wash. Remember, you're playing defense. So turning a loser into a scratch isn't really that much different from booking an outright winner from the beginning. And fourth, you could target a small loser. These are going to be your dire situations where you're sitting on a big loss and you'd be perfectly fine with just turning the big loser into a smaller, more manageable loser. This is going to be used for extreme situations only, but sometimes you just have to wave the white flag and be realistic about your expectations. Lastly, just as a side note, even though the same basic principles apply, Due to the undefined nature of naked, undefined risk strategies, how you adjust your profit targets on undefined risk strategies is a lot more important than how you adjust your profit targets on defined risk strategies. All right, so that's pretty much everything you need to know when it comes to rolling defensively. But what about rolling offensively? Well, this situation is really only going to apply in one specific circumstance. You're at 21 days to go. You have a slightly profitable position and you want to roll it out. You want to roll it out because IV is still elevated or IVR is still elevated or whatever reason you might have for keeping that position out. Well, here, you're in a really, really great spot because you're going to collect your credit when you roll that position, but this position is already working. So you have a lot of leverage that you can use when it comes to adjusting your profit targets. And you could even warrant kind of ratcheting up that profit target just a little bit if you wanted to. I would just be very careful and very cautious with how you approach this because it could start to build bad habits. It might be a better, more prudent decision to maintain the original profit target that you had and just use that leverage to kind of increase the probability that you're going to get there. All right, guys. And just like that, man, we made it. Episode number four of the Rolling Crash Course is in the books. How to adjust your profit targets on a rolled position. So welcome back to the Rolling Crash Course. My name is Jim Schultz, and you made it, man. We are in episode number five. So I would argue that this is the most valuable episode of the entire Crash Course. Because for the next, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 minutes, however long it ends up being, we're going to talk about some rolling FAQ. Now, I'd be willing to bet that in the previous four episodes, episode one, two, three, and four, you've had some questions along the way. Well, my goal and my intention with these FAQs is I want to fill in some, maybe even all of the gaps that you've had along the way here in episode number five, rolling FAQ. So without further ado, let's do it, man. Let's dive right in to episode number five of the rolling crash course. All right, so let's dive right in because we have a lot to get to. FAQ number one. Now, these are in no particular order. But our first FAQ, what do you do when you have a position that's been tested very early in the cycle? You still have like 35 days to go or 40 days to go or 43 days to go. Like, do you still roll that position? 
Like, do you still move that position out? Do you still move, you know, one of your strikes if it's tested? This one is a little bit trickier. The safe, diplomatic answer is yes. Roll the defined risk strategy if you can for a credit and roll the undefined risk strategy for sure because you can always do it for a credit. But I got to be honest, this is a unique situation. It's kind of a gray area. So if you wanted to wait just a wee bit longer to see if the market might come back to you, to see if things don't normalize, I got to be honest, man, I don't hate it. I don't hate it at all. Just don't tell Tom that you did it. All right, so FAQ number two. What do you do when your strikes are not available, the strikes that you currently have in your position, are not available in the next cycle? How do you handle that? Well, there's actually a few things that you want to consider here, so let's have a look. So first, if the strikes aren't available in the next monthly cycle, they will be eventually. So you could wait until more strikes begin to show up in that cycle, which usually happens with at least a few weeks to go in the cycle. But second, you could also consider rolling into a nearer term weekly cycle. These cycles typically have more strikes available. Just be mindful of the bid ask spread differential and make sure that it isn't super, super wide, making a fill in that option a much more challenging task. But third, you could always roll your strikes up or down too, even if you don't want to, just to get into that next monthly cycle. When you do this, just be aware that you are potentially altering the intrinsic value of the position. More specifically, assuming the strike or strikes are in the money, whenever you move the strike further away from the stock price, it will boost your credit collected, but it will always move the position deeper in the money. Similarly, when you move the strike closer to the stock price, it will lessen your credit collected and possibly even require a net debit but you are reducing the in the moneyness or intrinsic value of the position. Now, which should you choose? There is no right or wrong answer. It's all about gimmies and gotchas, but those are the things to consider. So FAQ number three, 21 days to go. Defined risk and undefined risk. Handle these guys differently or handle them the same? Well, here is how you want to think about this. Undefined risk. Always roll that 21 days to go. Don't think about it. Don't debate it. Don't hesitate. Just go ahead and do it. There's no reason not to do that because you can always do it for a credit. But define risk. If you can roll at 21 days to go for a credit, then go ahead and do it. But if you can't and it's a debit, then just sit on it. Sit on it and hold it all the way to expiration if you need to. Remember, you have that long leg in place. So you're not exposed to the gamma risk that you would be with a naked Position. So when it comes to 21 days to go, defined risk and undefined risk strategies need to be handled differently, and this is how I would think about them. All right, so moving right along, FAQ number four. Are there any exceptions to the never roll for a debit rule? Yes. Let's look at a couple of them. There are two main exceptions to the never pay a debit to roll rule. The first is with an undefined risk strategy like a strangle inverted strangle, or even just a short put. Paying a debit to roll when you recenter your strikes is definitely something to consider. Now, if you don't want to mess with this and just keep rolling for credits, like that's always an option. But if you want to reposition your strikes into a more favorable spot and you're willing to use some of your collected credits to pay for that debit roll, then by all means, it's something to think through. Second, with a defined risk strategy, one situation where you might want to consider paying to roll is, say, a vertical spread where the cycle that you're rolling to has earnings. Earnings are binary events that always have the potential for explosive moves. So it might be worth it to you to pay $0.20 cents or $0.35 cents to roll a $5 wide vertical into that cycle and see if the earnings can bail you out. Yes, you are adding risk to the trade and you must be aware of that. But the potential payday from an earnings move in your favor might make it worthwhile to consider. All right, so FAQ number five. And this one is kind of a twofer. And it is dealing with our old pal, the iron condor. So number one, should you roll the untested side of an iron condor when the other side is tested? And number two, should you consider legging out of the strategy when one side is tested? Let's dig in. 
As for rolling the untested side of an iron condor when one side is tested, yes, you can certainly do that. And if risk reduction is your primary goal, then you should absolutely consider this adjustment. Just be aware that the closer you bring those short strikes together, the more and more difficult you're making it to make money. This is largely because the region of profitability is shrinking smaller and smaller. And with the long options on each side, your margin for error to make money is already on the small side due to the friction between the longs and the shorts in the strategy. So yes, you can roll the untested side in on an iron condor, but don't forget, you can also choose to do nothing. And I would also add that if risk reduction in a defined risk strategy is your primary goal, I have to point out, you might be trading too large. Your total risk in a defined risk trade should be controlled on entry. It shouldn't be something that you feel pressured to reduce during the life of the trade. Like you want to have full freedom and flexibility to do what you want to do in a given moment, not feel like you have to do something. Okay, fair enough. But what about potentially legging out of an iron condor? So rather than roll the untested side in, why not just take it off? Well, this is definitely an option to consider, and you can certainly do that. Our research has shown that this doesn't really help you over time, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. It might not help you per se, but it doesn't appear to hurt you either. So if you want to close the untested side and just handle the tested side, by all means, give it a go. Just be aware that keeping the untested side on can really be helpful when it comes to rolling the strategy forward though. This is because you'll always be able to roll the untested side for a credit, whereas the tested side will usually require a debit. So by keeping the untested side on, it does give you more options to keep rolling your iron condor forward for credits. So moving right along, FAQ number six. Why is this so important when it comes to rolling a vertical spread that you keep your strikes the same? Why not widen those strikes out to improve that credit? Well, there are a couple of parts to this, and let's have a look. With a vertical spread, as we talked about back in episode number two, if you roll for a credit and you keep your strikes the same, you're always improving that risk return dynamic. You're decreasing potential risk and increasing potential return. That's good. But if you widen your strikes, that might not be the case. Suppose you had a $5 wide vertical that you collected $2 on at order entry. Now you want to roll the position, but to keep the same strikes, you would have to pay a 40 cent debit. So that's a no go. But let's say if you widen to a $7 wide vertical, you flip that into a 90 cent credit. Why not do that? Well, that credit does go to improving your profit potential as you now have $2.90 collected, not just $2, so that's good. But you also now have a $7 wide vertical and your total risk has also increased from $3 in the original trade to now $4.10 or the $7 width less the $2.90 collected. The last thing we want to do is add risk to a rolled vertical spread. So that's why this is a no-go. All right, so FAQ number seven, are there any situations where normally you would roll and the mechanics suggest that you should roll, but you actually don't want to roll? Are there any special situations where this is the case? Yes. Here's at least one example. There's probably more than this example, but I think this is the one that is going to be the most common one that we come across as tasty traders. You have a binary event in the next cycle. The next cycle that you were thinking about rolling too. So this could be like a Federal Reserve announcement. This could be like an earnings date. Those would be two classic examples. And maybe you just don't want to deal with it. Like maybe you don't want to roll into that cycle because you don't want to have your position on during that event. That makes perfect sense. So what do you do? Well, here, maybe you roll into a weekly cycle before that event. That's an option. Maybe you close the position altogether. That's an option. And maybe, just maybe, you hold that position just a wee bit longer to see if the market comes back to you. Just don't tell Tom. All right, so FAQ number eight. This video is never going to end. How do you track your P&L on a rolled position? Well, let's have a look. This one is really simple because all you need to do is pull up the order chains. Doing this will show you every roll that you made, every piece to the trade package compared to the new mark price, which will always give you an accurate real-time P&L for that position.
And lastly, believe it or not, we are very close to the end now. FAQ number nine. This might be the number one question that I am asked as it relates to rolling on a regular basis. Jim, I have a strangle on. I've made my first roll because one side was tested. How do I know when it's time to roll again? Let's take a look. This situation is very much a gray area, and there is no hard and fast rule, so keep that in mind. But once you make that first strangle roll and you reduce your directional bias by 30 to 50%, how do you know when to roll again? Well, here, I would normally look at my new break-even points. If one of those gets hit, it might be time to move into a straddle. Okay, so now you're in a straddle. How do you know when to roll into an inverted strangle? Well, again, I would use the break-even points. Once those are hit, it might be time to consider moving into an inverted strangle. You could sit, do nothing, and wait a wee bit longer, but this is the time when moving into the inverted strangle is absolutely on the table. All right, so now I'm into an inverted strangle. Now what do I do? Well, generally speaking, you've reached the final stop on the train tracks, as I like to say. You could make the inversion even wider. That's a possibility. You could consider paying a debit to uninvert, also a possibility. But by and large, the default setting here will be to do nothing, let the extrinsic value fall off the options, and hope the stock stays within your short strikes. All right, so that was all that I had planned for the rolling FAQ. But you know, man, we are having so much fun. Let's toss in a couple bonus FAQs. So these are a couple of FAQs that came through my Twitter feed just recently that I wanted to include here in the crash course. So the first one came from Larry over there at LT Baxter over there on Twitter. So definitely give him a look, give him a follow and connect with him. He had a great question. He said, Jim, why don't I just forget about rolling? Why don't I just close the positions and find a higher probability setup and just kind of start fresh? Because rolling is just technically starting a new position anyway. That's a really, really great question. Let's dive, dive in. So to be clear, that itself is a solid strategy. Like don't roll, just take what comes by 21 days to go and then move on from the trade either way. We have found, however, that by following our adjustment mechanics, adding duration to our losing positions and doing so in ways that always look to reduce risk, it's worthwhile to stick with a losing trade for at least a little bit to give it a chance to come back. But not even rolling at all, as Larry suggests, is certainly an option. And it's a good one at that. And second, and lastly, the final FAQ of the whole crash course, I promise. Mark over there at MarkNoCollins11 on Twitter. So definitely give him a look. He wanted to know, hey, Jim, wait a minute. If I have a deep in the money short put, can I just keep rolling this thing out forever? Like, can I just keep rolling this thing out forever? Keep picking up extrinsic value until the position recovers? Can I do that? And the answer is, the short answer is, the long answer is, Yes, you certainly can do that. At this point, a deep in the money short put is basically just stock. It's basically just stock. You hold on to it for as long as you can. You get a little extrinsic value along the way as a bit of a kicker, and you just hold it until the position recovers. You can absolutely unequivocally do that. Wow, man. And like that, we are finished. I promise. We are done. The rolling crash course is done. The FAQs are over. It is finished. And so, guys... I am so humbled. I am so appreciative of your attention and your time and your investment in this crash course and maybe any of the other crash courses that you have checked out. We now have about a handful of them on the YouTube channel. So definitely give those a look if you haven't done so already. Hello, everybody. Happy Monday to you. Uh, Easter's early this year, so likewise, Good Friday is early. Um, don't get many Easter's in March, but 2024 is like that. So this is a shortened trading week. There won't be any any market or show on Friday. So only got each other for four days this week. Um, mixed bag again. Uh, crypto's going crazy, blasting higher which kind of indicates that maybe there's more to inflation than the government's really letting on because uh, it seems that at least the crypto crab believes that fiat is just going to wither away 
in the face of raging inflation. But it is an election year, so there's some significant shenanigans going on. Um, but it is remarkable to see Bitcoin and MicroStrategy in particular, which is acting like a leveraged Bitcoin holding company, even though it's not. Um, I got the charts ready to roll, preloaded for you. Let's jump in and get through them all. Papang, there we go, the spider. Um, ain't a lot going on. Uh, past three days have been just kind of a drift. Uh, we had our uh, enormous move on um, Wednesday, and then just a subtle series of lower highs and lower lows from these lofty uh, areas. And we're pretty much where we were at the close on um, Wednesday, I guess it would be on the spider. Um, in that course of time, the coolest thing that happened was on Thursday at the peak, we just about perfectly tagged this funny trend line that goes all the way back, which isn't a trend line actually, it is the midline of a multi-decade channel. It could be just dumb luck, or it could be the magical power of trend lines doing their support and resistance thing. I'm more inclined to believe the latter. Um, so having said that, uh, we got up to there and have been weakening and weakening and weakening a little bit more. Uh, as it is now, the ES and NQ are down a little bit, not even quite a fifth of a percent. And the RTY is the, um, the odd man out. He's up a third of a percent. Um, one bit of news that came out was with Boeing. This wasn't another jet losing its, losing its wheels or doors in mid-flight. This was about their management. Their um, CEO, I think one Dave Calhoun uh, said, I am so out of here and it will be leaving uh, by the end of the year. And it must be odd for a CEO to say like, I'm out of here and the stock explodes higher, but that's exactly what happened. Um, and, you know, because companies, companies that are in trouble, usually shareholders like to see some kind of change in management. Um, from a charting perspective, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon going on. Yeah, it's up, but, 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 some important things to note. Let's zoom in. Here is the price gap. This was the big gap between here and here. I, I don't know exactly what happened. Maybe this was when the uh, Alaska air incident happened. It doesn't matter. Something nasty happened to really blast it lower. And that gap was at 198.46. We fell, 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 hit the bottom here on the 18th and went climbing. And we opened a day quite strong based on this Calhoun hidden for the uh, just spend more time with his family news. Uh, and we just about sealed that gap. And that's good enough for us, I would say. So that's that's pretty interesting. So um, you can see that this news really doesn't establish any kind of sea change. This is, you're not looking at a bullish base. You're not looking at the beginning of something new. You're looking at an intraday hiccup based upon this news that will be forgotten in about seven hours or so. So yeah, it sealed the price gap and that, that is all that was accomplished for BA. Um, Intel was the cheerful recipient of some government largesse uh, last week. Uh, many tens of billions of dollars of tax breaks and uh, outright cash and uh, other incentives um, to give an American semiconductor company as much of an advantage as possible. Um, in spite of all that help, um, Intel's actually not really gotten past this level here, which I talked about last week. This red line uh, is merely the uh, peak in the internet, internet bubble, which it took decades to best. And we're actually below it now. I mean, just pause for a minute. Consider how extraordinary that is. A semiconductor company, which these days is valued like insanely high, just look at NVIDIA. A semiconductor company is worth less now, including dividends for all these decades, than it was back, way back when probably Mark Zuckerberg was you know, in diapers. So that is extraordinary to me. And for all this, the government's hurling untold cash toward them. And this is its performance. And it's actually, it, it, on an intraday basis, it cracked below support here. So not looking that great, uh, looking quite vulnerable, I would say. If, if you're in a group that strong and you're down, given the circumstances, that ain't good. Uh, NVIDIA has no such trouble. It is up as it is want to do. It looks like another lifetime high close is coming. And it's even near the lifetime high on an intraday basis set back on the 8th. 
So it has had, you know, a steady just bang, 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 bang recovery. And we are just about back to where we peaked on the 8th like so. So that's worth watching. So that they remain the king. Um, and SMH, because uh, NVIDIA is the biggest component of it, is also up. Although it's, it's well away from its own um, lifetime peak here. Um, I don't. I didn't have AMD today. I didn't include that on the list, but um, that also is remaining below its own price cap. But Nvidia is still. Uh, it's like a one-man show. It's just uh, live and large. Um, oh, hello. I do that sometimes. Excuse me. Let me just get my symbols back where they belong. And like that. Okay. Oil is having a fine day. Uh, USO is up. Uh, about one and a half percent. This was the base it established. It has uh, zipped off of that. And, you know, there are plenty of folks that are making clear that uh, now is the age of commodities. You know, uh, commodities are very undervalued relative to equities. And uh, oil is definitely thriving uh, here. And the oil companies, those that extract the stuff and sell it, are doing especially well. For example, we look at XLE. Um, this is the energy sector, lifetime high on this. It, it pushed above its former high uh, last week, and it's just padding those gains. Uh, XOP up even more on a percentage basis, like so. And it's uh, pushed not to a lifetime high, but at least a um, multi-month high. In fact, let's compare those real quick. Yeah, so XLE, as you can see here, never been higher. And XOP actually well, well south of its peak set uh, you know, a decade ago. So that's an interesting contrast. Uh, while we're still talking about commodities, uh, gold having a pretty good day. Uh, you know, when you live in a world when Bitcoin goes up 10% a day, it's it's hard to look at 0.75% in cheer, but you know, gold's a little bit more of a tortoise, um, but it's doing all right. And so we are uh, in the vicinity of a lifetime high, not on an intraday basis, but it looks like a good strong day for gold. Now let's turn our attention to what I was just mentioning, crypto. Um, here's BTC up uh, about $3,400 over the psychologically important $70,000 level again. Um, as I mentioned a couple of weeks back, I'm the proud owner of a lot of historical data now. So th this used to go back only to about here. And now we go way back to when it was literally like a nickel uh, to buy a Bitcoin. And so you can see the different phases. It's a really amazing graph. Uh, but zooming in more recently, like so, you can see that we have been in just rainbow blast off mode here. And the, one of the coolest ironies of all history must be that this Thursday, if all goes as planned, SBF is going to be sentenced um, for, for the FTX debacle. And I've got to believe he knows what Bitcoin's doing. I've got to. And it must be that's punishment enough. The man must be going insane. Added to which, if I understand correctly, the FTX um, account holders, they're not going to lose a dime because, um, it, again, I don't know the particulars, but, you know, they had they had crypto holdings, obviously. Those holdings have appreciated massively under the uh, trustee uh, stewardship and bankruptcy, and they'll probably be just dandy, maybe even make a profit. But the, uh, the, the head of the group, the head of the organization, the founder, um, Thursday, prison sentence. So in the midst of all that, we've got Bitcoin right near lifetime highs. And of course, if you listen to Kathy Wood, increasingly giant predictions about how high it's going to go. Literally, I think her last thing was 3.4. This weekend, it was updated. $3.4 million of Bitcoin, I believe, is the latest prediction. So there you go. Only, you know, three point something, something million to go. But we're above 70,000. So uh, crypto has been having a very good few days. Um, and even the likes of the altcoins, like say Doge, Doge is doing well, um, and Shiba. Yeah, I'm not looking at that here, but uh, there's some altcoins that just, it's like 2021 all over again. Um, MicroStrategy is having an incredible day. They're up over 21%. And it's, as I said, it's almost like it's a leveraged fund because the vast, vast, vast majority of the value here is their Bitcoin holdings. And so it's weird. You know, Bitcoin goes up 10%, they go up 20 Why, I'm not sure, but... The market loves MicroStrategy right now. So um, not a lifetime high that was set literally a quarter century ago, but a multi-decade high. Uh, so MST are doing very well. And the brokers we've talked about before having 
good days also. Coinbase uh, up again, almost um, almost eight percent, and uh, Hood up about uh, not quite four percent. So let's keep on keeping on. A um, couple of other long ideas that I've mentioned, and they're not having the kinds of amazing days that uh, the others were, but still worth a, worth a tip of the hat. A UI path still looking good. P A T H um, and Sweet Green S G. Well, let's turn our attention to electric vehicles for a sec. Start with our old friend Tesla. The Fibonacci's on here continue to be jaw dropping. I honestly, it is amazing to me. Look at this. Here's today's high. All right, what was the Fib? 175.32. What was today's high? 175.13. Not bad. And then it reversed away from that. It's a tighter and tighter and tighter range, but these lines are acting as very potent uh, levels of support and resistance. Um, other competitors are having um, a variety of results today. Lucid's having a much needed good day, up about 5%. Um, at first blush, it's like, oh, cool, a higher low. Maybe it's turning around. Please note that during the course of this descent, there's been plenty of instances, you know, like here, for example, and here, where it's done the same thing. So it's, you know, hard, hard to name a bottom. Um, Rivian, not so good. Uh, down about 2% on this one, near lifetime lows and just shield your eyes with Fisker. Um, this is this is heading down to, you know, the aughts. Uh, really quite a sight, uh, as is, by the way, companies such as uh, Luminar, which is a component maker for EV. So Tesla remains kind of the, the sole survivor with, you know, Lucid kind of hanging on for dear life. Um, we are getting near the, uh, well, actually we're doing okay on time. That's amazing. All right, well, great. Let's look at a few more. Um, wanted to make mention of ADM, Archer Daniels Midland. This is a pretty nicely and heavily traded critter. Uh, over the course of time, it's exhibited a variety of nice clean tops. I just saw another one here that I had marked, like so. And so this is what I've spoken of in the past. You know, stocks have personalities just like people do, and they express themselves in ways that tend to repeat. And when you see an instance like this where tops tend to be followed by persistent sell-offs, that's worth noting. And in this case, zooming in nice and tight here, um, ADM has got a terrific topping pattern. We fell really hard and we've been recovering for weeks now. So the real question is, is this all it's going to do? Is it going to poop out at this 63.09 level or is it going to close the gap way up here a couple of dollars higher? I do not know. Uh, I do know the top's really clean. And for the more conservative, you might want to just sit tight, see if that gap closes up. But it's a really nice looking pattern and worth watching. So again, A, D, M on that. Um, I would also note A and F, Abercrombie. Um, this is having a tumble today. We're down almost $12, almost 9%. Um, this one has had an exceptional run, as you can plainly see. But it's starting to look a little raspy here. Lifetime high was here. We had another go at it. it didn't quite make it. And that today we're falling hard. And let's wrap up with XLU. Um, dull, boring, but really important. I think this has got to be one of the most important charts to keep an eye on um, because, uh, as I've said repeatedly, the diamond is held beautifully. Particularly if we do not exceed the 64.49 level, I think this is looking like a good canary in the coal mine. Um, that diamond is key, that level is key, um, and it, uh, it's hanging in there. In spite of all this push, it's, uh, it's still a fantastic chart and worth watching carefully. So uh, I will see you here tomorrow. I always appreciate your presence and you have a good evening. See you on Tuesday. Bye bye. If you missed the live show, here's our Cherry on Top weekly recap. Are you guys changing up the music? What, what's the answer you want to hear? I, I want to hear you say, we changed the music. We changed the music. Definitely like the old music better. I need the music, I can't do it, Beth. He can't perform without music. Oh, new slides. Near, 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 near. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I want to make you a might all smoothie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like smoothies. For all of his you don't mood, like smoothies? For all no. his mood we'll make it chunky then. You'll of be fine. You don't like I'm not a smoothie person. I mean, you're oh. going to eat, be eating most of your food in the next couple of years that way. <laughs> it's just not getting used to it. If you said to me, what is the one profession that you could, like, I could never do? Ever. Under, I mean, even be if I was. Veterinarian. No. no a dentist. Really? <laughs>
like a lot of people couldn't do that. That seems like a rough job. Yeah. To yeah. Be a dentist? Yeah. Peter in YouTube chat, Tom couldn't be a pole dancer either. I don't know about that. Could do a... He's no. correct. Yeah, there's a kink for everybody, so. No, no, no. Never no. say never. No, no, no. Tom cannot do pole dancing. I don't know about that. We'll debate later at 1 p.m. So I got to take care of a little work business. The way that lunch works in our office, uh, okay, is you just go online and you wait your turn. Now, I get that there's an exception for Tom, so lunch doesn't begin until Tom blesses it with his fingers. Okay, that I'm fine with that. But there's somebody, not naming names, who apparently didn't feel they needed to wait in the line because all they were getting was salad, so they jumped ahead of everybody. You heard, you heard about this? Ruffled no. a couple, ruffled a couple feathers. I was there. I was there. Okay. Who is this? Was, okay. Who is this so-called person? Oh, I don't. I don't call people out online. Oh, I'm. I'm gonna out him. I'm gonna out him. <laughs> I, I was waiting in line, uh, right in front of where the salads are, followed by the Chinese food, and yes. Jamal comes in and he starts looking at the salads. I said, "You look with your eyes. You touch with your hands." He goes, "Well, I'm only getting a salad." I said, what about about the 15 people behind you if they want a salad? So I outed him like crazy. I go, hey, anybody want a salad? Oh, uh, look who's coming into the studios right here. I, I thought we were boys. What, what, what's going on? <laughs> uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. Hey. I, I hear you, I hear what's uh, going on I, out here. Nobody behind me was going for a salad, including Tony's ass. He was going for a salad. Ooh. That's not true, there was at least 10 people behind me and he cut them all and I made sure that they weren't going for any salad. They gotta wait, okay? The oh talent, gosh. the talent needs his food. I mean, they can't, you, what, you can go down on air. It's embarrassing for the network. Is Jamal off the hook? He wants to know if he's off the hook. I'm Jamal, off. you're good. Okay, thank Jamal, you. Jamal, you're good. Wait a minute, Jamal's off the hook. He's gonna go wait in line right now for lunch. <laughs> That's too. right, I'm gonna get in line now, early. That way I don't have to deal with the riff. Oh, I, 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 did you hear this somewhere? Because I, you, lately you've been using this phrase a lot lately. He said, said no one ever, you know. I have a game changer here. I have a Bristol <laughs> Myers. Said nobody ever with Bristol Myers. <laughs> the sun rises. That's the, said nobody at a Bucky's in Georgia. I've heard it at least like 10 times in the last few days. I don't think so. <laughs> Did you hear it somewhere? I think you're dreaming. Get the full scoop by checking out the archives at tastylive.com. Are you on a quest for trading enlightenment? Driven by an unquenchable need to find the twin flame to your chosen strategy? Our Where Spat Live event is the search for trading's ultimate holy grail. Do you have what it takes to find the elusive bat as we visit three cities? Join six tasty live speakers as they present six unique strategies and six unique clues using games and probability to lead to the ultimate prize. Sign up for this free event today at tastylive.com slash events. Know someone who needs a better broker? Earn $250 for each qualified person you refer to Tasty Trade. Because friends don't let friends trade on a bad platform. Terms and conditions apply. Join the club, genius. Tasty Trade. Everybody else, we are back. I'm Tom Sosnoff. I'm here with Tom Preston sitting in for the bat. How for was the it? last call. How was it? It's just like riding a bike, right? <laughs> Easier than riding a bike. I don't even, you know, I don't, I don't have to watch out for cars. Don't when have to worry When was the last time about... you've ridden a bike? What's that? When was the last time you rode a bike? Is it a decade? It's been a while. Decade? Two decades. Could be. <laughs> Might be. So I went skiing for the first time this year. It's been over 20 years. Really? And it, I couldn't believe it. I went to Park City for two days, and you know what? It felt like I hadn't missed a day. It was like riding a bike. Really? It's like doing the show, right? I, the last time I went skiing, see, growing up in Massachusetts, well, in central Massachusetts, we used to go to Mount Wachusett. And in the fifth- Mount Wachusett? Wachusett. Do you know, I used to go skiing in Massachusetts, but it wasn't that mountain. Well, it did, it, it was a hill more of anything. What was the place called we used to go in Massachusetts? Um, uh, Sugarloaf or no, 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 no. Sugarloaf is in Maine. Um, I don't know. It, it was near that music venue. What was the music venue called? The fancy outdoor music place? Never went there. 
Oh, in the Berkshires? Yeah. Um, oh, my God. I can't believe I can't remember it now. Tanglewood? Tanglewood. There's some place skier around there somewhere. I don't know. But in the fifth grade, yeah. you could sign up for the uh, ski trip. So every, like, Thursday afternoon, sure. take the bus of kids. The kids sure. are signed up. Sure. Took my sister's skis. Yeah. And we'd go skiing down Mount Wachusett for, like, an hour. I don't ever fun. remember hearing of Mount Wachusett. Wachusett. And it was, like, half an hour away from the school. So we could go there. Huh. I don't remember that. That was great. But I haven't skied. I don't think I've skied since, but it was fun. I like skiing. Yeah. I like skiing. Yeah. Well, Massachusetts. Oh, that was selling, selling some bond puts just because I put my money where my mouth is. Mm hmm. Um, That's what we do here. Selling some 16 and a half puts at 31 ticks. The volatility right now in bonds is zero. The IV rank is zero. So unless you're doing something directional, it doesn't really pay to be short premium in there. No. So I think the most impressive thing in the board right now is NASDAQ only down 36 points. Well, it's just down five about a minute ago. Yeah, but it came back all throughout the day. That was a pretty strong Well, rally. the most impressive thing about this market today is, one, that it's been dead all day. And on a day that they had a chance to, to um, kind of, you know. Myrtleize them? Yeah, on a day they had a chance to myrtleize them. But I'm going to point out something, a couple things here that are interesting. So it's the Monday of essentially – you know, a new cycle, right? Mm -hmm. And it is 2.37 in the afternoon. Now, has it felt, it's felt pretty quiet to you today, hasn't it? Very quiet. Okay. Without looking at your screen and knowing that the average daily volume in the S&Ps is about 1.1 1 .1 to 1.2 million contracts. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's just my guess. But I, yeah, that's, yeah. that's just pretty much what we've been averaging. How many S&P contracts do you think have traded? It's 2.37 in the afternoon. There's 23 minutes left in the day. 23, but probably, I don't know, probably 1.1 million or something like that. Right now, we're at 700,000 contracts. 700,000. We're about 30% 30, 30 below. We're over 30% below. We're closer to 40% below. That's interesting because even though the market hasn't moved a lot, that doesn't usually keep volume down. In other words, the market doesn't care. No, of course not. market and, doesn't care. And usually on short weeks, we tend to be very compact and kind of busy. But you remember what Anton did this morning when he came on and he did the his piece at 8 o'clock this morning? Do you remember the first line of his piece was last week the expected move in the S&Ps was 73 handles. Mm -hmm. This week? It was 42. 42. So we went from 73 to 42. How did the market no like how is it how uncanny is it? how crazy is it that that these everybody the market makers and the people that basically set the implied volatilities beforehand know that it's going to be dead it's just crazy do you know that we did a piece last week um anton and i think it was gad did a piece and the piece was on um expected move mm -hmm. over the last 19 years 2004 ish to where we are now 19 years worth of research mm -hmm. okay how far off do you think expected move how far how much higher do you think expected move was than actually happened with realized move in all volatility environments about three and a half percent you would think it's about 3.5% because that's almost exactly what I said. Do you know what the number was? No. It's crazy. 35 cents. 35 cents. What's that in percentage? So I don't know exactly. It's very small. It's very Less small. Less than 3.5% of the Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Market. No, no, no. Well, the market's, the market's, um, the market's, the index is 5,000. So, um, no, no, I'm sorry. In the SPY, the market is uh, it's spy, so the market would be well, five hundred and, and over average of seventeen years. It was what four hundred. So if the yeah, average, well, is it's probably even lower than that over seventeen years. So they say it's three hundred and something. So even even one percent would have been three dollars, or one yeah one percent would have been three dollars. Right, three, so three it's and one percent would be about ten or eleven dollars. So it's about so one tenth of one percent. One tenth of one percent. 35 cents. Was so that accurate? It's, that's how accurate. That's how accurate averaged over 19 yeah. years it was. Yeah. All it shows is that like people go, well, how how can you guys talk about, you know, efficient markets and efficient all this and efficient that? And the answer is we can because 
that's just the way it is. That's the way it works. Like, no matter what you think, that is how this stuff works. As crazy as you want to think it is, you can that's how it works. You can deny that. You can try to debunk it. You can try to... It, it, that is not a profitable way to spend your time. You can disagree with that and do, do nothing in the market. Don't risk anything. Don't make any money trading. Or you can say, okay, that's the reality of a 33 cents. How do I proceed? How do I proceed? That's, that's what it is. And I like to think that the tasty traders, the tasty trading world is in the former group. We accept it as it is and proceed. Um, also, um, I want a big shout out to Frankie, um, who said it's butternut, and he's exactly right. It was butternut. Did butternut. You see butternut? Butternut Mountain. In Western Massachusetts. Yeah, I've never heard yeah. of it. Butternut and Jimmy Peak. Those were the two that we used to go ski all the time. See, that was. They were about an hour and forty-five minutes from where I grew up. Well, that was way west. Yeah. See, we never made it out that far from yeah. Fitchburg. Yeah. That was too yeah. far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, we used to go the to Butternut. The old Buick wouldn't go that far. We used to go to Butternut all the time. That was it. I couldn't think of the name. Thank you, Frankie. Good stuff. Um, it, 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 so, so, so I just wanted to bring that point up because it just it, it blows my mind how crazy. And then the other thing was, I, a couple of things I thought were super interesting today. By the way, S&Ps are down 775. They were just down, you know, about 10. About 10. But, but the way they oversold them on Friday afternoon, the way they just crushed them, um, after the market closed on Friday, I thought they would kind of bounce them on the close tonight, like bounce them higher. So let's see what happens. I just figured they're not going to have another, like they're not going to close them underwater for the second straight night. So I thought they might bounce them up a little bit today. Russell's still still up 850. Yeah, the Russell's been strongest all day. But, you know, anyway, my main points of crazy, content, not contention, but of things that I thought were totally didn't make much sense to me today. First of all, is Reddit. Okay. I mean, I've been yakking about Reddit since the stock went public um, a couple days ago. Mm -hmm. But, and the stock, remember, opened down a dollar this morning at $45. But, so it closed at 46, opened at 45. The symbol's RDT, RDDT. Today's the first day they launched options. And if you want to talk about the worst day ever <laughs> to launch options, I mean, because they, I, I didn't make a trade in there. So just so for for fairness, I did not make one trade in there, but it always scares me when they first launch options because hang on one second, RDDT. Now, at first, I thought that the perfect volatility. I talked about this last week with I think Victor, but I'm not sure who who else it was. I said the perfect volatility for launching Reddit would be about if I was making markets, mm -hmm. I would have launched them around 70. That'd be my IV like. 65 yeah. to 75 okay. in that range. Okay. It's a $45 stock. You know, a 75% volatility would mean about, you know, 4 or 5% move a day, mm -hmm. which made sense to me. Mm -hmm. And $2, 250 Okay, Reddit's up $15 right now. It just exploded. With 126% volatility. In May, it's it, it's almost 50% higher. Oh, I'm 19, sorry. 19 million shares already. Almost 100% higher than where I thought it should be. I mean, Reddit is insane here today at 125 percent implied volatility in may april's 140 percent and july is 98 percent and in april the options they have look at the volume in there first day three thousand three thousand four thousand three thousand remember we said we wanted this is why we want ipos to get some some new stuff to trade that's some I mean, size this is huge size huge freaking size i'm impressed if these april options the the 40 puts are 10 cents wide the 45 puts are 20 cents wide and that's yeah i mean i mean they're wide when you compare at 150 views, of course at 150 percent new option yeah 150 percent 130 percent volatility 125 percent. i'd make them 20 cents wide too <laughs> you're damn straight you would but read it up 15 dollars it was only a 45 dollar stock it came you know um, so that's a monster, monster move. Um, My only gripe with it is they used five point strikes, which of, is which really kind of limits the flexibility with the sixty dollar stock. Of course, but you know, insane move in Reddit to the upside. Um, you know, that that's it. Nothing, nothing else to say there other than we've been talking about it. You know, very publicly for the last 
been talking about it very publicly for the last, um, uh, you know, almost couple of days and, right. and doing it very nationally. So, right. so that's a good thing because everything we talked about actually came true today, which is shocking. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I was very bullish on Reddit. Let's put it that way. Um, also, so that was one thing. The other thing was this morning on the opening, some stocks had some huge opening moves. AMD was one of them. Opened down six dollars on the news that um, uh, news that you know China was going to ban it. Blah blah blah. Whatever. This is why I just want to say this is why I hate fundamental news and all. This is why I hate news. This is why I hate fundamentals. Because if you had a chance to short AMD. On the, on the, Today would be the day to do it. Or, or Friday would be the day. If you could have sold AMD $2 below work close, $3 below work close, you would have done it for sure because the stock was going to open down six, down 31 cents. Another stock that they banned was Intel, and Intel's down 61 cents. Now, I know Intel's been killed lately, but if you're going to buy— right, all the way back. Of course, all the way back. But if you're going to buy anything here, and, and by the way, the volatility in Intel, 37%, I mean, markets are a penny wide. Um, I'm going to sell. I didn't sell anything today, and I wanted to, but I didn't. I'm going to sell some um, 41 puts, and I'm going to sell them at, I think, I'm, I just sold some at 103. I'm going to offer a few more just because the stock came all the way back. I don't have Which a position. Which month are you doing them in? I'm selling the, the April 41 puts. So that's 103. a little close for me. I think I'll do the 40s. Only because the stock came all the way back today, and and if any day it should have got killed. I'm going to offer him a 60. And the last stock that they also banned was Microsoft, which I don't blame them. That's down $5. I'm already short that. I don't need to do anything. That's getting filled at 103 on the April mm. puts. It's just a cheap little shot. I didn't, I didn't do that much today, so I wanted to right. to get uh, a little bit of a trade on. So mm -hmm. sold some puts in micro. I mean, I'm sorry, sold some puts in Intel. I'm already a little bit long, and I hate Intel. For me to buy Intel, it has to. I have to feel like it's crashing. Um, I'm already long a little bit of AMD, and I'm already short um, a little bit of Microsoft. So we'll leave that there. Tesla's up a buck eighty. Tesla rallied right after the opening, and it stayed up the entire day. There's not much going on in there. Yeah. Um, Tesla was one of our better performing stocks today because it had uh, premium got killed in Tesla. Our best performing stocks were Tesla and Meta because they killed premium and Microsoft, and also the uh, two other things performed really well for us today. The, the um, HG, which is copper, they killed premium in there. And then the NASDAQ Russell, I'm sorry, the S&P Russell trade, that was a huge winner today. On the losing side, for the 100th straight day, we got killed in um, NVIDIA. I hate that stock. Yeah, what they saved burn in hell. What saved me today was Bitcoin and coin. Um, <sighs> That oh, coin was my massive rally up. I was coin was my worst stock today. I, I forgot was about coin. coin. Up twenty three dollars. You know, Bitcoin. This is the biggest one day move. Is it Bitcoin did a ten percent move today? It's up seven thousand um, dollars. <laughs> I love that. Up seven thousand dollars. Seven thousand dollars. Just no. Just the magnitude of the number. Ten percent. Well, lucky thing for us and for a lot of other. Lucky thing for a lot of people in this industry, you can't short Bitcoin. That's right. <laughs> you can short coin, and coin has cost me a lot of freaking money. You can short coin, but you can't short Bitcoin. So, I don't know. So it's, is that, is that uh, would you say it wouldn't be up 7,000 points if you could short it? I'm not so could sure, you? but it would probably be up more. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Reddit's up, Reddit's up 15 points because you can short it. No, no, no. You actually can't short Reddit, but you can sell calls in there now. Yeah, you know, Victor said something to me before. He's like, he's like, yeah, if I knew Reddit was going to come out with calls today, I would have got long the stock. And I'm like, why do you say that? Like, why would anybody get long stock just because he's, he's like, well, gamma squeeze. I'm like, you know what? That's not the way to try to gamma squeeze. That, I wouldn't. I would Even never, if you believe in a gamma squeeze. I would never, ever buy a stock because they just launched calls. Like, never. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, you know, he has his, his own perspective, whatever. Uh, let's see, some of the grains. Soybeans up 15 points. Corn was unchanged earlier. Corn down two points, right? Two cents today. So that was fairly flat. Crude oil. 
You know, I didn't Cruise look at earnings. Forty. Yeah, Cruise, Cruise been up a dollar forty today. Did 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 you have earnings? Did you um, look at the earnings for today? Ah, uh, let me see. Beth sent me an email. Yeah, I know. I sent you the email, and I just want to make sure. I, One moment, please. I believe we didn't talk about it. And GameStop has earnings. Um, GameStop's up two dollars, which is a huge move in there. Ivy ranks over a hundred. Two dollar move in there is about the biggest one day move we've seen in a while. Um, Ivy rank is over a hundred, and in the April options right now, if you wanted to do something, the markets are. Can I just say they're not very good? I can't open the file. Beth, Beth my my computer thinks Beth's emails spam. Okay, I will read it to you. Thank you. Okay, so. If we are going to, let me see, do I have this thing here? Um, Doesn't work. Sorry. What day is today? Monday, Monday, Monday. Um, so all right. GME. So of stocks that we recognize. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's GME. That's it. I'm just looking at it. It's not even on my list that he sent me. Um, the, other, the only other stock I know on this list is BAT. There's nothing else. B-A-K-K-T, which is like a $2 stock or whatever it is, $1 stock, so I have no interest in that. Um, I don't trade anything else that has earnings today. Before the opening tomorrow, maybe that's what he was talking about. GameStop Let's, is up a lot today. Yeah, I don't even see GameStop it's on a percentage this. basis. I don't even see it on this list here, which is crazy. But I don't see anything that comes out before the opening that we trade or even recognize. Okay. So um, let's just go with GameStop. Let's see if we have it on our platform. We have earnings on the platform as coming out tomorrow. But we don't have uh, March twenty sixth. Yeah. So tomorrow morning, right? Yeah. It's not on our list. But anyway, um, stocks up two dollars. Like I said, Ivy Rank is over a hundred. God, surprisingly, they just hit the S and P's. Surprised by that. But um, TP, what do you see here? I mean, personally, I like the 12 puts for 77 cents. Oh, GME. That's what I would sell if I had to sell anything, but I can't get filled. In the uh, three-day options? Um, in the 25-day options. Oh, duration, senor. I mean, the stock's trading for 15. Why wouldn't these 12 puts be um, interesting at 75 cents? Can't sell them at 70. Can't sell them at 77, 76, 75. So let me get rid of that little... That little game there. Yeah, I'd do the 12 puts. 68% probability of expiring worthless. Can't sell them anywhere. I tried, even on a down ticket. Did you try to sell them at 75? I did. Oh, you did sell them at No, I did. I tried. Well, they're at 75. Now. now they are. They were 75, 79 a minute ago, and then the stock uptick 10 cents to up 204 on the day with the market down ticking. Well, that's the tightest spread of all those puts. 11 halves are 41.62, the 12 halves are 72, 110. I sold some at 74, really small, yeah. just to have a position on. I think I'll get filled at 75 in a minute. I don't really like this trade, just for the record. Something to do. It's something to do. Um, I'm not, it, it's not like I'm bullish on GameStop, trust me. I am not. <laughs> I, I still think it's one of the worst companies ever, but a stock that's up $2 going into earnings, my guess is that they probably leaked whatever they could. And um, <laughs> yeah. look at this S&P move here, right on the close. They were just down seven. Now they're down 16. This is the second straight day where they whacked them into the close. They it took is, three points off the Russell. Yeah, the NASDAQ's down only 52 right now. Yeah, NASDAQ was on 100 and something this morning, but... You know, listen. We'll we'll take what we'll we'll take what we can get here. Yeah, what's um, gold? Gold's up twelve bucks right now. Gold's been sitting there pretty much the whole day. Um, I take it back. GameStop after the what's today? Today's the twenty twenty fifth. Oh, GameStop after the close tomorrow. According to somebody that just sent me that. Let me see if I have that on my tomorrow list. Um, I think I might have looked at the wrong list. Don't. Such a rookie. You are such a rookie. Uh, what's tomorrow, Tuesday? Oh, yes, tomorrow after the close. All right, so Tuesday you still have a close. day. Yep. Okay. Okay, good. So that's good because I didn't look at it before. And now those puts are bid again. So now that I know I don't have to rush to sell them, 
<laughs> I will put the order in above the market, 76. You um, will squeeze those GameStop puts. Yeah, I thought it was this afternoon. My bad, my bad, my bad. It's tomorrow. Um, I read an email wrong. Um, uh, well, what do you make of this little market on close here? I, I a little make bit of selling they... pressure for the second straight day going into the close. We have not seen that in an awfully long time. But these aren't big moves in either the ES or the or the Nasdaq. Down sixteen bucks and down sixty dollars for the Nasdaq. Those aren't aren't huge moves. I don't know. They're not. There's huge more moves. room in the downside. Looking at um, just NQ. And this Reddit moves all over the place. It was just up $16 a minute ago. Now it's up 12 and a half. <laughs> They're moving it all over. Talking about selling just, out of, you know, the one-day options and something like the NASDAQ and the NASDAQ futures. Yeah, I mean, they're capital intensive. That's the problem with them. You can't sell, you can't sell naked. Um, Is they're just too capital intensive. Yeah, you cannot sell naked options in nasdaq it just doesn't work so let's say you want to do something 100 points out of the money you'd need eighteen thousand dollars to make 330 dollars in, in which not, one are you talking about nasdaq futures just nasdaq futures that's not capital e efficient no 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 and that's and that's a fraction of the price that it would cost to do it in something else right yeah i don't like trading the nq options unless you're selling strangles and unless you're willing to hold it for you know, you need to have really high implied volatility. Yeah, and you, have to be willing, I, and you have to be willing to hold it. I I trade NQ options mainly because they're they have somewhat higher implied volatility than the than the ES, and I can collect more premium. But at fifteen percent IV for the Nasdaq, that's not very high. It's shown by a nineteen percent IV rank. Compare fifteen percent in the Nasdaq to the um, ten percent in the uh, ES, and that's what I mean. Is this 50% higher volatility? TP, we have um, two minutes left to go in the trading day. By the way, Tom Preston and I will be back, both of us back tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday of this and week. And now that I have my security card for the front door, I can get in. There you go. You're, you're, you're clean. I'm huge. But we also have a little bit of a warm handoff to the boys through at overtime. And um, they want to say hi to you, Mr. Preston. Thank you. Let's bring on Ilya Dillon and... Um, uh, Chris Vecchio. Yay! Is, is he is he healthy? He's back. Yay! He's, he's, he's back. Is, hey guys. Is is he, is he healthy? Is it healthy? <laughs> is, is, is it walking and talking and breathing? I don't. I we can't see you guys. Unfortunately, our screen's down. John, if you can crank up the screen, it'd be great. Um. But uh, so, Dylan, I got to say, my arrival here in Chicago, I'm happy to say that I brought along higher interest rates higher crude oil prices, and a lower 401k for America. Don't you love Listen, that? I mean, the, cre the key is to keep everybody, you know, the, 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 otherwise people's expectations, TP, they get out of control. That's right. That's right. Somebody's got to bang them around a little bit so that well, they don't have to they get big expectations. Next thing you know, everybody wants, you know, a raise tomorrow. You, you can't live like this. Remember the Matrix? Remember the Matrix when they said, yeah, we designed it so when everybody was so happy all the time, it didn't work. Nobody believed it. That's what it is. So, Chris, you're alive and well? Alive. Uh, 15 <laughs> pounds lighter still. 15. Is, you know, I guess it's, it's 20 pounds. I lost 20 pounds last week in the span of four days. When you don't eat and you can't drink water and everything comes up That's every 30 impressive. minutes for four straight days. That's impressive. Listen, it's... Now I just need to get to the gym because, like, I'm ready for beach season. So, the, <laughs> hey, I fit my how do I get for that? 2024. How do I get that 15 pounds in three days? <laughs> Dylan, you know what? Dylan, this is the idiotic sign thing. Sign me up for that, will you? <laughs> I, I shared a drink with my daughter. I guess she had something and I didn't know it because she had a, an upset stomach and I was at the park with her and I had a drink. And then all of a sudden, 24 hours later, down for the count. But the good news is... Stocks keep rallying. I saw fresh all-time highs last week. The market continues to party, even if I'm not here. I know that Thomas and Anton took my spot as resident bull cheerleader around here and uh, and made sure Illy stayed in his lane. <laughs> well, we just had two I straight. I refuse to believe. We have two straight days now where where they were market on closed sellers and on super light volume. So um, super light volume today. So let's see if it, it actually means anything because they definitely hit them on the close on Friday. And hit them on the close a little bit today. 
Um, I don't know. I'm not reading anything into it at this point. Absolutely nothing. These aren't big moves. No, these are tiny moves with little, little notional dollars behind it. But, you know, something. Something. And something. only 830,000 traded in the ES today. I know. And what was the NASDAQ volume? That's nothing. No, no, absolutely nothing. It's like half of what it should be. Yeah. Nas NASDAQ, NASDAQ was 445,000. It's not that bad. It's down, still down about 20%. But um, I don't know, boys. What, what else you got going on? Dylan, what do you think from wherever you are? I mean, I, listen, this whole situation has been inexplicable for months. The fact is we're dealing with uh, a, a, a delusional AI mania uh, against a uh, very rational Federal Reserve and the prices make no sense. And so, you know, that's why we need TP to come in and sort of just spook everybody a little bit. Just they, at least he makes everybody nervous. You know, what's what's funny about the Fed and the markets or the Fed keeps saying, listen, I don't care what you think or what what you see, whatever it is, you know, we're on a path to lower interest mm. rates. And the market says, you know, it's kind of saying prove it. You know, because it's yeah. not. No, no, the, the Fed, it's kind of the opposite. Normally, the market's like, listen, you guys got to cut rates. And the Fed's like, no way. Now the Fed's like, we're cutting rates no matter how high inflation is. And no matter how maniacal the AI situation is, we're still going to reduce rates because we don't care. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's that kinda... the NASDAQ hasn't been able to break out of a range for the better part of a month when the Fed is telling them we want to give you cheaper money. You got to notice that. Yeah, no, no, it's not. I, I agree with you. I, but it just means we're. Becky, Becky, I can't tell if Becky is rolling his eyes or is about to just fall back into a novel virus coma. <laughs> <laughs> like this is what I came back to. Damn. Well, if we sell off, he's gonna have. He's gonna relapse if we sell off. <laughs> uh, I, 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 was, I was I was telling Dylan last week like oh he, taught, he said Tom was humble I said oh was, let me know if Tom's humble enough to stop being bearish in stocks he goes no not yet I go okay well then I guess I can stay long I'll go back to sleep. <laughs> Well, TP. You guys capitulate. That's over. TP's here now, so we're evening out the. Uh, yes, sir, we're evening out the game. Yeah, we're evening out the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, boys. Well, have a great show. Thank you, sir. Thank good you luck, guys. Me. Yep. Good luck. Have a good show, and we've got a full full lineup this afternoon. Um, you guys followed by um, uh, followed by Ilya, followed by Ryan today, and then followed by Victor Jones, who's got guests in house. So it's going to be very cool. Yeah, we still got three hours of programming left. Hi, right, man. Thanks. Don't change that dial. Do it. The beautiful thing about talking to entrepreneurs is that they have the ability to maintain their positivity and their confidence when they know what and they know why, but they don't quite yet know how. And they're willing to take not only their own risk, but sort of to organize people around their idea and enroll them in the idea to try to bring it to fruition. And I think that, that there's something that's very appealing to me about people that are willing to transition from talk to action. Watch Bootstrapping with Dylan Radigan on Tasty Live. I bought a stock when I was first old enough to open a brokerage account. It went up thousand percent and I made a bunch of money and I was hooked. I felt like I was just pretty much gambling in the markets. I had a big win and it was mostly failures there after that. And I thought, I need to find a way to consistently pull money out of the markets and find a more consistent, repeatable system. Fast forward, I ran into Tasty Live, really loved the market measures and the data they had behind to back up the research they were doing. My biggest takeaway is that you can find an edge in financial markets. It lies in volatility overstatement, volatility mean reversion, and having solid mechanics. Tasty Trade app for today's traders. See it, tap it, trade it. Deposit and withdraw money right, right in the app. View company financials, forecasts, news, and more. Set custom alerts to stay up to date. See things bigger in landscape mode. Get the customizable trading experience you want. The tools, the data, the knowledge. See it, tap it, trade it. Join the club, genius. Tasty Trade. There's a 
slow start to a quieter week. It's Monday, March 25th, 2024, and this is Overtime. I'm your host, Chris Vecchio, the man in orange, Elias Bivak, the man in blue, Dylan Radigan. In my absence, I heard the children were playing last week and still trying to short this market, but don't worry, folks. Daddy's here to set everyone back in line. <laughs> Ilya, Dylan, did you miss me? But of course, sir. You The, the, the chart... Uh performance uh as i was attempting to uh give it was decidedly subpar the uh, the, the the thing is it's just not the same vecchio like again you're a hell of a pilot you know we we do what we can but it's always nice to have a professional at the switch with all due respect Ilya. this guy uh, i couldn't vecchio, agree more <laughs> vecchio runs the runs this run he's a, he's the captain of the ship so it's nice to have you back on deck sir I, I was told it was like uh, in the movie Airplane. Everyone was walking up to the front, uh, slapping Ilya, get the charts under control. But we are back here under control, and we're going to start Including off this Ilya. week. <laughs> with, yeah, he's slapping himself <laughs> with, with, a, with a lighter volume day here in equity markets. In fact, as Tom noted at the end of uh, last call here, S&P 500, barely over 800,000 contracts traded. You want to see basically double that on a healthy volume day. We look for a million contracts traded basically by the 1 p.m. Eastern mark when futures power hour goes on. So not a lot of participation in this market for the second day in a row in the wake of that FOMC meeting last week, where it appears Powell may have been getting a little bit more dovish. S&P off by 0.3%, 52.77 right now. NASDAQ down by 0.33%, 18,514. Your Russell squeaks out a small gain, 0.17%, 2,097.1, and the Dow Jones off by 0.44%, 39,693. In the world of bonds, it was bloody red everywhere on the screen, long end down more than the short end, although there's a little bit of steepening here in the curve, barely by about 0.6 basis points now at negative 38.1 in that 210 spread. Gold up, silver treads water, copper barely higher, energy mostly higher on the day, crude up and nat gas down, and then the dollar takes a bath. Most places, the yen bouncing back and forth between positive and negative territory here. Gentlemen, we didn't have a chance to talk after the FOMC meeting last week, and quite frankly, when you spend the better course of four days uh, hugging the toilet, throwing up every 30 to 60 minutes, I can tell you that you get a lot of thoughts stuck in your head. As a stereotypical Italian-American, you can imagine that's basically like poison. who didn't think the Fed needed to do much of anything at all or signal anything at all was more dovish than anticipated. The fact of the matter is that the summary of economic projections did show us an increase in inflation expectations, growth expectations for the rest of this calendar year. And at face value, that should persist at least a higher for longer mindset by uh, the Federal Reserve officials. But that was not the tone that Powell deployed. He deployed the tone that, well, it's a bumpy road getting to 2%, and we probably can start cutting rates before we get there because it's going to be a bumpy road. If we wait until 2%, we're probably waiting too long. That leads me to believe that we're probably entering the policy Arizona, the market rally. Now, there's a few different factors at play here, many of which are confounding, some at odds, quite frankly, because the statistical turns and the quant profile when you look at this market are resoundingly positive still when you have five months of gains in a row, or when you see a rally like we've just seen where you have an S&P up by 27% in 17 of the past 21 weeks, something that's never happened before in US market history. Uh, I will say that in those occasions, the market's higher for the rest of the year every single time, 100% of the time and to an average gain of about 11.9%. But again, late cycle type of behavior, 2021 type of behavior. The policy mistake that was being made then was inflation was marching up and the Fed was telling us that they could keep rates low. Now inflation appears to be getting some legs behind it once more. This should be the easy part of the inflation fight. The base effects are working for us, not against us, and yet we can't bring down those rates. When we look to commodity prices like DBC, something that we've talked about in recent weeks, the commodity tracking ETF, it continues to make moves higher outside of that range, suggesting that the near-term impulse for price pressures will be to the upside. And so what happens during a policy make type of mistake type of environment? Well, if it's like 2021, bond yields can continue to move up, but stocks can continue to move up too. And that's the key point here. Just because the Fed may be making a policy mistake, and I think that the odds of a policy mistake may be going up, doesn't mean that the market can't continue to rally. 
After all, what's a good of hedge against inflation? Stocks. And if we're going into an environment where the Fed is allowing inflation to move back up and they're still talking about rate cuts, then that is inflationary for asset prices. So this market rally that's here, it still may have some very, very good legs to it. And Ilya, to your point about the NASDAQ trading sideways for the past month, I'll, per- I'll contend that's an ascending triangle. It's not yet a double top, obviously. It's mm-hmm. still within an uptrend. We could very well be days away from another new all-time high. Sure. This week is a very weird week, though, because of how the calendar falls with obviously the most important event of the week, at least from the macro side of things, the PCE report coming on Friday, a day when the market is closed. So I was speaking on Friday, too, which is just very magical. Important. Very magical for the market, which is why my pers- personal plan is I'm going to be staying long this week. And because of the way the expirations work out, for example, with ES, I will get to 21 days expiration of my current lo- ES uh, long spread right now by the end of this week. So on Thursday, instead of rolling it, I'm just going to skip the risk of PCE where when I look to what's happening here on the trade tab and I look at the volatility profile of this market, you're telling me that through the Monday open, there's less than 50 points priced in. That's with a three-day weekend and PCE. That to me, the risk is far too low given the fact that there are upside risks in the inflation data. I'll ride this out through Thursday. Thursday afternoon, I'm closing my ES long, uh, call spread. I'll look to put it back on Monday regardless of what happens with PCE. But I think this week is rather tricky in that regard, where the most important event of the week is occurring while markets are, well, not open. That's my diatribe about the Fed from last week. Dylan, you said something to me, though, on Wednesday, to me and Ilya in our text chain. You said you're going to pull the Costanza. You thought the market would fall before the Fed or after the Fed, and so you decided to get long. And it worked out. So are you still long NASDAQ here? Have you scalped it? Are you staying long here in a market that seemingly no. can't get pulled down for any re- rhyme or reason? No, no, no. I uh, I pulled the Costanza. I <laughs> got long. Worked. And then uh, it, it was a one day to expiration kind of situation. So I made a, on a percentage basis, a small fortune. I then immediately sold it and bought a put and lost all of it. The market hasn't really gotten anywhere since Wednesday. So I'm it assuming it was a zero DTE put. It was a zero. It was a, yeah, it was a, so I, I pulled the Costanza, but then I, I did a reverse Costanza and did what I thought I should do, which then took away the reverse, the bet, you know, the, the, doing the reverse Costanza is very tricky because what would Costanza really do? And then what is the opposite of that? You, know, you can, re, you can get yourself wrapped around a tree in a hurry. I mean, the the, uh, the 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 underlying point here is, say what you will, think what you want. This here stock market likes to go higher, no matter what the data may be or what anybody may say. And, uh, you know, I think the only thing, I mean, it's an interesting, because Ilya and I have been in the same boat where neither of us have been terribly long equities. I have not been long equities in any way, shape, or form this year. Um and so I've sort of been sitting here like a fool waiting for some sort of an opportunity to get short only to sort of watch the days turn into weeks and the weeks turn into months and the sort of moments of fragility quickly breeze through and turn back into strength, um, which leaves me more interested in things like oil and um even gold on the to the short side, oil to the short side. Honestly, at this point, I obviously the my best trade of the year was those well, that whole put spread situation in oil. But again, this is not to carry on about my my particular personal account. I I find the equity markets behavior befuddling, and 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 I find myself somewhat uh, besmirched. The equity markets right now, I think we could say here, two light volume days of a pullback within what's, again, clearly established a broader uptrend right now. We can reconstitute our trend line to the most recent swing lows. We can see that that one month moving average once again, never really breached. We test it. We bounce from it once more. And a market that's at support tends to go up. Is this a good place to enter again? Probably not. If we're down near 52.10, 52.15, you have a little bit of a better entry point at uptrend support, which time and time again, 
this year has continued to hold up as a good place to buy. And when you're in an uptrend, you should buy at support. Um, that said, I think you have a very short-term level, the most recent swing high near 5140. And if we can hold up there, then you get an immediate bounce. But that's really it. And the S&P has been all reliable. I have long articulated. I think that this is something where there's, it's it's very easy to say that the market's overdone because of the historic nature of the rally. I don't know where the rally is going to stop. And so I'll keep going back to the well. But this week is the tricky week, Ilya. Mm-hmm. Because of the timing well, of this hold calendar. On back Let me ask you a question. If you were in, a, in the position that Ilya and I are in, or at least I'll speak for myself that I'm in, would you continue hanging around waiting for looking at non-equity indices for opportunity and waiting for an opportunity to get short? Or would you would you originate a new long position into this insanity if you were not if you hadn't been long since you went ape shit in November? I think the market's still in an uptrend. Who's to say that it's question, going to fall back from here? Question. Not the question. I would initiate here. I'm going to initiate another position on because the market's still in an uptrend. It's time to roll. I'm going to happen to skip C- the PCE report because I think that the market, why would I want to be long into an event where I think that the market is underpricing the risk? I would. I don't want to have long delta exposure there. I don't necessarily want to short the market either because I don't like shorting a market that's going up. And I think that will continue to go up. But yeah, if I'm here, I'm trading this long through Thursday. And if the market goes down, okay, then I take off the position. And then I put it back on a Monday. And I look to stay long until the uptrend breaks. And just staying disciplined and mechanical on it. Because we don't know where, you know, we can say the risk and reward here isn't great. And I say that in context of the uptrend because support is, you know, some 70 points away. It's, it's better to buy closer to support than near the all-time high. The high comes in, what, two days ago at 53.22. So on balance, we're closer to resistance than we are support. And so buying close to resistance as opposed to support isn't ideal. It's not great risk to reward. Uh, but is this a great place to short the market? I have, see zero inclination whatsoever still to even try to pick the top here. Because we don't know if the top is going to be 53.22 or it's going to be 5,600. And so to say that the you know this isn't a good place to get long, what if the market goes to 5,600? In hindsight, would you have won a bit long at 5,278? Hell yeah. So you got to just stay mechanical within the uptrend. And it's that you got to be, I'm going to stay disciplined here. There's a lot of reasons to think that this is going to go wrong. And quite frankly, if my my, out, my outlook, Ellie, which I think you might agree with, policy error would mean bad things for the market down the line. Sure. Ultimately, the bill came due at the start of 2022. And maybe the bill comes due for equity markets later. But if this is the policy mistake part of the cycle, that's still the part of the cycle where stocks go up <laughs> because the Fed is easing into inflation, which and inflation is good for asset prices. So is it irrational? Yes. But can you make money in that kind of environment still? Yes. You can recognize that something wrong is going on, that there's a problem about to come around the corner, and yet you can still ride the bull. And if you've had that mindset here, you still get paid. So I'm not going to try to call the top. I think the call spreads are working in ES and NQ still, or QQQ or SPY. I think with the Russell, it's the short put spreads, obviously, today on a day where markets are down elsewhere. That obviously works because vol is much higher in the Russell. But these markets still want to climb higher. So Ilya, talk to me about this PCE report this week. Are you, like I am, alarmed that it's potentially not going to be good again? Because I was looking at the, the expectations and- I don't see much reason for joy there in those mm. figures. No, um, I don't think that there is uh, a strong possibility here that we're going to get a Goldilocks kind of lower PCE markets clap the, the, their hands in joy at the prospect of cheaper money uh, in the future kind of uh, kind of outcome. I think this probably isn't the most uh, significant of releases. Because the guidance that we got from the Fed on Wednesday was probably the most um, the most striking in that the Fed said inflation is going to be stronger, higher, faster than we thought. Growth is going to be uh, better than we thought. And also, we're not adjusting the view on rate cuts. You're still going to get the three. And then when they asked... Powell in the press conference say, uh, how do you reconcile what you did here at the top of the SCP table and at the bottom? 
How do you go and increase growth and inflation forecasts, leave the unemployment uh, forecast essentially unchanged, and then still cut th three times, and there's not an adjustment there? And Powell said, well, actually, uh, this reflects data that's already out, which has been better than expected, uh, higher than expected in the case of uh, inflation. And uh, by the way, nigh two, three sentences later, he starts talking about how they need to start to um, taper off quantitative tightening, quote unquote, sometime soon. Who knows when soon is, but he really wanted to make the point that that's coming sooner rather than later. And so you got this sense that Powell was saying, yeah, we upgraded the forecasts, but that's not forward looking. That's backward looking. And whatever we see going forward is such that we're going to need to tighten less through quantitative tightening or at least slower. And we still think that we need at the front end of the process here, three cuts, not two. And so I'm not sure how much reaction function there is to this PCE data. In fact, if you look at what Fed funds futures are pricing in now versus what they were baking in before the Fed and after. Before the Fed, it was getting closer to like 62 basis points, 63. The Fed was uh, undeniably dovish in the market's take. Obviously, we saw big rallies in stocks. We saw the dollar sell off. Um, I actually made most of the money I made last week being long dollars after the Fed because what happened after the Fed was striking. We went into alignment. Fed said three cuts. Markets went to 70 basis points. They're at 73 now. So we're essentially right in alignment with what the Fed has said and haven't moved from there. We had gold that couldn't rally. Stocks that went nowhere Thursday and Friday. Yields that kept going down, but in the wrong configuration. When the Fed came out, it was the front end, understandably, that was weakest. And the back end, that was a little bit better off because, among other things, the Fed increased its long-term Fed funds rate estimate for the first time in, I don't even know, uh, years, from 2.5 to 2.6. In the price action we saw Thursday and Friday, it was in reverse. The long end fell harder. The front end held. So all of the, the price action that we saw in the two days immediately after the Fed showed zero follow through and actually moves in the wrong direction. Gold down, dollar up. Maybe that's digestion. But the outlook on the Fed policy story hasn't moved. It's 70 basis points, 70 70 to 75, depending on the day, here and there, a basis point. And so the question for me now is, less so will Powell say something that on Monday will be a thing, will the PCE data shock? It's where's the tailwind? And if the tailwind ha has gone because the market and the Fed are now in alignment and nothing on the near-term data sensitivity is going to move it, as we just saw in the Fed's uh, adjustment to the SCP, then the fundamental narrative is changing. And we're going to have to ask ourselves where global growth is now. We're going to have to ask ourselves uh, what the next narrative is. If the narrative from November to now was the Fed is starting to ease and there is cheaper money in the future, ostensibly that story has ended. Not because the Fed has become more hawkish, but because speculation has become a reality. Everybody's arrived at the same destination. There's nothing left to speculate on. Risk sentiment never came back after the Fed. It did its Fed reaction, then stopped and has done nothing since. Yeah, but this is still the market that's, you know, you 
you really didn't do much of anything. And we kind of just started leaking higher. We did this after CPI. But then it was we did this after Nvidia earnings. There, w there was no update of the, the SEP yet. The, the market doesn't need rate cuts. Rate cuts Maybe. are bad. I, 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 I'm going to re reiterate the point. Historically, how do stocks perform during the rate cut cycle itself? Good or bad? Bad. Well, sure, because, they be, because rates are being cut for bad reasons. The Fed doesn't exactly. go and raise rates for good re for bad reasons and cut them for good reasons. But That's not how this works. No, but we're we're in the pause. Do stocks like the period between the end of the hiking cycle and the beginning of the cutting cycle? Yes. Do stocks well, like sure. the sure? Do stocks the like is, do stocks like the, the hiking end? cycle? Yes. Is but if if the that, if the first the cut is still mind, sixty to ninety days away, we're the fine. To end. So markets, as we know, right? I mean, I agree with you. The question is of timing. Uh, markets, as we know, are forward looking. So the question for me isn't. The Fed has to actually physically say rates are now being cut for the cuts to commence. Speculation has to end. The markets have to fully bake in the outcome. And ostensibly they have. And that's why the NASDAQ hasn't moved for a month. It's been stuck in the same range. Very tellingly in that same range, the gap between where the markets and the Fed were got closed. I think if, if Dylan, if you told me again at the start of the year, we have to take seven cuts down to three cuts priced in for 2024. And you and I said, okay, let's make a deal. You said, Chris, I'll give you a market that doesn't go anywhere for the next three months while that adjustment occurs. I would have said that's pretty incredible that we weathered that storm. And if you told me that we we're going to be a thousand points higher, two thousand points higher, I would have said there's something great must be going on in the economy. That even though interest rates are going to stay higher, the increase in growth marginally is going to be so much better that you could substantiate and justify a higher equity market valuation, even in the face of continued elevated interest rates. That's a super glide, as you like to call it. Yeah, I mean, this is sort of like playing out. Yeah, I mean, no, it's a, we, we talked about this. We're like, well, there, I guess there's a world where the number of rate cuts goes down by more than half, but it goes down by more than half for such a good reason that the market rallies in the face of a total collapse in the number of rate cuts, rate cuts because the rate cut uh, declination has been adjusted because of uh, a profoundly robust economy, even if it's hyper-concentrated in a fantasy of, of artificial intelligence. I mean, Dylan, it, it, makes, it makes sense, though. If the market pushes up interest rates by a percent, but its expectations for growth over that same time horizon increase by a percent and a half, its expectations for corporate earnings increase in excess of the expected increase in interest rates, then valuation should stay supported. It's, it's a wash. And so I think that's been the big surprise here in this market. And I posted a few of these charts to my Twitter feed recently about how the US economy is outperforming its peers since the, since the COVID pandemic by such significant margins. That's a big part of the story here for why our equity markets are holding up better than everywhere else. Mm -hmm. Capital is flowing into the country because we're the world's fastest growing developed economy right now. By a long mile too. By a, by a wide country mile right now. Yeah. And that has profound implications for where capital goes around the globe. It's one of the reasons why the U.S. outperformed Europe in the 2010s, because who wanted to in put their money into a, a region that was debt laden and dragged down by shoveling all good money into repaying bad debts? That's not a productive use of capital. They were patching holes. Whereas the United States, relatively speaking, had its problems, but the problems weren't as bad. So you increment, allocated your incremental dollar to the U.S. and our equity markets outperformed theirs. It's a very similar type of situation. It's you know not it's not the Roaring Twenties, but the labor market's robust. Immigration is certainly playing a role into that. There are strong opinions for good reason, I think, about why that may or may not be a good thing. 
but there's a tailwind here for this economy right now that just persists and persists and persists. And so, but doesn't look, the concentration give you pause of anything? Yeah, right? the con- yeah, yeah the con- the concentration tells me though that when it breaks, it's going to break hard. But it, that doesn't tell me that this is the time to get short. It's why you know with this this updated, I, I see some people putting around charts. This is a double top in the Nasdaq. It could be. We'll know that if we break the neckline. There's no we way haven't. to know that here. But there's no way to know that here. So you there's can't treat no it like way. that. I mean, and I'm short. But there's... And, and I and, think that's nuts. As and, you know. Sure. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm not outright short. I still have a vertical spread on. It's still the out contract. It's still... Yeah, Ilya does this sort of very rational thing where he... Oodles to expiration. You long, know. Duration, long duration spread as opposed to my... Uh, Madman's delight. Oh yeah, I, I, am, I am, if nothing else, <laughs> driven by perpetual fear of loss. So, uh, because I completely agree with Chris that the uptrend isn't broken. However, I maintain that the risk reward consideration here for a market that was going up and isn't anymore. Notice I'm not talking about ES. I'm talking about NASDAQ specifically. I have no exposure in ES because that, that's a market that's kept going. This has not. In fact, this stopped the moment the Fed reaction was over. And for me, of course, you can cherry pick all, all, all sorts of bullish things that are out there. Of course, the US economy is doing better. Of course, of course, of course. But that's not the point. The point is, do those things still need to be priced in? And when we got to the place, I mean, we just saw PMI data last week. Just as an example of of how well the U.S. economy is doing. It's doing better than everybody. It also hasn't done meaningfully better than itself in three months. Nothing is changing. Things are getting anchored. And the question then becomes, okay, no progress on the U.S. business cycle. No collapse. Still doing better than everywhere else. The leading economic indicators turn positive for the first time in 16 or 17 months. So as I say, you can find this stuff. The, The question is, is there anything else left to price in? Because when we consider that it's the NASDAQ standing still, and remember that it's the tech sector and the AI narrative and blah, 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 that has gotten us here, as far as the leaders of the risk on rally, I think we do have to ask ourselves, is the entire rally, and I don't have the answer for this question in um, objective terms, I have it in subjective terms, uh, if the rally up to here was all about cheaper money in the future, powering the new wave of industrial development, the next tech revolution, whatever you want to call it, if that's the story, that story is over. Now that's now that's we very, need, that's now we need something else. I don't you know. I, I would love to agree with you, Ilya, but I mean, I, I have even subjectively, I don't understand how you could say it's over. That, here's why. You- here's why I can say it's over. That doesn't mean, by the way, that a new story won't keep this market going higher. That story to me is over because the spread between where the markets are and where the Fed is has closed. We began this rally on Basically, in November, the Fed told us we're done hiking rates on November 1st. Then in December, they told us how many cuts were coming and made it official. The market saw double that. That spread has gradually narrowed from being a spread of three cuts to two to one to none. Everybody's in alignment now. What is okay, left I, to price in? I've got to, I've got to push back on the AI being priced on fully. This is the no no not AI. AI not AI. 
the just fit, the cheap money part of it. The AI the cheap story money, is decades cheap, in the making, and the cheap money decades more the, to, to run. The fact that we've gone from seven cuts down to three cuts shows that the cheap money narrative is not part of the story. I disagree. Because if 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 this if markets were rallying on the prospect of cheap money, then the reduction in cuts since December it's relatively would be bad for money to the Fed. I'm with Vecchio. I believe it, would, it does not money. matter. You've got a Lamborghini V12 that's overpowering this entire cheap money, expensive money. Exactly. It, it's, a, it's a so it's much a stronger it, impulse. I'm growing at 100% parabolic, and who cares if the cost of capital But is. you're not, though. I, yeah, we are, also, though. That's the whole point. Equ- equities are pricing the expe- expectations. Exactly. Exactly. Equities are pricing exactly. And so the question. And so equities are pricing parabolic. What do they care if the cost exactly. is but, 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 exactly? Exactly. Exactly. The earnings equities growth has, are pricing parabolic. But it's been substantiated. Growth. But it's been substantiated through the earnings. The earnings, the margins growth, the vol- not just the sales total, but the volume figures. We've had earnings growth in in real terms the last several quarters. And I no, point sure. to like the and I point to like people say there's excesses in the market. You can point to various excesses in the market from one way or the other. AI, the bots, AI robotics ETF, it's it just eclipsed its highs from where we were. It hasn't gone. I mean, we have it, it on the screen here. It hasn't gone anywhere f- for a month. Well, so, no, so this there there are still legs to this. Like if you well, want to no, talk about sure. public territory, and this is my point, and this is my point entirely, that there are legs. To, nobody, it would be crazy. Let's put it this way: it would be crazy to say that the AI story as a story, as a theme, economically, socially, is dependent solely on cheap Fed money. Of course not. We are in the middle of a a transformative technological uh, evolution. I don't think anybody would uh, be silly enough to debate that. That isn't the question, in my mind. It is our assets priced correctly today for the amount of information that we know about it today. And what is the difference maker? And to me, what the is- difference maker is now it's going to cost you to get it wrong because the money isn't going to be cheaper in the future. You Couldn't I say it already? Couldn't I say that in an environment where rates are where they are, it's costly to be wrong and not be long stocks during the best no, bull market I don't in history? Think, well, you could say that. I just don't think the risk reward there makes sense. I think I think it lines up all too neatly that the gap between the Fed and the markets finally closes, and you can no longer say the market is on the dovish end of the Fed and the Nasdaq stops rallying and everything linked to this AI story s- stops rallying. Everything just stops for a month. I don't think that's a thing you can ignore. Now, maybe it will find a new narrative. I'm not suggesting that it won't, which is why I am not out here selling r- risk with reckless abandon. It may yet. It may break its highs and keep going. I'm not saying it won't. I am saying the makings of what got this rally here have evaporated. And the question now isn't. That's where I'm completely at odds. I don't think I disagree completely on what brought this rally here. So I don't think the makings of it have evaporated because I don't I this is where I think perhaps you and I. I Dylan, you just said you're on with me. The rate cuts do not matter. I I completely at disagree. All. I think they, at all. I think the cost of capital at all. At all. is the only not, thing that matters. Ilya, not, that matters. That's going to matter later. I but, think it's mattered from I think it's mattered from late October until today. I, I, in a world, I, I think it in a world with to matter. in a world of secular the cost stagnation, of money as relative to risk, is the only thing that ever matters. As a matter of fact. Exactly. And the cost of money relative to risk is lower than what everyone realized it was because the economy is so much better than people. Has it improved in three months, though? Just that's again where a few days removed from all time highs and stuff. If we were truly going to say 
all is well. Money is going to be cheaper relative to growth. You know what would be happening right now? A gold rally. It isn't happening. There would be a dollar. Not today. Sale. Gold it is up how much this year? It hasn't moved. Hey, come on. <laughs> It hasn't, it hasn't spiked. It hasn't moved since the gold Fed. The last month, you got to pick gold and tell us gold. I, 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 I was going to keep going. Gold, dollar, yields, none of them are showing that conclusion. Not one single asset sensitive to the cost of money is showing the idea that anybody looked at the Fed and said, oh, good, dovish. Beyond the initial hour or two, maybe four, of the response in the immediate aftermath. All right, so we're about I can't to wrap ignore that. We're about to wrap up what could be a uh, first quarter of ten percent gain or more in the S and P five hundred. We're Without up question. around nine point seven percent right now. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven other occasions we've seen a Q one gain of ten percent or more. We've averaged a gain of 1.1% in April, 64% of the time higher when you've had a Q1 that's up by 10% or more. Q2 on average has gone up by 2.7% averaging a win rate of 73%. For the rest of the year, the market has gained on average 6.5%. It's been higher 91% of the time. So again, November, December, January, February, March, those five months in a row, the rest of the year positive, 100% hit rate whenever that's happened before in history. This is the best bull market run that we've ever seen in history. 17 of 21 weeks up 27% on the S&P 500. When there's no other real comparisons because this has never happened before. But when you have other occasions that are like this, the forward returns are still positive for the next month for the remainder of the year. And so that's why even if I'm at the mindset, I've arrived at the point where I think the Fed is now more likely to make a policy mistake moving forward. I go back to what happened was the last time they made a policy mistake. And I go over to NQ and I look back at the weekly chart. We're going to have to go to the continuous contract here to make this point. Uh, but we go to the continuous contract. And what happened in 2021 when they were making that policy mistake? Stocks still went up. Yeah. And so we 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 may see that inflation is coming back and the cost of money is actually going to be way higher than we anticipate that even though the Fed is saying three cuts this year, four to five next year, the reality is that we're only getting two this year. and We may only get two next year. That's a big shift that may actually matter. That's no longer us pricing in excess cuts and coming back down to earth. That's us now pricing in more restrictive policy than we than we previously anticipated in a, in a detrimental way, as opposed to like us getting the dessert the gravy taken away. We, at least we still have our cake. We're just getting the sauce taken off the top. The cake is still here. It's still a robust economy. We're just losing the trappings of loose monetary policy. It's only once that cake begins to sour and you know a rot that we have a problem with it. And that's, unfortunately, I don't think that's anywhere close to where we are in the cycle. So time will tell. But when you look at the scoreboard and you see that consumer staples in healthcare, um, defensive names are all underperforming the broader market, the capital rotation isn't there right now in the short term to say people are getting bared up either. And even on a day like today, individually, again, light volume day, is there any signal from the noise? Look, I track 25 ETFs here, guys. I have 12 in positive territory, 13 in the red. On a day where the S&P 500 is up by, or excuse me, down by a quarter of a percent and the Russell's up by 0.2%, that seems like a fair shake where nothing really does much of anything whatsoever. Um, the best performer here is, no surprise, energy, uh, OIH up 2.61%, XOP 1.66, XLE 0.86, and IYE 0.44. Otherwise, very modest minor gains everywhere else. The biggest loser is tech, XLK down by 1.39%. Uh, Dylan, I feel like this is news that's not really news. China announces that it's going to be preventing Intel and AMD uh, chips in government computers, government products, government Anything that goes into a CCP is going to have to be locally sourced, which not a surprise. It's the latest salvo in what's been a going on almost 10 year long trade war that you could say started in 2016 when President Trump was first elected. Biden has largely continued a lot of those policies. Trump has promised to bring them back into overdrive. So seeing that there's this tit for tat going on, I don't think is a shock to anyone is probably par for the course moving forward. But Intel and AMD today both rebounded. They both barely closed lower after opening to the downside. Is this just the semiconductor risk now moving forward, Dylan? Like, do we 
is this going to be the, the continued story where the United States and China are going to continue to extricate one another from each other's technology orbits? And I mean, does it I, matter I, I mean, at all to the I, stock market? So I actually don't think they're like, I don't, I think disentanglement is impossible. So I think all of these things, whether it's the TikTok ban, whether it's the government, you no know, government equipment can have American chips in China are really marge. They're not that they're not real things at the end of the day, but they're marginal things that are more politically significant than they are financially significant. I guess over time, obviously, they they will be financially significant. But the idea that there would be a genuine disentanglement between China and the United States at this point, as much as there might be strong political desires to do so, it, it is a basically a mathematical impossibility. Uh, the, you know, there's a sort of desire to migrate all the production to Mexico, and there's a whole pro-Mexico case for deglobalization and obviously deglobalization is an agenda and obviously china has all these domestic issues related to real estate and all the rest of it and obviously there's a lot of political support in china to 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 do this kind of saber rattling or even sort of marginal you know disengagement much as there is here in the united states but from my perspective it's net net uh uh of limited to no relevance the amount of integration that has occurred would take will take decades to undo, and mm -hmm. maybe I listen. I, I didn't think that Russia was going to go into a hot war in Europe, honestly. So I have to question many of my highly confident opinions. So maybe the United States and China will completely disinter, disentangle, and will go to a completely siloed future world with no global interaction. I just think the odds of that are remarkably low. I would I would think they're they're pretty low here too. I mean, Ilya, China really isn't a geopolitical risk per se right now. It seems like they don't necessarily have their eyes set on Taiwan, although there was reports of Chinese aircraft in Taiwanese territory over the weekend. Uh, if if China were to do anything, I would posit that they probably wait until after the elections because there's a non-zero chance that I mean, I think Trump is probably the leading candidate right now. I think the elections held today, Donald Trump wins. And I think if Donald Trump wins, then Ukraine aid is cut off. And whether or not Europe has the backbone to actually put boots on the ground and prevent Putin from overwhelming Ukraine is a very significant discussion that will be had. Macron seems to be leaning into it. But if that does occur, then you could be looking at a broader war in Europe. And if Trump is the commander in chief, does that mean he's pulling us out of NATO so that we don't get sucked into a land war in Europe against Russia? And if he doesn't, then what does China think about our resolve to support Japan and South Korea in defending Taiwan? I think there's a vested interest for South Korea and Singapore and India and Japan to all say, you're not taking over Taiwan. We're not going to stand for this regional aggression. So it's not just the United States game, but I think China waits. So I don't think the Taiwan risk is real here in this calendar year 2024 plain and simple i don't I think, think that's a real either um i but, frankly but geopolitical risk to be rising real for a long time but geopolitical risks are rising right the, israel just canceled the delegation to the united states today because the united states abstained from a non-binding resolution calling for a ceasefire and release of the hostages which to me seems reasonable let's stop killing people and release hostages i think okay that seems like a good starting point but apparently it's not i guess that's why i'm not a le world leader um, we see that Russia is blaming Ukraine for, uh, this, this very obvious ISIS attack in Moscow. They're trying though. Putin, uh, in his I, own address stopped short a little. I mean, I, ISIS is like, Hey, we did it. And Russia's like, no, it was Ukraine. And ISIS is like, well, here's the video cam footage from our guys, GoPro cams of us doing it. And it's like, no, 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 it was Ukraine. And they're like, here's us with the newspaper in the concert hall with the watch showing you that it was us. Here's us taking some. And Russia was like, yeah, but Ukraine let you escape. So, it, it, might, so as well, like, might as well be. But but the, the geopolitics not seems that, to not, not only that, but you also have all this reporting about the in increased Russian activity in Syria that would be sort of heating up an adversarial relationship with ISIS, all the rest well, of Well, and these guys previously attacked, uh, if memory serves, in Iran. So they they see earlier this year. Be, yeah, they their their enemies appear to be the kind of Iran Shia axis of which Russia is a 
support. But remember, I mean, listen, Russia is the sort of country that tortures first and then prosecutes later. Right. And so well, I guess, I mean, the point the point here is, right, this is not to crude oil today. Like what catalyzed crude going up? Like, I think even though the IVR is 14.4 on a day when yields are doing what they're doing and gold is also holding on to gains. I think there is a case to be made that there's a little bit of geopolitical risk premia being pumped back into this market right now. Maybe. And I don't think it's something that that people can ignore, right? Because when you, and I point that out because I certainly have, and look, I'm still holding on to my iron condor and crude. Today's obviously not a great day because crude goes up and part of that condor, one of the wings is the short 84, 86 call spread. Um, but I am very hesitant because there's, there's, you know, if, if we're looking at this price action like a month ago or two months ago, and we were up at these levels, given the backdrop of where we were a month or two ago, I would have said, yeah, I would I would look to sell a call spread up here, or I would look to buy an at-the-money put spread and say that this resistance will hold because of the economic reasons or fundamental reasons, X, Y, Z. But in a world where geopolitical risk premium is expanding, we saw this back in October, where even though crude was clearly coming off the highs, it took us a month of digesting that through the system before we kind of went back to our previously scheduled programming. Mm -hmm. And so there is the possibility where we overshoot right now, some of the technicals in the very short term. And that's why I find what's seeing what's what's happening here in crude. Do I want to roll the, the iron condor again into the future? I don't know if that's the case per se. I think directionally bullish in the short term may actually be the more appropriate bet. And same thing for crude, that 42.2 IVR, very tempting to try to say, this is it, this is the top. But even so, we're consolidating right around the former high. This is a market that's not giving it up. And I think there's, you know, you look at this and say, okay, there are geopolitical risks that are rising beneath the surface that maybe the broader market right now with volatility heading where it is in equities, in bonds, is just not being accounted for whatsoever. And that could be a surprise that sneaks up on people here in a week where you have the two-year note auction today, fives tomorrow, sevens on Wednesday, durable goods tomorrow, PCE on Friday when the market's closed, a smattering of Fed speeches, including Powell, when Powell is going to be speaking when the market's closed. I think this coming weekend, quite frankly, is a really good weekend where if you have positions that are expiring, take them off. Yeah, maybe don't roll. This is I'm not rolling anything this weekend. Just everything seems a little bit too copacetic. And that's really I don't love that, it. That's but I'm really, still gonna be long on the other side of it. But I don't I don't love holding risk over this particular weekend. That's really where I think you and I generally see it the same way. I'm not looking for for a collapse. I'm not looking for some sort of Armageddon level event. But momentum has clearly changed here. And it lines up with the Fed narrative almost to the day going back a month. And it certainly lines up to the day going to last week's uh, policy announcement. And so I look at all of this and I say, okay, this is weird that gold isn't rallying if if everything is, is in fact as good as uh, we think from a dovish Fed lead. It's weird that yields are doing what they're doing. It's weird. I, I mean, I met, I made most of my money last week buying dollars. I went full boat long dollars after the Fed and picked up 5% of equity in 48 hours. That's not what's supposed to happen if the Fed was dovish. I was longing against everything. The Canadian dollar, uh, the Aussie, the pound, the euro, the franc. Um, the franc had uh, uncharacteristically treated me w w well out of s and shenanigans for once. But you, it, you'll have it, to torture me to get me to trade the Swiss franc ever again. So uh, I hadn't in a long time. It looked too good. I took it. Thank you, s and uh, that was certainly a nice catalyst. I, I got out out of almost all of it uh, except the pound on uh, on Friday and just booked all of it because all of it seemed to run up uh, against near term dollar resistance. So I just took took uh, took my winnings and went home 
for the most part, but that isn't what's supposed to happen out of a dovish Fed. It's supposed to be a weaker dollar and stronger gold and lower yields. And it didn't line up. Something is different. What it is? Oh, policy mistake Fed is good. Policy mistake Fed is good for the dollar. Because a, a yes. policy mistake Fed means that interest rates are ultimately going to resolve themselves higher than yes. where they, they are right now. Yes. Right. Because the market, we said this a few weeks ago, like, what if, you know, Dylan, we went back to the beginning of the year when the market was pricing in six cuts. Did it really think six cuts were coming or was it a placeholder? Well, remember, we said this in the beginning. It was always a placeholder because it was either going to be more or less. The, you, there was a no more report. One of the banks had a report, but you talked about it. It was months ago. Right. Is that still the case here? Is three cuts still a placeholder? I don't think so. I think three cuts is maybe wrong because it might be it's two, maybe it's four, probably not four. But maybe it's two, maybe it's three. But I think that the that the placeholder was replaced by a move to the two versus three debate as a as an actual mark. So instead of it being e instead of it being equal weighted 50 50 shot that we're going to get eight or three or eight or four even. Right. It's it's the, 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 now the, we're just firmly in the two to three zone. There's no more placeholder it's two to three, but it's two to three for the best reasons ever, because of the AI parabolic super glide. And I would posit that if it stays at two to three, and if look if inflation is is two to two and a half percent in the Fed's PCE and the unemployment rate is staying below four percent and growth is still above two, the market's not going to freak out that the Fed isn't cutting rates. Because growth at two and a half percent. That's not why it would freak out but no it, so then the it shouldn't the freak still... out that the fed isn't cutting rates the fed has been yelling at them that they're going to for months so anyway game plan this week for me that's Stay definitely long. not something the markets should be freaking out about if anybody freaks out about the fed not cutting rates they haven't been paying attention right so um staying long right now at the beginning of this week uh, we obviously have a lot more to say about like what's happening with Tesla because now there's talk like with Magnuson said it should be the Mad Two and the the the, the minimal three or this that the other thing. I guess it's almost time to go bottom fishing in Tesla. Forty seven point five IVR. Nasdaq looks like it wants to break out. Right, if the Nasdaq's going to break out, you imagine that Tesla probably gets a little bit of a carry back to it, and this thing is down in the dumps anyway. How much worse could the PR get for Musk? Why not try to go bottom fishing here? But uh, I, I think there's some individual equity names that we can talk about in the days ahead that are kind of detached from the macro themes because the macro themes this week, they take a back seat overall. And, and these indiv individual names are great for a little madman's delight trading. <laughs> a little madman's <laughs> delight trading. I want to yeah, do, you know do a new a new trading segment on the show that's just called Madman's Delight. And it's an extremely appealing, extremely ill-advised, extremely... Um, attractive, extremely unlikely to pay, extremely high profit, um, extremely entertaining. I can already think about like the confines of that. Show me a, show me like a, a solid technical setup where where's like the madman trade is like you're calling the breakout's gonna be by the end of the day. Yeah, no madman so delight. Yeah, that, like that's like a twenty it. delta call out of the yeah. money and yeah. yes. This is what I like. Right. Okay. We'll get, we'll get working on that. Uh, and we're going to have to do like the Christopher Lloyd hair for you. So when you get the <laughs> I'm growing it out, I'm growing it out. So I'll try to get into character. The it's, key, it's... the key will be, how do you differentiate from uh, certain other shows with sound effects and buttons already doing this shtick? Yeah. Well, but I mean that, but that shtick is that, you know, listen, what, what we're talking about is, you know, 12 to 24 hours to expiration, a 20 to one payout, Three hours to go. We can find a madman's delight I like it. tomorrow, Dylan. I like it. It's it's but, it's the uh, the red the the four Red Bulls version of what's already out there. We are going to have to wait until tomorrow because overtime <laughs> is now out of time. We'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place. Here every Monday through Thursday on Tasty Live for the man in orange, Julius Spivak, and the man in blue, Dylan Radigan. I've been Chris Vecchio. Good luck trading. Up next, after a brief break, programming will continue with Macro Money and Ilya Spivak. See you there, everybody. Rock, paper, scissors? He just played paper. 
he'll do it again. No, Rock. Men statistically play Rock, but he played paper and lost, and the mind works in patterns. He's going scissors. He knows I know he'll go scissors, but knowing I know, he knows. Scissors, shoot. I thought we were doing rock, paper, scissors, shoot. It's always rock, paper, scissors. If you think like a trader, we've got your back. Tasty trade. Join the club, genius. Know someone who needs a better broker? Earn $250 for each qualified person you refer to Tasty Trade. Because friends don't let friends trade on a bad platform. Terms and conditions apply. Join the club, genius. Tasty Trade. One of the things that, that was most intriguing about the financial space to us is just that there wasn't a lot of vision. There wasn't a lot of innovation. After almost 20 years of open outcry, standing in the pit trading, I felt like all the markets were moving to uh, electronic trading. I saw the writing on the wall and I wanted to be first. Building the best technology in the world for traders was one of the coolest things anybody could ever do. I loved every second of it. Think or swim will always be my baby, but this one, it's different. We built ours literally from scratch. It's a much thinner, it's a faster, it's a slicker application. Everything's on one page. So you're always looking at the core page and then bouncing around from there to get to whatever you wanna to get to. We're here to support whatever you're looking to do. We have the tools that you need to be a successful trader. I wanna play a game. It's a relationship game. So I'm gonna oh, ask you each a question to your Who partner. Who loves the hardest? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes! Are you ready? Yeah, exactly. Who's more stubborn? Who's more public? And who do you think takes longer to get ready? Oh. <laughs> He's gonna do his hair. Who's a better driver? I mean, for sure. Yeah. Like, I live in Italy. Yeah. Like, we, like, we drive like... I drove a truck in New York City. I, I drove a tractor on a farm. I can fly an airplane. Who loves the bed most? <laughs> Who is more spoiled? Oh. <laughs> it's not even close. Like you got buildings full of people. What do you want, Mr. Zosnoff? I have nothing. Looking for a better broker and a bonus? Sweet. We got you. Right now, you can get a bonus of up to $4,000 when you open and fund a Tasty Trade account. Plus, low rates, smart tech with the analysis tools you need, and award winning support. So, get a broker who's actually got your back. And up to $4,000 at Tasty Trade. Make your move, genius. Tasty Trade. 90% goes to SP index funds, 10% straight to buy. Is 20th century advice driving your 21st century portfolio? Tasty Live has joined forces with the CME and SIBO to offer the industry's first multi-exchange trading collaboration. Our new live event, Building a Complex Portfolio, puts active traders on the path to modern portfolio creation. Tom Sosnoff and other Tasty Live personalities will cover strategies that'll help you integrate futures and options in your portfolio. Sign up at tastylive.com events and see where we're headed next. Beat the opening bell. Get trade ideas and market insights before the open. From the creator, Tom Sosnoff, and our chief market strategist, Tom Preston. Every weekday. Sign up at tastylive.com slash newsletters. And the markets have not made any headway since they celebrated the dovish Federal Reserve last week. We are left to wonder, well, what gives? What exactly seems to be going on here that investors don't find any more joy having been so thoroughly uh, cheered up by what the Federal Reserve had for us on Wednesday. This is macro money. Uh, 
we are uh, once again looking at what these markets are doing here this week. I'm Ilya Spivak, head of Global Macro uh, here at Tasty Live. As we do every Monday, we're going to look at the week ahead, um, in a strange week it is, um, in macro drivers that uh, might well give us uh, a guide on what's going to happen here next. But before we do, a bit of stage setting. And this really is where we uh, really ought to, I think, begin our conversation before anything forward looking comes to mind. And that is to ask, are these markets now out of catalysts? Have we exhausted scope for these markets to continue building higher. And this is why uh, we're going to look at this. If you look at the performance for the major assets last week, the story appears wholly unmistakable. Stocks are up. S&P up 2.1%, uh, NASDAQ up almost 3 Yields are down. The 10-year down 2.5%. The 2-year down 2.9%, almost 3%. Even there alone, the story seems very straightforward. On Wednesday, we got a Federal Reserve that told us growth and inflation expectations as we see them have been upgraded. This is the first uh, adjustment in the Fed's official forecasting since December. So needless to say, this is an important, fateful sort of moment. And the Fed says, we think growth is going to be faster. We think inflation is going to be hotter. And also, that does not translate into fewer rate cuts for us. We told you we looked at three as likely in December. We still see three as likely in March, despite growth and inflation upgrades. Not surprisingly, the markets looked at this and said, well, this is dovish. The Fed is not responsive to data surprises that might be pushing them into a less uh, dovish direction. They are resisting and they're saying, no, no, we said three. And when asked specifically about this in the press conference following the FOMC policy announcement, Fed Chair Jerome Powell said, yeah, you know, these upgrades reflect data that's already been out. And of course, U.S. economic data has tended to look relatively better than expected since the beginning of the year. That much we know here on Macro Money. We've been following it from data point to data point. And so with that, Powell seemingly said, well, these upgrades that we just did, they're old news. That's not forward-looking. Don't extrapolate that. Oh, and by the way, we're looking to slow down quantitative tightening, the program where we let assets run off our balance sheet, which is a kind of stealth hiking of rates or a further uh, sort of tightening of monetary policy running in the background, even though the Fed hasn't actually raised rates for uh, quite a few months now, a kind of slow, cautious tightening of credit conditions continues because the balance sheet continues to run down. And so what the Fed told us here is, don't worry about the upgrades in the forecasts. We're still going to cut three times, we think. And we're going to need to slow down the pace of this uh, back of the stage tightening as if to say, no, we're, we're really skewing in the dovish direction, not the other way. So not surprisingly, front end yields uh, and longer end yields fall, but the front end does most of the falling. Stocks cheer. The dollar weakens. Initially, at least. But then, 
something strange occurs. So when we look at this at face value, it seems to make sense, except if we look at uh, 6E here, that's the euro, a kind of um, a kind of proxy for the direction of the US dollar. The euro, of course, it's, is uh, its most liquid counterpart. The euro is down for a second week and is down more than the week before, almost 1%. In fact, the dollar was up against all major currencies with the exception of the yen, at least for, for a bit. The Bank of Japan seemed to be the much bigger catalyst in um, the yen. It fell 1.7% and largely stayed motionless for most of the week thereafter. And we'll dig into the Bank of Japan here momentarily. But on a week where there seemed to be an unequivocally dovish Fed narrative, Gold, which yields nothing and loves nothing more than a dovish narrative, could not rally. And the dollar rose. Crude oil continued to largely do its own thing. But the signaling from rates markets to stock markets to currency markets, even to crypto, where Bitcoin fell 7.5%, seem to be at a disconnect. It gets even more overt if we look at what happens after the Fed announcement occurs. So needless to say, when the Fed comes out, the markets have their dovish uh, reaction. But if we look at what then happens Thursday, Friday, the two days immediately after the Fed announcement where there isn't really any more major event risk to shape this narrative and every opportunity for momentum to build, it doesn't happen. The S&P 500 returns nothing extra in those two days. NASDAQ manages to eke out two-tenths of a percent, so stocks are flat, standing still after this Fed uh, announcement's initial reaction is run out. Yields continue to fall, but in a strange configuration. The long end falls more than the short end. So the markets don't seem to then be still making the adjustment to an extra rate cut at the front. Rather, it seems like safety-seeking capital is buying longer-dated bonds and so those yields are falling more. Crude oil comes off a bit. Not much to uh, say there in that it continues to kind of oscillate to the beat of its own drum. But gold sees a dramatic decline. The dollar sees most of the week's gains. Notice here, it's up 0.8% on the euro and 1.1% in two days after the Fed. So we can see here that the dollar actually fell on the Fed and a little bit before, and then most of that 0.8% was the last two days of last week. The yen is motionless, and Bitcoin does most of its falling after the Fed, down 5.9% in those last two days out of a 7.5% decline. So the markets ostensibly heard a dovish Fed, had a knee-jerk reaction, as you might expect, and then stopped on a dime, making no more hay of it for the rest of the week. And this, needless to say, is eye-catching. Because if, in fact, the markets were so very enthused by the prospect of Fed support, they certainly did not show it beyond a few hours following the policy announcement crossing the wires. Here's what we find uh, within our sort of framework of benchmarking risk sentiment against the cost of money and the driving force of that, of course, the Fed policy outlook. 
in the gr- in, in uh, the green line there is the Fed's December benchmark of 80 basis points, which was left unchanged with this policy announcement. So we can say December, we can say March. This is still where we're at. The Fed is unchanged. The gray bars are the priced in rate cut uh, expectations as they appear in Fed funds futures for this calendar year. And in the blue there is the S&P 500 as a kind of benchmark for overall risk sentiment. We can see in relatively clear terms here, what is driving the rally in stocks since it begins in late October, early November, because we can see that this is precisely the time that the Fed policy outlook starts to swell with rate cuts. And we go from about three baked in for 2024 right here out to as many as six. Now, of course, the Fed was not admitting any rate cuts, really, at this stage in the game. They really signaled that rate cuts were coming uh, with the November 1 policy announcement, and then later in December actually quantified how many were likely on the menu. So the markets had lots and lots of room to speculate here, and ultimately arrived at six cuts. Then in late December, the Fed said, okay, three is what we're thinking. And so begins 2024 with a wide gap of three cuts in between where the markets are, which is down here, and where the Fed is, which is here. Ostensibly, the markets then are saying, we're right, the Fed's wrong. It's going to have to come our way on this because obviously... Uh, if we didn't think that, we wouldn't be pricing in what we are showing in markets. So we clearly think it's going to be more cuts than the Fed has thus far acknowledged. So money is going to be cheaper. There will be more of an of a dovish adjustment in the Fed's stance. Risk on. And stocks keep rallying. As a matter of fact, they keep rallying as better than expected economic data that we just mentioned keeps coming out and the stock of rate cuts shrinks. Just until we get to the point now where we've essentially reached alignment. With the latest Fed update, the Fed and the markets are basically of a mind. In fact, the markets are holding slightly to the hawkish side of Fed expectations. They're looking at 70 basis points as of today being baked in. That's uh, against expectations from the Fed of uh, three cuts. So what we're ostensibly looking at here is a narrowly uh, less... uh, dovish perspective from the markets, but still more chance of that third cut than the other way around. So if we uh, uh, consider here that uh, 20 of the 25 basis points of that third cut are in the market, so 70 rather than 75, then we're looking at an 80% chance that 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 third cut occurs. So we are effectively lined up here. And the question naturally then becomes, well, if the catalyst up through here was that the Fed will at the very least have to adjust somewhat to a more dovish setting, be it here where the rate cuts are first building out, to then here where there's more of them in the market's view than in the Fed's, Now we have officially arrived. And you can perhaps rationalize this additional uh, increase in the S&P by saying, well, we didn't have an update from the Fed yet. But now we have. The December dots and the March dots are the same dots for this year. And by the way, even though the S&P has been rising, 
the, the Nasdaq, which we don't have on the chart here and which ostensibly has been the leader of this rally, has actually been stalling for the better part of a month as we reached this stasis and this alignment. And so not surprisingly, the question then becomes, well, if we're in alignment, what exactly is it that stocks have to keep them going higher? If this rally was truly predicated on the prospect of cheaper money in the future, there is nothing else seemingly to price in here, at least until we get another big piece of economic data that wildly misses expectations and the markets can go off speculating that we are going to have a more um, dovish Fed and the data will force them that way. But there is no major U.S. economic uh, data that's immediately on the menu to do that. And of course, nothing is to say that it's necessarily going to miss relative to expectations. The latest update that we got on this was U.S. Uh, purchasing manager index data, PMI data that we saw last week, where we saw a third consecutive month of generally positive growth that was neither accelerating nor decelerating from, from a baseline that's been established for about three months now. And so the U.S. economy is seemingly in cruise control. And the question then naturally becomes, well, what then is the tailwind? And is there then room for profit taking on some of this narrative that makes stocks vulnerable? Not necessarily because anything is wrong, but because the story has run out of gas. And that is the question that we are going to be asking ourselves this week. Now, of course, the most potent indicator in the stew here when it comes to Fed policy will be the PCE inflation data that we um, are going to get on Friday. Fortunately, on Friday, we are also going to have market closures. Fed Chair Jerome Powell was also due to speak on Friday. He, he's going to be um, uh, having a sit down with the Federal Reserve's San Francisco branch, my home branch. But the markets will not be open to have a reaction. Now, over-the-counter markets, like, for example, foreign exchange, they will be open because there are no exchanges that open or close there. But because it will be the Good Friday holiday for almost every major liquidity center around the world, and Europe will remain closed uh, for uh, much of uh, Monday and into Tuesday next week, then you find that liquidity will be very scarce, e even in OTC markets. And so getting a reasonable reaction to whatever this is, is going to have to wait. So there really isn't an immediate catalyst here. Now, looking at the numbers um, from uh, the Bureau of Economic uh, Analysis, uh, dissecting this data, and this is a dissection done by the San Francisco Fed, uh, we can see here that food and energy are essentially not a factor. Housing has been slowly easing as a factor, but the main story continues to be core services. And that's just straight economic growth as driven by consumption, the bedrock of the economy. And here, again, as we just saw in the PMI data, we seem to have relative stasis. So the idea that these numbers are going to bring us anything game-changing is probably overstated in general. But in any case, if the Fed is telling us that they can upgrade growth and inflation forecasts and stay with their outlook, then perhaps that there isn't a uh, data-sensitive reaction function here in any case. And so perhaps the narrative is truly over. And the next one waiting to begin. What that next one is, time will tell. 
But a period of profit taking on the blistering rally that we've seen in stocks already is certainly not out of the question. Elsewhere on the docket, uh, we're going to have minutes from the last uh, monetary policy announcement from the Bank of Japan, as promised. Here we are with the Bank of Japan. Last week, they exited negative interest rate policy and finally sounded uh, the end of yield curve control, the policy where they were capping the 10-year Japanese government bond yield at 0%. Both of those things were overwhelmingly expected. And so the yen roundly sold off, even though here was one major central bank, the only one that isn't tightening, but hike, uh, that isn't uh, cutting rather, but uh, tightening. There wasn't really anything else to say. Speculation had become reality. It, it was about as classic of a buy the rumor, sell the fact sort of a reaction as could be. Certainly didn't uh, didn't hurt uh, that as we've been talking about here on macro money for the better part of two years, there is really no strong impetus for the Bank of Japan to tighten in a hurry because they face structural disinflationary and deflationary forces that largely rely on demographics and that aren't going anywhere. And the Bank of Japan said as much. They said, here's a bit of tightening, but we're in no hurry to keep going. This will make minutes from that meeting very, very interesting because the markets, not surprisingly, are now saying, okay, well, let's get a better sense of this reaction function. How sensitive are you to economic data if that data suggests that, in fact, the economy is reaccelerating and things are heating up? You've just had wage negotiations where you've locked in significantly higher wages for the next fiscal year. So how responsive are you? And might you put some more tightening on the table? As we see here, uh, at this point, the policy rate is at zero. We expect um, a hike of 10 basis points within the next six months. We expect to be up by about two of those one year from now. Three, two years from now, four, as the outlook uh, runs out here, give or take. We're looking out th uh, three years here. So looking at these minutes should be very interesting. And if we look at the way Japanese economic data has recently performed, it's increasingly improved relative to expectations so far this year. Looking at the Citigroup Economic Surprise Index um, for Japan. We also happen to have retail sales and industrial production numbers, as well as uh, CPI for the Tokyo region on tap this week. If it follows, if those releases follow this pattern here, and we get hotter results along with BOJ minutes that signal that perhaps the Bank of Japan is open minded to picking up the pace a little bit, the yen might have room to rally. And finally, we're going to get over the weekend here, heading into next week, purchasing manager index numbers from China. Expectations are that the service sector will accelerate while manufacturing is almost back to even. 50 is no growth, no contraction. We've been in contraction mode for months. Expectation is we might finally climb out of it, or at least almost climb out of it. We can see Chinese economic data has basically been hugging the zero line when it comes to their economic uh, surprise index. So expectations and reality have been basically uh, aligned. But of course, how the world's second largest economy fares is a key question if the Fed story is in fact exhausted. So it'll be key to see what, what happens here. And that is macro money for today. As ever, we are here every Monday through Thursday after Overtime, a show I co-host with Dylan Radigan and Chris Vecchio, where we look at the Wall Street close and what may happen thereafter. I'm back on with Chris for Futures Power Hour on Fridays, although not this week. It's a market holiday. I'm back on uh, last or uh, first call, rather, uh, with uh, Tom and Victor on Sundays, writing for the news and insights portion of TastyLive.com. 
and opining sporadically on the platform formerly known as Twitter at Ilya Spivak. Thanks very much for joining. See you tomorrow. Know someone who needs a better broker? Earn $250 for each qualified person you refer to Tasty Trade. Because friends don't let friends trade on a bad platform. Terms and conditions apply. Join the club, genius. Tasty Trade. Need a little more luck in your life? I'm Vanetta, and this is your first look at the spring issue of Luckbox. The latest luck box is all about the auto industry. And once again, your free digital subscription is available at getluckbox.com. In 2022, the US auto industry sold 13.75 million vehicles. And it feels like I got stuck behind all of them this morning in traffic. And in 2023, the total value of the US car and auto manufacturing market is an eye-popping $104 billion. This issue of Luckbox looks at what's ahead for the auto industry and who are the winners and the losers. EVs have hit a speed bump the last six months, dealing with slowing demand, more competition, and lagging infrastructure. What lies ahead? We also take a look at two EV titans battling for supremacy in Asia, Tesla versus BYD and US versus China. On the American side of things, baby, you can drive my car. We also take a look at GM versus Ford. Plus, we look at why hybrids are so hot and is there a play to be made in lithium? The massive rare earth deposit is the key to powering vehicles. Will lawyers and lizards stand in the way of mining? I'm sorry, what now? We also show you the 12 hottest new cars of 2024. I hope they're bringing back the El Camino. Business in the front, party in the back. And I went to the Chicago Auto Show, and I want to know why there were adventure vehicles everywhere when people are only driving to Starbucks. And AM radio is back and more relevant than ever. Finally, for all you investors, we have 50 auto sector trade ideas. But hey, don't take my word for it. Do you want the best in life, money, and probability? Get your motor running and go to getluckbox.com and hit that subscribe button to get the digital edition of Luckbox magazine for free. Make your own luck. Get Luckbox. Hey, get Luckbox. Let's go. All right, we're back. Tasty Crypto Show. I'm Ryan Grace. He's Frank Caberna. <laughs> What's up, everybody? What's up, Frank? How are you? I'm still learning about the new studio. I did it again, but it wasn't as bad. I like that, I, man. I, I do that. Like I, go, I get excited, like I'm on a roller coaster. But then I do this, and I hit the cam. I, I put my hand in front of the camera. Hey. It blocks out your beautiful face. Um, but I'm learning. I'll I don't there. think there's anything wrong with it. That's just how we open the show. Cool. You know, that's our thing. Everybody's. The people know it's live. Exactly. If it wasn't live, we would have redone this because, yeah, waving in front of the camera is maybe not. Hey, it was the best. great. It was a great open. But here we are. Here we are. Let's jump right into the show, Frank, because typically yep. we run out of time. We have so much fun <laughs> going much all fun. over the place. We run out of time. We're not going to run out of time today, at least not in our fourth, maybe, third, fourth attempt to talk about liquidity pools. We're going to go right in here and set this up. Cool. Um, I should have, unfortunately, didn't have the title on the screen here. So it doesn't matter. It's up here now. Liquidity pools part two. Exciting right. stuff. Awesome. So, Frank, we have, uh, just to pick up where we left off last week, so if anybody hasn't seen the show, check it out. It's on the Tasty Crypto YouTube. But to pick up where we left off, we are going to go in and set up a liquidity pool from the very beginning. I had a pool previously on Uniswap. It went out of range given the price move today. I think ETH's up like 5%, 6%. So my pool is no longer generating fees. What do you do when that happens? You remove your liquidity, you rebalance your position, and you create a new pool. Unbelievable. It is. So that's what we're going to do today. And we're going to do that with the Tasty Crypto browser extension. Tasty Crypto is available for Chrome and on mobile, iOS and Android, both. 
I've got the iOS app. Okay. Check it all the time. Beautiful design, it's, I would say. And it's get the best thing about it, Ryan, it's getting better all the time. It is. We've uh, we've been working on this for a while now. We've got a lot more that's coming soon, but we're excited about where it is. I think finally today, given our last update, which was a week, two weeks ago, we have a lot of the pieces in place for our phase one, for version one. So this is version one, a lot more coming soon, but you can see that you can download this for Chrome or any Chromium browser as a browser extension. We've got it right here in the corner. Um, Sorry, let me find the mouse. There we go. And this is what it looks like. So we've got it installed. It's loading up here. We're going to create a liquidity pool. So we're going to create the liquidity pool, Frank, on Uniswap. I don't know. I keep losing my mouse. I'm going to jump over to Uniswap here. And the first thing that we need to do is we actually have to launch the application. Okay. And so. We're on the Uniswap protocol website. You can learn more about the protocol. You can get some analytics here. But what you really want to do is launch the app. Well, hold on one second. Are, do we have, do the guys out there have this up on the network? It's a good question. Right now, because I'm not seeing it on my monitor. I just want to make sure we've got so much great stuff planned here. I'm super excited to, to take a look at launching this liquidity pool. But we're going to need the people at home to see it as well. I've got... The monitor up and I just perfect perfect we're gonna get up there in a second let's yeah. talk about price action then really quickly Frank awesome yeah because I I just wanted to stop you right there because you're gonna launch into what's gonna be honestly life-changing for me it'll be like the first time I, I learned you could sell options okay. is setting up this liquidity pool um, the price action's been insane uh, another I, I feel like there's been a, a trend recently. You and I jump on on Mondays, obviously. Yes. And we've seen a lot of strong starts to the week for crypto. And I mean, I, I of course, Ryan, you and I have been friends for a long time. And, and so I'm sure you would uh, guess about me that I don't necessarily think there's a trend to like, oh, it's the weekend. And so it, you should buy crypto into the weekend because it always goes up over the weekend. I, obviously, everything is relatively random, especially a market that doesn't close ever, um, in theory is really, you know, random all the time. Um, but, but what are you seeing from your side of things that's, you know, more in the weeds of the crypto universe that warrants some of these, you know, Sunday, Monday, huge price action events? Because we've gotten a few of them over the course of the last couple months. Yeah, you know, it's tough to pick uh, one specific kind of catalyst or culprit yeah. here, though I would argue you're probably seeing a little bit of a short squeeze. Okay. Um, and the reason why I say that is I'm just looking at, I know we don't have it up on the screen, but on my screens here, I'm looking at the data dashboard from the block. I think it's a great place to go to, to kind of get just, again, an aggregation of everything from what's happening in futures markets to on-chain metrics to some data around stable coins. Uh, those are some of the categories that they have up there. But what I'm seeing here, Frank, is really open interest and volume in the futures markets. And this, to some extent, I do believe is, is related to what we've seen now that the ETFs exist. But you have uh, open interest and in, in trading volumes that are really near all-time highs. Okay. So I think some of that you know, short position that's been built up, maybe you're seeing a little bit of a squeeze. You are seeing some reports of liquidations on the short side. So these are data points that you can actually... Um, you can find and you can point to to try to get an understanding of what's going on. But yeah, I think you have a lot more participation. Um, start of the week, you know, you, you have more traders coming back. You know, there's definitely more liquidity, more volume activity mm -hmm. um, during the weekdays correlated with, you know, traditional markets uh, compared to the weekend, even though this does trade over the weekend. So I think it's a little bit of that. Um, that said, it's a big move. It feels good when you're, you're long here, for example. But I don't think it's really out of the ordinary, to be honest with you. Gotcha. Um, a five, six percent move on a daily basis in Bitcoin, in Ethereum, in other tokens. Um, Solana, for example, is up almost nine percent, kind of par for the course. Yeah, I, and it's it's funny because you wouldn't even say necessarily like, oh, this is the pent up price action from over the weekend, because most of the price action happened during the U.S. session. I mean, I'm sure you watched it. I watched it. We were going into the um, the U.S. session this morning, and Bitcoin and ETH and most crypto across the board was up 
a couple percentage points. And then it kind of uh, it, it gave back a little bit on the open. And then it really took off for, for the rest of the day. I think you're right. It, it has just become normal in both directions, um, these 5 to 10 percent. Uh, moves, but yeah, it's just interesting. I, I couldn't help but notice a few of them happening on these uh, Mondays. And with that, I, we've got the the Uniswap platform up. It appears and beautiful. I, I think you're ready to run. Yeah, let's jump back into that, and then we'll come back to the markets here at the end because I want to get your thoughts on a couple moves in traditional assets as well. Sure. But let's take a look at the Uniswap protocol. As I mentioned. You've got to open up the app first. You go to the website. So if I just pop back over here, this is what it looks like. And I, um, I guess I also realized that didn't show the Tasty Crypto app before. So as I mentioned, we're going to use the browser extension here today. You can download the browser extension in the Chrome Web Store. Here's what it looks like. It's called Tasty Crypto, obviously. And then when I click on this, you'll see that it's going to pop up. So I have it installed in the browser. Okay. I have imported an existing wallet. And we're going to use this wallet here to create that liquidity pool. So let's close that and jump back over to the Uniswap application. This is the trading interface. This is where you can swap tokens. So when you connect your wallet, it'll recognize what's in your wallet or what's mm -hmm. associated with that wallet address. You want to swap from ETH to USDC or to one of the other tokens that um, we've talked about. You can do that right here. But the first thing that you have to do is you have to connect your wallet. So in order to do that, you want to click on connect in the upper right corner. You have a couple options that are pre-populated here. We use Wallet Connect in the Tasty Crypto wallet. So if you click on Wallet Connect, it's going to give you a QR code. If you have the mobile app, you can scan the QR code with your app and then automatically establish the connection. I'm going to copy the link here. And then in the Tasty Crypto application, let me just enter a password and log back in. But in here, I'm going to connect using Wallet Connect by clicking on a little button in the upper right corner. So you can see this link. This is going to connect to the DAP, which is a decentralized application. And so if I just paste what we copied from Uniswap, it'll connect directly to Uniswap. And now my wallet is connected to Uniswap. You can see that it's changed up there in the upper right corner. No longer says connect. Now we're, um, what's the saying? Cooking with gas. Is that it? Bang. I'm so excited about this. I mean, that that was, I mean, obviously really easy. So you have to do a couple of things. A couple you have, to, steps, you have yeah. to get the Tasty Crypto app, open an account one way or another. Um, and yeah, you have to either use the mobile app or use the web browser or use both as looks like the easiest process. But now we're here. And yeah, the, the swap functionality, uh, I don't want to spend any time on it because it's essentially you're, you're buying a market. You're converting in the same when you buy euro versus USD in the Forex market, it's kind of similar to this where you're like technically converting your, you know, USD to euro, you're buying euro. Yes. Um, but selling this is, dollars this, and buying the euro. same thing sense. is the swap functionality, right? Where it's like, I've got 10 grand of USD and I can swap that for USDC. I could swap 10 grand of USDC for ETH if I'm buying ETH. It's just buying or selling a market. Yes, this is all on chain. Now, this is not connected to a bank account or okay. anything like that. It's only connected to the wallet. So I'd have to go to a centralized exchange. Gotcha. If I wanted to then move this, let's say I sell it for dollars on the exchange, I want to move those dollars to my bank account. I'd need a centralized exchange and that on off ramp functionality to do that. But this is going to allow me to trade directly on chain for anything that exists on chain. So as I mentioned, you can see the balance of ETH here. If I wanted to select a different token that I held in the wallet, I could do that. And then I can sell this, in that sense, into USDC. It's easy to think about it that way when you price it in dollars. I can also swap it into any other token. So to your point about currency trading, you can think of it a lot more like that, where if I want to sell my ETH and just quickly get into something else, maybe I want the Aave governance token, I can set that up and make the trade. So this is the front end, and this is the trading component that's powered by the liquidity pool we're going to set up, right? Where does the liquidity come from? Well, it comes from liquidity providers. I'll show you how to be a liquidity provider on Uniswap right now. It, it, this is, yeah, so cool because the a market like this is invented however many years ago, Ryan, and you, you would technically have to find um, some other person to take the other side of your trade. You know, Bitcoin is starting to run up 
and for you to buy Bitcoin, someone has to sell it to you, right? But this functionality has been created here, allowing retail individuals to provide liquidity in this market moving in either direction. And, and it, it adds in the same way that a lot of people have learned, oh, I can buy stocks. Oh, I can, you know, trade one stock long against one stock short. Oh, great. Oh, I can add this other dimension, which is options on top of that stock. This is uh, exactly that, going from swapping, buying or selling the market to providing liquidity. I I'm super excited to set this up. Yeah, and I'd even take it one step further, Frank, and look at this as almost a liquidity mechanism for almost anything. Okay. Granted, it has to be tokenized. But this is a platform or a mechanism for creating liquidity because you can, in theory, swap any token as long as there's liquidity for it. Mm. And so if we take this a step further and we think about what could happen in the future, maybe equities are represented in tokenized form, mm. uh, maybe other assets, uh, coupons, whatever it might be that you want to trade or you want to exchange for another token on the blockchain. This facilitates that process as long as there are individuals, institutions, it doesn't really matter as long as there are liquidity providers mm -hmm. on the other side of that. You have to have a liquid market, but this technology facilitates it. So, you know, it's not a stretch to say that if all equities, all assets were represented in tokenized form, then you would no longer really need a lot of the intermediaries that exist today, right? Um, not saying that they wouldn't be around in some form, sure. but the way that this is done today would look a bit different in that world. Yeah, tr truly leveling. It's one of those events similar to, you know, Robin Hood and Tasty Trade in these places, taking commissions down to zero, leveling the playing field so that anybody can take part in stock trading and everything. This is almost another step in that direction of like, now anyone can take part in liquidity providing. Yeah, in market making, really. Yeah. You know, it's very, very early. But I think you can see some of the signs. And I was talking to TP about this uh, before the show. To me, it's kind of like you went from open outcry in the pits mm -hmm. to trading on a screen to electronic trading, the rise of retail brokerages, um, you know, your E-trades, your Tasty Trades of the world when that first popped up or go back um, you know, to TP and, and Tom and Scott's days of Think or Swim. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, that's an evolution from the open outcry. This to me is the evolution from where we are here today, not happening overnight. But the technology exists in this nascent form that it's I think it's certainly possible. It's a non zero probability. I mean, the Uniswap's generated uh, over two billion dollars in revenue uh, since inception, you know, m much more than that. So it's not a stretch. Um, this is real, as I like to say. Well, well let's as, set up a pool. Yeah, as we set it up, what is the incentive to, oh, okay, I understand why I'd want to buy or sell Bitcoin or ETH. What, why would I want to set up one of these pools? And I guess that could kind of launch us into setting them up. What is the incentive behind uh, setting up a liquidity pool for me, aside from it's a historic event, a, a retail individual can enter into these market making functionalities that you couldn't in the past, but, but why would I want to set one of these up? As a liquidity provider, the fees that are charged by the protocol um, and that those that are trading are paying, they don't go straight to a company or to the protocol, directly to Uniswap. They go to the liquidity providers. Mm. So the answer is to make money, gotcha. um, to generate yield, right? That yield might be in the form of other tokens, but maybe you want those other tokens, and that's the reason why you're providing liquidity for that underlying pair. But the reason you would do this is because of the commercial element to it, um, you know, generating revenue. Again, those fees go to the liquidity providers. So gotcha. that's what I'm interested in. Very cool. All right, Frank, let's set up the pool. So step one in setting up a pool is you click on pool at the top. Easy. Very straightforward. We don't have any existing positions. If I show my closed positions and then scroll all the way down here to, you can see I've been doing this for a while, um, all the way down to my most recent pool, uh, this is what I was talking about. So my range was right around 3,000 to the downside and about 3,500 to the upside here. You can see the price is above that. It was well above this earlier. So my pool here, if this was the one that I still had up and running, is out of range. That means it's not generating any fees. I'm not providing liquidity um, for trading around the current price. So I need to rebalance. I need to create a new pool. And that's exactly 
what we're going to do. So I have removed the liquidity prior to this. We'll hide our closed positions. Here's how you set up a new pool. And you guessed it, click on new position. So when I do that, it's going to give me the ability to select the pair of tokens that I want to provide liquidity for. In the same way that I need a pair to swap, I've got ETH, I want to swap into USDC. Well, what kind of liquidity pool do you want to set up? In this case, we're going to stick with the tried and true ETH USDC. So I'm going to click on USDC. That is my pair. Let me just pull up my notes because I picked out earlier exactly the amount that I want to put in here because I was telling you that um, when I do this, the fees that I generate, I tend to just keep them in my wallet. You can put them back into your pool. You can compound this. I'm bullish on ETH. Uh, I think it could get to much higher prices as we've discussed. So the fees that I generate in Ethereum and in USDC, I like to keep those in the wallet and then put the same consistent for the most part. I mean, the prices of, of the cryptocurrencies of, ETH, of Ethereum can change, but I like to put around the same size pool position on each gotcha. time. So let me just pull this up. So I've got my numbers. Yeah, and it, it's similar to, I mean, if you've got a dividend paying stock and you have that dividend just going into the stock, of course, there's the risk of like, you can't just be like, oh, I, I'm playing with house money because the, the stock that you're getting paid, whatever the dividend yield is, could go to zero. Yes. And sa same in this case. But yeah, to your point, it's like, OK, I, I, I'm, I own the ETH. That's why I'm here. Uh, and, and now I'm trying to make money off of the ETH. And so I'm going to keep kind of pumping it into that part of my portfolio. Yes, exactly right. So we're going to set up a pool. We've got ETH USDC. We have to select the fee tier. So we have a fee tier of five basis points, 30 basis points, 1%. This is a pair that is not going to be as volatile as two different cryptocurrencies that maybe aren't always positively correlated. Obviously, we have a dollar stable coin as one side of the pair here. So we're really only worried about the price of Ethereum. Mm -hmm. um, USDC is one. Could it depeg? Maybe. But for the purposes of this show, it's one. So one dollar on this side and then the price of Ethereum on the other side, we're going to use that five basis point fee tier, which you can see the majority, at least 55 percent of people setting up these pools tend to select that. So the next step after we've selected our fee tier and the pair that we're going to put on, and again, you could do ETH uh, versus wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum. You could do it against any other token, um, two random ass tokens, if mm. you want to, Frank. Mm. Um, but again, we're going to go with ETH USDC. We now have to select a price range. And you can think about this as just ETH in dollar terms because the dollar is on the other side of our pair. So what price range do you select? I knew you were going to ask that question. <laughs> it's, my, it's my top three questions for sure. Here's how I think about it, OK? You can go and you can look at a chart and you can say, this is support. This is resistance. This is the range I think it's going to trade in over a period of time. You could say, this is where I'd love to own a bunch of ETH. Or if I come in and I set this pool up and I've got half of it in Ethereum and half of it in USDC, I'm perfectly fine being 100% USDC at a certain level. Mm -hmm. It might be a similar approach that you would take if you're selling a put. I like the stock at the 100 strike. Mm -hmm. It's trading at 125, it gets down to 100, I'll buy 100 shares at 100. Mm -hmm. You know, a similar concept, I sure. suppose. Or you can use a little bit of math. And I know you're a math guy. Heard about it. So what I'm going to do for this pool, or at least as a way to think about it, is to jump over to our expected moves. We ran these numbers earlier and use the vol and a one standard deviation range as a starting point. So we've got ETH at about 3,600, and we've got a weekly expected range given a volatility of about 77%. That's an implied vol on a 30-day basis. That number or that range is about $400. So let's just use that as a way to set this up. Um, you can model different volatilities. You can you know, set up whatever range you want. Maybe just like $100 up, $100 down, and that's where you want to go. You can do that. We will go to, um, what, about 400 or so. So we'll do 3,200 on the downside, and we'll do 4,000 on the upside. So this is the range in which we're going to provide liquidity. As I move down, I now have to decide how much liquidity do I want to provide in that range. And as I had mentioned earlier, I kind of ran my numbers. And 
to set this up because I like to keep some USDC in here. I like to keep some ETH in here as well because I'm bullish on ETH. I am going to create a pool that has um, about six tenths of an ETH in it, a little bit over that, and um, almost $2,500 in terms of USDC. So we have 4,479 in terms of the USDC balance, but we're going to only add 2457 to this. And you can see that it's going to then balance it out. So we're at about 50-50. I'm gonna be adding spot 64 ETH, which is $2,300 and 2457, almost $2,500 gotcha. in USDC. And that is the total size of the pool. So the total size of the pool will be closer to um, almost $5,000 there. And that's really it. Um, from here, I'm gonna click on preview. It's gonna, again, just kind of confirm and send uh, very similar in terms of review before you, you send your order or add liquidity. And then it's gonna populate the Tasty Crypto application. Um, you are going to pay a gas fee. So this is something that I wanna point out. Yep. And please stop me, because I know I'm just running all over the place without giving you time to ask questions. But the gas fee is what you're gonna pay to interact with the network. So here it's estimated about $55. We're gonna click send now, and then this is going to process here and ultimately, well, give me an error. So I have to look at why that, uh, that error popped up there. But um, <clears throat> once you do that, there we go. Okay, so inadvertent error message. You can see in the app, it uh, has added my liquidity. Perfect. And so if I go back to the pool, should appear and now here's our active wow. pool so let's take a look at what we have going on before we wrap up the show so we set it up we click the button we got a weird error message for a second but let's ignore that we'll fix yeah. why that popped up but we've now created the pool and here's what's going on in this pool we have almost five thousand dollars that we are in a sense risking to provide liquidity you can see the makeup of the pool. We started at 50-50, it's right around there. So 51% USDC, 49% ETH. What that tells me is that the price of ETH has increased just slightly. So what's happened in the pool, I've sold some of my ETH that I started with and I've gained a little bit more USDC. Price goes down, there's some selling, I'll have more ETH, I'll have less USDC. The unclaimed fees, we're not quite at a penny as of uh, right yet, but it's only been a couple seconds. This will update automatically as awesome. the protocol is utilized for swaps, right? Um, if I go down here, we'll talk about the risks really quickly, then we'll wrap it up. This is the range, 3,200 to about 4,000 on the upside, right mid-range at the moment. Think about this as a strangle. This is your covered call, short or your short call uh, strike here. I would treat it like a covered call in terms of how I think about it. So if the price goes above 4,000, what's happened? Well, I've sold out of all of my ETH. I only have USDC. My pool will reflect that. It'll be 100% USDC. It'll tell me I'm out of range. I will have collected fees. But in order to then get back in range, I either need to wait and the price has to fall or I have to rebalance the pool and set it up. So you have a risk to the upside, opportunity cost. If I set this pool up and ETH goes to five grand, well, I've missed out on the appreciation of that ETH I otherwise would have experienced. But, right? but I'm capped like a short call. The big question for me, especially, but it seems like if you're using USDC based pairs. Yes, you, you, my USDC isn't gonna be wild. Exactly. Volatile. I'm just gonna have dollars, and, I've sold out of all. And of so them. if you put, let's say 10 grand, you put five grand, let's say you put 10 grand into this pool, Yes. Five grand on each side here. And the market, yeah, ETH runs up huge. You're still going to essentially have that 10 grand minus the gas fees plus your your fees that you generated. Yes. You will have made money, but you have this risk called impermanent loss. You you know, I think about this almost as an opportunity cost. Yeah. You would have made more money had you not created the pool. Yeah. But... As a strategy, maybe you want a little bit of your crypto in a pool to generate some fees. Exactly. You know, there might be times when you want to do this, might be times when you don't want to do it, but that's what the upside risk is. Okay. The downside risk is similar to a short put for all the option traders following along. This is no different than if my position went to 100% ETH. If it's under 3,200, my pool goes from 50-50 to 100% ETH, no more USDC. I might be perfectly fine with that. Worst case scenario, ETH goes to zero. I lose everything. It doesn't sound good, but that's no different than 
I was put the stock at whatever the price is at $100 a share. It goes down to 50. It goes to zero. It goes out of business. I lose everything. Very similar risk. Um, you have currency risk. You have the you know the risk of the underlying asset in this case. That's the risk to the downside here. So those are your two big risks um, in terms of you know the, the market action and the price action. And let's cover the. I, today was great. We set it up. You show me how easy it is for uh, if I have ETH or USDC or, or funds in my Tasty Crypto wallet, I can very easily set one of these up. Um, using what you've just shown. I think the next piece is let's dive into what we want to happen, Yes. what the risks are involved. Is there counterparty risk at Uniswap? Like, like what, what are the risks and what do we want to happen from here on out? And, uh, and watch this thing uh, hopefully make money. Yeah, we'll monitor this. Um, best case scenario over the next week, you know, best case scenario for us mm -hmm. with this specific liquidity pool is when you think about it, we're short vol. So we want a lot of trading activity, but within a defined range. We want the price of ETH to chop between 4000 and 3200 gotcha. We want to generate fees. Now, that's not good for us if we're long a bunch of ETH and we want it to go up. Yeah. But for this specific position, how does it ultimately make money over time? The price of ETH chops in that range and you just collect those sweet, sweet fees. This is awesome, dude. I, I seriously am going to go set one of these up as soon as possible. I think we'll talk off the show. I think I have enough money to, to set one of these up relatively safely and see. Oh, I know you guys enough money, Frank. <laughs> I'm so excited, man. Thanks for showing me this. Absolutely. That's going to do it for our show. Victor Jones is up next with The Price of Truth. I'll be back on Wednesday with the one and only Mad Mike. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Ryan. I'm Frank. Peace. To my trusted financial advisor, let me know your thoughts on reinvesting what very little remains of my money into ramen noodle stock, now that I'll be eating it for every meal until I die. Best, Cynthia. Sometimes it feels good to get smart. Get even smarter with live market insights and insults. They're all freaking losers. There's no <laughs> skill. From the smart mouths at Tasty Live. Think or swim will always be my baby, but this one, it's different. We built ours literally from scratch. It's a much thinner, it's a faster, it's a slicker application. Everything's on one page. So you're always looking at the core page and then bouncing around from there to get to whatever you wanna get to. We're here to support whatever you're looking to do. We have the tools that you need to be a successful trader. Tap it, trade it. Deposit and withdraw money right in the app. View company financials, forecasts, news, and more. Set custom alerts to stay up to date. See things bigger in landscape mode. Get the customizable trading experience you want. The tools, the data, the knowledge. See it, tap it, trade it. Join the club, genius. Tasty Trade. Got friends? Get $250. We'll give you a bonus for each qualified person you refer to Tasty Trade. So spread the word and earn rewards. Terms and conditions apply. Join the club, genius. Tasty Trade. Tom, when you talk about the good guys, who are they? They are, they are, they are us. <laughs> we are the good guys. When you, when you say they take out the weekend, what does that mean to you? That means when you're a premium seller and they take out the weekend, that means that 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 means that all the decay over those two days, Saturday and Sunday, when the markets are closed, come out of the market Monday morning. When I say bell to bell, what does that mean to you? Bell to bell is like in horse racing, they would call it wire to wire. And in trading, they call it bell to bell. So the opening bell to the closing bell. If you're saying something's thin, what does that mean to you? That means it's not very liquid. That means that the marketplace is relatively illiquid. That's what thin means. If you can't buy an uptick, what's happening? If you can't buy an uptick, that means the market is going down and it's not, and it's there's no bounce. How does daddy do it? <laughs> daddy does it good.
Looking for a better broker and a bonus? Sweet. We got you. Right now, you can get a bonus of up to $4,000 when you open and fund a Tasty Trade account. Plus, low rates, smart tech with the analysis tools you need, and award winning support. So, get a broker who's actually got your back. And up to $4,000 at Tasty Trade. Make your move, genius. Tasty Trade. Oh, yeah. Tasty Nation, good morning. Yeah, it's March 25th, a little bit after 5 o'clock. You know what that means. It's time for Tasty Live's all-new evening show, The Price of Truth, the podcast where we explore the incentives that govern our world. The idea is to have great minds come on and share great ideas. Today is no different. Today uh, with us we have Mr. Urban Cowboy himself, (laughs) Mr. Michael Cow. Michael, how you doing, my friend? Great. It's great to be with you again. It's been a while. It has been a while, over a year or so, and I'm drowning. Yeah. There's too much global, you know, economic market signal, cross currents, and I need uh, Mr. Urban Cowboy himself to come in, set me straight, <laughs> and help me think about how to think about markets and signaling and macro and everything else. Uh, before we get into it, just in case, Michael, somebody's been living under a rock and they're not as familiar with your illustrious career, would uh, would you mind giving us a quick update on your, your background so we can get into the good stuff? Sure. Uh, I've been in the hedge fund business for, I guess, around 25 years or so, 17 of them on my own running Acanthos Capital Management. Uh, I retired from active fund management back in 2019. And so now I just think of myself as a family office investor, cross asset class, uh, pay attention a lot to macro and oil specifically because I still have a, a uh, an outsized uh, long-term uh, private equity, a post reorg private equity in the oil and gas space. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, since 2019, I've been, uh, in addition to just trading on my own for fun, um, I've been allocating to uh, outside managers in a lot of different spaces now. So I'm kind of becoming uh, uh, a, a allocator of assets to outside managers, which 